Chapter One of The Doctor's Wife. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsten Weber. The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. Chapter One A Young Man from the Country. There were two surgeons in the little town of Greybridge on the Wavern, in pretty pastoral Midlandshire. Mr. Polkett, who lived in a big, new, brazen-faced house in the middle of the queer old high street, and John Gilbert, the parish doctor, who lived in his own house on the outskirts of Greybridge, and worked very hard for a smaller income than that which the stylish Mr. Polkett derived from his aristocratic patients. John Gilbert was an elderly man, with a young son. He had married late in life, and his wife had died very soon after the birth of this son. It was for this reason, most likely, that the surgeon loved his child, as children are rarely loved by their fathers, with an earnest, over-anxious devotion, which from the very first had something womanly in its character, and which grew with the child's growth. Mr. Gilbert's mind was narrowed by the circle in which he lived. He had inherited his own patients and the parish patients from his father, who had been a surgeon before him, and who had lived in the same house with the same red lamp over the little old-fashioned surgery door for eight and forty years, and had died, leaving the house, the practice, and the red lamp to his son. If John Gilbert's only child had possessed the capacity of a Newton or the aspirations of a Napoleon, the surgeon would nevertheless have shut him up in the surgery to compound aloes and conserve of roses, tincture of rhubarb, and essence of peppermint. Luckily for the boy, he was only a commonplace lad with a good-looking, rosy face, clear gray eyes which stared at you frankly, and a thick stubble of brown hair, parted in the middle and waving from the roots. He was a tall, straight, and muscular boy, a good runner, a first-rate cricketer, tolerably skillful with a pair of boxing gloves or single sticks, and a decent shot. He wrote a fair business-like hand, was an excellent arithmetician, remembered a smattering of Latin, a random line here and there from those Roman poets and philosophers whose writings had been his torment at a certain classical and commercial academy at Wareham. He spoke and wrote tolerable English. He had read Shakespeare and Sir Walter Scott, and infinitely preferred the latter, though he made a point of skipping the first few chapters of the great novelist's fictions in order to get at once to the action of the story. He was a very good young man, went to church two or three times on a Sunday, and would on no account have broken any one of the Ten Commandments on the painted tablets above the altar by so much as a thought. He was very good, and, above all, he was very good-looking. No one had ever disputed this fact. George Gilbert was eminently good-looking. No one had ever gone so far as to call him handsome, no one had ever presumed to designate him plain. He had those homely, healthy good looks, which the novelist or poet in search of a hero would recoil from with actual horror, and which the practical mind involuntarily associates with tenant farming in a small way, or the sale of butcher's meat. I will not say that poor George was ungentlemanly, because he had kind, cordial manners, and a certain instinctive Christianity, which had never yet expressed itself in any tangible form, but which lent a genial flavor to every word upon his lips, to every thought in his heart. He was a very trusting young man, and thought well of all mankind. He was a Tory, heart and soul, as his father and grandfather had been before him, and thought especially well of all the magnates around about Wareham and Greybridge, holding the grand names that had been familiar to him from his childhood in a simple reverence that was without a thought of meanness. He was a candid, honest, country-bred young man, who did his duty well, and filled a small place in a very narrow circle with credit to himself and the father who loved him. 
The fiery ordeal of two years' student life at St. Bartholomew's had left the lad almost as innocent as a girl. For John Gilbert had planted his son during these two awful years in the heart of a quiet Wesleyan family in the Seven Sisters Road, and the boy had enjoyed very little leisure for disporting himself with the dangerous spirits of St. Bartholomew's. George Gilbert was two and twenty, and in all the course of those two and twenty years which made the sum of the young man's life, his father had never had reason to reproach him by so much as a look. The young doctor was held to be a model youth in the town of Greybridge, and it was whispered that if he should presume to lift his eyes to Miss Sophronia Burdock, the second daughter of the rich maltster, he need not aspire in vain. But George was by no means a coxcomb, and didn't particularly admire Miss Burdock, whose eyelashes were a good deal paler than her hair, and whose eyebrows were only visible in a strong light. The surgeon was young, and all the world was before him. But he was not ambitious. He felt no sense of oppression in the narrow high street at Greybridge. He could sit in the little parlour next to the surgery reading Byron's fiercest poems, sympathizing in his own way with the jowers and corsairs, but with no passionate yearning stirring up in his breast, with no thought of revolt against the dull quiet of his life. George Gilbert took his life as he found it, and had no wish to make it better. To him, Greybridge on the Wavern was all the world. He had been in London, and had felt a provincial's brief sense of surprised delight in the thronged streets, the clamour and the bustle, but he had very soon discovered that the great metropolis was a dirty and disreputable place, as compared to Greybridge on the Wavern, where you might have taken your dinner comfortably off any doorstep, as far as the matter of cleanliness is concerned. The young man was more than satisfied with his life. He was pleased with it. He was pleased to think that he was to be his father's partner, and was to live and marry, and have children and die at last, in the familiar rooms in which he had been born. His nature was very adhesive, and he loved the things he had long known, because they were old and familiar to him, rather than for any merit or beauty in the things themselves. The 20th of July, 1852, was a very great day for George Gilbert, and indeed for the town of Greybridge generally, for on that day an excursion train left Wareham for London, conveying such roving spirits as cared to pay a week's visit to the great metropolis upon very moderate terms. George had a week's holiday, which he was to spend with an old schoolfellow who had turned author, and had chambers in the temple, but who boarded and lodged with a family at Camberwell. The young surgeon left Greybridge in the maltster's carriage at eight o'clock upon that bright summer morning, in company with Miss Burdock and her sister Sophronia, who were going up to London on a visit to an aristocratic aunt in Baker Street, and who had been confided to George's care during the journey. The young ladies and their attendant squire were in very high spirits. London, when your time is spent between St. Bartholomew's Hospital and the Seven Sisters Road, is not the most delightful city in the world, but London, when you are a young man from the country with a week's holiday and a five-pound note and some odd silver in your pocket, assumes quite another aspect. George was not enthusiastic but he looked forward to his holiday with a placid sense of pleasure, and listened with untiring good humour to the conversation of the maltster's daughters, who gave him a good deal of information about their aunt in Baker Street, and the brilliant parties given by that lady and her acquaintance. But amiable as the young ladies were, George was glad when the Midlandshire train steamed into the Euston terminus, and his charge was ended. He handed the Mrs. Burdock to a portly and rather pompous lady, who had a Clarence and pair waiting for her, and who thanked him with supreme condescension for his care of her nieces. She even went so far as to ask him to call in Baker Street during his stay in London, at which Sophronia blushed. But, unhappily, Sophronia did not blush prettily. A faint, patchy red broke out all over her face, even where her eyebrows ought to have been, 
and was a long time dispersing. If the blush had been beauty's bright transient glow, as brief as summer lightning in a sunset sky, George Gilbert could scarcely have been blind to its flattering import. But he looked at the young lady's emotion from a professional point of view, and mistook it for indigestion. "'You're very kind, ma'am,' he said, "'but I'm going to stay at Camberwell. I don't think I shall have time to call in Baker Street.' The carriage drove away, and George took his portmanteau and went to find a cab. He hailed a hansom, and he felt, as he stepped into it, that he was doing a dreadful thing, which would tell against him in Greybridge, if by any evil chance it should become known that he had ridden in that disreputable vehicle. He thought the horse had a rakish, unkempt look about the head and mane, like an animal who was accustomed to night work and indifferent as to his appearance during the day. George was not used to riding in hansoms, so instead of balancing himself upon the step for a moment while he gave his orders to the charioteer, he settled himself comfortably inside, and was a little startled when a hoarse voice at the back of his head demanded, "'Where to, sir?' and suggested the momentary idea that he was breaking out into involuntary ventriloquism. "'The Temple, driver, the Temple, in Fleet Street,' Mr. Gilbert said politely." The man banged down a little trap-door and rattled off eastwards. I am afraid to say how much George Gilbert gave the cabman when he was set down at last at the bottom of Chancery Lane, but I think he paid for five miles at eightpence a mile and a trifle in on account of a blockade at Holborn, and even then the driver did not thank him. George was a long time groping about the courts and quadrangles of the temple before he found the place he wanted, though he took a crumpled letter out of his waistcoat pocket and referred to it every now and then when he came to a standstill. Wareham is only a hundred and twenty miles from London, and the excursion train, after stopping at every station on the line, had arrived at the terminus at half-past two o'clock. It was between three and four now, and the sun was shining upon the river, and the flags in the temple were hot under Mr. Gilbert's feet. He was very warm himself, and almost worn out, when he found, at last, the name which he was looking for, painted very high up in white letters upon a black doorpost. Fourth floor, Mr. Andrew Morgan, and Mr. Sigismund Smith. It was in the most obscure corner of the dingiest court in the temple that George Gilbert found this name. He climbed a very dirty staircase, thumping the end of his portmanteau upon every step as he went up, until he came to a landing midway between the third and fourth stories. Here he was obliged to stop for sheer want of breath, for he had been lugging the portmanteau about with him throughout his wanderings in the temple, and a good many people had been startled by the aspect of a well-dressed young man carrying his own luggage, and staring at the names of the different rows of houses, the courts, and quadrangles in the grave sanctuary. George Gilbert stopped to take a breath, and he had scarcely done so when he was terrified by the apparition of a very dirty boy, who slid suddenly down the baluster between the floor above and the landing, and alighted face to face with the young surgeon. The boy's face was very black, and he was evidently a child of tender years, something between eleven and twelve, perhaps. But he was in no wise discomfited by the appearance of Mr. Gilbert. He ran upstairs again, and placed himself astride upon the slippery baluster, with a view to another descent, when a door above was suddenly opened, and a voice said, "'You know where Mr. Manders, the artist, lives?' "'Yes, sir. Waterloo Road, sir. Montague Terrace, number two. "'Then run round to him and tell him the subject for the next illustration in The Smuggler's Bride. "'A man with his knee upon the chest of another man, and a knife in his hand. "'You can remember that?' "'Yes, sir. And bring me a proof for chapter fifty-seven. "'Yes, sir.' The door was shut, and the boy ran downstairs, past George Gilbert, as fast as he could go, but the door above was opened again, and the same voice called aloud, "'Tell Mr. Manders the man with the knife in his hand must have on top boots.' "'All right, sir,' the boy called from the bottom of the stairs. George Gilbert went up and knocked at the door above. 
It was a black door, and the names of Mr. Andrew Morgan and Mr. Sigismund Smith were painted upon it in white letters, as upon the doorpost below. A pale-faced young man, with a smudge of ink upon the end of his nose and very dirty wristbands, opened the door. "'Sam! George!' cried the two young men simultaneously, and then began to shake hands with effusion, as the French playwrights say. "'My dear old George! My dear old Sam! But you call yourself Sigismund now?' "'Yes, Sigismund Smith. It sounds well, doesn't it? If a man's evil destiny makes him a smith, the least he can do is to take it out in his Christian name. No smith with a grain of spirit would ever consent to be a Samuel. But come in, dear old boy, and put your portmanteau down. Knock those papers off that chair, there by the window.' Don't be frightened of making em a muddle. They can't be in a worse muddle than they are now. If you don't mind just amusing yourself with the times for half an hour or so, while I finish this chapter of The Smuggler's Bride, I shall be able to strike work and do whatever you like. But the printer's boy is coming back in half an hour for the end of the chapter. I won't speak a word, George said respectfully. The young man with the smudgy nose was an author and George Gilbert had an awful sense of the solemnity of his friend's vocation. "'Right away, my dear Sam. I won't interrupt you.' He drew his chair close to the open window, and looked down into the court below, where the paint was slowly blistering in the July sun. End of chapter 1 Recording by Kirsten Weber How do you find this book? Any thoughts about the book or the author? Any suggestion for improvement? Please take a moment to share your thoughts in a comment. If you like it, share it with your friends who might enjoy it as well. Subscribe to keep in touch. Visit completeaudiobooks.com for more quality content. Chapter 2 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Bratton this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter 2. A Sensation Author Mr. Sigismund Smith was a sensation author. That bitter term of reproach, sensation, had not been invented for the terror of romancers in the fifty-second year of this present century— but the thing existed nevertheless in diverse forms, and people wrote sensation novels as unconsciously as M. Jourdain talked prose. Sigismund Smith was the author of about half a dozen highly spiced fictions, which enjoyed an immense popularity amongst the classes who like their literature as they like their tobacco, very strong. Sigismund had never in his life presented himself before the public in a complete form. He appeared in weekly numbers, at a penny, and was always so appearing, and except on one occasion, when he found himself very greasy and dog's-eared at the edges and not exactly pleasant to the sense of smell, on the shelf of a humble librarian and news-vendor who dealt in tobacco and sweet stuff as well as literature— Sigismund had never known what it was to be bound. He was well paid for his work, and he was contented. He had his ambition, which was to write a great novel, and the archetype of this magnum opus was the dream which he carried about with him wherever he went, and fondly nursed by night and day. In the meantime, he wrote for his public, which was a public that bought its literature in the same manner as its pudding, in penny slices. There was very little to look at in the court below the window, so George Gilbert fell to watching his friend, whose rapid pen scratched along the paper in a breathless way, which indicated a dashing and Dumas-like style of literature, rather than the polished composition of a Johnson or an Addison. Sigismund only drew breath once, and then he paused to make frantic gashes at his shirt-collar with an inky bone paper-knife that lay upon the table. "'I'm only trying whether a man would cut his throat from right to left or left to right,' Mr. Smith said, in answer to his friend's look of terror. 
"'It's as well to be true to nature, or as true as one can be, for a pound a page, double column pages, and eighty-one lines in a column. A man would cut his throat from left to right. He couldn't do it the other way without making perfect slices of himself.' "'There's a suicide, then, in your story?' George said, with a look of awe. "'A suicide!' exclaimed Sigismund Smith. "'A suicide! In the smuggler's bride? Why, it teems with suicides! There's the Duke of Port St. Martins, who walls himself up alive in his own cellar, and there's Leonie de Padabasque, the ballet dancer, who throws herself out of Count Cesar Marachetti's private balloon— and there is Lilia, the dumb girl, the penny public like dumb girls, who sets fire to herself to escape from the... In fact, there's lots of them, said Mr. Smith, dipping his pen in his ink and hurrying wildly along the paper. The boy came back before the last page was finished, and Mr. Smith detained him for five or ten minutes, at the end of which time he rolled up the manuscript, still damp, and dismissed the printer's emissary. "'Now, George,' he said, "'I can talk to you.' Sigismund was the son of a Wareham attorney, and the two young men had been schoolfellows at the Classical and Commercial Academy in the Wareham Road. They had been schoolfellows, and were very sincerely attached to each other. Sigismund was supposed to be reading for the bar, and for the first twelve months of his sojourn in the temple, the young man had worked honestly and conscientiously, but finding that his legal studies resulted in nothing but mental perplexity and confusion, Sigismund beguiled his leisure by the pursuit of literature. He found literature a great deal more profitable, and a great deal easier, than the study of Coke upon Littleton or Blackstone's commentaries, and he abandoned himself entirely to the composition of such works as are to be seen, garnished with striking illustrations, in the windows of humble news-vendors in the smaller and dingier thoroughfares of every large town. Sigismund gave himself wholly to this fascinating pursuit, and perhaps produced more sheets of that mysterious stuff which literary people call copy than any other author of his age. It would be almost impossible for me adequately to describe the difference between Sigismund Smith, as he was known to the very few friends who knew anything at all about him, and Sigismund Smith, as he appeared on paper. In the narrow circle of his home, Mr. Smith was a very mild young man, with the most placid blue eyes that ever looked out of a human head, and a good deal of light curling hair. He was a very mild young man. He could not have hit any one if he had tried ever so, and if you had hit him, I don't think he would have minded much. It was not in him to be very angry, or to fall in love to any serious extent, or to be desperate about anything. Perhaps it was that he exhausted all that was passionate in his nature in penny numbers, and had nothing left for the affairs of real life. People who were impressed by his fictions and were curious to see him generally left him with a strong sense of disappointment, if not indignation. Was this meek young man the Byronic hero they had pictured? Was this the author of Colonel Montefiasco or The Brand Upon the Shoulder Blade? They had imagined a splendid creature, half magician, half brigand, with a pale face and fierce black eyes, a tumbled mass of raven hair, a bare white throat, a long black velvet dressing gown, and thin tapering hands with queer agate and onyx rings encircling the flexible fingers, and then the surroundings— an oak-panelled chamber, of course, black oak, with grotesque and diabolical carvings jutting out at the angles of the room, a crystal globe upon a porphyry pedestal, a mysterious picture with a curtain drawn before it, certain death being the fate of him who dared to raise that curtain by so much as a corner, a mantelpiece of black marble and a collection of pistols and scimitars, swords and yetagans, especially yatagans, glimmering and flashing in the firelight, a little show of eccentricity in the way of household pets, a bear under the sofa, and a tame rattlesnake coiled up on the hearth-rug. This was the sort of thing that the penny public expected of Sigismund Smith, 
and lo here was a young man with perennial ink smudges upon his face and an untidy chamber in the temple with nothing more romantic than a waste-paper basket a litter of old letters and tumbled proofs and a cracked teapot simmering upon the hob this was the young man who described the reckless extravagance of a montefiasco's sumptuous chamber the mysterious elegance of a diana firmiani's dimly lighted boudoir this was the young man in whose works there were more masked doors and hidden staircases and revolving picture frames and sliding panels than in all the old houses in great britain and a greater length of vaulted passages than would make an underground railway from the scottish border to the land's end this was the young man who in an early volume of poems a failure as it is in the nature of all early volumes of poems to be had cried in passionate accents to some youthful member of the aristocracy surname unknown lady mabel lady may no paean in your praise i'll sing my shattered lyre all mutely tells the tortured hand that broke the string go fair and false while jangling bells through golden waves of sunshine ring go mistress of a thousand spells but no midst those you've left forlorn one lady gives you scorn for scorn now george mr smith said as he pushed away a very dirty inkstand and wiped his pen upon the cuff of his coat now george i can attend to the rights of hospitality you must be hungry after your journey poor old boy what'll you take there were no cupboards in the room which was very bare of furniture and the only vestiges of any kind of refreshment were a brown crockery ware teapot upon the hob and a roll and pat of butter upon a plate on the mantelpiece have something sigismund said i know there isn't much because you see i never have time to attend to that sort of thing have some bread and marmalade he drew out a drawer in the desk before which he was sitting and triumphantly displayed a pot of marmalade with a spoon in it bread and marmalade and cold teas capital he said "'You'll try some, George, won't you? "'And then we'll go home to Camberwell.' "'Mr. Gilbert declined the bread and marmalade, "'so Sigismund prepared to take his departure. "'Morgan's gone into Buckinghamshire for a week's fishing,' he said, "'so I've got the place to myself. "'I come here of a morning, you know, work all day, "'and go home to tea and a chop or a steak in the evening. "'Come along, old fellow.' "'The young men went out upon the landing.' Sigismund locked the black door and put the key in his pocket. They went downstairs and through the courts and across the quadrangles of the temple, bearing towards that outlet which is nearest Blackfriars Bridge. "'You'd like to walk, I suppose, George?' Mr. Smith asked. "'Oh, yes, we can talk better walking.' They talked a great deal as they went along. They were very fond of one another and had each of them a good deal to tell." But George wasn't much of a talker as compared to his friend Sigismund. That young man poured forth a perpetual stream of eloquence which knew no exhaustion. "'And so you like the people at Camberwell?' George said. "'Oh, yes, they're capital people, free and easy, you know, and no stupid stuck-up gentility about them. Not but what Sleaford's a gentleman. He's a barrister.' I don't know exactly where his chambers are, or in what court he practices, when he's in town, but he is a barrister. I suppose he goes on circuit sometimes, for he's very often away from home for a long time together, but I don't know what circuit he goes on. It doesn't do to ask a man these sort of questions, you see, George, so I hold my tongue. I don't think he's rich, that's to say, not rich in a regular way. He's flush of money sometimes, and then you should see the Sunday dinners, salmon and cucumber and duck and green peas, as if they were nothing. Is he a nice fellow? Oh, yes, a jolly, outspoken sort of fellow, with a loud voice and black eyes. He's a capital fellow, to me, but he's not fond of company. He seldom shows if I take down a friend, 
"'Very likely you mayn't see him all the time you stay there. "'He'll shut himself up in his own room when he's at home, "'and won't so much as look at you.' "'George seemed rather alarmed at this prospect. "'But if Mr. Sleaford objects to my being in the house,' he began, "'perhaps I'd better—' "'Oh, he doesn't object, bless you,' Sigismund cried hastily. "'Not a bit of it. "'I said to Mrs. Sleaford the other morning at breakfast— "'A friend of mine is coming up from Midlandshire. "'He's as good a fellow as ever breathed,' I said, "'and good-looking into the bargain. "'Don't you blush, George, because it's spoony. "'And I asked Mrs. S. if she could give you a room and partially board you— "'I'm a partial boarder, you know, for a week or so. "'She looked at her husband. "'She's very sharp with all of us, but she's afraid of him. "'And Sleaford said, yes, my friend might come and should be welcome "'as long as he wasn't bothered about it. "'So your room's ready, George, and you come as my visitor. "'And I can get orders for all the theatres in London, "'and I'll give you a French dinner in the neighbourhood of Leicester Square "'every day of your life, if you like, "'and we'll fill the cup of dissipation to the highest top sparkle.' "'It was a long walk from the temple to Camberwell, "'but the two young men were good walkers, "'and as Sigismund Smith talked unceasingly all the way, "'there were no awkward pauses in the conversation.' They walked the whole length of the Walworth Road, and turned to the left soon after passing the turnpike. Mr. Smith conducted his friend by mazy convolutions of narrow streets and lanes, where there were pretty little villas and comfortable cottages nestling amongst trees, and where there was the perpetual sound of clattering tin pails and the slopping of milk, blending pleasantly with the cry of the milkman. Sigismund led George through these shady little retreats, and past a tall, stern-looking church, and along by the brink of a canal, till they came to a place where the country was wild and sterile in the year 1852. I dare say that railways have cut the neighborhood all to pieces by this time, and that Mr. Sleaford's house has been sold by auction in the form of old bricks. But on this summer afternoon the place to which Sigismund brought his friend was a quiet, lonely, countrified spot, where there was one big, ill-looking house, shut in by a high wall, and straggling rows of cottages dwindling away into pigsties upon each side of it. Standing before a little wooden door in the wall that surrounded Mr. Sleaford's garden, George Gilbert could see only that the house was a square brick building, with sickly ivy straggling here and there about it, and long narrow windows considerably obscured by dust and dirt. It was not a pleasant house to look at, however agreeable it might be as a habitation, and George compared it unfavorably with the trim white-walled villas he had seen on his way, those neat little mansions at five-and-thirty pounds a year, those cozy little cottages with shining windows that winked and blinked in the sunshine by reason of their cleanliness, those dazzling brass plates which shone like brazen shields upon the vivid green of newly painted front doors. If Mr. Sleaford's house had ever been painted within Mr. Sleaford's memory, the barrister must have been one of the oldest inhabitants of that sterile region on the outskirts of Camberwell. If Mr. Sleaford held the house upon a repairing lease— he must have anticipated a prodigious claim for dilapidations at the expiration of his tenancy. Whatever could be broken in Mr. Sleaford's house was broken. Whatever could fall out of repair had so fallen. The bricks held together, and the house stood, and that was about all that could be said for the barrister's habitation. The bell was broken, and the handle rattled loosely in a kind of basin of tarnished brass, so it was no use attempting to ring. But Sigismund was used to this. He stooped down, put his lips to a hole in the broken woodwork above the lock of the garden door, and gave a shrill whistle. "'They understand that,' he said. "'The bell's been broken ever since I've lived here, but they never have anything mended.' "'Why not?' "'Because they're thinking of leaving. "'I've been with them for two years and a half, "'and they've been thinking of leaving all the time. "'Sleaford has got the house cheap, "'and the landlord won't do anything, "'so between them they let it go. "'Sleaford talks about going to Australia some of these days.' 
The garden door was opened while Mr. Smith was talking, and the two young men went in. The person who had admitted them was a boy who had just arrived at that period of life when boys are most obnoxious. He had ceased to be a boy, pure and simple, and had not yet presumed to call himself a young man. Rejected on one side by his juniors, who found him arrogant and despotic, mooting strange and unorthodox theories with regard to marbles, and evincing supreme contempt for boys who were not familiar with the latest vaticinations of the sporting prophets in Bell's Life and the Sunday Times, and flouted, on the other hand, by his seniors, who offered him halfpence for the purchase of hardbake, and taunted him with base insinuations when he was seized with a sudden fancy for going to look at the weather in the middle of a strong cheroot, the hobbledehoy sought vainly for a standing place upon the social scale, and, finding none, became a misanthrope, and wrapped himself in scorn as in a mantle. For Sigismund Smith, the gloomy youth cherished a peculiar hatred. The young author was master of that proud position to obtain which the boy struggled in vain. He was a man. He could smoke a cigar to the very stump and not grow ashy pale or stagger dizzily once during the operation. But how little he made of his advantages! He could stay out late of nights, and there was no one to reprove him. He could go into a popular tavern, and call for gin and bitters, and drink the mixture, without so much as a wry face, and slap his money upon the pewter counter, and call the barmaid Mary, and there was no chance of his mother happening to be passing at that moment, and catching a glimpse of his familiar back view through the half-open swinging door, and rushing in red and angry to lead him off by the collar of his jacket amid the laughter of heartless bystanders. No, Sigismund Smith was a man. He might have got tipsy if he had liked, and walked about London half the night ringing surgeons' bells and pulling off knockers, and being taken to the station-house early in the morning to be bailed out by a friend by and by, and to have his name in the Sunday papers with a sensational heading— another tipsy swell, or a modern spring-heeled jack. Yes, Horace Sleaford hated his mother's partial boarder, but his hatred was tempered by disdain. What did Mr. Smith make of all his lofty privileges? Nothing, absolutely nothing. The glory of manhood was thrown away upon a mean-spirited cur who, possessed of liberty to go where he pleased, had never seen a fight for the championship of England, or the last grand rush for the blue ribbon of the turf, and who, at four-and-twenty years of age, ate bread and marmalade openly in the face of contemptuous mankind. Master Sleaford shut the door with a bang and locked it. There was one exception to the rule of no repairs in Mr. Sleaford's establishment. The locks were all kept in excellent order. The disdainful boy took the key from the lock, and carried it indoors on his little finger. He had warts upon his hands, and warts are the stigmata of boyhood, and the sleeves of his jacket were white and shiny at the elbows, and left him cruelly exposed about the wrists. The knowledge of his youth, and that shabby frowsiness of raiment peculiar to middle-class hobbledehoyhood, gave him a sulky fierceness of aspect, which harmonized well with a pair of big black eyes, and a tumbled shock of blue-black hair. He suspected everybody of despising him, and was perpetually trying to look down the scorn of others with still deeper scorn. He stared at George Gilbert, as the young man came into the garden, but did not deign to speak. George was six feet high, and that was in itself enough to make him hateful. "'Well, Horace,' Mr. Smith said, good-naturedly. "'Well, young un,' the boy answered disdainfully, "'how do you find yourself?' Horace Sleaford led the way into the house. They went up a flight of steps leading to a half-glass door— 
It might have been pretty once upon a time when the glass was bright and the latticed porch sheltered by clustering roses and clematis, but the clematis had withered and the straggling roses were choked with wild convolvulus tendrils that wound about the branches like weedy serpents and stifled buds and blossoms in their weedy embrace. The boy banged open the door of the house as he had banged to the door of the garden. He made a point of doing everything with a bang. It was one way of evincing his contempt for his species. "'Mother's in the kitchen,' he said. "'The boys are on the common flying a kite, and Izzy's in the garden.' "'Is your father at home?' Sigismund asked. "'No, he isn't clever. You might have known that without asking. Whenever is he at home at this time of day?' "'Is tea ready?' "'No, nor won't be for this half-hour.' "'answered the boy triumphantly. "'So, if you and your friend are hungry, "'you'd better have some bread and marmalade. "'There's a pot in your drawer upstairs. "'I haven't taken any, and I shouldn't have seen it "'if I hadn't gone to look for a steel pen. "'So if you've made a mark upon the label "'and think the marmalade's gone down lower, it isn't me. "'Tea won't be ready for half an hour, "'for the kitchen fire's been a-smokin', "'and the chops can't be done till that's clear.' and the kettle ain't on either, and the girl's gone to fetch a fancy loaf. So you'll have to wait. Oh, never mind that, Sigismund said. Come into the garden, George. I'll introduce you to Miss Sleaford. Then I shan't go with you, said the boy. I don't care for girls' talk. I say, Mr. Gilbert, you're a Midlandshire man, and you ought to know something. What odds will you give me against Mr. Tomlinson's brown colt, vinegar cruet, for the convent fur steeplechase? Unfortunately, Mr. Gilbert was lamentably ignorant on the merits or demerits of vinegar cruet. I'll tell you what I'll do, then, the boy said. I'll take fifteen to two against him in fourpenny bits, and that's one less than the last Manchester quotation. George shook his head. "'Horse-racing is worse than Greek to me, Master Sleaford,' he said. "'The master goaded the boy to retaliate. "'Your friend doesn't seem to have much life,' he said to Sigismund. "'I think we shall be able to show him a thing or two before he goes back to Midlandshire. "'A. Eh, Samuel?' "'Horace Sleaford had discovered that fatal name Samuel in an old prayer-book belonging to Mr. Smith.' and he kept it in reserve as a kind of poisoned dart, always ready to be hurled at his foe. "'We'll teach him a little life, eh, Samuel?' he repeated. "'Ha, ha, ha!' But his gaiety was cut short suddenly, for a door in the shadowy passage opened, and a woman's face, thin and vinegary of aspect, looked out, and a shrill voice cried, "'Didn't I tell you I want another penneth of milk fetched, you young torment? "'But, law, you're like the rest of them, that's all. "'I may slave my life out, and there isn't one of you will as much as lift a finger to help me.' "'The boy disappeared upon this, grumbling sulkily, "'and Sigismund opened a door leading into a parlour. "'The room was large, but shabbily furnished, and very untidy.' The traces of half a dozen different occupations were scattered about, and the apartment was evidently inhabited by people who made a point of never putting anything away. There was a work-box upon the table open, and running over with a confusion of tangled tapes and bobbins, and a mass of different colored threads that looked like variegated vermicelli. There was an old-fashioned desk, covered with dusty green bez and decorated with loose brasswork which caught at people's garments or wounded their flesh when the desk was carried about. This was open, like the work-box, and was littered with papers that had been blown about by the summer breeze and were scattered all over the table and the floor beneath it. On a rickety little table near the window there was a dilapidated box of colors, a pot of gum with a lot of brushes sticking up out of it, half a dozen sheets of Skelt's dramatic scenes and characters lying under scraps of tinsel and fragments of colored satin and neatly folded packets of little gold and silver dots, which the uninitiated might have mistaken for powders. There were some ragged-looking books on a shelf near the fireplace, two or three different kinds of inkstands on the mantelpiece, a miniature wooden stage with the lopsided pasteboard proscenium and greasy tin lamps in one corner of the floor, 
a fishing-rod and tackle leaning against the wall in another corner, and the room was generally pervaded by copy-books, slate-pencils, and torn Latin grammars, with half a brown leather cover hanging to the leaves by a stout drab thread. Everything in the apartment was shabby and more or less dilapidated. Nothing was particularly clean, and everywhere there was the evidence of boys. I believe Mr. Sleaford's was the true policy. If you have boys, cry havoc and let loose the dogs of war. Shut your purse against the painter and the carpenter, the plumber and the glazier, the upholsterer and gardener, let what is broken so remain. Reparations are wasted labor and wasted money. Buy a box of carpenter's tools for your boys, if you like, and let them mend what they themselves have broken, and if you don't mind their sawing off one or two little fingers occasionally, you may end by making them tolerably useful. Mr. Sleaford had one daughter and four sons, and the sons were all boys." People ceased to wonder at the shabbiness of his furniture and the dilapidations of his house when they were made aware of this fact. The limp chintz curtains that straggled from the cornice had been torn ruthlessly down to serve as draperies for Tom when he personated the ghost in a charade, or for Jack when he wanted a sail to fasten to his fishing rod, firmly planted on the quarter-deck of the sofa, the chairs had done duty as blocks for the accommodation of many an imaginary Anne Boleyn and Marie Antoinette upon long winter evenings, when Horace decapitated the sofa pillow with a smoky poker, while Tom and Jack kept guard upon the scaffold, and held the populace of one at bay with their halberds, the tongs and shovel. The loose carpets had done duty as raging oceans on many a night, when the easy-chair had gone to pieces against the sideboard, with a loss of two wine-glasses, and all hands had been picked up in a perishing state by the crew of the sofa, after an undramatic interlude of slaps, cuffs, and remonstrances from the higher powers, who walked into the storm-beaten ocean with cruel disregard of the unities. Mr. Sleaford had a room to himself upstairs, a bluebeard chamber, which the boys never entered, for the barrister made a point of locking his door whenever he left his room, and his sons were therefore compelled to respect his apartment. They looked through the keyhole now and then to see if there was anything of a mysterious nature in the forbidden chamber, but as they saw nothing but a dingy easy-chair and an office-table, with a quantity of papers scattered about it, their curiosity gradually subsided, and they ceased to concern themselves in any manner about the apartment, which they always spoke of as Pa's room. End of chapter 2 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 3 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter 3. Isabel. The garden at the back of Mr. Sleaford's house was a large square plot of land, with fine old pear trees sheltering a neglected lawn. A row of hazel bushes screened all the length of the wall upon one side of the garden, and wherever you looked there were roses and sweet-briar, espaliered apples, and tall, straggling raspberry bushes, all equally unfamiliar with the gardener's pruning-knife, though here and there you came to a luckless bush that had been hacked at and mutilated in some amateur operation of the boys. It was an old-fashioned garden, and had doubtless once been beautifully kept, for bright garden flowers grew up amongst the weeds summer after summer, as if even neglect or cruel usage could not disroot them from the familiar place they loved. Thus rare orchids sprouted up out of beds that were half full of chickweed, and lilies of the valley flourished amongst the ground cell in a shady corner under the water-butt. There were vines, under which no grape had ever been suffered to ripen during Mr. Sleaford's tenancy, 
but which yet made a beautiful screen of verdant tracery all over the back of the house, twining their loving tendrils about the dilapidated Venetian shutters that rotted slowly on their rusted hinges. There were strawberry beds, and there was an arbor at one end of the garden in which the boys played at Beggar My Neighbor and All Fours, with greasy dog's-eared cards in the long summer afternoons, and there were some rabbit hutches, sure evidence of the neighborhood of boys, in a sheltered corner under the hazel bushes. It was a dear, old, untidy place, where the odor of distant pigsties mingled faintly with the perfume of the roses, and it was in this neglected garden that Isabel Sleaford spent the best part of her idle, useless life. She was sitting in a basket-chair under one of the pear-trees, when Sigismund Smith and his friend went into the garden to look for her. She was lolling in a low basket-chair, with a book on her lap, and her chin resting on the palm of her hand, so absorbed by the interest of the page before her that she did not even lift her eyes when the two young men went close up to her. She wore a muslin dress, a good deal tumbled and not too clean, and a strip of black velvet was tied round her long throat. Her hair was almost as black as her brother's, and was rolled up in a great loose knot from which a long, untidy curl fell, straggling on her white throat. Her throat was very white, with the dead yellowish whiteness of ivory. "'I wish that was Colonel Montefiasco,' said Mr. Smith, pointing to the book which the young lady was reading. "'I should like to see a lady so interested in one of my books that she wouldn't so much as look up when a gentleman was waiting to be introduced to her.' Miss Sleaford shut her book, and rose from her low chair, abashed by this reproach, but she kept her thumb between the pages, and evidently meant to go on with the volume at the first convenient opportunity. She did not wait for any ceremonious introduction to George, but held out her hand to him, and smiled at him frankly. "'You are Mr. Gilbert, I know,' she said. "'Sigismund has been talking of you incessantly for the last week. Mamma has got your room ready, and I suppose we shall have tea soon.' "'There are to be some chops on purpose for your friend, Sigismund, Mamma told me to tell you.' She glanced downwards at the book, as much as to say that she had finished speaking and wanted to get back to it. "'What is it, Izzy?' Sigismund asked, interpreting her look. "'Algernon Mountford. Ah, I thought so. Always his books.' A faint blush trembled over Miss Sleaford's pale face. "'They are so beautiful,' she said. "'Dangerously beautiful, I'm afraid, Isabel,' the young man said gravely. "'Beautiful sweetmeats with opium inside the sugar. "'These books don't make you happy, do they, Izzy?' "'No, they make me unhappy, but—' "'She hesitated a little, and then blushed when she said, "'I like that sort of unhappiness. "'It's better than eating and drinking and sleeping and being happy that way.' George could only stare at the young lady's kindling face, which lighted up all in a moment, and was suddenly beautiful, like some transparency which seems a dingy picture till you put a lamp behind it. The young surgeon could only stare wonderingly at Mr. Sleaford's daughter, for he hadn't the faintest idea what she and his friend were talking about. He could only watch her pale face, over which faint blushes trembled and vanished like the roseate reflections of a sunset sky. George Gilbert saw that Isabel Sleaford had eyes that were large and black, like her brother's, but which were entirely different from his, notwithstanding, for they were soft and sleepy, with very little light in them and what little light there was, only a dim, dreamy glimmer in the depths of the large pupils. Being a very quiet young man, without much to say for himself, George Gilbert had plenty of leisure in which to examine the young lady's face as she talked to her mother's boarder, who was on cordial, brotherly terms with her. George was not a very enthusiastic young man, and he looked at Miss Sleaford's face with no more emotion than if she had been a statue amongst many statues in a gallery of sculpture. He saw that she had small, delicate features and a pale face, and that her great black eyes alone invested her with a kind of weird and melancholy beauty which kindled into warmer loveliness when she smiled. 
George did not see the full extent of Isabel Sleaford's beauty, for he was merely a good young man with a tolerable, commonplace intellect, and Isabel's beauty was of a poetical kind, which could only be fully comprehended by a poet. But Mr. Gilbert arrived at a vague conviction that she was what he called pretty, and he wondered how it was that her eyes looked a tawny yellow when the light shone full upon them, and a dense black when they were shadowed by their dark lashes. George was not so much impressed by Miss Sleaford's beauty as by the fact that she was entirely different from any woman he had ever seen before. And I think herein lay this young lady's richest charm, by right of which she should have won the homage of an emperor. There was no one like her. Whatever beauty she had was her own, and no common property, shared with a hundred other pretty girls. You saw her once, and remembered her forever, but you never saw any mortal face that reminded you of hers. She shut her book altogether, at Sigismund's request, and went with the two young men to show George the garden, but she carried the dingy-looking volume lovingly under her arm, and she relapsed into a dreamy silence every now and then, as if she had been reading the hidden pages by some strange faculty of clairvoyance. Horace Sleaford came running out presently and summoned the wanderers to the house where tea was ready. "'The boys are to have theirs in the kitchen,' he said, "'and we elders tea together in the front parlour. Three younger boys came trooping out as he spoke, and one by one presented a dingy paw to Mr. Gilbert. They had been flying a kite and fishing in the canal, and helping to stack some hay in the distant meadow, and they were rough and tumbled and smelt strongly of outdoor amusements. They were all three very much like their brother, and George, looking at the four boys as they clustered round him, saw eight of the blackest eyes he ever remembered having looked upon. But not one of those four pairs of eyes bore any resemblance to Isabel's. The boys were only Miss Sleaford's half-brothers. Mr. Sleaford's first wife had died three years after her marriage, and Isabel's only memory of her mother was the faint shadow of a loving, melancholy face, a transient shadow that came to the motherless girl sometimes in her sleep. An old servant, who had come one day long ago to see the Sleafords, told Isabel that her mother had once had a great trouble, and that it had killed her. The child had asked what the great trouble was, but the old servant only shook her head and said, "'Better for you not to know, my poor sweet lamb, better for you never to know.' There was a pencil sketch of the first Mrs. Sleaford in the best parlour, a fly-spotted pencil sketch, which represented a young woman, like Isabel, dressed in a short-waisted gown with big balloon sleeves, and this was all Miss Sleaford knew of her mother. The present Mrs. Sleaford was a shrewish little woman with light hair and sharp gray eyes, a well-meaning little woman who made everybody about her miserable, and who worked from morning till night, and yet never seemed to finish any task she undertook. The Sleafords kept one servant, a maid of all work, who was called the girl, but this young person very rarely emerged from the back kitchen, where there was a perpetual pumping of water and clattering of hardware, except to disfigure the gooseberry bushes with pudding cloths and dusters, which she hung out to dry in the sunshine. To the ignorant mind it would have seemed that the Sleafords might have been very nearly as well off without a servant, for Mrs. Sleaford appeared to do all the cooking and the greater part of the housework while Isabel and the boys took it in turns to go upon errands and attend to the garden door. The front parlour was a palatial chamber as compared to the back, for the boys were chased away with slaps by Mrs. Sleaford when they carried thither that artistic paraphernalia which she called their rubbish, and the depredations of the race were therefore less visible in this apartment. Mrs. Sleaford had made herself tidy in honour of her new boarder, and her face was shining with the recent application of strong yellowish soap. George saw at once that she was a very common little woman, and that any intellectual graces inherited by the boys must have descended to them from their father. 
He had a profound reverence for the higher branch of the legal profession, and he wondered that a barrister should have married such a woman as Mrs. Sleaford, and should be content to live in the muddle peculiar to a household where the mistress is her own cook and the junior branches are amateur errand-boys. After tea, the two young men walked up and down the weedy pathways in the garden, while Isabel sat under her favorite pear-tree, reading the volume she had been so loath to close. Sigismund and his Midlandshire friend walked up and down, smoking cigars and talking of what they called old times. But those old times were only four or five years ago, though the young men talked like greybeards who look back half a century or so and wonder at the folly of their youth. Isabel went on with her book. The light was dying away, little by little, dropping down behind the pear-trees at the western side of the garden, and the pale evening star glimmered at the end of one of the pathways. She read on more eagerly, almost breathlessly, as the light grew less, for her stepmother would call her in by and by, and there would be a torn jacket to mend, perhaps, or a heap of worsted socks to be darned for the boys, and there would be no chance of reading another line of that sweet, sentimental story, that heavenly prose, which fell into a cadence like poetry, that tender, melancholy music which haunted the reader long after the book was shut and laid aside, and made the dull course of common life so dismally unendurable. Isabel Sleaford was not quite eighteen years of age. She had been taught a smattering of everything at a day-school in the Albany Road, rather a stylish seminary in the opinion of the Camberwellians. She knew a little Italian, enough French to serve for the reading of novels that she might have better left unread, and just so much of modern history as to enable her to pick out all of the sugar-plums in the historian's pages, the Mary Stuarts and Joan of Arcs and Anne Boleyns, the Iron Masks and La Valliere, the Marie Antoinettes and Charlotte Cordays, luckless Königsmarks and wicked Borgias, all the romantic and horrible stories scattered amidst the dry records of Magna Cartas and Reform Bills, clamorous third estates and beds of justice. She played the piano a little, and sang a little, and painted wishy-washy-looking flowers on Bristol board, from nature, but not at all like nature, for the passion flowers were apt to come out like blue muslin frills, and the fuchsias would have passed for prawns with short-sighted people. Miss Sleaford had received that half-and-half -half education which is popular with the poorer middle classes. She left the Albany Road Seminary in her sixteenth year, and set to work to educate herself by means of the nearest circulating library. She did not feed upon garbage, but settled at once upon the highest blossoms in the flower-garden of fiction, and read her favorite novels over and over again, and wrote little extracts of her own choosing in penny account books usually employed for the entry of butcher's meat and grocery. She knew whole pages of her pet authors by heart, and used to recite long sentimental passages to Sigismund Smith in the dusky summer evenings and I am sorry to say that the young man, going to work at Colonel Montefiasco next morning, would put neat paraphrases of Bulwer or Dickens or Thackeray into that gentleman's mouth, and invest the heroic brigand with the genial humor of a John Brodie, the spirituality of a Zanoni, and the savage sarcasm of a Lord Stein. Perhaps there never was a wider difference between two people than that which existed between Isabel Sleaford and her mother's boarder. Sigismund wrote romantic fictions by wholesale, and yet was as unromantic as the prosiest butcher who ever entered a cattle market. He sold his imagination, and Isabel lived upon hers. To him romance was something which must be woven into the form most likely to suit the popular demand. He slapped his heroes into marketable shape as coolly as a butterman slaps a pat of butter into the semblance of a swan or a crown, in accordance with the requirements of his customers. But poor Isabel's heroes were impalpable tyrants and ruled her life. She wanted her life to be like her books, 
She wanted to be a heroine, unhappy, perhaps, and dying early. She had an especial desire to die early by consumption with a hectic flush and an unnatural luster in her eyes. She fancied every time she had a little cough that the consumption was coming, and she began to pose herself, and was gently melancholy to her half-brothers, and told them, one by one in confidence, that she did not think she should be with them long. They were slow to understand the drift of her remarks, and would ask her if she was going to go out as a governess, and if she took the trouble to explain her dismal meaning, were apt to destroy the sentiment of the situation by saying, "'Oh, come now, Hooky Walker, who ate a plum dumpling yesterday for dinner, and asked for more. That's the only sort of consumption you've got, Izzy. Two helps of pudding at dinner, and no end of bread and butter for breakfast.' It was not so that Florence Dombey's friends addressed her. It was not thus that little Paul would have spoken to his sister. But then, who could tolerate these great, healthy boys after reading about little Paul? Poor Izzy's life was altogether vulgar and commonplace, and she could extract not one ray of romance out of it, twist it as she would. Her father was not a Dombey, or an Augustine Caxton, or even a Rawdon Crawley. He was a stout, broad-shouldered, good-tempered-looking man, who was fond of good eating, and drank three bottles of French brandy every week of his life. He was tolerably fond of his children, but he never took them out with him, and he saw very little of them at home. There was nothing romantic to be got out of him. Isabel would have been rather glad if he had ill-used her, for then she would have had a grievance, and that would have been something. If he would have worked himself up into a rage and struck her on the stairs, she might have run out into the lane by the canal, but, alas, she had no good Captain Cuddle with whom to take refuge, no noble-hearted Walter to come back to her with his shadow trembling on the wall in the dim firelight. Alas, alas, she looked north and south and east and west, and the sky was all dark. So she was obliged to go back to her intellectual opium-eating and become a dreamer of dreams. She had plenty of grievances in a small way, such as having to mend awkward three-cornered rents in her brother's garments and being sent to fetch butter in the Walworth Road, but she was willing enough to do these things when once you had wrenched her away from her idolized books, and she carried her ideal world wherever she went, and was tending delirious Byron at Missolonghi, or standing by the deathbed of Napoleon the Great, while the shopman slapped the butter on the scale, and the vulgar people hustled her before the greasy counter. If there had been any one to take this lonely girl in hand and organize her education— Heaven only knows what might have been made of her, but there was no friendly finger to point a pathway in the intellectual forest, and Isabel rambled as her inclination led her, now setting upon one idol, now superseding him by another, living as much alone as if she had resided in a balloon, forever suspended in mid-air, and never coming down in serious earnest to the common joys and sorrows of the vulgar life about her. George and Sigismund talked of Miss Sleaford when they grew tired of discoursing upon the memories of their schoolboy life in Midlandshire. "'You didn't tell me that Mr. Sleaford had a daughter,' George said. "'Didn't I?' "'No. She, Miss Sleaford, is very pretty. She's gorgeous,' answered Sigismund, with enthusiasm. "'She's lovely. I do her for all my dark heroines. The good heroines, not the wicked ones.' "'Have you noticed Isabel's eyes? People call them black, but they're bright orange color if you look at them in the sunshine. There's a story of Balzac's called The Girl with the Golden Eyes. I never knew what golden eyes were till I saw Isabel Sleaford. "'You seem very much at home with her.' "'Oh, yes, we're like brother and sister. She helps me with my work sometimes. At least she throws out suggestions, and I use them. "'But she's dreadfully romantic. She reads too many novels.' "'Too many?' "'Yes. Don't suppose that I want to depreciate the value of the article. A novel's a splendid thing after a hard day's work, a sharp, practical tussle with the real world. 
a healthy race on the barren moorland of life, a hardy wrestling match in the universal ring, sit down then and read Ernest Maltravers or Eugene Aram or The Bride of Lammermoor, and the sweet romance lulls your tired soul to rest like the cradle song that soothes a child. No wise man or woman was ever the worse for reading novels. Novels are only dangerous for those poor, foolish girls who read nothing else and think that their lives are to be paraphrases of their favorite books. That girl yonder wouldn't look at a decent fellow in a government office with three hundred a year and the chance of advancement, said Mr. Smith, pointing to Isabel Sleaford with a backward jerk of his thumb. "'She's waiting for a melancholy creature with a murder on his mind.' "'They went across the grass to the pear-tree under which Isabel was still seated. "'It was growing dark, and her pale face and black eyes had a mysterious look in the dusky twilight. "'George Gilbert thought she was fitted to be the heroine of a romance, "'and felt himself miserably awkward and commonplace as he stood before her, struggling with the sensation that he had more arms and legs than he knew what to do with. I like to think of these three people, gathered in this neglected suburban garden upon the 21st of July, 1852, for they were on the very threshold of life, and the future lay before them like a great stage in a theatre, but the curtain was down, and all beyond it was a dense mystery. These three foolish children had their own ideas about the great mystery. Isabel thought that she would meet a duke some day in the Walworth Road. The duke would be driving his cab, and she would be wearing her best bonnet and not going to fetch butter, and the young patrician would be struck by her and would drive off to her father and there and then make a formal demand of her hand, and she would be married to him and wear ruby velvet and a diamond coronet ever after, like Edith Dombey in Mr. Hablet Brown's grand picture. Poor George fashioned no such romantic destiny in his daydreams. He thought that he would marry some pretty girl, and have plenty of patience, and perhaps some day be engaged in a great case which would be mentioned in The Lancet, and live and die respected, as his grandfather had done before him, in the old house with the red-tiled roof and oaken gable ends painted black. Sigismund had, of course, only one vision, and that was the publication of that great book which should be written about by reviewers and praised by the public. He could afford to take life very quietly himself, for was he not, in a vicarious manner, going through more adventures than ever the mind of man imagined? He came home to Camberwell of an afternoon, and took half a pound of rump steak and three or four cups of weak tea, and lounged about the weedy garden with the boys— and other young men, who saw what his life was, sneered at him and called him slow. Slow, indeed. Is it slow to be dangling from a housetop with a frayed rope slipping through your hands and seventy feet of empty space below you? Is it slow to be on board a ship on fire in the middle of the lonely Atlantic and to rescue the entire crew on one fragile raft, with the handsomest female passenger lashed to your waist by means of her back hair? Is it slow to go down into subterranean passages with a dark lantern and half a dozen bloodhounds in pursuit of a murderer? This was the sort of thing that Sigismund was doing all day and every day, upon paper. And when the day's work was done, he was very well contented to loll in a garden chair and smoke his cigar while enthusiastic Isabel talked to him about Byron and Shelley and Napoleon I, for the two poets and the warrior were her three idols, and tears came into her eyes when she talked of the sorrowful evening after Waterloo or the wasted journey to Missolonghi, just as if she had known and loved these great men. The lower windows of the house were lighted by this time, and Mrs. Sleaford came to the back parlor window to call the young people to supper. They kept primitive hours at Camberwell, and supper was the pleasantest meal in the day, for Mrs. Sleaford's work was done by that time, and she softened into amiability and discoursed plaintively of her troubles to Sigismund and her children. 
but tonight was to be a kind of gala on account of the young man from the country. So there was a lobster and a heap of lettuces, very little lobster in proportion to the green stuff, and Sigismund was to make a salad. He was very proud of his skill in this department of culinary art, and as he was generally about five and twenty minutes chopping and sprinkling and stirring and tasting and compounding before the salad was ready, there was ample time for conversation. Tonight George Gilbert talked to Isabel, while Horace enjoyed the privilege of sitting up to supper, chiefly because there was no one in the house strong enough to send him to bed, since he refused to retire to his chamber unless driven there by force. He sat opposite his sister and amused himself by sucking the long feelers of the lobster and staring reflectively at George with his elbows on the table while Sigismund mixed the salad. They were all very comfortable and very merry, for Isabel forgot her heroes and condescended to come down temporarily to George's level and talk about the great exhibition of the previous year and the pantomime she had seen last Christmas. He thought her very pretty as she smiled at him across the table, but he fell to wondering about her again and wondered why it was she was so different from Miss Sophronia Burdock and the young ladies of Greybridge on the Wavern, whom he had known all his life and in whom he had never found cause for wonder. The salad was pronounced ready at last, and the six ale, as Horace called it, was poured out into long narrow glasses and being a light, frisky kind of beverage, was almost as good as champagne. George had been to supper parties at Greybridge, at which there had been real champagne and jellies and trifles, but where the talk had not been half so pleasant as at this humble supper table, on which there were not two forks that matched one another, or a glass that was free from flaw or crack. The young surgeon enjoyed his first night at Camberwell to his heart's content, and Sigismund's spirits rose perceptibly with the six ale. It was when the little party was gayest that Horace jumped up suddenly with the empty lobster shell in his hand and told his companions to hold their noise. "'I heard him,' he said. A shrill whistle from the gate sounded as the boy spoke. "'That's him again!' he exclaimed, running to the door of the room. He's been at it ever so long, perhaps, and won't he just give it to me if he has? Everybody was silent, and George heard the boy opening the hall door and going out to the gate. He heard a brief colloquy and a deep voice with rather a sulky tone in it, and then heavy footsteps coming along the paved garden walk and counting the steps before the door. It's your pa, Izzy, Mrs. Sleaford said. He'll want a candle, and you'd better take it out to him. I don't suppose he'll care about coming in here. George Gilbert felt a kind of curiosity about Isabel's father, and was rather disappointed when he learned that Mr. Sleaford was not coming into the parlor, but Sigismund Smith went on eating bread and cheese and fishing pickled onions out of a deep stone jar without any reference to the movements of the barrister. Isabel took the candle and went out into the hall to greet her father. She left the door ajar, and George could hear her talking to Mr. Sleaford, but the barrister answered his daughter with very ill grace, and the speech which George heard plainest gave him no very favorable opinion of his host. "'Give me the light, girl, and don't bother,' Mr. Sleaford said. "'I've been worried this day until my head's all of a muddle. Don't stand staring at me, child. Tell your mother I've got some work to do, and mayn't go to bed all night.' "'You've been worried, papa?' "'Yes, infernally, and I don't want to be bothered by stupid questions now I've got home. Give me the light, can't you?' The heavy footstep went slowly up the uncarpeted staircase. A door opened on the floor above, and the footsteps were heard in the room over the parlor. Isabel came in looking very grave and sat down away from the table. George saw that all pleasure was over for that night, and even Sigismund came to a pause in his depredations on the cheese and meditated with a pickled onion on the end of his fork. He was thinking that a father who ill-used his daughter would not be a bad subject for penny numbers, and he made a mental plan of the plot for a new romance. 
If Mr. Sleaford had business which required to be done that night, he seemed in no great hurry to begin his work, for the heavy footsteps tramped up and down, up and down the floor overhead, as steadily as if the barrister had been some ascetic Romanist who had appointed a penance for himself, and was working it out in the solitude of his own chamber. A church clock in the distance struck eleven presently, and a Dutch clock in the kitchen struck three, which was tolerably near the mark for any clock in Mr. Sleaford's house. Isabel and her mother made a stir as if about to retire, so Sigismund got up and lighted a couple of candles for himself and his friend. He undertook to show George to the room that had been prepared for him, and the two young men went upstairs together after bidding the ladies good night. Horace had fallen asleep with his elbows upon the table, and his hair flopping against the flaring tallow candle near him. The young surgeon took very little notice of the apartment to which he was conducted. He was worn out by his journey, and all the fatigue of the long summer day. So he undressed quickly, and fell asleep while his friend was talking to him through the half-open door between the two bedrooms. George slept, but not soundly, for he was accustomed to a quiet house in which no human creature stirred after ten o'clock at night, and the heavy tramp of Mr. Sleaford's footsteps in a room near at hand disturbed the young man's slumbers and mixed themselves with his dreams. It seemed to George Gilbert as if Mr. Sleaford walked up and down his room all night, and long after the early daylight shone through the dingy window curtains. George was not surprised, therefore, when he was told at breakfast next morning that his host had not yet risen, and was not likely to appear for some hours. Isabel had to go to the Walworth Road on some mysterious mission, and George overheard fragments of a whispered conversation between the young lady and her mother in the passage outside the parlour door, in which the words poor rates and summonses and silver spoons and backing and interest figured several times. Mrs. Sleaford was busy about the house, and the boys were scattered, so George and Sigismund took their breakfast comfortably together and read Mr. Sleaford's Times, which was not as yet required for that gentleman's own use. Sigismund made a plan of the day— he would take a holiday for once in a way, he said, and would escort his friend to the Royal Academy and diverse other picture galleries, and would crown the day's enjoyment by a French dinner. The two young men left the house at eleven o'clock. They had seen nothing of Isabel that morning, nor of the master of the house. All that George Gilbert knew of that gentleman was the fact that Mr. Sleaford had a very heavy footstep and a deep, sulky voice. The 21st of July was a blazing summer's day, and I am ashamed to confess that George Gilbert grew very tired of staring at pictures in the Royal Academy. To him the finest works of modern art were only pretty pictures, more or less interesting according to the story they told, and Sigismund's disquisitions upon modeling and depth and feeling and tone and color and distance were so much unintelligible jargon. So he was glad when the day's work was over, and Mr. Smith led him away to a very dingy street a little way behind the National Gallery. "'And now I'm going to give you a regular French dinner, George, old fellow,' Sigismund said in a triumphant tone. Mr. Gilbert looked about him with an air of mystification. He had been accustomed to associate French dinners with brilliantly lighted cafés and gorgeous saloons, where the chairs were crimson velvet and gold, and where a dozen vast sheets of looking-glass reflected you as you ate your soup. He was a little disappointed, perhaps, when Sigismund paused before a narrow doorway, on each side of which there was an old-fashioned window with queer-shaped wine and liqueur bottles neatly ranged behind the glass. A big lantern-shaped lamp hung over the door, and below one of the windows was an iron grating, through which a subtle flavor of garlic and mock-turtle soup steamed out upon the summer air. "'This is Bougeot's, said Mr. Smith. "'It's the jolliest place. No grander, you know, but capital wine and first-rate cooking.' The Emperor of the French used to dine here almost every day when he was in England, 
but he never told anyone his name, and the waiters didn't know who he was until they saw his portrait as president in the illustrated news. It is a popular fiction that Prince Louis Napoleon was in the habit of dining daily at every French restaurant in London during the years of his exile, a fiction which gives a romantic flavor to the dishes and an aroma of poetry to the wines. George Gilbert looked about him as he seated himself at a little table chosen by his friend, and he wondered whether Napoleon the Third had ever sat at that particular table, and whether the tablecloth had been as dirty in his time. The waiters at Bougeot's were very civil and accommodating, though they were nearly harassed off their legs by the claims of desultory gentlemen in the public apartments and old customers dining by prearrangement in the private rooms upstairs. Sigismund pounced upon a great sheet of paper, which looked something like a chronological table, and on the blank margins of which the pencil records of dinners lately consumed and paid for had been hurriedly jotted down by the harassed waiters. Mr. Smith was a long time absorbed in the study of this mysterious document, so George Gilbert amused himself by staring at some coffee-colored marine views upon the walls, which were supposed to represent the Bay of Biscay and the Cape of Good Hope, with brown waves rolling tempestuously under a brown sky. George stared at these, and at a gentleman who was engaged in the soul-absorbing occupation of paying his bill, and then the surgeon's thoughts went vagabondizing away from the little coffee-room at Bougeot's to Mr. Sleaford's garden, and Isabel's pale face and yellow-black eyes glimmering mysteriously in the summer twilight. He thought of Miss Sleaford because she was so unlike any other woman he had ever seen, and he wondered how his father would like her. Not much, George feared, for Mr. Gilbert Sr. expected a young woman to be very neat about her back hair, which Isabel was not, and handy with her needle and clever in the management of a house and the government of a maid-of-all-work, and Isabel could scarcely be that, since her favorite employment was to loll in a wicker-work garden-chair and read novels. The dinner came in at last, with little pewter covers on the dishes, which the waiter drew one by one out of a mysterious kind of wooden oven, from which there came a voice and nothing more. The two young men dined, and George thought that, except for the fried potatoes, which flew about his plate when he tried to stick his fork into them, and a flavor of garlic that pervaded everything savory, and faintly hovered over the sweets, a French dinner was not so very unlike an English one. But Sigismund served out the little messes with an air of swelling pride, and George was fain to smack his lips with the manner of a connoisseur when his friend asked him what he thought of the filet de sol à la maître d'hôtel, or the rognon à la South African sherry. Somehow or other, George was glad when the dinner was eaten and paid for, and it was time to go home to Camberwell. It was only seven o'clock as yet, and the sun was shining on the fountains as the young men went across Trafalgar Square. They took an omnibus at Charing Cross and rode to the turnpike at Walworth in the hope of being in time to get a cup of tea before Mrs. Sleaford let the fire out, for that lady had an aggravating trick of letting out the kitchen fire at half-past seven or eight o'clock on summer evenings, after which hour hot water was an impossibility unless Mr. Sleaford wanted grog, in which case a kettle was set upon a bundle of blazing firewood. George Gilbert did not particularly care whether or not there was any tea to be procured at Camberwell, but he looked forward with a faint thrill of pleasure to the thought of a stroll with Isabel in the twilight garden. He thought so much of this that he was quite pleased when the big, ill-looking house and the dead wall that surrounded it became visible across the barren waste of ground that was called a common. He was quite pleased, not with any fierce or passionate emotion, but with a tranquil sense of pleasure. When they came to the wooden door in the garden wall, Sigismund Smith stooped down and gave his usual whistle at the keyhole, but he looked up suddenly and cried, "'Well, I'm blessed!' 
"'What's the matter?' "'The door's open!' Mr. Smith pushed it in as he spoke, and the two young men went into the front garden. "'In all the time I have lived with the Sleafords, that never happened before,' said Sigismund. "'Mr. Sleaford's awfully particular about the gate being kept locked. He says that the neighborhood's a queer one, and you never know what thieves are hanging about the place. Though, intra nos, I don't see that there is much to steal hereabouts.' Mr. Smith added, in a confidential whisper. The door of the house, as well as that of the garden, was open. Sigismund went into the hall, followed closely by George. The parlor door was open, too, and the room was empty. The room was empty, and it had an abnormal appearance of tidiness, as if all the litter and rubbish had been subtly scrabbled together and carried away. There was a scrap of old frayed rope upon the table, lying side by side with some tin tacks, a hammer, and a couple of blank luggage labels. George did not stop to look at these. He went straight to the open window and looked out into the garden. He had so fully expected to see Isabel sitting under the pear tree with a novel in her lap that he started and drew back with an exclamation of surprise at finding the garden empty. The place seemed so strangely blank without the girlish figure lolling in the basket-chair. It was as if George Gilbert had been familiar with that garden for the last ten years, and had never seen it without seeing Isabel in her accustomed place. "'I suppose, Miss Sleaford, I suppose they're all out,' the surgeon said, rather dolefully. "'I suppose they are out,' Sigismund answered, looking about him with a puzzled air. "'And yet that's strange. They don't often go out. At least not all at once. They seldom go out at all, in fact, except on errands. I'll call the girl.' He opened the door and looked into the front parlour before going to carry out this design, and he started back upon the threshold as if he had seen a ghost. "'What is it?' cried George. "'My luggage and your portmanteau, all packed and corded. Look!' Mr. Smith pointed, as he spoke, to a couple of trunks, a hat-box, a carpet-bag, and a portmanteau piled in a heap in the centre of the room. He spoke loudly in his surprise, and the maid of all work came in with her cap hanging by a single hairpin to a knob of tumbled hair. "'Oh, sir,' she said, "'they're all gone. They went at six o'clock this evening, and they ain't gone to America, Mrs. Says.' "'and she packed all your things, and she thinks you'd better have em took round to the greengrocer's immediate for fear of being seized for the rent, which is three-quarters due. "'But you was to sleep in the house to-night, if you please, and your friend likewise, "'and I was to get you your breakfasters in the morning before taking the key round to the Albany Road, "'and tell the landlord as they've gone away, which he don't know it yet.' "'Gone away,' said Sigismund. "'Gone away!' "'Yes, sir. Every one of em and the boys was so pleased that they would go shouting, "'Oo-ray, oo-ray, all over the garden,' though Mr. Sleaford swore at em awful, and did hurry and tear so, I thought he was a-going mad. But Miss Isabel, she cried about going so sudden, and seemed all pale and frightened-like, and there's a letter on the chimbley piece, please, which she put it there.' Sigismund pounced upon the letter and tore it open. George read it over his friend's shoulder. It was only two lines. Dear Mr. Smith, don't think hardly of us for going away so suddenly. Papa says it must be so. Yours ever faithfully, Isabel. I should like to keep that letter, George said, blushing up to the roots of his hair. Miss Sleaford uh, writes a pretty hand. End of chapter 3 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 4 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter 4 The End of George Gilbert's Holiday. The two young men acted very promptly upon that friendly warning conveyed in Mrs. Sleaford's farewell message. 
The maid of all work went to the greengrocer's and returned in company with a dirty-looking boy who was Mrs. Judkins' son, please, sir, and a truck. Mrs. Judkins' son piled the trunks, portmanteau, and carpet bag on the truck and departed with his load, which was to be kept in the custody of the Judkin family until the next morning, when Sigismund was to take the luggage away in a cab. When this business had been arranged, Mr. Smith and his friend went out into the garden and talked of the surprise that had fallen upon them. "'I always knew they were thinking of leaving,' Sigismund said. "'But I never thought they'd go away like this. I feel quite cut up about it, George. I've got to like them, you know, old boy, and to feel as if I was one of the family, and I shall never be able to partial board with anybody else.' George seemed to take the matter quite as seriously as his friend, though his acquaintance with the Sleafords was little more than four-and-twenty hours old. "'They must have known before today that they were going,' he said. "'People don't go to America at a few hours' notice.' Sigismund summoned the dirty maid of all work, and the two young men subjected her to a very rigorous cross-examination— but she could tell them very little more than she had told them all in one breath in the first instance. Mr. Sleaford at his breakfast at nigh upon one o'clock, leastways she put on the pertaters for the boy's dinner before she biled his egg, and then he went out, and he come tearin' home again in one of these ansom cabs at three o'clock in the afternoon, and he told Mrs. to pack up, and he told the ansom cab man to send a four-wheeler from the first stand he passed at six o'clock precise and the best part of the luggage was sent round to the greengrocer's on a truck, and the rest was took off on the roof of the cab, and Master Oris rode alongside the cabman and would smoke one of them nasty penny pickwicks, which they always made him bilious, and Mr. Sleaford, he didn't go in a cab, but walked off as cool as possible, swinging his stick and holding his head as high as hever. Sigismund asked the girl if she had heard the address given to the cabman who took the family away. No. The girl said. Mr. Sleaford had given no address. He directed the cabman to drive over Waterloo Bridge, and that was all the girl heard. Mr. Smith's astonishment knew no bounds. He walked about the deserted house and up and down the weedy pathways between the espalier until long after the summer moon was bright upon the lawn and every trailing branch and tender leaflet threw its sharp separate shadow on the shining ground. "'I never heard of such a thing in all my life,' the young author cried. "'It's like penny numbers, with the exception of their going away in a four-wheeler cab instead of through a sliding panel and subterranean passage. It's for all the world like penny numbers.' "'But you'll be able to find out where they've gone and why they went away so suddenly,' suggested George Gilbert. "'Some of their friends will be able to tell you.' "'Friends!' exclaimed Sigismund. They never had any friends, at least not friends that they visited, or anything of that kind. Mr. Sleaford used to bring home some of his friends now and then of an evening, after dark generally, or on a Sunday afternoon, but we never saw much of them, for he used to take them up to his room, and except for his wanting brandy and cigars fetched, and chops and steaks cooked, and swearing at the girl over the balusters if the plates weren't hot enough— we shouldn't have known that there was company in the house. I suppose his chums were in the law, like himself, Mr. Smith added musingly, but they didn't look much like barristers, for they had straggling mustachios and a kind of would-be military way, and if they hadn't been Sleaford's friends I should have thought them raffish-looking. Neither of the young men could think or talk of anything that night, except the Sleafords and their abrupt departure. They roamed about the garden, staring at the long grass and the neglected flower-beds, at the osier arbor, dark under the shadow of a trailing vine, that was half smothered by the vulgar luxuriance of wild hops, the osier arbor in which the spiders made their home, and where, upon the rotten bench, Romantic Izzy had sat through the hot hours of drowsy summer days, reading her favorite novels and dreaming of a life that was to be like the plot of a novel. They went into the house and called for candles, 
and wandered from room to room, looking blankly at the chairs and tables, the open drawers, the disordered furniture, as if from these inanimate objects they might obtain some clue to the little domestic mystery that bewildered them. The house was pervaded by torn scraps of paper, fragments of rag and string, morsels of crumpled lace and muslin, bald hair-brushes lying in the corners of the bedrooms, wisps of hay and straw, tin tacks and old kid gloves. Everywhere there were traces of disorder and hurry, except in Mr. Sleaford's room. That sanctuary was wide open now, and Mr. Smith and his friend went in to examine it. To Sigismund, a newly excavated chamber in a long-buried city could scarcely have been of more interest— here there was no evidence of reckless haste. There was not a single fragment of waste paper in any one of the half-dozen open drawers on either side of the desk. There was not so much as an old envelope upon the floor. A great heap of grey ashes upon the cold hearthstone revealed the fact that Mr. Sleaford had employed himself in destroying papers before his hasty departure— the candlestick that Isabel had given him upon the previous night stood upon his desk, with the candle burnt down to the socket. George remembered having heard his host's heavy footsteps pacing up and down the room, and the occasional opening and shutting of drawers and slamming of the lids of boxes, which had mixed with his dreams all through that brief summer's night. It was all explained now. Mr. Sleaford had, of course, been making his preparations for leaving Camberwell, for leaving England, if it was really true that the family were going to America. Early the next morning there came a very irate gentleman from the Albany Road. This was the proprietor of the neglected mansion, who had just heard of the Sleaford's Hegira, and who was in a towering passion because of those three-quarters rent which he was never likely to behold. He walked about the house with his hands in his pockets, kicking the doors open and denouncing his late tenants in very unpleasant language. He stalked into the back parlour, where George and Sigismund were taking spongy French rolls and doubtful French eggs, and glared ferociously at them, and muttered something to the effect that it was like their impudence to be making themselves so jolly comfortable in his house, when he'd been swindled by that disreputable gang of theirs. He used other adjectives besides that word disreputable when he spoke of the Sleafords, but Sigismund got up from before the dirty tablecloth and protested with his mouth full that he believed in the honesty of the Sleafords, and that, although temporarily under a cloud, Mr. Sleaford would no doubt make a point of looking up the three-quarters rent and would forward post-office orders for the amount at the earliest opportunity. To this the landlord merely replied that he hoped his, Sigismund's, head would not ache till Mr. Sleaford did send the rent, which friendly aspiration was about the only civil thing the proprietor of the mansion said to either of the young men. He prowled about the rooms, poking the furniture with his stick and punching his fist into the beds to see if any of the feathers had been extracted therefrom, he groaned over the rents in the carpets, the notches and scratches upon the mahogany, the entire absence of handles and knobs, where it was possible for handles or knobs to be wanting, and every time he found out any new dilapidation in the room where the two young men were taking their breakfast, he made as if he would come down upon them for the cost of the damage. "'Is that the best teapot you're having your teas out of? "'Where's the Britannia metal, as I gave thirteen and six for seven years ago? "'Where did that tuppenny halfpenny blown glass sugar basin come from? "'It ain't mine. Mine was cut diamond. "'Why, they've done me two hundred pound mischief. "'I could afford to give them the rent. "'The rent's the least part of the damage they've done me.' "'And then the landlord became too forcible to be recorded in these pages.' and then he went groaning about the garden, whereupon George and Sigismund collected their toilet apparatus and such trifling paraphernalia as they had retained for the night's use, and hustled them into a carpet-bag and fled hastily and fearfully, after giving the servant-maid a couple of half-crowns and a solemn injunction to write to Sigismund at his address in the temple if she should hear any tidings whatever of the Sleafords. 
So, in the bright summer morning, George Gilbert saw the last of the old house, which for nearly seven years had sheltered Mr. Sleaford and his wife and children, the weedy garden in which Isabel had idled away so many hours of her early girlhood, the straggling vines under which she had dreamed bright, sentimental dreams over the open leaves of her novels. The two young men hired a cab at the nearest cab-stand, and drove to the establishment of the friendly greengrocer who had given shelter to their goods. It was well for them, perhaps, that the trunks and portmanteau had been conveyed to that humble sanctuary, for the landlord was in no humour to hesitate at trifles, and would very cheerfully have impounded Sigismund's simple wardrobe and the brand-new linen shirts which George Gilbert had brought to London. They bestowed a small gratuity upon Mrs. Judkin, and then drove to Sigismund's chambers, where they encamped, and contrived to make themselves tolerably comfortable in a rough, gypsy kind of way. "'You shall have Morgan's room,' Sigismund said to his friend, "'and I can make up a bed in the sitting-room. There's plenty of mattresses and blankets.' They dined rather late that evening at a celebrated tavern in the near neighborhood of those sacred precincts where law and justice have their headquarters, and after dinner Sigismund borrowed the law list. We may find out something about Mr. Sleaford in that, he said, but the law list told nothing of Mr. Sleaford. In vain Sigismund and George took it in turns to explore the long catalogue of legal practitioners whose names began with the letter S. There were St. John's and Simpsons, St. Evermonds and Smitherses, Standishes and Sykeses. There was almost every variety of appellation, aristocratic and plebeian, but the name Sleaford was not in the list, and the young man returned the document to the waiter, and went home wondering how it was that Mr. Sleaford's name had no place among the names of his brotherhood. I have very little to tell concerning the remaining days which the conditions of George Gilbert's excursion ticket left him free to enjoy in London. He went to the theatres with his friends and sat in stifling upper boxes, in which there was a considerable sprinkling of the order element during these sunshiny summer evenings, Sigismund also took him to diverse alfresco entertainments, where there were fireworks and polking and bottled stout, and in the daytime George was fain to wander about the streets by himself, staring at the shop windows, and hustled and frowned at for walking on the wrong side of the pavement, or else to loll on the window-seat in Sigismund's apartment, looking down into the court below, or watching his friend's scratching pen scud across the paper. Sacred as the rights of hospitality may be, they must yet give way before the exigencies of the penny press, and Sigismund was rather a dull companion for a young man from the country who was bent upon a week's enjoyment of London life. For very lack of employment, George grew to take an interest in his friend's labor, and asked him questions about the story that poured so rapidly from his hurrying pen. "'What's it all about, Sigismund?' he demanded. "'Is it funny?' "'Funny!' cried Mr. Smith, with a look of horror. "'I should think not, indeed. Who ever heard of penny numbers being funny? What the penny public want is a plot, and plenty of it, surprises, and plenty of em, mystery, as thick as a November fog. Don't you know the sort of thing? The clock of St. Paul's had just sounded eleven hours.' It's generally translation, you know, and St. Paul stands for Notre Dame. A man came to appear upon the quay which extends itself all the length between the bridges of Waterloo and London. There isn't any quay, you know, but you're obliged to have it so, on account of the plot. This man, who had a true head of a vulture, the nose pointed, sharp, terrible, all that there is of the most ferocious, the eyes cavernous, and full of a somber fire, "'carried a bag upon his back. "'Presently he stops himself. "'He regards with all his eyes the quay, nearly deserted, "'the water, black and shiny, which stretches itself at his feet. "'He listens, but there is nothing. "'He bends himself upon the border of the quay. "'He puts aside the bag from his shoulders, "'and something dull, heavy, slides slowly downwards "'and falls into the water. 
At the instant that the heavy burthen sinks with a dull noise to the bottom of the river, there is a voice loud and piercing which seems to elevate itself out of the darkness— Philip Launay, what dost thou do there with the corpse of thy victim? That's the sort of thing for the penny public, said Mr. Smith, or else a good strong combination story. What do you call a combination story? Mr. Gilbert asked innocently. Why, you see, when you're doing four great stories a week for a public that must have a continuous flow of incident— you can't be quite as original as a strict sense of honor might prompt you to be, and the next best thing that you can do, if you haven't got ideas of your own, is to steal other people's ideas in an impartial manner. Don't empty one man's pocket, but take a little bit all around. The combination novel enables a young author to present his public with all the brightest flowers of fiction, neatly arranged into every variety of garland. I'm doing a combination novel now, The Heart of Midlothian and The Wandering Jew. You've no idea how admirably the two stories blend. In the first place, I throw my period back into the Middle Ages. There's nothing like the Middle Ages for getting over the difficulties of a story. Good gracious me! Why, what is there that isn't possible if you go back into the time of the Plantagenets? I make Jeanie Deans a dumb girl, there's twice the interest in her if you make her dumb, and I give her a goat and a tambourine, because you see the artist likes that sort of thing for his illustrations. I think you'd admit that I've very much improved upon Sir Walter Scott, a delightful writer, I allow you, but decidedly a failure in penny numbers. If you were to run your eye over the story, George— "'There's only seventy-eight numbers out yet, but you'll be able to judge the plot. "'Of course, I don't make Aureola. I call my genie Aureola. "'Rather a fine name, isn't it, and entirely my own invention. "'Of course, I don't make Aureola walk from Edinburgh to London. "'What would be the good of that? "'Why, anybody could walk it if they only took long enough about it. "'I make her walk from London to Rome.' to get a papal bull for the release of her sister from the Tower of London. That's something like a walk, I flatter myself, over the Alps, which admits Aureola's getting buried in the snow and dug out again by a Mount St. Bernard's dog, and then walled up alive by the monks, because they suspect her of being friendly to the Lollards, and dug out again by Caesar Borgia, who happens to be traveling that way, and asks a night's lodging, and heard Aureola's tambourine behind the stone wall in his bedroom, and digs her out and falls in love with her, and she escapes from his persecution out of a window, and lets herself down the side of the mountain by means of her gauze scarf, and dances her way to Rome, and obtains an audience with the Pope, and gets mixed up with the Jesuits, and that's where I work in the wandering Jew." concluded Mr. Smith. George Gilbert ventured to suggest that in the days when the Plantagenet ruled our happy isle, Ignatius Loyola had not yet founded his wonderful brotherhood, but Mr. Smith acknowledged this prosaic suggestion with a smile of supreme contempt. "'Oh, if you tie me down to facts,' he said, "'I can't write at all.' "'But you like writing?' For the penny public? Oh, yes, I like writing for them. There's only one objection to the style. It's apt to give an author a tendency toward bodies. Mr. Gilbert was compelled to confess that this last remark was incomprehensible to him. Why, you see, the penny public require excitement, said Mr. Smith, and in order to get the excitement up to a strong point, you're obliged to have recourse to bodies. Say your hero murders his father and buries him in the coal cellar in number one. What's the consequence? There's an undercurrent of the body in the coal cellar running through every chapter, like the subject in a fugue or a symphony. You drop it in in the treble, you catch it up in the bass, and then it goes sliding up into the treble again, and then drops down with a melodious groan into the bass, and so on to the end of the story. And when you've once had recourse to the stimulant of bodies, you're like a man who's accustomed to strong liquors, and to whose vitiated palate simple drinks seem flat and wishy-washy. 
I think there ought to be a literary temperance pledge by which the votaries of the ghastly and melodramatic school might bind themselves to the renunciation of the bowl and dagger, the midnight rendezvous, the secret grave dug by lantern light under a black grove of cypress, the white-robed figure gliding in the gray gloaming athwart a lonely churchyard, and all the alcoholic elements of fiction. But you see, George, it isn't so easy to turn teetotaler, added Mr. Smith doubtfully, and I scarcely know that it is so very wise to make the experiment. Are not reformed drunkards the dullest and most miserable of mankind? Isn't it better for a man to do his best in the style that is natural to him than to do badly in another man's line of business? Box and Cox is not a great work when criticized upon sternly ascetic principles, but I would rather be the author of Box and Cox and hear my audience screaming with laughter from the rise of the curtain to the fall thereof than write a dull five-act tragedy in the unities of which Aristotle himself could find no flaw, but from whose performance panic-stricken spectators should slink away before the second act came to its dreary close. I think I should have liked to have been Gilbert de Pixereco, the father and prince of melodrama, the man whose dramas were acted thirty thousand times in France before he died, and how many times in England, the man who reigned supreme over the playgoers of his time, and has not yet ceased to reign. Who ever quotes any passage from the works of Gilbert de Pixerico, or remembers his name? But to this day his dramas are acted in every country theatre, his persecuted heroines weep and tremble, his murderous scoundrels run their two hours' career of villainy to be dragged off scowling to subterranean dungeons or to die, impenitent and groaning at the feet of triumphant virtue. Before nine o'clock tonight there will be honest country folks trembling for the fate of Teresa, the orphan of Geneva, and simple matrons weeping over the peril of the wandering boys. But Gilbert de Pixereco was never a great man. He was only popular. If a man can't have a niche in Walhalla, isn't it something to have his name in big letters in the playbills on the boulevard? And I wonder how long my friend Gilbert would have held the stage if he had emulated Racine or Corneille. He did what it was in him to do, honestly. And he had his reward. Who would not wish to be great— do you think I wouldn't rather be the author of The Vicar of Wakefield than of Colonel Montefiasco? I could write The Vicar of Wakefield, too, but— George stared aghast at his excited friend. But not Oliver Goldsmith's Vicar of Wakefield, Sigismund explained. He had thrown down his pen now and was walking up and down the room with his hands thrust deep down in his pockets— and his face scarlet with fierce excitement. I should do the vicar in the detective pre-Raphaelite style. Moses knows a secret of his father's, forged accommodation bills or something of that kind, sets out to go to the fair on a drowsy morning, not a leaf stirring in the vicarage garden. You hear the humming of the bees as they bounce against the vicarage windows, you see the faint light trembling about Olivia's head as she comes to watch her brother riding along the road. You see him riding away, and the girl watching him, and feel the hot, sleepy atmosphere, and hear the swoop of the sickle in the cornfields on the other side of the road, and the low white gate swings too with a click. And Miss Primrose walks slowly back to the house and says, "'Papa, it is very warm.' and you know there's something going to happen. Then the second chapter comes, and Mr. Primrose has his dinner and goes out to visit his poor, and the two girls walk about the garden with Mr. Burchell watching for Moses, who never comes back. And then the serious business of the story begins, and Burchell keeps his eye upon the vicar. Nobody else suspects good Mr. Primrose, but Burchill's eye is never off him. And one night, when the curtains are drawn and the girls are sitting at their work, 
and dear Mrs. Primrose is cutting out comfortable flannels for the poor, the vicar opens his desk and begins to write a letter. You hear the faint sound of the light ashes falling on the hearth, the slow ticking of an eight-day clock in the hall outside the drawing-room door, the sharp snap of Mrs. Primrose's scissors as they close upon the flannel. Sophia asks Birchill to fetch a volume from the bookcase behind the vicar's chair. He is a long time in choosing the book, and his eye looks over the vicar's shoulder. He takes a mental inventory of the contents of the open desk, and he sees amongst the neatly docketed papers, the receipted bills, the packets of envelopes. What? A glove. A green kid glove sewn with white, which he distinctly remembers to have seen worn by Moses when he started out on that pleasant journey from which he never returned. Can't you see the vicar's face as he looks round at Birchill and knows that his secret is discovered? I can. Can't you fancy the awful silent duel between the two men? The furtive glances, the hidden allusions to that dreadful mystery lurking in every word that Birchill utters? That's how I should do the vicar of Wakefield, said Sigismund triumphantly. There wouldn't be much in it, you know, but the story would be pervaded by Moses's body, lying murdered in a ditch half a mile from the vicarage, and Birchill's ubiquitous eye. I dare say some people would cry out upon it and declare that it was wicked and immoral, and that the young man who could write about a murder would be ready to commit the deed at the earliest convenient opportunity— but I don't suppose the clergy would take to murdering their sons by reason of my fiction, in which the rules of poetical justice would be sternly adhered to, and nemesis in the shape of Birchill perpetually before the reader. Poor George Gilbert listened very patiently to his friend's talk, which was not particularly interesting to him. Sigismund preached chop to whomsoever would listen to him or suffer him to talk, which was pretty much the same to this young man. I am afraid there were times when his enthusiastic devotion to his profession rendered Mr. Smith a terrible nuisance to his friends and acquaintance. He would visit a pleasant country house and receive hospitable entertainment and enjoy himself, and then, when all that was morbid in his imagination had been stimulated by sparkling burgundy and pale hochheimer, this wretched young trader would steal out into some peaceful garden where dew-laden flowers flung their odors on the still evening air, and, sauntering in the shadowy groves where the nightingale's faint jug-jug was beginning to sound, would plan a diabolical murder to be carried out in seventy-five penny numbers. Sometimes he was honorable enough to ask permission of the proprietor of the country mansion, and when, on one occasion, after admiring the trim flower-gardens and ivied walls, the low-turreted towers and grassy moats of a dear old place that had once been a grange, he ventured to remark that the spot was so peaceful it reminded him of slow poisoning— and demanded whether there would be any objection to his making this quiet grain the scene of his next fiction, the cordial, cheery host cried out in a big voice that resounded high up among the trees, where the rooks were cawing, "'People it with fiends, my dear boy. You're welcome to people the place with fiends, as far as I'm concerned.'" End of Chapter 4 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter Five of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter Five. George at home. The young surgeon went home to Midlandshire with his fellow excursionists when the appointed Monday came round. He met Miss Burdock and her sister on the platform in Euston Square, and received those ladies from the hands of their aunt. Sophronia did not blush now, when her eyes met George Gilbert's frank stare. She had danced twice with a young barrister at the little quadrille party which her aunt had given in honor of the maltster's daughters, 
a young barrister who was tall and dark and stylish, and who spoke of Greybridge on the Wavern as a benighted place, which was only endurable for a week or so in the hunting season. Miss Sophronia Burdick's ideas had expanded during that week in Baker Street, and she treated her travelling companion with an air of haughty indifference, which might have wounded George to the quick had he been aware of the change in the lady's manner. But poor George saw no alteration in the maltster's daughter. He watched no changes of expression in the face opposite to him as the rushing engine carried him back to Midlandshire. He was thinking of another face, which he had only seen for a few brief hours, and which he was perhaps never again to look upon, a pale girlish countenance framed with dense black hair, a pale face out of which there looked large solemn eyes like stars that glimmer faintly through the twilight shadows. Before leaving London, George had obtained a promise from his friend Sigismund Smith, Whatever tidings Mr. Smith should at any time hear about the Sleafords, he was to communicate immediately to the young surgeon of Greybridge on the Wavern. It was, of course, very absurd of George to take such an interest in this singular family. The young man admitted as much to himself. But then singular people are always more or less interesting— and having been a witness of Mr. Sleaford's abrupt departure, it was only natural that George should want to know the end of the story. If these people were really gone to America, why, of course, it was all over. But if they had not left London, some one or other of the family might turn up some day, and in that case Sigismund was to write and tell his friend all about it. George Gilbert's last words upon the platform at Euston Square had relation to this subject, and all the way home he kept debating in his mind whether it was likely the Sleafords had really gone to America, or whether the American idea had been merely thrown out with a view to the mystification of the irate landlord. Life at Greybridge on the Wavern was as slow and sleepy as the river which widened in the flat meadows outside the town, the dear old river which crept lazily past the mouldering wall of the churchyard and licked the moss-grown tombstones that had lurched against the ancient boundary. Everything at Greybridge was more or less old and quaint and picturesque, but the chief glory of Greybridge was the parish church a grand old edifice which was planted beyond the outskirts of the town and approached by a long avenue of elms beneath whose shadow the tombstones glimmered whitely in the sun. The capricious wavern, which was perpetually widening across your path wheresoever you wandered in pleasant Midlandshire, was widest here, and on still summer days the grey towers of the old church looked down at other phantasmal towers in the tranquil water. George used to wander in this churchyard sometimes on his return from a trout-fishing expedition, and, lounging among the tombstones with his rod upon his shoulder, would abandon himself to the simple daydreams he loved best to weave. But the young surgeon had a good deal of work to do, now that his father had admitted him to the solemn rites of partnership, and very little time for any sentimental musings in the churchyard. The parish work in itself was very heavy, and George rode long distances on his steady-going grey pony to attend to captious patients who gave him small thanks for his attendance. He was a very soft-hearted young man, and he often gave his slender pocket-money to those of his patients who wanted food rather than medicine. Little by little people grew to understand that George Gilbert was very different from his father, and had a tender pity for the sorrows and sufferings it was a part of his duty to behold. Love and gratitude for this young doctor may have been somewhat slow to spring up in the hearts of his parish patients, but they took deep root and became hardy, vigorous plants before the first year of George's service was over. Before that year came to a close, the partnership between the father and son had been irrevocably dissolved without the aid of legal practitioners or any legal formulas whatsoever, 
and George Gilbert was sole master of the old house with the whitewashed plaster walls and painted beams of massive oak. The young man lamented the loss of his father with all that single-minded earnestness which was the dominant attribute of his character. He had been as obedient to his father at the last as he had been at the first, as submissive in his manhood as in his childhood. But in his obedience there had been nothing childish or cowardly. He was obedient because he believed his father to be wise and good, reverencing the old man with simple, unquestioning veneration. And now that the father was gone, George Gilbert began life in real earnest. The poor of Greybridge on the Wavern had good reason to rejoice at the change which had given the young doctor increase of means and power. He was elected unanimously to the post his father's death had left nominally vacant, and wherever there was sickness and pain, his kindly face seemed to bring comfort, his bright blue eyes seemed to inspire courage. He took an atmosphere of youth and hope and brave endurance with him everywhere, which was more invigorating than the medicines he prescribed. And next to Mr. Neat, the curate, George Gilbert, was the best beloved and most popular man in Greybridge. He had never had any higher ambition than this. He had no wish to strive or to achieve. He only wanted to be useful. And when he heard the parable of the talents read aloud in the old church, a glow of gentle happiness thrilled through his veins as he thought of his own small gifts, which had never yet been suffered to grow rusty for lack of service. The young man's life could scarcely have been more sheltered from the storm and tempest of the world, though the walls of some medieval monastery had encircled his little surgery. Could the tumults of passion ever have a home in the calm breast of these quiet provincials, whose regular lives knew no greater change than the slow alteration of the seasons, whose orderly existences were never disturbed by an event? Away at Conventford there were factory strikes, and political dissensions, and fighting and rioting now and then— but here the tranquil days crept by, and left no mark by which they might be remembered. Miss Sophronia Burdick did not long cherish the memory of the dark-haired barrister she had met in Baker Street. To do so would have been as foolish as to love some bright particular star and think to wed it, in the young damsel's opinion. She wisely banished the barrister's splendid image— and she smiled once more upon Mr. Gilbert when she met him coming out of the church in the cold wintry sunlight, looking to a special advantage in his new morning clothes. But George was blind to the sympathetic smiles that greeted him. He was not in love with Miss Sophronia Burdick. The image of Isabel's pale face had faded into a very indistinct shadow by this time, Nay, it was almost entirely blotted out by the young man's grief for his father's death. But if his heart was empty enough now, there was no place in it for Miss Burdock, though it was hinted at Greybridge that a dower of four thousand pounds would accompany that fair damsel's hand. George Gilbert had no high-flown or sentimental notions, but he would have thought it no greater shame to rifle the contents of the Maltzer's iron safe than to enrich himself with the possessions of a woman he did not love. In the meantime, he lived his peaceful life in the house where he had been born, mourning with simple natural sorrow for the old father who had so long sat at the opposite side of the hearth, reading a local paper by the light of a candle held between his eyes and the small print, and putting down the page every now and then to descant at his ease upon the degeneracy of the times. The weak, loving, fidgety father was gone now, and George looked blankly at the empty chair which had taken the old man's shape, but his sorrow was unembittered by vain remorse or cruel self-reproach. He had been a good son, and he could look back at his life with his dead father and thank God for the peaceful life that they had spent together. But he was very lonely now in the old house, which was a bare, blank place, peopled by no bright, inanimate creations by which art fills the homes of wealthy hermits with fair semblances of life. 
The empty walls stared down upon the young man as he sat alone in the dim candlelight, till he was fain to go into the kitchen, which was the most cheerful room in the house, and where he could talk to William and Tilly, while he lounged against the quaint old angle of the high oaken chimney-piece, smoking his cigar. William and Tilly were a certain Mr. and Mrs. Jeffson, who had come southwards with the pretty young woman whom Mr. John Gilbert had encountered in the course of a holiday trip to a quiet Yorkshire town, where the fair towers of a minster rose above a queer old street, beyond whose gabled roofs lay spreading common lands, fair pasture farms, and pleasant market gardens. It was in the homestead attached to one of these pasture farms that John Gilbert had met the bright, rosy-faced girl whom he made his wife. And Mr. and Mrs. Jeffson were poor relations of the young lady's father. At Mrs. Gilbert's entreaty, they consented to leave the little bit of garden and meadowland which they rented near her father's farm, and followed the surgeon's wife to her new home, where Matilda Jeffson took upon herself the duties of housekeeper, general manager, and servant of all work, while her husband looked after the surgeon's table and worked in the long, old-fashioned garden, where the useful element very much preponderated over the ornamental. I am compelled to admit that, in common with almost all those bright and noble qualities which can make a man admirable, Mr. William Jeffson possessed one failing. He was lazy. But then his laziness gave such a delicious, easy-going tone to his whole character, and was so much a part of his good nature and benevolence, that to wish him faultless would have been to wish him something less than he was. There are some people whose faults are better than other people's virtues. Mr. Jeffson was lazy. In the garden, which it was his duty to cultivate, the snails crawled along their peaceful way, unhindered by cruel rake or hoe. But then, on the other hand, the toads grew fat in shadowy corners under the broad dock leaves, and the empty shells of their slimy victims attested the uses of those ugly and venomous reptiles. The harmony of the universe asserted itself in that Midlandshire garden, unchecked by any presumptuous interference from Mr. Jeffson. The weeds grew high in waste patches of ground, left here and there amongst the gooseberry bushes and the cabbages, the raspberries and potatoes, and William Jeffson offered little hindrance to their rank luxuriance. There was room enough for all he wanted, he said philosophically, and ground that wouldn't grow weeds would be good for naught. Mr. Gilbert had more fruit and vegetables than he could eat or cared to give away, and surely that was enough for anybody. Officious visitors would sometimes suggest this or that alteration or improvement in the simple garden, but Mr. Jeffson would only smile at them with a bland, sleepy smile as he lolled upon his spade and remark, that he'd been used to gardens all his life, and knew what could be made of em and what couldn't. In short, Mr. Jeffson and Matilda Jeffson, his wife, did as they liked in the surgeon's house, and had done so ever since that day upon which they came to Midlandshire to take friendly service with their second cousin, pretty Mrs. John Gilbert. They took very small wages from their kinswoman's husband, but they had their own apartments, and lived as they pleased, and ordered the lives of their master and mistress, and idolized the fair-haired baby boy who was born by and by, and who grew day by day under their loving eyes when the tender gaze of his mother had ceased to follow his toddling footsteps, or yearn for the sight of his frank, innocent face." Mr. Jeffson may have neglected the surgeon's garden, by reason of that lymphatic temperament which was peculiar to him, but there was one business in which he never lacked energy, one pursuit in which he knew no weariness. He was never tired of any labor which contributed to the pleasure or amusement of Mr. Gilbert's only son. He carried the child on his shoulders for long journeys to distant meadows in the sunshiny haymaking season, when all the air was fragrant with the scent of grass and flowers, 
He clambered through thorny gaps amidst the brambly underwood and tore the flesh off his poor big hands, hunting for blackberries and cobnuts for Master Jarge. He persuaded his master into the purchase of a pony when the boy was five years old, and the little fellow trotted to Wareham at Mr. Jeffson's side when that gentleman went on errands for the Greybridge household. William Jeffson had no children of his own, and he loved the surgeon's boy with all the fondness of a nature peculiarly capable of love and devotion. It was a bitter day for him when Master Jarge went to the Classical and Commercial Academy at Wareham, and but for those happy Saturday afternoons on which he went to fetch the boy for a holiday that lasted till Sunday evening, poor William Jeffson would have lost all the pleasures of his simple life. What was the good of haymaking if George wasn't in the thick of the fun, clambering on the loaded wain, or standing, flushed and triumphant, high up against the sunlit sky, on the growing summit of the new-made stack? What could be drearier work than feeding the pigs or milking the cow, unless Master Jarge was by, to turn labor into pleasure by the bright magic of his presence? William Jeffson went about his work with a grave countenance during the boy's absence, and only brightened on those delicious Saturday afternoons when Master Jarge came hurrying to the little wooden gate in Dr. Mulder's playground, shouting a merry welcome to his friend. There was no storm of rain or hail, snow or sleet, that ever came out of the heavens heavy enough to hinder Mr. Jeffson's punctual attendance at that little gate. What did he care for drenching showers or thunderclaps that seemed to shake the earth, so long as the little wooden gate opened and the fair young face he loved poked out at him with a welcoming smile? "'Our boys laid any money you wouldn't come to-day, Jeff,' Master Gilbert said sometimes, "'but I knew there wasn't any weather invented that would keep you away. O oh, blessed reward of fidelity and devotion!' What did William Jeffson want more than this? Matilda Jeffson loved her master's son very dearly in her own way, but her household duties were a great deal heavier than Mr. Jeffson's responsibilities, and she had little time to waste upon the poetry of affection. She kept the boy's wardrobe in excellent order, baked rare batches of hot cakes on Saturday afternoons for his special gratification, sent him glorious hampers, in which there were big jars of gooseberry jam, pork pies, plum loaves, and shriveled apples. In all substantial matters, Mrs. Jeffson was as much the boy's friend as her husband. But that tender, sympathetic devotion which William felt for his master's son was something beyond her comprehension. "'My master's daft about the lad,' she said when she spoke of the two. George Gilbert taught his companion a good deal in those pleasant Saturday evenings when the surgeon was away amongst his patients and the boy was free to sit in the kitchen with Mr. and Mrs. Jeffson. He told the Yorkshireman all about those enemies of boyhood, the classic poets. But William infinitely preferred Shakespeare and Milton, Byron and Scott to the accomplished Romans, whose verses were of the lamest, as translated by George, Mr. Jeffson could never have enough of Shakespeare. He was never weary of Hamlet, Lear, Othello, and Romeo, the bright young prince who tried on his father's crown, bold Hotspur, ill-used Richard, passionate Margaret, murderous Gloucester, ruined Wolsey, noble Catherine. All that grand gallery of pictures unrolled its splendors for this man, and the schoolboy wondered at the enthusiasm he was powerless to understand. He was inclined to think that practical Mrs. Jeffson was right, and that her husband was a little daft upon some matters. The boy returned his humble friend's affection with a steady, honest regard that richly compensated the gardener, whose love was not of a nature to need much recompense, since its growth was as spontaneous and unconscious as that of the wild flowers amongst the long grass. George returned William Jeffson's affection, but he could not return it in kind. The poetry of friendship was not in his nature. He was honest, sincere, and true, but not sympathetic or assimilative. 
He preserved his own individuality wherever he went, and took no color from the people amongst whom he lived. Mr. Gilbert would have been very lonely now that his father was gone, had it not been for this honest couple, who managed his house and garden, his stable and paddocks, and watched his interests as earnestly as if he had been indeed their son. Whenever he had a spare half-hour, the young man strolled into the old-fashioned kitchen and smoked his cigar in the chimney-corner, where he had passed so much of his boyhood. "'When I sit here, Jeff,' he said sometimes, "'I seem to go back to the old school days again, and I fancy I hear Molly Brown's hoofs upon the frosty road and my father's voice calling to you to open the gate.' Mr. Jeffson sighed as he looked up from the mending of a bridle, or the patching of a horse-cloth. "'Them was pleasant days, Master Jarge,' he said regretfully. He was thinking that the schoolboy had been more to him, and nearer to him, than the young surgeon could ever be. They had been children together, these two, and William had never grown weary of his childhood. He was left behind, now that his companion had grown up, and the happy childish days were all over. There was a gigantic kite on a shelf in the back kitchen, a kite that Mr. Jeffson had made with his own patient hands. George Gilbert would have laughed now if that kite had been mentioned to him, but William Jeffson would have been constant to the same boyish sports until his hair was gray, and would have never known weariness of spirit. "'You'll be marrying some fine lady, maybe now, Master Jarge,' Mrs. Jeffson said, "'and she'll look down upon our north country ways, and turn us out of the old place where we've lived so long.' But George protested eagerly that were he to marry the daughter of the Queen of England, which was not particularly likely, that royal lady should take kindly to his old servants, or should be no wife of his.' "'When I marry, my wife must love the people I love,' said the surgeon, who entertained those superb theories upon the management of a wife which are peculiar to youthful bachelors. George further informed his humble friends that he was not likely to enter the holy estate of matrimony for many years to come, as he had so far seen no one who at all approached his idea of womanly perfection.' He had very practical views upon this subject, and meant to wait patiently until some faultless young person came across his pathway, some neat-handed, church-going damsel, with tripping feet and smoothly banded hair, some fair sage, who had never been known to do a foolish act or say an idle word. Sometimes the image of Isabel Sleaford trembled faintly upon the magic mirror of the young man's reveries, and he wondered whether, under any combination of circumstances, she would ever arrive at this standard. Oh, no, it was impossible. He looked back to the drowsy summer-time, and saw her lolling in the garden-chair, with the shadows of the branches fluttering upon her tumbled muslin dress, and her black hair pushed anyhow away from the broad, low brow. "'I hope that foolish Sigismund won't meet Miss Sleaford again,' George thought very gravely. "'He might be silly enough to marry her, and I'm sure she'd never make a good wife for any man.' George Gilbert's father died in the autumn of fifty-two, and early in the following spring the young man received a letter from his friend Mr. Smith. Sigismund wrote very discursively about his own prospects and schemes, and gave his friend a brief synopsis of the romance he had last begun. George skimmed lightly enough over this part of the letter, but as he turned the leaf by and by he saw a name that brought the blood to his face. He was vexed with himself for that involuntary blush, and sorely puzzled to know why he should be so startled by the unexpected sight of Isabel Sleaford's name. "'You made me promise to tell you anything that turned up about the Sleafords,' Sigismund wrote. "'You'll be very much surprised to hear that Miss Sleaford came to me the other day here in my chambers, and asked me if I could help her in any way to get a living.' She wanted me to recommend her as a nursery governess, or a companion, or something of that kind, if I knew of any family in want of such a person. 
She was staying at Islington with a sister of her stepmother's, she told me, but she couldn't be a burthen on her any longer. Mrs. Sleaford and the boys have gone to live in Jersey, it seems, on account of things being cheap there, and I have no doubt that boy Horace will become an inveterate smoker. Poor Sleaford is dead. You will be as much astounded as I was to hear this. Isabel did not tell me this at first, but I saw that she was dressed in black, and when I asked her about her father she burst out crying, and sobbed as if her heart would break. I should like to have ascertained what the poor fellow died of, and all about it, for Sleaford was not an old man, and one of the most powerful-looking fellows I ever saw, but I could not torture Izzy with questions while she was in such a state of grief and agitation. "'I'm very sorry you've lost your father, my dear Miss Sleaford,' I said, and she sobbed out something that I scarcely heard, and I got her some cold water to drink, and it was ever so long before she came round again and was able to talk to me. Well, I couldn't think of anybody that was likely to help her that day, but I took the address of her aunt's house at Islington and promised to call upon her there in a day or two. I wrote by that day's post to my mother and asked if she could help me, and she wrote back by return to tell me that my uncle, Charles Raymond, at Conventford, was in want of just such a person as Miss Sleaford. Of course, I had endowed Isabel with all the virtues under the sun— and if I really thought Miss S. would suit, and I could answer for the perfect respectability of her connections and antecedents, it isn't to be supposed that I was going to say anything about that three-quarters rent, or that I should own that Isabel's antecedents were lolling in a garden chair reading novels, or going on suspicious errands to the jeweler, oh, my prophetic soul, etc., etc., in the Walworth Road. Why, I was to engage Miss S. at twenty pounds a year salary. I went up to Islington that very afternoon, although I was a number and a half behind with the demon of the galleys. The D of the G is a sequel to the brand upon the shoulder blade. The proprietor of the Penny Parthenon insisted upon having a sequel, and I had to bring Colonel Montefiasco to life again, after hurling him over a precipice three hundred feet high. "'and the poor girl began to cry when I told her I'd found a home for her. "'I'm afraid she's had a great deal of trouble since the Sleafords left Camberwell, "'for she isn't at all the girl she was. "'Her stepmother's sister is a vulgar woman who lets lodgings, "'and there's only one servant, such a miserable slavery, "'and Isabel went to the door three times while I was there. "'You know my Uncle Raymond, and you know what a dear jolly fellow he is, "'so you may guess the change will be a pleasant one for poor Izzy. "'By the by, you might call and see her the first time you're in Conventford, "'and write me word how the poor child gets on. "'I thought she seemed a little frightened at the idea of going among strangers. "'I saw her off at Euston Square the day before yesterday. "'She went by the parliamentary train, and I put her in charge of a most respectable family, going all the way through, with six children and a bird-cage, and a dog and a pack of cards to play upon a tea-tray, on account of the train being slow. Mr. Gilbert read this part of his friend's letter three times over, before he was able to realize the news contained in it. Mr. Sleaford, dead! and Isabel settled as a nursery governess at Conventford. If the winding Wavern had overflowed its sedgy banks and flooded all Midlandshire, the young surgeon could have been scarcely more surprised than he was by the contents of his friend's letter. Isabel at Conventford, within eleven miles of Greybridge, within eleven miles of him, at that moment, as he walked up and down the little room, with his hair tumbled all about his flushed, good-looking face, and Sigismund's letter in his waistcoat. What was it to him that Isabel Sleaford was so near? What was she to him that he should think of her, or be fluttered by the thought that she was within his reach? What did he know of her? Only that she had eyes that were unlike any other eyes he had ever looked at, eyes that haunted his memory like strange stars seen in a feverish dream. He knew nothing of her but this, and that she had a pretty, sentimental manner, a pensive softness in her voice, and sudden flights and capricious changes of expression that had filled his mind with wonder. George went back to the kitchen and smoked another cigar in Mr. Jeffson's company. 
he went back to that apartment fully determined to waste no more of his thoughts upon Isabel Sleaford, who was, in sober truth, a frivolous, sentimental creature, eminently adapted to make any man miserable. But, somehow or other, before the cigar was finished, George had told his earliest friend and confidant all about Mr. Sleaford's family, touching very lightly upon Isabel's attractions, and speaking of a visit to Conventford as a disagreeable duty that friendship imposed. "'Of course I shouldn't think of going all that way on purpose to see Miss Sleaford,' he said, "'though Sigismund seems to expect me to do so. But I must go to Conventford in the course of the week to see about those drugs Johnson promised to get me. They won't make a very big parcel, and I can bring them home in my coat pocket. You might trim Brown Molly's fetlocks, Jeff. She'll look all the better for it. I'll go on Thursday, and yet I don't know that I couldn't better spare the time to-morrow. "'Tomorrow's market-day, Master Jarge. I was thinking of going to Conventford myself. I might bring to drugs for you, or thou could straight a know it, ask an after to young lady,' Mr. Jeffson remarked thoughtfully. George shook his head. "'That would never do, Jeff,' he said. "'Sigismund asks me to go and see her.' Mr. Jeffson relapsed into a thoughtful silence, out of which he emerged by and by with a slow chuckle. "'I reckon Miss Sleaford'll be a pretty girl,' he remarked, thoughtfully, with a rather sly glance at his young master. George Gilbert found it necessary to enter into an elaborate explanation upon this subject. No, Miss Sleaford was not pretty. She had no color in her cheeks, and her nose was nothing particular, not a beautiful queen-like hook, like that of Miss Harleystone, the belle of Greybridge, who was considered like the youthful members of the peerage, and her mouth wasn't very small, and her forehead was low, and, in short, some people might think Miss Sleaford plain. "'But thou doesn't, Master Jarge,' exclaimed Mr. Jeffson, clapping his hand upon his knee with an intolerable chuckle. Lou thinks somewhat of her, I'll lay. I'll trim brown Molly's fetlocks till she looks as genteel as a thoroughbred. Thort an old fondy, cried Mrs. Jeffson, looking up from her needlework. It isn't one of these London lasses as'll make a good wife for Master Jarge, and he'd never be that soft as to go running after nursery governesses at Conventford when he might have Miss Burdock and all her money and be one of the first gentlefolks in Greybridge. Hold thy nose, Tilly, thou knowst nought about it. Didn't I marry thee for Louvre, lass, when I might have had Sarah Beglog, as was only daughter to him as kept Red Lion in Belminster? Didn't I come up to London, where thou wast in service, and take thee away from thy place? And wasn't Sarah a-must wild when she heard it? Master Jarge'll marry for Louvre, or he'll never marry at all. Don't you remember her as wore the pink sash and shoes with sandals at the dancing school, Master Jarge, and us taking her a plume loaf and a valentine and sugar sticks and oranges when you was home for the holidays? Mr. Jeffson had been the confidant of all George's boyish love affairs, the innocent leporello of this young provincial Juan, and he was eager to be trusted with new secrets and to have a finger once more in the sentimental pie. But nothing could be more stern than Mr. Gilbert's denial of any romantic fancy for Miss Sleaford. "'I should be very glad to befriend her in any way,' he said gravely, "'but she's the very last person in the world that I should ever dream of making my wife.' This young man discussed his matrimonial views with the calm grandiosity of manner with which man, the autocrat— talks of his humble slaves before he has tried his hand at governing them, before he has received the fiery baptism of suffering, and learned by bitter experience that a perfect woman is not a creature to be found at every street corner waiting meekly for her ruler. End of chapter 5 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter Six of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. 
Chapter Six Too Much Alone. Brown Molly's fetlocks were neatly trimmed by Mr. Jeffson's patient hands. I fancy the old mare would have gone long without a clipping had it not been George's special pleasure that the animal should be smartened up before he rode her to Conventford. Clipping is not a very pleasant labor, but there is no task so difficult that William Jeffson would have shrunk from it if its achievement could give George Gilbert happiness. Brown Molly looked a magnificent creature when George came home after a hurried round of professional visits and found her saddled and bridled at eleven o'clock on the bright March morning which he had chosen for his journey to Conventford. But though the mare was ready, and had been ready for a quarter of an hour, there was some slight delay, while George ran up to his room, the room which he had slept in from his earliest boyhood. There were some of his toys, dusty and forgotten, amongst the portmanteau and hat-boxes at the top of the painted deal wardrobe, and was for some little time engaged in changing his neckcloth, brushing his hair and hat, and making other nice little improvements in his personal appearance. William Jeffson declared that his young master looked as if he was going straight off to be married, as he rode away out of the stable-yard with a bright, eager smile upon his face, and the spring breezes blowing amongst his hair. He looked the very incarnation of homely, healthy comeliness, the archetype of honest youth and simple English manhood, radiant with the fresh brightness of an unsullied nature, untainted by an evil memory, pure as a new polished mirror on which no foul breath had ever rested. He rode away to his fate, self-deluded and happy in the idea that his journey was a wise blending of the duties of friendship and the cares of his surgery. I do not think there can be a more beautiful road in all England than that between Greybridge on the Wavern and Conventford, and I can scarcely believe that in all England there is an uglier town than Conventford itself. I envy George Gilbert his long ride on that bright March morning, when the pale primroses glimmered among the underwood, and the odor of early violets mingled faintly with the air. The country roads were long avenues, which might have made the glory of a ducal park, and every here and there, between a gap in the budding hedge, a white-walled country villa or a grave old red-brick mansion peeped out of some nook of rustic beauty with shining windows winking in the noontide sun. Midway between Greybridge and Conventford there is the village of Waverley, the straggling village street over whose quaint Elizabethan roofs the ruined towers of a grand old castle cast their protecting shadows. John of Gaunt was master and founder of the grandest of those old towers, and Henry the Eighth's wonderful daughter had feasted in the great banqueting hall, where the ivy hangs its natural garlands round the stone mullions of the Tudor window. The surgeon gave his steed a mouthful of hay and a drink of water before the Waverley Arms, and then sauntered at a foot-pace into the long, unbroken arcade which stretches from the quiet village to the very outskirts of the bustling Conventford. George urged Brown Molly into a ponderous kind of canter by and by, and went at a dashing rate till he came to the little turnpike at the end of the avenue, and left fair Elizabethan Midlandshire behind him. Before him there was only the smoky, noisy, poverty-stricken town, with hideous factory chimneys blackening the air, and three tall spires rising from amongst the crowded roofs high up into the clearer sky. Mr. Gilbert drew rein on the green, which was quiet enough to-day, though such an uproarious spot in fair time. He drew rein and began to wonder what he should do. Should he go to the chemist's in the market-place, and get his drugs, and thence to Mr. Raymond's house, which was at the other end of the town, or rather on the outskirts of the country, and beyond the town? Or should he go first to Mr. Raymond's, by quiet little back lanes, which were clear of the bustle and riot of the market-people? To go to the chemist's first would be the wiser course, perhaps, but then it wouldn't be very agreeable to have drugs in his pocket, and to smell of rhubarb and chamomile flowers when he made his appearance before Miss Sleaford. 
After a good deal of deliberation, George decided on going by the back way to Mr. Raymond's house, and then as he rode along the lanes and back slums, he began to think that Mr. Raymond would wonder why he called, and would think his interest in the nursery governess odd, or even intrusive. And from that, a natural transition of thought brought him to wonder whether it would not be better to abandon all idea of seeing Miss Sleaford, and to content himself with the purchase of the drugs. While he was thinking of this, Brown Molly brought him into the lane at the end of which Mr. Raymond's house stood, on a gentle eminence, looking over a wide expanse of grassy fields, a railway cutting, and a white high road dotted here and there by little knots of stunted trees. The country upon this side of Conventford was bleak and bare of aspect, as compared to that fair park-like region which I venture to call Elizabethan Midlandshire. If Mr. Raymond had resembled other people, I dare say he would have been considerably surprised, or, it may be, outraged, by a young gentleman in the medical profession venturing to make a morning call upon his nursery governess. But, as Mr. Charles Raymond was the very opposite of everybody else in the world, and as he was a most faithful disciple of Mr. George Coombe, and could discover by a glance at the surgeon's head that the young man was neither a profligate nor a scoundrel, he received George as cordially as it was his habit to receive every living creature who had need of his friendliness and sent Brown Molly away to his stable, and set her master at his ease, before George had quite left off blushing in his first paroxysm of shyness. "'Come into my room,' cried Mr. Raymond, in a voice that had more vibration in it than any other voice that ever rang out upon the air. "'Come into my room. You've had a letter from Sigismund. The idea of the absurd young dog calling himself Sigismund, and he's told you all about Miss Sleaford, very nice girl, but wants to be educated before she can teach, keeps the little ones amused, however, and takes them out in the meadows, a very nice conscientious little thing, cautiousness very large, can't get anything out of her about her past life, turns pale and begins to cry when I ask her questions, has seen a good deal of trouble, I'm afraid, never mind, we'll try and make her happy." What does her past life matter to us if her head's well balanced? Let me have my pick of the young people in Field Lane, and I'll find you an undeveloped Archbishop of Canterbury. Take me into places where the crimes of mankind are only known by their names in the Decalogue, and I'll find you an embryo Greenacre. Miss Sleaford's a very good little girl, but she's got too much wonder and exaggerated ideality. She opens her big eyes when she talks of her favorite books, and looks up all scared and startled if you speak to her while she's reading. Mr. Raymond's room was a comfortable little apartment, lined with books from the ceiling to the floor. There were books everywhere in Mr. Raymond's house, and the master of the house read at all manner of abnormal hours, and kept a candle burning by his bedside in the dead of the night, when every other citizen of Conventford was asleep. He was a bachelor, and the children whom it was Miss Sleaford's duty to educate were a couple of sickly orphans left by a pale-faced niece of Charles Raymond's, an unhappy young lady who seemed only born to be unfortunate, and who had married badly, and lost her husband, and died of consumption, running through all the troubles common to womankind before her twenty-fifth birthday. Of course Mr. Raymond took the children. He would have taken an accidental chimney-sweep's children, if it could have been demonstrated to him that there was no one else to take them. He buried the pale-faced niece in a quiet suburban cemetery, and took the orphans home to his pretty house at Conventford, and bought black frocks for them, and engaged Miss Sleaford for their education, and made less fuss about the transaction than many men would have done concerning the donation of a ten-pound note. It was Charles Raymond's nature to help his fellow creatures— he had been very rich once, the Conventford people said, in those far-off golden days when there were neither strikes nor starvation in the grim old town, and he had lost a great deal of money in the carrying out of sundry philanthropic schemes for the benefit of his fellow-creatures, and was comparatively poor in these latter days, 
but he was never so poor as to be unable to help other people, or to hold his hand when a mechanics institution, or a working men's club, or an evening school, or a cooking depot, was wanted for the benefit and improvement of Conventford. And all this time, while he was the moving spirit of half a dozen committees, while he distributed cast-off clothing and coals and tickets for soup and orders for flannel, and debated the solemn question as to whether Betsy Scrubs or Maria Tompkins was most in want of a wadded petticoat, or gave due investigation to the rival claims of Mrs. Jones and Mrs. Green to the largesse of the soup kitchen, he was an author, a philosopher a phrenologist, a metaphysician, writing grave books and publishing them for the instruction of mankind. He was fifty years of age, but except that his hair was grey, he had no single attribute of age. That grey hair framed the brightest face that ever smiled upon mankind, and with the liberal sunshine smiled alike on all. George Gilbert had seen Mr. Raymond several times before to-day, Everybody in Conventford, or within a certain radius of Conventford, knew Mr. Charles Raymond, and Mr. Charles Raymond knew everybody. He looked through the transparent screen which shrouded the young surgeon's thoughts. He looked down into the young man's heart through depths that were as clear as limpid water, and saw nothing there but truth and purity. When I say that Mr. Raymond looked into George Gilbert's heart, I use a figure of speech, for it was from the outside of the surgeon's head he drew his deductions, but I like the old romantic fancy that a good man's heart is a temple of courage, love, and piety, an earthly shrine of all the virtues. Mr. Raymond's house was a pretty, gothic building, half villa, half cottage, with bay windows opening into a small garden, which was very different from the garden at Camberwell, inasmuch as here all was trimly kept by an indefatigable gardener and factotum. Beyond the garden there were the meadows, only separated from Mr. Raymond's lawn by a low privet hedge, and, beyond the meadows, the roofs and chimneys of Conventford loomed darkly in the distance. Charles Raymond took George into the drawing-room by and by, and from the bay window the young man saw Isabel Sleaford once more, as he had seen her first, in a garden. But the scene had a different aspect from that other scene, which still lingered in his mind, like a picture seen briefly in a crowded gallery. Instead of pear-trees on the low, disorderly grass-plat, the straggling branches, green against the yellow sunshine of July, George saw a close-cropped lawn and trim flower-beds, stiff groups of laurel amid bare, bleak fields, unsheltered from the chill March winds. Against the cold blue sky he saw Isabel's slight figure, not lolling in a garden-chair, reading a novel, but walking primly with two pale-faced children dressed in black. A chill sense of pain crept through the surgeon's breast as he looked at the girlish figure, the pale, joyless face, the sad, dreaming eyes. He felt that some inexplicable change had come to Isabel Sleaford since that July day on which she had talked of her pet authors, and glowed and trembled with childish love for the dear books out of whose pages she took the joys and sorrows of her life. The three pale faces, the three black dresses, had a desolate look in the cold sunlight. Mr. Raymond tapped at the glass and beckoned to the nursery governess. "'Melancholy-looking objects, are they not?' he said to George, as the three girls came towards the window. "'I've told my housekeeper to give them plenty of roast meat, not too much done. Meat's the best antidote for melancholy.' He opened the window and admitted Isabel and her two pupils. "'Here's a friend come to see you, Miss Sleaford,' he said. "'A friend of Sigismund's, a gentleman who knew you in London.' George held out his hand, but he saw something like terror in the girl's face as she recognized him, and he fell straight away into a profound gulf of confusion and embarrassment. Sigismund asked me to call, he stammered. Sigismund told me to write and tell him how you were. Miss Sleaford's eyes filled with tears. The tears came unbidden to her eyes now, with the smallest provocation. 
"'You are all very good to me,' she said. "'There, you children, go out into the garden and walk about,' cried Mr. Raymond. "'You go with them, Gilbert, and then come in and have some Stilton cheese and bottled beer, and tell us all about your Greybridge patience.' Mr. Gilbert obeyed his kindly host. He went out onto the lawn, where the brown shrubs were putting forth their feeble leaflets to be blighted by the chill air of March. He walked by Isabel's side, while the two orphans prowled mournfully here and there amongst the evergreens, and picked the lonely daisies that had escaped the gardener's scythe. George and Isabel talked a little, but the young man was fain to confine himself to a few commonplace remarks about Conventford and Mr. Raymond and Miss Sleaford's new duties, for he saw that the least allusion to the old Camberwell life distressed and agitated her. There was not much that these two could talk about as yet. With Sigismund Smith, Isabel would have had plenty to say. Indeed, it would have been a struggle between the two as to which should do all the talking. But in George Gilbert's company, Isabel Sleaford's fancies folded themselves like delicate buds, whose fragile petals are shriveled by a bracing northern breeze. She knew that Mr. Gilbert was a good young man, kindly disposed towards her, and after his simple fashion, eager to please her, but she felt, rather than knew, that he did not understand her, and that, in that cloudy region where her thoughts forever dwelt, he could never be her companion. So, after a little of that deliciously original conversation which forms the staple talk of a morning call amongst people who have never acquired the supreme accomplishment called small talk, George and Isabel returned to the drawing-room, where Mr. Raymond was ready to preside over a banquet of bread and cheese and bottled ale, after which refection the surgeon's steed was brought to the door. "'Come and see us again, Gilbert, whenever you've a day in Conventford,' Mr. Raymond said, as he shook hands with the surgeon. George thanked him for his cordial invitation, but he rode away from the house rather depressed in spirit, notwithstanding. How stupid he had been during that brief walk on Mr. Raymond's lawn! How little he had said to Isabel, or she to him! How dismally the conversation had died away into silence every now and then, only to be revived by some lame question— some miserable remark apropos to nothing, the idiotic emanation of despair. Mr. Gilbert rode to an inn near the market-place, where his father had been wont to take his dinner whenever he went to Conventford. George gave Brown Molly into the ostler's custody, and then walked away to the crowded pavement, where the country people were jostling each other in front of shop-windows and open stalls. The broad, stony market-place, where the voices of the hawkers were loud and shrill, where the brazen boastings of quack medicine vendors rang out upon the afternoon air, he walked through the crowd and rambled away into a narrow back street leading to an old square where the great church of Conventford stood amidst a stony waste of tombstones, and where the bells that played a hymn tune when they chimed the hour were booming up in the grand old steeple. The young man went into the stony churchyard, which was lonely enough, even on a market-day, and walked about among the tombs, whiling away the time, for the benefit of Brown Molly, who required considerable rest and refreshment before she set out on the return journey, and thinking of Isabel Sleaford. He had only seen her twice, and yet already her image had fastened itself with a fatal grip upon his mind, and was planted there, an enduring picture, never again to be blotted out. That evening at Camberwell had been the one romantic episode of this young man's eventless life, Isabel Sleaford, the one stranger who had come across his pathway. There were pretty girls and amiable girls in Greybridge, but then he had known them all his life. Isabel came to him in her pale young beauty, and all his latent sentimentality, without which youth is hideous, kindled and thrilled into life at the magic spell of her presence. The mystic Venus rises, a full-blown beauty from the sea, and man, the captive, bows down before his divine enslaver. 
Who would care for a Venus whose cradle he had rocked, whose gradual growth he had watched, the divinity of whose beauty had perished beneath the withering influence of familiarity? It was dusk when George Gilbert went to the chemist and received his parcel of drugs. He would not stop to dine at the White Lion, but paid his eighteen pence for Brown Molly's accommodation, and took a hasty glass of ale at the bar before he sprang into the saddle. He rode homeward through the solemn avenue, the dusky cathedral aisle, the infinite temple fashioned by the great architect Nature. He rode through the long ghostly avenue until the twinkling lights at Waverley glimmered on him faintly between the bare branches of the trees. Isabel Sleaford's new life was a very pleasant one. There was no butter to be fetched, no mysterious errands to the Walworth Road. Everything was bright and smooth and trim in Mr. Raymond's household. There was a middle-aged housekeeper who reigned supreme, and an industrious maid-servant under her sway. Isabel and her sickly charges had two cheerful rooms over the drawing-room, and took their meals together, and enjoyed the delight of one another's society all day long. The children were rather stupid, but they were very good. They, too, had known the sharp ills of poverty, the butter-fetching, the blank days in which there was no bright oasis of dinner, the scraps of cold meat, and melancholy cups of tea. They told Isabel their troubles of an evening, how poor Mamma had cried when the sheriff's officer came in, and said he was very sorry for her, but must take an inventory, and wouldn't leave even Papa's picture or the silver spoons that had been Grandmamma's. Miss Sleaford put her shoulder to the wheel very honestly, and went through Pinnock's pleasant abridgments of modern and ancient history with her patient pupils, she let them off with a very slight dose of the heptarchy and the normans and even the early plantagenet monarchs but she gave them plenty of anne boleyn and mary queen of scots fair princess mary queen of france and wife of thomas brandon marie antoinette and charlotte corday the children only said lor when they heard of mademoiselle corday's heroic adventure but they were very much interested in the fate of the young princes of the house of york and amused themselves by a representation of the smothering business with the pillows on the schoolroom sofa it was not to be supposed that mr charles raymond who had all the interests of conventford to claim his attention could give much time or trouble to the two pupils or the nursery governess he was quite satisfied with Miss Sleaford's head, and was content to entrust his orphan nieces to her care. "'If they were clever children, I should be afraid of her exaggerated ideality,' he said. "'But they're too stupid to be damaged by any influence of that kind. She's got a decent moral region, not equal to that young doctor at Greybridge, certainly, and she'll do her duty to the little ones very well, I dare say.' So no one interfered with Isabel or her pupils. The education of association, which would have been invaluable to her, was as much wanting at Conventford as it had been at Camberwell. She lived alone with her books and the dreams which were born of them, and waited for the Prince, the Ernest Maltravers, the Henry Esmond, the Steerforth. It was Steerforth's proud image, and not simple-hearted David's gentle shadow, which lingered in the girl's mind when she shut the book. She was young and sentimental, and it was not good people upon whom her fancy fixed itself. To be handsome and proud and miserable was to possess an indisputable claim to Miss Sleaford's worship. She sighed to sit at the feet of a Byron, grand and gloomy and discontented, bearing his white brow to the midnight blast, and raving against the baseness and ingratitude of mankind. She pined to be the chosen slave of some scornful creature who should perhaps ill-treat and neglect her. I think she would have worshipped an aristocratic Bill Sykes, and would have been contented to die under his cruel hand, only in the ruined chamber of some Gothic castle, by moonlight, with the distant Alps shimmering whitely before her glazing eyes, instead of in poor Nancy's unromantic garret. 
and then the Count Guillaume de Sique would be sorry, and put up a wooden cross on the mountain pathway to the memory of blank, Anatk, and he would be found some morning stretched at the foot of that mysterious memorial, with a long black mantle trailing over his king-like form, and an important blood-vessel broken. There is no dream so foolish, there is no fancy, however childish, that did not find a lodgment in Isabel Sleaford's mind during the long idle evenings in which she sat alone in her quiet schoolroom, watching the stars kindle faintly in the dusk, and darkening shadows gathering in the meadows, while feeble lights began to twinkle in the distant streets of Conventford. Sometimes, when her pupils were fast asleep in their white-curtained beds, Izzy stole softly down and went out into the garden to walk up and down in the fair moonlight, the beautiful moonlight in which Juliet had looked more lovely than the light of day to Romeo's enraptured eyes, in which Hamlet had trembled before his father's ghostly face. She walked up and down in the moonlight, and thought of all her dreams, and wondered when her life was going to begin. She was getting quite old. Yes, she thought of it with a thrill of horror. She was nearly eighteen. Juliet was buried in the tomb of the Capulets before this age, and haughty Beatrix had lived her life, and Florence Dombey was married and settled, and the story all over. A dull despair crept over this foolish girl, as she thought that perhaps her life was to be only a commonplace kind of existence, after all, a blank, flat level, along which she was to creep to a nameless grave. She was so eager to be something. Oh, why was there not a revolution that she might take a knife in her hand, and go forth to seek the tyrant in his lodgings, and then die, so that people might talk of her and remember her name when she was dead. I think Isabel Sleaford was just in that frame of mind in which a respectable and otherwise harmless young person aims a bullet at some virtuous sovereign in a paroxysm of insensate yearning for distinction. Miss Sleaford wanted to be famous. She wanted the drama of her life to begin, and the hero to appear. Vague and grand and shadowy, there floated before her the image of the prince. But, oh, how slow he was to come! Would he ever come? Were there any princes in the world? Were there any of those beings whose manners and customs her books described to her, but whose mortal semblances she had never seen? The sleeping beauty in the woods slumbered a century before the appointed hero came to awaken her. Beauty must wait, and wait patiently, for the coming of her fate. But poor Isabel thought that she had waited so long, and as yet there was not even the distant shimmer of the prince's plumes dimly visible on the horizon. There were reasons why Isabel Sleaford should shut away the memories of her past life, and solace herself with visions of a brighter existence. A little wholesome drudgery might have been very good for her as a homely antidote against the sentimentalism of her nature, but in Mr. Raymond's house she had ample leisure to sit dreaming over her books, weaving wonderful romances in which she was to be the heroine, and the hero? The hero was the veriest chameleon, inasmuch as he took his color from the last book Miss Sleaford had been reading. Sometimes he was Ernest Maltravers, the exquisite young aristocrat, with violet eyes and silken hair. Sometimes he was Eugene Aram, dark, gloomy, and intellectual, with that awkward little matter of Mr. Clark's murder preying upon his mind. At another time he was Steerforth, the selfish, haughty, and elegant. Sometimes, when the orphans were asleep, Miss Sleaford let down her long black hair before the little looking-glass, and acted to herself in a whisper. She saw her pale face, awful in the dusky glass, her lifted arms, her great black eyes, and she fancied herself dominating a terror-stricken pit. Sometimes she thought of leaving friendly Mr. Raymond, and going up to London with a five-pound note in her pocket, and coming out at one of the theatres as a tragic actress. She would go to the manager and tell him that she wanted to act. There might be a little difficulty at first, perhaps, 
and he would be rather inclined to be doubtful of her powers, but then she would take off her bonnet and let down her hair and would draw the long tresses wildly through her thin white fingers, so. She stopped to look at herself in the glass as she did it, and would cry, I am not mad. This hair I tear is mine. And the thing would be done. The manager would exclaim, Indeed, my dear young lady, I was not prepared for such acting as this. Excuse my emotion. But really, since the days of Miss O'Neill, I don't remember to have witnessed anything to equal your delivery of that speech. Come to-morrow evening and play Constance. You don't want a rehearsal? No, of course not. You know every syllable of the part. I shall take the liberty of offering you fifty pounds a night to begin with, and I shall place one of my carriages at your disposal. Isabel had read a good many novels in which timid young heroines essay their histrionic powers, but she had never read of a dramatically disposed heroine who had not burst forth a full-blown Mrs. Siddons without so much as the ordeal of a rehearsal. Sometimes Miss Sleaford thought that her destiny, she clung to the idea that she had a destiny, designed her to be a poet, an L.E.L., Oh, above all, she would have chosen to be an L.E.L. -E and in the evening, when she had looked over the children's copy-books and practiced a new style of capital B in order to infuse a dash of variety into the next day's studies, she drew the candles nearer to her and posed herself and dipped her pen into the ink and began to pour forth some melancholy plaint upon the lonely blankness of her life, or some vague invocation of the unknown prince. She rarely finished either the plaint or the invocation, for there was generally some rhythmical difficulty that brought her poetic musings to a deadlock, but she began a great many verses, and spoiled several choirs of paper with abortive sonnets, in which stars and streamlets, dreams and fountains, recurred with a frequency which was inimical to originality or variety of style. The poor, lonely, untaught child looked right and left for some anchorage on the blank sea of life, and could find nothing but floating masses of ocean verdure that drifted her here and there at the wild will of all the winds of heaven. Behind her there was a past that she dared not look back upon or remember. Before her lay the unknown future, wrapped in mysterious shadow, grand by reason of its obscurity. She was eager to push onward, to pierce the solemn veil, to tear aside the misty curtain, to penetrate the innermost chamber of the temple. Late in the night, when the lights of Conventford had died out under the starlit sky, the girl lay awake, sometimes looking up at those mystical stars and thinking of the future. But never once, in any dream or reverie, in any fantastic vision built out of the stories she loved, did the homely image of the Greybridge surgeon find a place. George Gilbert thought of her, and wondered about her, as he rode Brown Molly in the winding Midlandshire lanes, where the brown hedgerows were budding, and the white thorn bursting into full blossom. He thought of her by day and by night and was angry with himself for so thinking, and then began straightway to consider when he could, with any show of grace, present himself once more before Mr. Raymond's gothic porch at Conventford. End of chapter 6 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 7 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter 7 On the Bridge. While George Gilbert was thinking of Isabel Sleaford's pale face and black eyes, while in his long rides to and fro among the cottages of his parish patients he solemnly debated as to whether he ought to call upon Mr. Raymond when next he went to Conventford, or whether he ought to go to Conventford for the express purpose of paying his respects to Mr. Raymond, 
the hand of fate turned the wavering balance, and the make-weight which she threw into the scale was no heavier than the ordinary half-ounce of original composition, which government undertakes to convey not exactly from Indus to the Pole, but from the land's end to the highlands, for the small charge of a penny. While George Gilbert hesitated and doubted and argued and debated with himself, after the manner of every prudent, homebred young man who begins to think that he loves well and sadly fears that he may not love wisely, destiny, under the form of a friend, gave him a push, and he went south overhead and ears into the roaring ocean, and there was nothing left for him but to swim as best he might towards the undiscovered shore upon the other side. The letter from Sigismund was dated Oak Bank, Coventford, May twenty-third, 1853. Dear George, wrote the author of The Brand Upon the Shoulder Blade, I'm down here for a few days with my uncle Charles, and we've arranged a picnic in Lord Hurstonleigh's grounds, and we want you to join us. So if your patients are not the most troublesome people in the world, you can give yourself a holiday and meet us on Wednesday morning at twelve, if fine, at the Waverley Road Lodge Gate to Hurstonleigh Park. Mrs. Pidgers, Pidgers is my uncle's housekeeper, a regular old dear and such a hand at pie crusts, is going to pack up a basket, and I know what Pidger's baskets are, and we shall bring plenty of sparkling, because when my uncle does this sort of thing, he does do it, and we're to drink tea at one of Lord Hurstonleigh's model cottages in his model village with a model old woman, who's had all manner of prizes for the tidiest dust holes and the whitest hearthstones, the neatest knife boards, and all that kind of thing and we're going to make a regular holiday of it, and I shall forget that there is such a creature as the demon of the galleys in the world, and that I'm a number behind with him, which I am, and the artist is waiting for a subject for his next cut. The orphans are coming, of course, and Miss Sleaford, and, oh, by the by, I want you to tell me all about poisoning by strychnine, because I think I shall do a case or two in the D of the G. Twelve o'clock sharp, remember. We come in a fly. You can leave your horse at Waverley. Yours, S.S. S. Yes, fate, impatient, perhaps, of any wavering of the balance in so insignificant a matter as George Gilbert's destiny, threw this penny-post letter into the scale, and, lo, it was turned. The young man read the letter over and over again, till it was crumpled and soiled with much unfolding and refolding and taking out of and putting back into his waistcoat pocket. A picnic! A picnic in the Hurstonleigh grounds, with Isabel Sleaford! Other people were to be of the party, but George Gilbert scarcely remembered that. He saw himself, with Isabel by his side, wandering along the winding pathways, straying away into mysterious arcades of verdure, where the low branches of the trees would meet above their heads, and shut them in from all the world. He fancied himself talking to Mr. Sleaford's daughter as he never had talked, nor was ever likely to talk, with any voice audible to mortal ears. He laid out and arranged that day, as we are apt to arrange the days that are to come, and which, heaven help our folly and presumption, are so different when they do come from the dreams we have dreamed about them. Mr. Gilbert lived that May holiday over and over again between the Monday afternoon on which he received Sigismund's letter and the appointed Wednesday morning. He lay away at night, when his day's work was done, thinking of Isabel and what she would say to him and how she would look at him, until those fancied words and looks thrilled him to the heart's core and he was deluded by the thought that it was all a settled thing, and that his love was returned. His love! Did he love her, then, already, this pale-faced young person whom he had only seen twice, who might be a Florence Nightingale or a Madame Lafarge, for all that he knew either one way or the other? Yes, he loved her. The wondrous flower that never yet thrived by the calendar had burst into full bloom. 
He loved this young woman, and believed in her, and was ready to bring her to his simple home whenever she pleased to come thither, and had already pictured her sitting opposite to him in the little parlor, making weak tea for him in a Britannia metal teapot, sewing commonplace buttons upon his commonplace shirts, debating with Mrs. Jeffson as to whether there should be roast beef or boiled mutton for the two o'clock dinner, sitting up alone in that most uninteresting little parlor, when the surgeon's patients were tiresome and insisted upon being ill in the night, waiting to preside over little suppers of cold meat and pickles, bread and cheese and celery. Yes, George pictured Miss Sleaford the heroine of such a domestic story as this, and had no power to divine that there was any incongruity in the fancy, no finesse of ear to discover the dissonant interval between the heroine and the story. Alas, poor Izzy! And are all your fancies, all the pretty stories woven out of your novels, all your long daydreams about Marie Antoinette and Charlotte Corday, Edith Dombey and Ernest Maltravers, all your foolish pictures of a modern Byron, fever-stricken at Missolonghi, and tended by you, a new Napoleon exiled to St. Helena and followed, perhaps liberated, by you, are they all come to this? Are none of the wonderful things that happen to women ever to happen to you? Are you never to be Charlotte Corday and die for your country? Are you never to wear ruby velvet and diamonds in your hair, and to lure some recreant carker to a foreign hostelry, and there denounce and scorn him? Are all the pages of the great book of life to be closed upon you, you who seem to yourself predestined, by reason of so many dreams and fancies, to such a wonderful existence? Is all the mystic cloudland of your dreams to collapse and shrivel into this? A commonplace, square-built cottage at Greybridge on the Wavern, with a commonplace country surgeon for your husband? George Gilbert was waiting at the low white gate before the ivy-covered lodge on the Waverley Road when the fly from Conventford drove up, with Sigismund Smith sitting beside the coachman and questioning him about a murder that had been committed in the neighborhood ten years before, and Mr. Raymond, Miss Sleaford, and the orphans inside. The surgeon had been waiting at the gate for a quarter of an hour, and he had been up ever since six o'clock that morning, riding backwards and forwards amongst his patients, doing a day's work in a few hours. He had been home to dress, of course, and wore his newest and most fashionable clothes, and was, in fact, a living realization of one of the figures in a fly-blown fashion plate for June 1852, still exhibited in the window of a Greybridge tailor. He wore a rosebud in his buttonhole, and he carried a bunch of spring flowers, jonquils and polyanthuses, pink hawthorn, peonies, and sweet briar, which Mr. Jeffson had gathered up and tied, with a view to their presentation to Isabel, although there were better flowers in Mr. Raymond's garden, as George reminded his faithful steward. "'Don't thee to the self about that, Master Jarge,' said the Yorkshireman. "'Young wench'll like the flowers if thou gifts them to her.' Of course it never for a moment entered into Mr. Jeffson's mind that his young master's attentions could be otherwise than welcome and agreeable to any woman living, least of all to a forlorn young damsel who was obliged to earn her bread amongst strangers. "'I'd like to see Miss Sleaford, Master Jarge,' Mr. Jeffson said." in an insinuating manner, as George gathered up the reins and patted Brown Molly's neck, preparatory to riding away from the low white gate of his domain. George blushed like the peonies that formed the center of his nosegay. "'I don't know why you should want to see Miss Sleaford any more than other girls, Jeff,' he said. "'Well, never you mind why, Master George. I should like to see her. I'd give a deal to see her.' "'Then we'll try and manage it, Jeff. "'We are to drink tea at Hurstonleigh, "'and we shall be leaving there, I suppose, "'as soon as it's dark, between seven and eight o'clock, I dare say. "'You might ride the grey pony to Waverley "'and bring Brown Molly on to Hurstonleigh "'and stop at the alehouse. "'There's an alehouse, you know, though it is a model village. "'Until I'm ready to come home, "'and you can leave the horses with the ostler, you know, "'and stroll about the village.' 
and you're sure to find us. Yes, yes, Master Jarge, I'll manage it. So George was at his post a quarter of an hour before the fly drove up to the gate. He was there to open the door of the vehicle and to give his hand to Isabel when she alighted. He felt the touch of her fingers resting briefly on his arm and trembled and blushed like a girl as he met the indifferent gaze of her great black eyes. Nobody took any notice of his embarrassment. Mr. Raymond and his nephew were busy with the hampers that had been stowed under the seats of the fly, and the orphans were employed in watching their elders, for to them the very cream of the picnic was in those baskets. There was a boy at the lodge who was ready to take the baskets whithersoever Mr. Raymond should direct, so all was settled very quickly. The driver received his instructions respecting the return journey, and went rumbling off to Hurstonleigh to refresh himself and his horse. The lad went on before the little party, with the baskets swinging on either side of him as he went. In the bustle of these small arrangements, George Gilbert found courage to offer Isabel his arm. She took it without hesitation, and Sigismund placed himself on the other side of her. Mr. Raymond went on before with the little orphans, who affected the neighborhood of the baskets, and the three young people followed, walking slowly over the grass. Isabel had put off her mourning. She had never had but one black dress, poor child, and that being worn out, she was fain to fall back upon her ordinary costume. If she had looked pretty in the garden at Camberwell, with tumbled hair and a dingy dress, she looked beautiful today, in clean muslin, fresh and crisp, fluttering in the spring breezes as she walked, and with her hair smoothly banded under a broad-leaved straw hat. Her face brightened with the brightness of the sunshine and the charm of the landscape. Her step grew light and buoyant as she walked upon the springing turf. Her eyes lit up by and by when the little party came to a low iron gate, beyond which there was a grove, a winding woodland patch, and undulating glades and craggy banks, half hidden under foliage, and in a deep cleft below, a brawling waterfall, forever rushing over moss-grown rockwork, and winding far away to meet the river. "'Oh, how beautiful it is!' cried Isabel. "'How beautiful!' She was a cockney, poor child, and had spent the best part of her life amidst the suburban districts of Camberwell and Peckham. All this Midlandshire beauty burst upon her like a sudden revelation of paradise." Could the Garden of Eden have been more beautiful than this woodland grove, where the ground was purple with wild hyacinths that grew under beeches and oaks centuries old, where the sunlight and shadows flickered on the mossy pathways, where the guttural warble of the blackbirds made perpetual music in the air? George looked wonderingly at the girl's rapt countenance, her parted lips that were faintly tremulous with the force of her emotion. "'I did not think there could be any place in England so beautiful,' she said by and by, when George disturbed her with some trite remark upon the scene. "'I thought it was only in Italy and in Greece and those sorts of places where Child Harold went, that it was beautiful like this. It makes one feel as if one could never go back to the world again, doesn't it?' she asked naively. George was fain to confess that, although the grove was very beautiful, it inspired him with no desire to turn hermit and take up his abode therein. But Isabel hardly heard what he said to her. She was looking away into mysterious vistas of light and shadow, and thinking that, in such a spot as this, the hero of a woman's life might appear in all his shining glory. If she could meet him now, this wonderful unknown being— the child Harold, the Lara, of her life. What if it was to be so? What if she was to meet him now, and the story was appointed to begin today, this very day, and all her life henceforth was to be changed? The day was like the beginning of a story somehow, inasmuch as it was unlike the other days of her life. She had thought of the holiday and dreamt about it even more foolishly than George had done, for there had been some foundation for the young man's visions, while hers had been altogether baseless. 
What if Lord Hurstonleigh should happen to be strolling in his grove and should see her and rescue her from death by drowning, or a mad bull, or something of that sort, and thereupon fall in love with her? Nothing was more lifelike, or likely, according to Izzy's experience of three-volume novels. Unhappily, she discovered from Mr. Raymond that Lord Hurstonleigh was an elderly married man, and was, moreover, resident in the south of France. So that bright dream was speedily shattered. But there is no point of the compass from which any hero may not come. There was hope yet. There was hope that this bright spring day might not close, as so many days had closed, upon the same dull record, the same empty page. Mr. Raymond was in his highest spirits today. He liked to be with young people, and was younger than the youngest of them, in his fresh enjoyment of all that is bright and beautiful upon earth. He devoted himself chiefly to the society of his orphan protégés, and contrived to impart a good deal of information to them, in a pleasant, easy-going manner, that took the bitterness out of those pier and waters, for which the orphans had very small affection. They were stupid and unimpressionable, but then were they not the children of that unhappy, consumptive niece of his, who had acquired, by reason of her many troubles, a kind of divine right to become a burden upon happy people? If she had left me such an orphan as that girl Isabel, I would have thanked her kindly for dying, Mr. Raymond mused. That girl has mental imitation, the highest and rarest faculty of the human brain, ideality and compassion. What could I not make of such a girl as that? And yet... Mr. Raymond only finished the sentence with a sigh. He was thinking that, after all, these bright faculties might not be the best gifts for a woman. It would have been better, perhaps, for Isabel to have possessed the organ of pudding-making and stocking-darning, if those useful accomplishments are represented by an organ. The kindly phrenologist was thinking that perhaps the highest fate life held for that pale girl with the yellow tinge in her eyes was to share the home of a simple-hearted country surgeon, and rear his children to be honest men and virtuous women. "'I suppose that is the best,' Mr. Raymond said to himself. He had dismissed the orphans now, and had sent them on to walk with Sigismund Smith, who kindly related to them the story of Lillian the Deserted, with such suppressions and emendations as rendered the romance suitable to their tender years. The philosopher of Conventford had got rid of the orphans and was strolling by himself in those delicious glades, swinging his stick as he went, and throwing up his head every now and then to scent all the freshness of the warm spring air. "'Poor little orphan child,' he mused, Will anybody ever fathom her fancies or understand her dreams? Will she marry that good, sheepish country surgeon who has fallen in love with her? He can give her a home and a shelter, and she seems such a poor, friendless little creature, just the sort of girl to get into some kind of mischief if she were left to herself. Perhaps it's about the best thing that could happen to her. I should like to have fancied a brighter fate for her, a life with more color in it, She's so pretty, so pretty, and when she talks, and her face lights up, a sort of picture comes into my mind of what she would be in a great saloon, with clusters of lights about her and masses of shimmering color, making a gorgeous background for her pale young beauty, and brilliant men and women clustering round her to hear her talk and see her smile. I can see her like this, and then, when I remember what her life is likely to be, I begin to feel sorry for her just as if she were some fair young nun foredoomed to be buried alive by and by. Sometimes I have had a fancy that if he were to come and see her, but that's an old busybody's dream. When did a matchmaker ever create anything but matrimonial confusion and misery? I dare say Beatrice kept her word and did make Benedict wretched. No, Miss Sleaford must marry whom she may, and be happy or miserable, according to the doctrine of averages. And as for him... Mr. Raymond stopped, and, seeing the rest of the party happily engaged in gathering hyacinths under the low branches of the trees, he seated himself upon a clump of fallen timber, and took a book out of his pocket. 
It was a book that had been sent by post, for the paper wrapper was still about it. It was a neat little volume, bound in glistening green cloth with uncut edges, and the gilt letter title on the back of the volume set forth that the book contained An Alien's Dreams. An Alien's Dreams could be nothing but poetry, and, as the name of the poet was not printed under the title, it was perhaps only natural that Mr. Raymond should not open the book immediately, but should sit turning and twisting the volume about in his hands, and looking at it with a contemptuous expression of countenance. "'An alien!' he exclaimed. "'Why, in the name of all the affectations of the present day, should a young man with fifteen thousand a year, and one of the finest estates in Midlandshire, call himself an alien? An alien's dreams, and such dreams! I had a look at them this morning without cutting the leaves. It's always a mistake to cut the leaves of young people's poetry.' such dreams. Surely no alien could have been afflicted with anything like them, unless he was perpetually eating heavy suppers of underdone pork, or drinking bad wine, or neglecting the ventilation of his bedroom. Imperfect ventilation has a good deal to do with it, I dare say. To think that Roland Lansdell should ever write such stuff, such a clever young man as he is, too, such a generous-hearted, high-minded young fellow, who might be— Mr. Raymond opened the volume in a very gingerly fashion, almost as if he expected something unpleasant might crawl out of it, and looked in a sideways manner between the leaves, muttering the first line or so of a poem, and then skipping on to another, and giving utterance to every species of contemptuous ejaculation between whiles. "'Imogen!' he exclaimed. To Imogen, as if anybody was ever called Imogen, out of Shakespeare's play and Monk Lewis's ballad, to Imogen. Do you ever think of me, proud and cruel Imogen, as I think, ah, sadly, think of thee, when the shadows darken on the misty lee, Imogen, and the low light dies behind the sea? Broken, shattered, blighted, lively titles to tempt the general reader. Here's a nice sort of thing. Like an actor in a play, like a phantom in a dream, like a lost boat left to stray, rudderless adown the stream. That is what my life has grown, idly, since thy false heart left me lone, idly. And I wonder sometimes when the laugh is loud, and I wonder at the faces of the crowd, and the strange fantastic measures that they tread, till I think at last I must be dead, till I half believe that I am dead. And to think that Roland Lansdell should waste his time in writing this sort of thing, and here's his letter, poor boy, his long rambling letter, in which he tells me how he wrote the verses, and how writing them was a kind of consolation to him, a safety valve for so much passionate anger against a world that doesn't exactly harmonize with the utopian fancies of a young man with fifteen thousand a year and nothing to do. If some rightful heir would turn up in the person of one of Roland's gamekeepers now and denounce my young friend as a wrongful heir and turn him out of doors bag and baggage, and with very little bag and baggage, after the manner of those delightful melodramas which hold the mirror up to nature so exactly, what a blessing it would be for the author of An Alien's Dreams! If he could only find himself without a sixpence in the world, what a noble young soldier in the great battle of life, what a triumphant hero he might be! But, as it is, he is nothing better than a colonel of militia, with a fine uniform and a long sword that is only meant for show. My poor Roland, my poor Roland! Mr. Raymond murmured sadly, as he dropped the little volume back in his pocket, I am so sorry that you, too, should be infected with the noxious disease of our time, the fatal cynicism that transforms youth into a malady for which age is the only cure. But he had no time to waste upon any regretful musings about Mr. Roland Lansdell, sole master of Lansdell Priory, one of the finest seats in Midlandshire, and who was just now wandering somewhere in Greece upon a Byronic kind of tour that had lasted upward of six months, and was likely to last much longer. 
It was nearly three o'clock now, and high time for the opening of the hampers, Mr. Raymond declared, when he rejoined the rest of the party, much to the delight of the orphans, who were always hungry, and who ate so much, and yet remained so pale and skeleton-like of aspect, that they presented a pair of perpetual phenomena to the eye of the physiologist. The baskets had been carried to a little ivy-sheltered arbor, perched high above the waterfall, and here Mr. Raymond unpacked them, bringing out his treasures, one after another, first a tongue, then a pair of fowls, a packet of anchovy sandwiches, a great pound cake, at sight of which the eyes of the orphans glistened, delicate caprices in the way of pastry, semi-transparent biscuits, and a little block of Stilton cheese, to say nothing of sundry bottles of Madeira and sparkling Burgundy. Perhaps there never was a merrier party. To eat cold chicken and drink sparkling Burgundy in the open air on a bright May afternoon is always an exhilarating kind of thing, though the scene of your picnic may be the bleakest of the Sussex Downs or the dreariest of the Yorkshire Wolds. But to drink the sparkling wine in that little arbor of Hurstonleigh, with the brawling of the waterfall keeping time to your laughter, the shadows of patriarchal oaks sheltering you from all the outer world, is the very acme of bliss in the way of a picnic. And then Mr. Raymond's companions were so young. It was so easy for them to leave all the past on the threshold of that lovely grove, and to narrow their lives into the life of that one bright day. Even Isabel forgot that she had a destiny, and consented to be happy in a simple, girlish way, without a thought of the prince who was so long coming. It may be that the sparkling burgundy had something to do with George Gilbert's enthusiasm, but by and by, after the debris of the dinner had been cleared away, and the little party lingered round the rustic table, talking with that expansion of thought and eloquence of language, which is so apt to result from the consumption of effervescing wines in the open air, the young surgeon thought that all the earth could scarcely hold a more lovely creature than the girl who sat opposite to him, with her head resting against the rustic woodwork of the arbor, and her hat lying on her knee. She did not say very much, in comparison with Sigismund and Mr. Raymond, who were neither of them in different hands at talking, but when she spoke there was generally something vague and dreamy in her words, something that set George wondering about her anew, and made him admire her more than ever. He forgot all the dictates of prudence now. He was false to all the grand doctrines of young manhood. He only remembered that Isabel Sleaford was the loveliest creature upon earth. He only knew that he loved her and that his love, like all true love, was mingled with modest doubtfulness of his own merits, and exaggerated deference for hers. He loved her as purely and truly as if he had been able to express his passion in the noblest poem ever written, but not being able to express it, his love and himself seemed alike tame and commonplace. I must not dwell too long on this picnic— though it seemed a half a lifetime to George Gilbert, for he walked with Isabel through the lanes between Hurstonleigh Grove and Hurstonleigh Village, and he loitered with her in the little churchyard at Hurstonleigh, and stood upon the bridge beneath which the wavern crept like a riband of silver, winding in and out among the rushes. He lingered there by her side, while the orphans and Sigismund and Mr. Raymond were getting tea ready at the model cottage, and putting the model old woman's wits into such a state of flustrification, as she herself expressed it, that she could scarcely hold the tea-kettle, and was in imminent peril of breaking one of her best chainy saucers, produced from a corner cupboard in honour of her friend and patron, Charles Raymond. George loitered on the little stone bridge with Isabel, and, somehow or other, still emboldened by the sparkling burgundy, his passion all of a sudden found a voice, and he told her that he loved her, and that his highest hope upon earth was the hope of winning her for his wife. I suppose that simple little story must be a pretty story in its way, for when a woman hears it for the first time she is apt to feel kindly disposed to the person who recites it, 
however poorly or tamely he may tell his tale. Isabel listened with a most delightful complacency, not because she reciprocated George's affection for her, but because this was the first little bit of romance in her life, and she felt that the story was beginning all at once, and that she was going to be a heroine. She felt this, and with this a kind of grateful liking for the young man at her side, through whose agency all these pleasant feelings came to her. And all this time George was pleading with her, and arguing, from her blushes and her silence, that his suit was not hopeless. Emboldened by the girl's tacit encouragement, he grew more and more eloquent, and went on to tell her how he had loved her from the first. Yes, from that first summer's afternoon, when he had seen her sitting under the pear-trees in the old-fashioned garden, with the low yellow light behind her. "'Of course I didn't know then that I loved you, Isabel. Oh, may I call you Isabel? It is such a pretty name. I have written it over and over and over on the leaves of a blotting-book at home, very often without knowing that I was writing it. I only thought at first that I admired you, because you are so beautiful, and so different from other beautiful women. And then, when I was always thinking of you and wondering about you, I wouldn't believe that it was because I loved you. It is only today, this dear happy day, that has made me understand what I have felt all along. And now I know that I have loved you from the first Isabel, dearest Isabel, from the very first. All this was quite as it should be. Isabel's heart fluttered like the wings of a young bird that had essayed its first flight. "'This is what it is to be a heroine,' she thought, as she looked down at the colored pebbles, the floating river weeds under the clear, rippling water, and yet knew all the time, by virtue of feminine second sight, that George Gilbert was gazing at her and adoring her. She didn't like him, but she liked him to be there, talking to her. The words she heard for the first time were delightful to her, because of their novelty— but they took no charm from the lips that spoke them. Any other good-looking, respectably dressed young man would have been quite as much to her as George Gilbert was. But then she did not know this. It was so very easy for her to mistake her pleasure in the situation, the rustic bridge, the rippling water, the bright spring twilight, even the faint influence of that one glass of sparkling burgundy, and, above all, the sensation of being a heroine for the first time in her life, it was so terribly easy to mistake all these for that which she did not feel, a regard for George Gilbert. While the young man was still pleading, while she was still listening to him and blushing and glancing shyly at him out of those wonderful tawny-colored eyes, which seemed black just now under the shadow of their drooping lashes, Sigismund and the orphans appeared at the distant gate of the churchyard, whooping and hallooing to announce that the tea was all ready. "'Oh, Isabel,' cried George, "'they are coming, and it may be ever so long before I see you again alone. Isabel, dear Isabel, do tell me that you will make me happy. Tell me that you will be my wife.' He did not ask her if she loved him. He was too much in love with her, too entirely impressed with her grace and beauty, and his own inferiority, to tempt his fate by such a question. If she would marry him, and let him love her, and by and by reward his devotion by loving him a little, surely that would be enough to satisfy his most presumptuous wishes? "'Dear Isabel, you will marry me, won't you? You can't mean to say no. You would have said it before now.' You would not be so cruel as to let me hope, even for a minute, if you meant to disappoint me. I have known you, you have known me, such a short time, the girl murmured. But long enough to love you with a love that will last all my life, George answered eagerly. I shall have no thought except to make you happy, Isabel. I know that you are so beautiful that you ought to marry a very different fellow from me, a man who could give you a grand house and carriages and horses and all that sort of thing. But he could never love you better than I, and he mightn't love you as well, perhaps. 
and I'll work for you, Isabel, as no man ever worked before. You shall never know what poverty is, darling, if you will be my wife. I shouldn't mind being poor, Isabel answered dreamily. She was thinking that Walter Gay had been poor, and that the chief romance of Florence's life had been the quiet wedding in that little city church, and the long sea voyage with her young husband. This sort of poverty was almost as nice as poor Edith's miserable wealth, with diamonds flung about and trampled upon, and ruby velvet for everyday wear. "'I shouldn't mind so much being poor,' repeated the girl, for she thought if she didn't marry a duke or a donaby, it would be at least something to experience the sentimental phase of poverty. George Gilbert seized upon the words. "'Ah, then you will marry me, dearest Isabel. You will marry me, my own darling, my beautiful wife.' He was almost startled by the intensity of his own feelings, as he bent down and kissed the little ungloved hand lying on the moss-grown stonework of the bridge. "'Oh, Isabel, if you could only know how happy you have made me, if you could only know—' She looked at him with a startled expression in her face. Was it all settled, then, so suddenly, with so little consideration? Yes, it was all settled. She was beloved with one of those passions that endured for a lifetime. George had said something to that effect. The story had begun, and she was a heroine. "'Good gracious me!' cried Mr. Smith, as he bounded on the parapet of the little bridge— and disported himself there in the character of an amateur blondin. If the model old woman, who has had so many prizes, we've been looking at her diplomas, framed and glazed in a parlour that I couldn't have believed to exist out of Lillian the deserted, who begins life as the cottager's daughter, you know, and elopes with the squire in top boots out of a diamond-paned window, and I've been trying the model old woman's windows, and Lillian couldn't have done it, but I was about to remark that if the old woman hasn't had a prize for model temper, you two will catch it for keeping the tea waiting. Why, Izzy, what's the matter? You and George are both looking as spoony as— Is it, eh? Yes, it is, isn't it? Hooray! Didn't I see it from the first? cried Mr. Smith, striking an attitude upon the balustrade and pointing down to the two blushing faces with a triumphant finger. "'When George asked me for your letter, Izzy, the little bit of letter that you wrote to me when you left Camberwell, didn't I see him fold it up as gingerly as if it had been a fifty-pound note, and slip it into his waistcoat pocket, and then try to look as if he hadn't done it? Do you think I wasn't a fly, then? A pretty knowledge of human nature I should have if I couldn't see through that. The creator of Octavio Montefiasco, the demon of the galleys, flatters himself.' that he understands the obscurest diagnostic of the complaint commonly designated spoons. "'Don't be downhearted, George,' exclaimed Sigismund, jumping suddenly off the parapet of the bridge and extending his hand to his friend. "'Accept the congratulations of one who, with a heart long burlighted by the burlasting inferluence of curlime, can yet er feel generous throb in unison with virtue. After this, they all left the bridge and went straight to the little cottage where Mr. Raymond had been holding a species of Yankee levy for the reception of the model villagers, every one of whom knew him and required his advice on some knotty point of law, medicine, or domestic economy. The tea was laid upon a little round table, close to the window, in the full light of the low evening sun. Isabel sat with her back to that low western light, and George sat next to her, staring at her in silent rapture, and wondering at himself for his own temerity in having asked her to be his wife. That tiresome Sigismund called Mr. Raymond aside before sitting down to tea, on the pretense of showing him a highly coloured representation of Joseph and his brethren, with a strong family likeness between the brethren, and told him in a loud whisper what had happened on the little bridge. So it was scarcely wonderful that poor George and Isabel took their tea in silence, and were rather awkward in the handling of their teacups. 
but they were spared any further congratulations from Sigismund, as that young gentleman found it was as much as he could do to hold his own against the orphans in the demolition of the pound cake, to say nothing of a lump of honeycomb which the model old woman produced for the delectation of the visitors. The twilight deepened presently, and the stars began to glimmer faintly in an opal-tinted sky. Mr. Raymond, Sigismund, and the orphans employed themselves in packing the baskets with the knives, plates, and glasses which had been used for the picnic. The fly was to pick them up at the cottage. Isabel stood in the little doorway, looking dreamily out at the village, the dim lights twinkling in the casement windows, the lazy cattle standing in the pond upon the green, and a man holding a couple of horses before the door of the little inn. That man with the horses is Jeffson, my father's gardener. I scarcely like to call him a servant, for he is a kind of connection of my poor mother's family, George said, with a little confusion, for he thought that perhaps Miss Sleaford's pride might take alarm at the idea of any such kindred between her future husband and his servant. And he is such a good fellow. And what do you think, Isabel? the young man added, dropping his voice to a whisper, Poor Jeffson has come all the way from Greybridge on purpose to see you, because he has heard me say that you are very beautiful, and I think he guessed ever so long ago that I had fallen in love with you. Would you have any objection to walk over yonder and see him, Isabel, or shall I call him here? I'll go to him, if you like. I should like very much to see him, the girl answered. She took the arm George offered her. Of course, it was only right that she should take his arm. It was all a settled thing now. "'Miss Sleaford has come to see you, Jeff,' the young man said, when they came to where the Yorkshireman was standing. Poor Jeff had very little to say upon this rather trying occasion. He took off his hat and stood bareheaded, smiling and blushing, as George spoke of him and praised him, yet all the while keeping a sharp watch upon Isabel's face. He could see that pale, girlish face very well in the evening light, for Miss Sleaford had left her hat in the cottage, and stood bareheaded with her face turned toward the west, while George rambled on about Jeff and his old school days, when Jeff and he had been such friends and playfellows. But the fly from Conventford came rumbling out of the inn-yard as they stood there, and this was a signal for Isabel to hurry back to the cottage. She held out her hand to Mr. Jeffson, as she wished him good-night, and then went back, still attended by George, who handed her into the fly presently, and wished her good-night in a very commonplace manner, for he was a young man whose feelings hid themselves from indifferent eyes, and, indeed, only appeared under the influence of extreme emotion. End of Chapter 7 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 8 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 8 About Poor Joe Tillett's Young Wife George went back to the Seven Stars, where Mr. Jeffson was waiting with the horses. He went back, after watching the open vehicle drive away. He went back with his happiness, which was so new and strange, he thought a fresh life was to begin for him from this day, and would have almost expected to find the diseases of his patients miraculously cured, and a new phase of existence opening for them as well as for himself. He was going to be married. He was going to have this beautiful young creature for his wife. He thought of her, and the image of this pale-faced girl, sitting in the little parlour at Greybridge, waiting to receive him when he came home from his patients, was such an overpowering vision that his brain reeled as he contemplated it. Was it true? Could it be true that all this inexpressible happiness was to be his?' 
By and by, when he was riding Brown Molly slowly along the shadowy lanes that lie between Hurstonleigh and Waverley, his silent bliss overflowed his heart, and sought to utter itself in words. William Jeffson had always been George's confidant. Why should he not be so now, when the young man had such need of some friendly ear to which to impart his happiness? Somehow or other the Yorkshireman did not seem so eager as usual to take part in his master's pleasure. He had seemed to hang back a little, for under ordinary circumstances George would have had no occasion to break the ice, but to-night Mr. Jeffson seemed bent on keeping silence, and George was obliged to hazard a preliminary question. "'What do you think of her, Jeff?' he asked. "'What do I think of who, Master Jarge?' demanded the Yorkshireman in his simple vernacular. "'Why, is a Miss Sleaford, of course,' answered George rather indignantly. "'Was there any other woman in the world whom he could possibly think of or speak of to-night?' Mr. Jeffson was silent for some moments, as if the question related to so profound a subject that he had to descend into the farthest depths of his mind before he could answer it. He was silent, and the slow trampling of the horse's hoofs along the lane, and the twittering of some dissipated bird far away in the dim woodland, were the only sounds that broke the evening stillness. "'She's rare and pretty, Master Jarge,' the philosopher said at last, in a very thoughtful tone. "'I almost think I never see any one so pretty, though it isn't that high-coloured sort of prettiness they think so much to in Greybridge. She's still and white, somehow, like the images in Yorkminster, and her eyes seem far away as you look at her. Yes, she is rare and pretty.' "'I've told her how I love her, and—and and you like her, Jeff, don't you?' asked George, in a rapture of happiness that was stronger than his native shyness. "'You like her, and she likes you, Jeff, and will like you better as she comes to know you more, and she's going to be my wife, old Jeff.' The young man's voice grew tremulous as he made this grand announcement. Whatever enthusiasm there was in his nature seemed concentrated in the emotions of this one day. He had loved for the first time, and declared his love, his true and constant heart, that wondrous aloe which was to bear a single flower, had burst into sudden blossom, and all the vigor of the root was in that one bright bloom. The aloe flower might bloom steadily on for ever, or might fade and die, but it could never know a second blossoming. "'She's going to be my wife, Jeff,' he repeated, as if to say these words was in itself to taste an overpowering happiness. But William Jeffson seemed very stupid to-night. His conversational powers appeared to have undergone a kind of paralysis— he spoke slowly, and made long pauses every now and then. "'You're going to marry her, Master Jarge?' he said. "'Yes, Jeff. I love her better than any living creature in this world, better than the world itself or my life. For I think if she had answered me differently today, I should have died. Why, you're not surprised, are you, Jeff?' I thought you guessed at the very first, before I knew it myself, even, that I was in love with Isabel. Isabel, Isabel, what a pretty name! It sounds like a flower, doesn't it? No, I'm not surprised, Master Jarge, the Yorkshireman said thoughtfully. I knew you was in love with Miss Sleaford, regular fond about her, you know. "'But I didn't think, I didn't think, as you'd asked her to marry you so soon.' "'But why not, Jeff?' cried the young man. "'What should I wait for? I couldn't love her better than I do if I knew her for years and years, and every year were to make her brighter and lovelier than she is now. I've got a home to bring her to, and I'll work for her.' I'll work for her as no man ever worked before to make a happy home for his wife. He struck out his arm with his fist clenched, 
as if he thought that the highest round on the ladder of fortune was to be reached by any young surgeon who had the desire to climb. "'Why shouldn't I marry at once, Jeff?' he demanded with some touch of indignation. "'I can give my wife as good a home as that from which I shall take her.' "'It isn't that, as I was thinking of, Master Jarge,' William Jeffson answered, growing slower of speech and graver of tone with every word he spoke. "'It isn't that. But, you see, you know so little of Miss Sleaford. You know not, but that she's different somehow to all the other lasses you've seen, and that she seems to take your fancy like because of that.' "'You know not about her, Master Jarge. "'And what's still worse, ever so much worse than that, "'you don't know that she loves you. "'You don't know that, Master Jarge. "'If he was only sure of that, the rest wouldn't matter so much, "'for there's scarcely anything in this world as true love can't do, "'and a good woman that loves truly can't be aught but a good woman at heart.' "'I see, Miss Sleaford, when you was standin' talkin' by the seven stars, Master Jarge, "'and there wasn't any look in her face as if she knew what you was sayin' or thought about it, "'but her eyes looked ever so far away like, "'and though there was a kind of light in her face, "'it didn't seem as if it had anything to do with you. "'And, Lord bless your heart, Master Jarge, "'You should have seen my Tilly's face when she come up the airy steps in the square, where she was head housemaid, and see me come up to London on purpose to surprise her. Why, it was all of a shine-like with smiles and brightness at the sight of me, Master Jarge, and I'm sure I'm no great shakes to look at,' added Mr. Jeffson in a deprecating tone. The reins, lying loose upon Brown Molly's neck, shook with the sudden trembling of the hand that held them. George Gilbert was seized with a kind of panic as he listened to his mentor's discourse. He had not presumed to solicit any confession of love from Isabel Sleaford. He had thought himself more than blessed inasmuch as she had promised to become his wife. Yet he was absolutely terror-stricken at Mr. Jeffson's humiliating suggestion and was, withal, very angry at his old playmate's insolence. "'You mean that she doesn't love me?' he said sharply. "'Oh, Master Jarge, to be right down truthful with you, that's just what I do mean. She don't love you. As sure as I've seen true love looking out of my Tilly's face, I see something that wasn't love looking out of hern to-night.' I see just such a look in Miss Sleaford's eyes as I see once in a pretty young creeter that married a mate of mine down home, a young man as had got a bit of land and cottage and everything comfortable, and it wasn't the young creeter himself that was in favor of marrying him, but it was her friends that worried and bothered her till she said yes. She was a poor, foolish young thing that didn't seem to have the strength to say no. "'and it was at Joe Tillett's wedding. "'His name was Joe Tillett, "'and I see the pretty young creeter standin', "'like I see Miss Sleaford to-night, "'close alongside her husband, "'while he was talkin', "'and lookin' prettier nor ever "'in her straw bonnet and her white ribbons. "'But her eyes seemed to fix themselves "'on something far away like, "'and when her husband turned of a sudden "'and spoke to her, "'she started like as if she was waked out of a dream.' I never forgot that look o' hern, Master Jarge, and I saw the same kind o' look to-night. "'What nonsense you're talking, Jeff,' George answered with considerable impatience. "'I dare say your friend and his wife were very happy?' "'No, Master Jarge, they wasn't. And that's just the very thing that makes me remember the pretty young creature's look that summer day as she stood, dressed out in her wedding clothes, by her loving husband's side. He was very fond of her, and for a good two year or so he seemed very happy, and was always telling his friends he'd got the best wife in the three ridens, and the quietest and the most industrious. 
but she seemed to pine like, and by and by there was a young soldier came home that had been to the Indies, and that was her first cousin, and had lived neighbors with her family when she was a bit of a girl. I won't tell you the story, Master Jarge, for it isn't the pleasantest kind of thing to tell, nor yet to hear. But the end of it was my poor mate Joe was found one summer's morning, just such a day as that when he was married, hanging dead behind the door of one of his barns. And as for the poor wretched young creetur as had caused his death, nobody ever knew what came of her. And yet, concluded Mr. Jeffson in a meditative tone, I've heard that poor chap Joe tell me so confident that his wife would get to love him dearly by and by, because he loved her so true and dear. George Gilbert made no answer to all this. He rode on slowly, with his head drooping. The Yorkshireman kept an anxious watch upon his master. He could not see the expression of the young man's face, but he could see by his attitude that the story of Joseph Tillett's misadventure had not been without a depressing influence upon him. "'See thee new, Master Jarge,' said William Jeffson, laying his hand upon the surgeon's wrist, and speaking in a voice that was almost solemn. "'Marryin' a pretty girl seems no more than gatherin' a wild rose out of the hedge to some men. They do it so light and careless-like, just because the flower looks pretty where it's growin'. I'd known my Tilly six year before I asked her to be my wife, Master Jarge, and it was only because she'd been true and faithful to me all that time, and because I'd never, look at her when I might, see anything but love in her face, that I ventured at last to say to my son, William Jeffson, there's a lass that'll make thee a true wife. Don't be in a hurry, Master Jarge, don't. Take the advice of a poor, ignorant chap, as has one great advantage over all your learnin', for he's lived double your time in the world. Don't be in a hurry. If Miss Sleaford loves ye true to-night, she'll love ye ten times truer this night twelve months, and truer still this time ten years. If she don't love ye, Master Jarge, keep clear of her, as you would of a venomous serpent." "'for she'll bring you worse harm than ever that could do "'if it stung you to the heart and made an end of you at once. "'I see Joe Tillett lying dead after the inquest "'that was held upon him, Master Jarge, "'and the thought that the poor, desperate creature had killed hisself "'warn't so bad to me as the sight of the suffering on his poor dead face, "'the suffering that he'd borne nigh upon two year, Master Jarge, and had held his tongue about. End of chapter 8 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 9 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 9 Miss Sleaford's Engagement Isabel Sleaford was engaged. She remembered this when she woke on the morning after that pleasant day in Hurstonleigh Grove, and that henceforward there existed a person who was bound to be miserable because of her. She thought this as she stood before the modest looking-glass, rolling the long plaits of her hair into a great knot that seemed too heavy for her head. Her life was all settled. She was not to be a great poetess or an actress. The tragic mantle of the Siddons might have descended on her young shoulders, but she was never to display its gloomy folds on any mortal stage. She was not to be anything great. She was only to be a country surgeon's wife. It was very commonplace, perhaps, and yet this lonely girl, this untaught and unfriended creature, felt some little pride in her new position. After all, she had read many novels in which the story was very little more than this, three volumes of simple love-making and a quiet wedding at the end of the chapter. She was not to be an Edith Dombey or a Jane Eyre, 
Oh, to have been a Jane Eyre, and to roam away on the cold moorland and starve, wouldn't that have been delicious? No, there was to be a very moderate portion of romance in her life, but still some romance. George Gilbert would be very devoted, and would worship her always, of course. She gave her head a little toss, as she thought that, at the worst, she could treat him as Edith treated Dombey, and enjoy herself that way, though she was doubtful how far Edith Dombey's style of treatment might answer without the ruby velvet and diamond coronet and other properties appertaining to that role. In the meanwhile, Miss Sleaford performed her duties as best she could, and instructed the orphans in a dreamy kind of way, breaking off in the middle of a preterperfect tense of verb to promise them that they should come to spend a day with her when she was married, and neglecting their fingering of the overture to Massaniello while she pondered on the color of her wedding dress. And how much did she think of George Gilbert all this time? about as much as she would have thought of the pages who were to support the splendid burgeon of her trailing robes if she had been about to be crowned queen of England. He was the bridegroom, the husband, a secondary character in the play of which she was the heroine. Poor George's first love-letter came to her on the following day, a vague and rambling epistle full of shadowy doubts and fears, haunted, as it were, by the phantom of the poor, dead-and-gone Joe Tillett, and without any punctuation whatever. But, O oh, dearest, ever dearest Isabel, for ever dear you will be to me, if you cast me from you and I should go to America, for life in Greybridge would be worse than odious without you. O oh, Isabel, if you do not love me, I implore you, for pity's sake, say so, and end my misery. I know I am not worthy of your love, who are so beautiful and accomplished, but, O, oh, the thought of giving you up is so bitter, unless you yourself should wish it, and, O, oh, there is no sacrifice on earth I would not make for you. The letter was certainly not as elegant a composition as Isabel would have desired it to be, but then a love-letter is a love-letter, and this was the first Miss Sleaford had ever received. George's tone of mingled doubt and supplication was by no means displeasing to her. It was only right that he should be miserable, it was only proper that he should be tormented by all manner of apprehensions. They would have to quarrel by and by, and to bid each other an eternal farewell, and to burn each other's letters, and be reconciled again. The quietest story could not be made without such legitimate incidents in the course of the three volumes. Although Isabel amused herself by planning her wedding dress, and changed her mind very often as to the color and material, she had no idea of a speedy marriage. Were there not three volumes of courtship to be gone through first? Sigismund went back to town after the picnic, which had been planned for his gratification, and Isabel was left quite alone with her pupils. She walked with them, and took her meals with them, and was with them all day, and it was only of a Sunday that she saw much of Mr. Raymond. That gentleman was very kind to the affianced lovers— George Gilbert rode over to Conventford every alternate Sunday, and dined with the family at Oakbank. Sometimes he went early enough to attend Isabel and the orphans to church. Mr. Raymond himself was not a church-goer, but he sent his grandnieces to perform their devotions, as he sent them to have their hair clipped by the hairdresser, or their teeth examined by the dentist. George plunged into the wildest extravagance in the way of waistcoats, in order to do honor to these happy Sundays, and left off mourning for his father a month or so earlier than he had intended, in order to infuse variety into his costume. Everything he wore used to look new on those Sundays, and Isabel, sitting opposite to him in the square pew, would contemplate him thoughtfully when the sermon was dull, and wonder, rather regretfully, why his garments never wore themselves into folds, 
but always retained a hard, angular look, as if they had been originally worn by a wooden figure and had never got over that disadvantage. He wore a watch-chain that his father had given him, a long chain that went round his neck, but which he artfully twisted and doubled into the semblance of a short one, and on this chain he hung a lucky sixpence and an old-fashioned silver vinaigrette, which trifles, when seen from a distance, looked almost like the gold charms which the officers stationed at Conventford wore dangling on their waistcoats. And so the engagement dawdled on through all the bright summer months, and while the leaves were falling in the woods of Midlandshire, George still entreating that the marriage might speedily take place, and Isabel always deferring that ceremonial to some indefinite period. Every alternate Sunday the young man's horse appeared at Mr. Raymond's gate. He would have come every Sunday, if he had dared, and indeed he had been invited to do so by Isabel's kind employer, but he had sensitive scruples about eating so much beef and mutton and drinking so many cups of tea, for which he could make no adequate return to his hospitable entertainer. Sometimes he brought a present for one of the orphans, a work-box or a desk, fitted with scissors that wouldn't cut, and inkstands that wouldn't open, for there are no Parkins and Grotto in Greybridge or its vicinity, or a marvellous cake made by Matilda Jeffson. Once he got up a little entertainment for his betrothed and her friends, and gave quite a dinner with five sweets, and an elaborate dessert, and with the most plum-coloured of ports, and the brownest of sherries, procured specially from the cock at Greybridge. But as the orphans, who alone did full justice to the entertainment, were afflicted with a bilious attack on the following day, the experiment was not repeated. But the dinner at Greybridge was not without its good effect. Isabel saw the house that was to be her home and the future began to take a more palpable shape than it had worn hitherto. She looked at the little china ornaments on the mantelpiece, the jar of withered rose leaves mingled with faint odors of spices. The scent was very faint now, for the hands of George's dead mother had gathered the flowers. George took Isabel through the little rooms and showed her an old-fashioned work-table with a rosewood box at the top and a well of fluted silk that had once been rose-colored underneath. My mother used to sit at this table working while she waited for my father. I've often heard him say so. You'll use this old work-box, won't you, Izzy? George asked tenderly. He had grown accustomed to call her Izzy now, and was familiar with her, and confided in her as in a betrothed wife, whom no possible chance could alienate from him. He had ceased to regard her as a superior being, whom it was a privilege to know and worship. He loved her as truly as he had ever loved her, but not being of a poetical or sentimental nature— the brief access of romantic feeling which he had experienced on first falling in love speedily wore itself out, and the young man grew to contemplate his approaching marriage with perfect equanimity. He even took it upon himself to lecture Isabel on sundry occasions with regard to her love of novel-reading, her neglect of plain needlework, and her appalling ignorance on the subject of puddings. He turned over her leaves and found her places in the hymn-book at church. He made her follow the progress of the lessons with the aid of a church service printed in a pale ink and minute type. And he frowned at her sternly when he caught her eyes wandering to distant bonnets during the sermon. All the young man's old notions of masculine superiority returned, now that he was familiar with Miss Sleaford, but all this while he loved her, as only a good man can love, and supplicated all manner of blessings for her every night when he said his prayers. Isabel Sleaford improved very much in this matter-of-fact companionship, and in the exercise of her daily round of duty. She was no longer the sentimental young lady whose best employment was to loll in a garden-chair reading novels, 
and who was wont to burst into sudden rhapsodies about George Gordon Lord Byron and Napoleon I upon the very smallest provocation. She had tried George on both these subjects, and had found him entirely wanting in any special reverence for either of her pet heroes. Talking with him on autumn Sunday afternoons in the breezy meadows near Conventford, with the orphans loitering behind or straggling on before, Miss Sleaford had tested her lover's conversational powers to the utmost, but as she found that he neither knew nor wished to know anything about Edith Dombey or Ernest Maltravers, and that he regarded the poems of Byron and Shelley as immoral and blasphemous compositions, whose very titles should be unknown to a well-conducted young woman, Isabel was fain to hold her tongue about all the bright reveries of her girlhood, and to talk to Mr. Gilbert about what he did understand. He had read Cooper's novels, and a few of Lever's, and he had read Sir Walter Scott and Shakespeare, and was fully impressed with the idea that he could not overestimate these latter writers. But when Isabel began to talk about Edgar Ravenswood and Lucy, with her face all lighted up with emotion, the young surgeon could only stare wonderingly at his betrothed. Oh, if he had only been like Edgar Ravenswood! The poor, childish, dissatisfied heart was always wishing that he could be something different from what he was. Perhaps during all that engagement the girl never once saw her lover really as he was. She dressed him up in her own fancies, and deluded herself by imaginary resemblances between him and the heroes in her books. If he was abrupt and disagreeable in his manner to her, he was Rochester, and she was Jane Eyre, tender and submissive. If he was cold, he was Dombey, and she feasted on her own pride and scorned him, and made much of one of the orphans during an entire afternoon. If he was clumsy and stupid, he was Rawdon Crawley, and she patronized him and laughed at him, and taunted him with little scraps of French, with Albany Road accent, and played off all green-eyed Becky's prettiest airs upon him. But in spite of all this, the young man's sober common sense exercised a beneficial influence upon her. And by and by, when the three volumes of courtship had been prolonged to the uttermost, and the last inevitable chapter was close at hand, she had grown to think affectionately of her promised husband, and was determined to be very good and obedient to him when she became his wife but for the pure and perfect love which makes marriage thrice holy, the love which counts no sacrifice too great, no suffering too bitter, the love which knows no change but death, and seems infused with such divinity that death can be but its apotheosis, such love as this had no place in Isabel Sleaford's heart. Her books had given her some vague idea of this grand passion, and on comparing herself with Lucy Ashton and Zuleika, with Amy Robarts and Florence Dombey and Medora, she began to think that the poets and novelists were all in the wrong, and that there were no heroes or heroines upon this commonplace earth. She thought this, and she was content to sacrifice the foolish dreams of her girlhood, which were doubtless as impossible as they were beautiful. She was content to think that her lot in life was fixed, and that she was to be the wife of a good man, and the mistress of an old-fashioned house in one of the dullest towns in England. The time had slipped so quietly away since that spring twilight on the bridge at Hurstonleigh. Her engagement had been taken so much as a matter of course by everyone about her, that no thought of withdrawal therefrom had ever entered into her mind. And then, again, why should she withdraw from the engagement? George loved her, and there was no one else who loved her. There was no wandering Jamie to come home in the still gloaming and scare her with the sight of his sad, reproachful face. If she was not George Gilbert's wife, she would be nothing, a nursery governess for ever and ever, teaching stupid orphans and earning five-and-twenty pounds a year. 
when she thought of her desolate position and of another subject which was most painful to her she clung to george gilbert and was grateful to him and fancied that she loved him the wedding day came at last one bleak january morning when conventford wore its barest and ugliest aspect and mr raymond gave his nursery governess away after the fashion of that simple protestant ceremonial which is apt to seem tame and commonplace when compared with the solemn grandeur of a roman catholic marriage he had given her the dress she wore and the orphans had clubbed their pocket money to buy their preceptress a bonnet as a surprise which was a failure after the usual manner of artfully planned surprises Isabel Sleaford pronounced the words that made her George Gilbert's wife, and if she spoke them somewhat lightly, it was because there had been no one to teach her their solemn import. There was no taint of falsehood in her heart, no thought of revolt or disobedience in her mind, and when she came out of the vestry, leaning on her young husband's arm, there was a smile of quiet contentment on her face. Joe Tillett's wife could never have smiled like that, thought George, as he looked at his bride. The life that lay before Isabel was new, and being little more than a child as yet, she thought that novelty must mean happiness. She was to have a house of her own, and servants, and an orchard and paddock, two horses, and a gig. She was to be called Mrs. Gilbert. Was not her name so engraved upon the cards which George had ordered for her in a Morocco card-case, that smelt like new boots and was difficult to open, as well as on those wedding cards which the surgeon had distributed among his friends? George had ordered envelopes for these cards with his wife's maiden name engraved inside, but to his surprise the girl had implored him ever so piteously to counter-order them. "'Oh, don't have my name upon the envelopes, George,' she said. "'Don't send my name to your friends. "'Don't ever tell them what I was called before you married me.' "'But why not, Izzy?' "'Because I hate my name,' she answered passionately. "'I hate it. I hate it. "'I would have changed it if I could when—when when I first came here. "'But Sigismund wouldn't let me come to his uncle's house in a false name.' I hate my name, I hate and detest it. And then, suddenly seeing wonderment and curiosity plainly expressed in her lover's face, the girl cried out that there was no meaning in what she had said, and that it was only her romantic folly, and that he was to forgive her and forget all about it. But am I to send your name, or not, Isabel? George asked rather coolly. He did not cherish these flights of fancy on the part of the young lady he was training, with a view to his own ideal of a wife. You first say a thing, and then say you don't mean it. Am I to send the envelopes, or not? No, no, George, don't send them, please. I really do dislike my name. Sleaford is such an ugly name, you know. End of chapter 9 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 10 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 10 A Bad Beginning Mr. Gilbert took his young wife to an hotel at Merlington for a week's honeymoon to a family hotel. A splendid mansion, Isabel thought, where there was a solemn church-like stillness all day long, only broken by the occasional tinkling of silver spoons in the distance, or the musical chime of fragile glasses carried hither and thither on salvers of electroplate. Isabel had never stayed at an hotel before, and she felt a thrill of pleasure when she saw the glittering table, the wax candles in silver branches, the sweeping crimson curtains drawn before the lofty windows, and the delightful waiter, whose manner was such a judicious combination of protecting benevolence and obsequious humility. Mrs. George Gilbert drew a long breath as she trifled with the shining damask napkin, 
so wondrously folded into a bishop's mitre, and saw herself reflected in the tall glass on the opposite side of the room. She wore her wedding dress still, a somber brown silk dress, which had been chosen by George himself because of its homely merit of usefulness, rather than for any special beauty or elegance. Poor Isabel had struggled a little about the choice of that dress, for she had wanted to look like Florence Dombey on her wedding day, but she had given way. Her life had never been her own yet, and never was to be her own, she thought, for now that her stepmother had ceased to rule over her by force of those spasmodic outbreaks of violence by which sorely tried matrons govern their households, here was George with his strong will and sound common sense. Oh, how Isabel hated common sense, and she must needs acknowledge him as her master. But she looked at her reflection in the glass and saw that she was pretty. Was it only prettiness, or was it something more, even in spite of the brown dress? She saw her pale face and black hair lighted up by the wax candles, and thought, if this could go on for ever, the tinkling silver and glittering glass, the deferential waiter, the flavor of luxury and elegance, not to say Edith Dombeyism, that pervaded the atmosphere, she would be pleased with her new lot. Unhappily, there was only to be a brief interval of this aristocratic existence, for George had told his young wife confidentially that he didn't mean to go beyond a ten-pound note. And by and by, when the dinner-table had been cleared, he amused himself by making abstruse calculations as to how long that sum would hold out against the charges of the family hotel. The young couple stayed for a week at Merlington. They drove about the neighborhood in an open fly— conscientiously admiring what the guide-books called the beauties of the vicinity, and the bleak winds of January tweaked their young noses as they faced the northern sky. George was happy, ah, how serenely happy, in that the woman he so dearly loved was his wife. The thought of any sorrow darkling in the distance now, now that the solemn vows had been spoken, never entered into his mind. He had thought of William Jeffson's warning sometimes, it is true, but only to smile in superb contempt of the simple creature's foolish talk. Isabel loved him. She smiled at him when he spoke to her, and was gentle and obedient to his advice. He was perhaps a shad too fond of advising her. She had given up novel-reading, and employed her leisure in the interesting pursuit of plain needlework. Her husband watched her complacently by the light of the wax candles while she hemmed a cambric handkerchief, threading and unthreading her needle very often, and boggling a little when she turned the corners, and stopping now and then to yawn behind her pretty little pink fingers. But then she had been out in the open air nearly all day, and it was only natural that she should be sleepy. Perhaps it might have been better for George Gilbert if he had not solicited Mr. Polkett's occasional attendance upon his parish patients, and thus secured a week's holiday in honor of his young wife. Perhaps it would have been better if he had kept his ten-pound note in his pocket, and taken Isabel straight to the house which was henceforth to be her home. That week in the hotel at Merlington revealed one dreadful fact to these young people— a fact which the Sunday afternoon walks at Conventford had only dimly foreshadowed. They had very little to say to each other. That dread discovery, which should bring despair wherever it comes, dawned upon Isabel at least all at once, and a chill sense of weariness and disappointment crept into her breast and grew there while she was yet ignorant of its cause. She was very young, she had not yet parted with one of her delusions, and she ignorantly believed that she could keep those foolish dreams and yet be a good wife to George Gilbert. He talked to her of his school days, and then branched away to his youth, his father's decline and death, his own election to the parish duties, his lonely bachelorhood, his hope of a better position and larger income some day. Oh, how dull and prosaic it all sounded to that creature 
whose vague fancies were forever wandering toward wonderful regions of poetry and romance. It was a relief to her when George left off talking, and left her free to think her own thoughts, as she labored on at the cambric handkerchief, and pricked the points of her fingers, and entangled her thread. There were no books in the sitting-room at the family hotel, and even if there had been, this honeymoon week seemed to Isabel a ceremonial period. She felt as if she were on a visit, and was not free to read. She sighed as she passed the library on the fashionable parade, and saw the name of the new novels exhibited on a board before the door, but she had not the courage to say how happy three cloth-covered volumes of light literature would have made her. George was not a reading man. He read the local papers, and skimmed the times after breakfast, and then there he was, all day long. There were two wet days during that week at Merlington, and the young married people had ample opportunity of testing each other's conversational powers, as they stood in the broad window, watching occasional passers-by in the sloppy streets, and counting the raindrops on the glass. The week came to an end at last, and on a wet Saturday afternoon George Gilbert paid his bill at the family hotel. The ten-pound note had held out very well, for the young bridegroom's ideas had never soared beyond a daily pint of sherry to wash down the simple repast, which the discreet waiter provided for those humble guests, in pitiful regard to their youth and simplicity. Mr. Gilbert paid his bill, while Isabel packed her own and her husband's things. Oh, what uninteresting things! double-soled boots and serviceable garments of grey woollen stuff. Then, when all was ready, she stood in the window watching for the omnibus which was to carry her to her new home. Merlington was only ten miles from Greybridge, and the journey between the two places was performed in an old-fashioned, stunted omnibus, a darksome vehicle with a low roof, a narrow door, and only one small square of glass on each side. Isabel breathed a long sigh as she watched for the appearance of this vehicle in the empty street. The dull, wet day, the lonely pavement, the blank, empty houses to let furnished, for it was not the Merlington season now, were not so dull or empty as her own life seemed to her this afternoon. Was it to be for ever and for ever like this? Yes, she was married, and the story was all over. Her destiny was irrevocably sealed, and she was tired of it already. But then she thought of her new home, and all the little plans she had made for herself before her marriage, the alterations and improvements she had sketched out for the beautification of her husband's house. Somehow or other, even these ideas, which had beguiled her so, in her maiden reveries, seemed to melt and vanish now. She had spoken to George, and he had received her suggestions doubtfully, hinting at the money which would be required for the carrying out of her plans, though they were very simple plans, and did not involve much expense. Was there to be nothing in her life, then? She was only a week married, and already, as she stood at the window listening to the slop-slop of the everlasting rain, she began to think that she had made a mistake— the omnibus came to the door presently, and she was handed into it, and her husband seated himself in the dim obscurity by her side. There was only one passenger, a wet farmer, wrapped in so many greatcoats, that being wet outside didn't matter to him, as he only gave other people cold. He wiped his muddy boots on Isabel's dress, the brown silk wedding dress, which she had worn all week, and Mrs. Gilbert made no effort to save the garment from his depredations. She leaned her head back in the corner of the omnibus while the luggage was being bumped upon the roof above her, and let down her veil. The slow tears gathered in her eyes and rolled down her pale cheeks. It was a mistake, a horrible and irreparable mistake, whose dismal consequences she must bear for ever and ever. She felt no dislike of George Gilbert, she neither liked nor disliked him, only he could not give her the kind of life she wanted. 
and by her marriage with him she was shut out for ever from the hope of such a life. No prince would ever come now, no accidental duke would fall in love with her black eyes, and lift her all at once to the bright regions she pined to inhabit. No, it was all over. She had sold her birthright for a vulgar mess of pottage. She had bartered all the chances of the future for a little relief to the monotony of the present, for a few wedding clothes, a card case with a new name on the cards contained in it, the brief distinction of being a bride. George spoke to her two or three times during the journey to Greybridge, but she only answered him in monosyllables. She had a headache, she said, that convenient feminine complaint which is an excuse for anything. She never once looked out of the window, though the road was new to her. She sat back in the dusky vehicle while George and the farmer talked local politics, and their talk mingled vaguely with her own misery. The darkness grew thicker in the low-roofed carriage, the voices of George and the farmer died drowsily away, and by and by there was snoring, whether from George or the farmer, Isabel did not care to think. She was thinking of Byron and of Napoleon I. Ah, to have lived in his time and followed him and slaved for him and died for him in that lonely island far out in the waste of waters. The tears fell faster as all her childish dreams came back upon her and arrayed themselves in cruel contrast with her new life. Mr. Buckstone's bright Irish heroine, when she had been singing her song in the cold city street, the song which she had dreamt will be the means of finding her lost nursling, sinks down at last upon a snow-covered doorstep, and sobs aloud because it all seems so real. Life seemed so real now to Isabel. She awakened suddenly to the knowledge that all her dreams were only dreams after all, and never had been likely to come true. As it was, they could never come true. She had set a barrier against the fulfillment of those bright visions, and she must abide by her own act. It was quite dark upon that wintry afternoon, when the omnibus stopped at the cock at Greybridge, and then there was more bumping about of the luggage before Isabel was handed out upon the pavement to walk home with her husband. Yes, they were to walk home. What was the use of a ten-pound note spent upon splendor in Merlington when the honeymoon was to close in degradation such as this? They walked home. The streets were sloppy, and there was mud in the lane where George's house stood. But it was only five or ten minutes' walk, as he said, and nobody in Greybridge would have dreamed of hiring a fly. So they walked home, with the luggage following on a truck, and when they came to the house there was only a dim glimmer in the red lamp over the surgery door. All the rest was dark, for George's letter to Mr. Jeffson had been posted too late, and the bride and bridegroom were not expected. Everybody knows the cruel bleakness which that simple fact involves. There were no fires in the rooms, no cheery show of preparation, and there was a faint odor of soft soap suggestive of recent cleaning. Mrs. Jeffson was up to her elbows in a flower-tub when the young master pulled his own door-bell, and she came out with her arms white and her face dirty to receive the newly married pair. She set a flaring tallow-candle on the parlour-table and knelt down to light the fire, exclaiming and wondering all the while at the unexpected arrival of Mr. Gilbert and his wife. "'My master's gone over to Coventford for some groceries, and we're all of a moodle-like, ma'am,' she said. "'But we must e'en do the best we can, and make all comfortable. Master Jarge said Monday as plain as words could speak when he went away, and the letter's not coom yet, so you may just excuse things not being straight.' Mrs. Jeffson might have gone on apologizing for some time longer, but she jumped up suddenly to attend upon Isabel— who had burst into a passion of hysterical sobbing. She was romantic, sensitive, impressionable, selfish, if you will, and her poor, untutored heart revolted against the utter ruin of her dreams. "'It is so miserable,' she sobbed. 
"'It all seems so miserable.' "'George came in from the stables, where he had been to see Brown Molly, "'and brought his wife some sal volatile in a wine-glass of water, "'and Mrs. Jeffson comforted the poor young creature.' and took her up to the half-prepared bedroom, where the carpets were still up, and where the whitewashed walls—it was an old-fashioned house, and the upper rooms had never been papered, and the bare boards looked cheerless and desolate in the light of a tallow candle. Mrs. Jeffson brought her young mistress a cup of tea, and sat down by the bedside while she drank it and talked to her and comforted her— though she did not entertain a very high opinion of a young lady who went into hysterics because there was no fire in her sitting-room. "'I dare say it did seem cold and lonesome and comfortless-like,' Miss Jeffson said, indulgently, "'but we'll get things nice in no time.' Isabel shook her head. "'You are very kind,' she said, "'but it wasn't that made me cry.' She closed her eyes, not because she was sleepy, but because she wanted Miss Jeffson to go away and leave her alone. Then, when the good woman had retired with cautious footsteps and closed the door, Mrs. George Gilbert slowly opened her eyes and looked at the things on which they were to open every morning for all her life to come. There was nothing beautiful in the room, certainly. There was a narrow mantelpiece with a few blocks of Derbyshire spar and other mineral productions, and above them there hung an old-fashioned engraving of some scriptural subject in a wooden frame painted black. There was a lumbering old wardrobe, or press, as it was called, of painted wood, with a good deal of paint chipped off. There was a painted dressing-table, a square looking-glass with brass ornamentation about the stand and frame, a glass in which George Gilbert's grandfather had looked at himself seventy years before. Isabel stared at the blank white walls, the gaunt shadows of the awkward furniture, with a horrible fascination. It was all so ugly, she thought, and her mind revolted against her husband as she remembered that he could have changed all this, and yet had left it in its bald hideousness. And all this time George was busy in his surgery, grinding his pestle in so cheerful a spirit that it seemed to fall into a kind of tune, and thinking how happy he was, now that Isabel Sleaford was his wife. End of chapter 10 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 11 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter 11. She only said, My life is weary. When the chill discomfort of that first evening at Greybridge was past and done with, Isabel felt a kind of remorseful regret for the mute passion of discontent and disappointment that had gone along with it. The keen sense of misery passed with the bad influence of the day and hour. In the sunlight her new home looked a little better, her new life seemed a little brighter. Yes, she would do her duty, she would be a good wife to dear George, who was so kind to her and loved her with such a generous devotion. She went to church with him at Greybridge for the first time on the morning after that dreary wet Saturday evening, and all through the sermon she thought of her new home, and what she would do to make it bright and pretty. The rector of Greybridge had chosen one of the obscurest texts in St. Paul's epistle to the Hebrews for his sermon that morning, and Isabel did not even try to understand him. She let her thoughts ramble away to carpets and curtains and china flower-pots and Venetian blinds and little bits of ornamentation which should transform George's house from its square nakedness into a bowery cottage. Oh, if the trees had only grown differently, if there had been trailing parasites climbing up to the chimneys and a sloping lawn and a belt of laurels and little winding pathways and a rustic seat— half hidden under a weeping willow, instead of that bleak flat of cabbages and gooseberry bushes and raw clods of earth piled in black ridges across the dreary waste. 
After church there was an early dinner of some baked meat, prepared by Mrs. Jeffson. Isabel did not take much notice of what she ate. She was at that early period of life when a young person of sentimental temperament scarcely knows roast beef from boiled veal. But she observed that there were steel forks on the surgeon's table. Steel forks, with knobby horn handles, suggestive of the wildest species of deer, and a metal mustard pot lined with blue glass, and willow-patterned plates, and a brown earthenware jug of home-brewed beer, and that everything was altogether commonplace and vulgar. After dinner Mrs. Gilbert amused herself by going over the house with her husband. It was a very tolerable house, after all, but it wasn't pretty. It had been inhabited by people who were fully satisfied so long as they had chairs to sit upon, and beds to sleep on, and tables and cups and plates for the common purposes of breakfast, dinner, and supper, and who would have regarded the purchase of a chair that was not intended to be sat upon, or a cup that was never designed to be drunk out of, as something useless and absurd, or even in an indirect manner sinful, because involving the waste of money that might be devoted to a better use. "'George,' said Isabel gently, when she had seen all the rooms, "'did you never think of refurnishing the house?' "'Refurnishing it? How do you mean, Izzy?' "'Buying new furniture, I mean, dear. This is all so old-fashioned.' George, the conservative, shook his head. "'I like it all the better for that, Izzy,' he said. "'It was my father's, you know, and his father's before him. "'I wouldn't change a stick of it for the world. "'Besides, it's such capital, substantial furniture. "'They don't make such chairs and tables nowadays.' "'No,' Izzy murmured with a sigh. "'I'm very glad they don't.' "'Then she clasped her hand suddenly upon his arm "'and looked up at him with her eyes open to their widest extent.' and shining with a look of rapture. "'Oh, George!' she cried. "'There was an ottoman in one of the shops at Conventford, with seats for three people, and little stands for people to put their cups and saucers upon, and a place in the middle for flowers. And I asked the price of it. I often ask the price of things, for it's almost like buying them, you know. And it was only eleven pounds ten, and I dare say they'd take less.' "'And, oh, George, if you'd make the best parlour into a drawing-room, "'and have that ottoman here in the centre, "'and chintz curtains lined with rose colour, "'and a white-watered paper on the walls, "'and Venetian shutters outside,' "'George put his hand upon the pretty mouth "'from which the eager words came so rapidly. "'Why, Izzy,' he said, "'you'd ruin me before half the year was out. "'All that finery would make a hole in a hundred pounds.' "'No, no, dear, the best parlour was good enough for my father and mother, "'and it ought to be good enough for you and me. "'By and by, when my practice extends, Izzy, as I've every reason to hope it will, "'we'll talk about a new Kittleminster carpet, "'a nice serviceable brown ground with a drab spot, or something of that kind. "'But until then—' "'Isabel turned away from him with a gesture of disgust.' "'What do I care about new carpets?' she said. "'I wanted it all to look pretty.' "'Yes, she wanted it to look pretty. "'She wanted to infuse some beauty into her life, "'something which, in however remote a degree, "'should be akin to the things she read of in her books. "'Everything that was beautiful gave her a thrill of happiness. "'Everything that was ugly gave her a shudder of pain.' and she had not yet learned that life was never meant to be all happiness, and that the soul must struggle toward the upper light out of a region of pain and darkness and confusion as the blossoming plant pushes its way to the sunshine from amongst dull clods of earth. She wanted to be happy and enjoy herself in her own way. She was not content to wait till her allotted portion of joy came to her and she mistook the power to appreciate and enjoy beautiful things for a kind of divine right to happiness and splendor. To say that George Gilbert did not understand his wife was to say very little. Nobody, except perhaps Sigismund Smith, had ever yet understood Isabel. She did not express herself better than other girls of her age, 
Sometimes she expressed herself worse, for she wanted to say so much, and a hopeless confusion would arise every now and then out of that entanglement of eager thought and romantic rapture which filled her brain. In Miss Sleaford's own home, people had been a great deal too occupied with the ordinary bustle of life to trouble themselves about a young lady's romantic reveries. Mrs. Sleaford had thought that she had said all that was to be said about Isabel when she had denounced her as a lazy, selfish thing who would have sat on the grass and read novels if the house had been blazing and all her family perishing in the flames. The boys had looked upon their half-sister with all that supercilious mixture of pity and contempt with which all boys are apt to regard any fellow-creature who is so weak-minded as to be a girl. Mr. Sleaford had been very fond of his daughter, but he had loved her chiefly because she was pretty, and because of those dark eyes whose like he had never seen except in the face of the young broken-hearted wife so early lost to him. Nobody had ever quite understood Isabel, and least of all could George Gilbert understand the woman whom he had chosen for his wife. He loved and admired her, and he was honestly anxious that she should be happy, but then he wanted her to be happy according to his ideas of happiness, and not her own. He wanted her to be delighted with stiff little tea-parties, at which the Mrs. Palkett and the Mrs. Burdock and young Mrs. Henry Palmer, wife of Mr. Henry Palmer, Jr., solicitor, discoursed pleasantly of the newest patterns in crochet and the last popular memoir of some departed evangelical curate. Isabel did not take any interest in these things, and could not make herself happy with these people. Unluckily, she allowed this to be seen, and after a few tea-parties the Greybridge aristocracy dropped away from her, only calling now and then, out of respect for George, who was heartily compassioned on account of his most mistaken selection of a wife. So Isabel was left to herself, and little by little fell back into very much the same kind of life as that which she had led at Camberwell. She had given up all thought of beautifying the house which was now her home. After that struggle about the ottoman, there had been many other struggles, in which Isabel had pleaded for smaller and less expensive improvements, only to be blighted by that hard common sense with which Mr. George Gilbert was wont, on principle, to crush his wife's enthusiasm. He had married this girl because she was unlike other women and now that she was his own property, he set himself conscientiously to work to smooth her into the most ordinary semblance of everyday womanhood by means of that moral flat-iron called common sense. Of course he succeeded to admiration. Isabel abandoned all hope of making her new home pretty, or transforming George Gilbert into a Walter Gay. She had made a mistake— and she accepted the consequences of her mistake, and fell back upon the useless, dreamy life she had led so long in her father's house. The surgeon's duties occupied him all day long, and Isabel was left to herself. She had none of the common distractions of a young matron. She had no servants to scold, no china to dust, no puddings or pies or soups or hashes to compound for her husband's dinner— Mrs. Jeffson did all that kind of work, and would have bitterly resented any interference from the slip of a girl whom Mr. Gilbert had chosen for his wife. Isabel did as she liked, and this meant reading novels all day long, or as long as she had a novel to read, and writing unfinished verses of a lachrymose nature on half-sheets of paper. When the spring came she went out alone for her husband was away among his patients, and had no time to accompany her. She went for long rambles in that lovely Elizabethan Midlandshire, and thought of the life that never was to be hers. She wandered alone in the country lanes where the hedgerows were budding, and sat alone with her book on her lap, among the buttercups and daisies in the shady angle of a meadow, where the untrimmed hawthorns made a natural bower above her head. Stray pedestrians crossing the meadows near Greybridge often found the doctor's young wife sitting under a big green parasol with a little heap of gathered wild flowers fading on the grass beside her, 
and with an open book upon her knees. Sometimes she went as far as Thurston's Crag, the Midlandshire seat of Lord Thurston, a dear old place, an island of medieval splendor amidst a sea of green pasture-land, where, under the very shadow of a noble mansion, there was a waterfall and a miller's cottage that was difficult to believe in out of a picture. There was a wooden bridge across that noisiest of waterfalls, and a monster oak whose spreading branches shadowed all the width of the water, and it was on a rough wooden bench under this dear old tree that Isabel loved best to sit. The Greybridge people were not slow to remark upon Mrs. Gilbert's habits, and hinted that a young person who spent so much of her time in the perusal of works of fiction could scarcely be a model wife. Before George had been married three months, the ladies who had been familiar with him in his bachelorhood had begun to pity him, and had already mapped out for him such a career of domestic wretchedness as rarely falls to the lot of afflicted man. Mrs. Gilbert was not pretty. The Greybridge lady settled that question at the very first tea-party from which George and his wife were absent. She was not pretty when you looked into her. That was the point upon which the feminine critics laid great stress. At a distance, certainly, Mrs. Gilbert might look showy. The lady who hit upon the adjective showy was very much applauded by her friends. At a distance, Isabel might be called showy, always provided you like eyes that are so large as only by a miracle to escape from being goggles, and lips that are so red as to be unpleasantly suggestive of scarlet fever. But look into Mrs. Gilbert, and even this show of beauty vanished, and you only saw a sickly young person with insignificant features and coarse black hair, so coarse and common in texture that its abnormal length and thickness, of which Isabel was no doubt inordinately proud, were very little to boast of. But while the Greybridge ladies criticized his wife, and prophesied for him all manner of dismal sufferings, George Gilbert, strange to say, was very happy. He had married the woman he loved, and no thought that he had loved unwisely or married hastily ever entered his mind. When he came home from a long day's work, he found a beautiful creature waiting to receive him, a lovely and lovable creature who put her arms around his neck and kissed him and smiled at him. It was not in his nature to see that the graceful little embrace and the welcoming kiss and the smile were rather mechanical matters that came of themselves. He took his dinner or his weak tea or his supper, as the case might be, and stretched his long legs across the familiar hearth-rug and talked to his wife and was happy. If she had an open book beside her plate, and if her eyes wandered to the page every now and then while he was talking to her, she had often told him that she could listen and read at the same time, and no doubt she could do so. What more than sweet smiles and gentle looks could the most exacting husband demand? And George Gilbert had plenty of these, for Isabel was very grateful to him, because he never grumbled at her idleness and novel reading, or worried and scolded, as her stepmother had done. She was fond of him, as she would have been fond of a big elder brother, who let her have a good deal of her own way. And so long as he left her unassailed by his common sense, she was happy, and tolerably satisfied with her life. Yes, she was satisfied with her life, which was the same every day, and with the dull old town, where no change ever came. She was satisfied as an opium-eater is satisfied with the common everyday world, which is only the frame that holds together all manner of splendid and ever-changing pictures. She was content with a life in which she had ample leisure to dream of a different existence. Oh, how she thought of that other and brighter life, that life in which there was passion and poetry and beauty and rapture and despair— here, among these meadows and winding waters and hedgerows, life was a long sleep, and one might as well be a brown-eyed cow browsing from week's end to week's end in the same pastures as a beautiful woman with an eager, yearning soul. Mrs. Gilbert thought of London, 
that wonderful West End Mayfair London, which has no attribute in common with all the great metropolitan wilderness around and about it. She thought of that holy of holies, that inner sanctuary of life, in which all the women are beautiful and all the men are wicked, in which existence is a perpetual whirlpool of balls and dinner-parties and hothouse flowers and despair. She thought of that untasted life, and pictured it, and thrilled with a sense of its splendor and brightness, as she sat by the brawling waterfall, and heard the creaking wheel of the mill, and the splashing of the trailing weeds. She saw herself amongst the light and music of that other world, queen of a lamp-lit boudoir, where loose patches of ermine gleamed whitely upon carpets of velvet pile, where, amid a confusion of glitter and color, she might sit nestling among the cushions of a low gilded chair, and listening contemptuously, she always imagined herself contemptuous, to the eloquent compliments of a wicked prince. And then the row, she saw herself in the row sometimes upon an Arab, a black Arab, that would run away with her at the most fashionable time in the afternoon, and all but kill her and then she would rein him up, as no mortal woman ever reined in an Arab steed before, and would ride slowly back between two ranks of half-scared, half-admiring faces, with her hair hanging over her shoulders, and her eyelashes drooping on her flushed cheeks. And then the wicked prince, goaded by an unvarying course of contemptuous treatment, would fall ill and be at the point of death, and one night, when she was at a ball, with floating robes of cloud-like lace and diamonds glimmering in her hair, he would send for her. That wicked, handsome, adorable creature would send his valet to summon her to his deathbed. And she would see him there in the dim lamplight, pale and repentant, and romantic and delightful, and as she fell on her knees in all the splendor of her lace and diamonds, he would break a blood vessel and die and then she would go back to the ball, and would be the gayest and most beautiful creature in all that whirlpool of elegance and beauty. Only the next morning, when her attendants came to awaken her, they would find her dead. Amongst the books which Mrs. Gilbert most often carried to the bench by the waterfall was the identical volume which Charles Raymond had looked at in such a contemptuous spirit, in Hurstonleigh Grove, the little thin volume of poems entitled An Alien's Dreams. Mr. Raymond had given his nursery governess a parcel of light literature soon after her marriage, and this poor little book of verses was one of the volumes in the parcel, and as Isabel knew her Byron and her Shelley by heart, and could recite long melancholy rhapsodies from the works of either poet by the hour together, she fastened quite eagerly upon this little green-covered volume by a nameless writer. The alien's dreams seemed like her own fancies, somehow, for they belonged to that bright other world which she was never to see. How familiar the alien was with that delicious region, and how lightly he spoke of the hothouse flowers and diamonds, the ermine carpets and Arab steeds. She read the poems over and over again in that drowsy June weather, sitting in the shabby little common parlor, where the afternoons were too hot for outdoor rambles, and getting up now and again to look at her profile in the glass over the mantelpiece, and to wonder whether she was like any of those gorgeous but hollow-hearted creatures upon whom the alien showered such torrents of melodious abuse. Who was the alien? Isabel had asked Mr. Raymond that question, and had been a little crashed by the reply. The alien was a Midlandshire squire, Mr. Raymond had told her, and the word squire suggested nothing but a broad-shouldered, rosy-faced man in a scarlet coat and top-boots. Surely no squire could have written those half-heartbroken, half-cynical verses, those deliciously scornful elegies upon the hollowness of lovely woman— and things in general. Isabel had her own image of the writer, her own ideal poet, who rose in all his melancholy glory and pushed the red-coated country squire out of her mind when she sat with the alien's dreams in her lap, 
or scribbled weak imitations of that gentleman's poetry upon the backs of old envelopes and other scraps of waste paper. Sometimes, when George had eaten his supper, Isabel would do him the favor of reading aloud one of the most spasmodic of the alien's dreams, but when the alien was most melodiously cynical, and the girl's voice tremulous with sudden exaltation of feeling, her eyes, wandering by chance to where her husband sat, would watch him yawning behind his glass of ale, or reckoning a patient's account on the square tips of his fingers. On one occasion poor George was terribly perplexed to behold his wife suddenly drop her book upon her lap and burst into tears. He could imagine no reason for her weeping, and he sat aghast, staring at her for some moments before he could utter any word of consolation. "'You don't care for poetry, George,' she cried with the sudden passion of a spoiled child. "'Oh, why do you let me read to you if you don't care for poetry?' "'But I do care for it, Izzy, dear,' Mr. Gilbert murmured soothingly. "'At least I like to hear you read it, if it amuses you.' Isabel flung the alien into the remotest corner of the little parlor, and turned from her husband, as if he had stung her. "'You don't understand me,' she said. "'You don't understand me.' "'No, Isabel, my dear,' returned Mr. Gilbert, with dignity, for his common sense reasserted itself after the first shock of surprise. "'I certainly do not understand you when you give way to such temper as this, without any visible cause.' He walked over to the corner of the room, picked up the little volume, and smoothed the crumpled leaves, for his habits were orderly, and the sight of a book lying open upon the carpet was unpleasant to him. Of course poor George was right, and Isabel was a very capricious, ill-tempered young woman when she flew into a passion of rage and grief because her husband counted his fingers while she was reading to him. But then such little things as these made the troubles of people who are spared from the storm and tempest of life. Such sorrows as these are the scotch mists, the drizzling rains of existence. The weather doesn't appear so very bad to those who behold it from a window, but that sort of scarcely perceptible drizzle chills the hapless pedestrian to the very bone. I have heard of a lady who was an exquisite musician, and who in the dusky twilight of a honeymoon evening played to her husband, played as some women play, pouring out all her soul upon the keys of the piano, breathing her finest and purest thoughts into one of Beethoven's sublime sonatas. "'That's a very pretty tune,' said the husband, complacently. She was a proud, reserved woman, and she closed the piano without a word of complaint or disdain, but she lived to be old, and she never touched the keys again. End of chapter 11 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 12 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 12 Something Like a Birthday it happened that the very day after Isabel's little outbreak of passion was a peculiar occasion in George Gilbert's life. It was the 2nd of July, and it was his wife's birthday, the first birthday after her marriage, and the young surgeon had planned a grand treat and surprise, quite an elaborate festival, in honor of the day. He had been, therefore, especially wounded by Isabel's ill temper. Had he not been thinking of her, and of her pleasure, at the very moment when she had upbraided him for his lack of interest in the alien? He did not care about the alien. He did not appreciate, Clotilde, Clotilde, my dark Clotilde, with the sleepy light in your midnight glance. We let the dancers go by to dance, but we stayed out on the lamplit stair, and the odorous breath of your trailing hair swept over my face as your whispers stole, like a gush of melody through my soul, Clotilde, Clotilde, my own Clotilde. But he loved his wife, and was anxious to please her, and he had schemed and plotted to do her pleasure. He had hired a fly, an open fly, for the whole day, 
and Mrs. Jeffson had prepared a basket with port and sherry from the cock, and all manner of north-country delicacies, and George had written to Mr. Raymond, asking that gentleman, with the orphans, of course, to meet himself and his wife at Morncliffe Castle, the show-place of the county. This Mr. Raymond had promised to do, and all the arrangements had been carefully planned, and had been kept profoundly secret from Isabel. She was very much pleased when her husband told her of the festival early on that bright summer morning, while she was plaiting her long black hair at the little glass before the open lattice. She ran to the wardrobe to see if she had a clean muslin dress. Yes, there it was, the very lavender muslin which she had worn at the Hurstonleigh picnic. George was delighted to see her pleasure, and he sat on the window-sill watching her as she arranged her collar and fastened a little bow of ribbon at her throat, and admired herself in the glass. "'I want it to be like that day last year, Izzy, the day I asked you to marry me. Mr. Raymond will bring the key of Hurstonleigh Grove, and we're to drive there after we've seen the castle, and picnic there as we did before, and then we're to go to the very identical model old woman's to tea, and everything will be exactly the same.' "'Ah, Mr. George Gilbert, do you know the world so little as to be ignorant that no day in life ever has its counterpart, and that to endeavour to bring about an exact repetition of any given occasion is to attempt the impossible?' It was a six-mile drive from Greybridge to Warncliffe, the grave old country town, the dear old town with shady pavements and abutting upper stories, pointed gables and diamond-paned casements, the queer old town with wonderful churches and gloomy archways, and steep stony streets, and, above all, the grand old castle, the black towers and keep, and turrets and gloomy basement dungeons, lashed for ever and for ever by the blue rippling water. I have never seen Warncliffe Castle except in the summer sunshine, and my hand seems paralyzed when I try to write of it. It is easy to invent a castle and go into raptures about the ivied walls and mouldering turrets, but I shrink away before the grand reality, and can describe nothing. I see it all too plainly, and feel the tameness of my words too much. But in summer time this Elizabethan Midlandshire is an English paradise, endowed with all the wealth of natural loveliness, enriched by the brightest associations of poetry and romance. Mr. Raymond was waiting at the little doorway when the fly stopped, and he gave Isabel his arm, and led her into a narrow winding alley of verdure and rockwork, and then across a smooth lawn, and under an arch of solid masonry to another lawn, a velvety grass plat, surrounded by shrubberies, and altogether a triumph of landscape gardening. They went into the castle with a little group of visitors who had just collected on the broad steps before the door and they were taken at once under the convoy of a dignified housekeeper in a rustling silk gown, who started off in a viva voce catalogue of the contents of the castle hall, a noble chamber with armor-clad effigies of dead-and-gone warriors ranged along the walls, with notched battle-axes and cloven helmets and monster antlers, and Indian wampum and Canadian wolf-skins and Australian boomerangs, hanging against the wainscot, with carved oak and ebony muniment chests upon the floor, and with three deep embayed windows overhanging the brightest landscape, the fairest streamlet in England. While the housekeeper was running herself down like a musical box that had been newly wound up, and with as much animation and expression in her tones as there is in a popular melody interpreted by a musical box, Mr. Raymond led Isabel to the window, and showed her the blue waters of the Wavern bubbling and boiling over craggy masses of rockwork, green boulders, and pebbles that shimmered in the sunlight, and then playing hide-and-seek under dripping willows, brawling away over emerald moss and golden sand, to fall with a sudden impetus into the quiet depths beneath the bridge. "'Look at that, my dear,' said Mr. Raymond. "'That isn't in the catalogue.' I'll tell you all about the castle, and we'll treat the lady in the silk dress as they treat the organ-boys in London, 
"'We'll give her half a crown to move on and leave us to look at the pictures and the boomerangs and the armor and the tapestry and the identical toilet table and pin-cushion in which her gracious majesty stuck the pin she took out of her bonnet-string when she took luncheon with Lord Warncliffe a year or two ago. "'That's the gem of the catalogue in the housekeeper's opinion, I know. We'll look at all the pictures by ourselves, Mrs. Gilbert, and I'll tell you all about them.' To my mind, Warncliffe Castle is one of the pleasantest show-places in the kingdom. There are not many rooms to see, nor are they large rooms. There are not many pictures, but the few in every room are of the choicest, and are hung on a level with the eye, and do not necessitate the straining of the spinal column which makes the misery of most picture-galleries. Warncliffe Castle is like an elegant little dinner— there are not many dishes, and everything is so good that you wish there were more. And at Warncliffe the sunny chambers have the extra charm of looking as if people lived in them. You see not only Murillos and Titians, Lilies and Van Dykes upon the walls, you see tables scattered with books and women's handiwork here and there, and whichever way you turn there is always the noisy waver and brawling and rippling under the windows, and the green expanse of meadow, and the glory of purple woodland beyond. Isabel moved through the rooms in a silent rapture, but yet there was a pang of anguish lurking somewhere or other amid that rapture. Her dreams were all true, then. There were such places as this, and people lived in them, happy people, for whom life was all loveliness and poetry, looked out of those windows and lolled in those antique chairs, and lived all their lives amidst caskets of Florentine mosaic and portraits by Van Dyck, and marble busts of Roman emperors, and gobelin tapestries, and a hundred objects of art and beauty whose very names were a strange language to Isabel. For some people life was like this, and for her— She shuddered as she remembered the parlors at Greybridge— the shabby carpet, the faded moreen curtains edged with rusty velvet, the cracked jars and vases on the mantelpiece, and even if George had given her all that she had asked, the ottoman and the Venetian blind and the rose-colored curtains, what would have been the use? Her room would never have looked like this. She gazed about her in a sort of walking dream, intoxicated by the beauty of the place. She was looking like this when Mr. Raymond led her into one of the larger rooms and showed her a little picture in a corner, a Tintoretto, which he said was a gem. She looked at the Tintoretto in a drowsy kind of way. It was a very brown gem, and its beauties were quite beyond Mrs. Gilbert's appreciation. She was not thinking of the picture. She was thinking if, by some romantic ledger domain, she could turn out to be the rightful heiress of such a castle as this, with a river like the Wavern brawling under her windows, and trailing willow branches dipping into the water. There was some such childish thought as this in her mind when Mr. Raymond was enlarging upon the wonderful finish and modeling of the Venetian's masterpiece, and she was aroused from her reverie not by her companion's remarks, but by a woman's voice on the other side of the room. "'You so rarely see that contrast of fair hair and black eyes,' said the voice, "'and there is something peculiar in those eyes.' There was nothing particular in the words. It was the tone in which they were spoken that caught Isabel Gilbert's ear, the tone in which Lady Clara Vere de Vere herself might have spoken, a tone in which there was a lazy hauteur softened by womanly gentleness, a drawling accent which had yet no affectation, only a kind of liquid carrying on of the voice like a legato passage in music. "'Yes,' returned another voice, which had all the laziness and none of the hauteur, "'It is a pretty face. Joanna of Naples, isn't it? She was an improper person, wasn't she? Threw someone out of a window and made herself altogether objectionable?' Mr. Raymond wheeled round as suddenly as if he had received an electric shock, and ran across the room to a gentleman who was lounging in a half-reclining attitude upon one of the broad window-seats. "'Why, Roland, I thought you were at Corfu!' The gentleman got up with a kind of effort and the faintest suspicion of a yawn, but his face brightened nevertheless as he held out his hand to Isabel's late employer. "'My dear Raymond, how glad I am to see you. 
I meant to ride over to-morrow morning for a long day's talk. I only came home last night to please my uncle and cousin, who met me at Baden, and insisted on bringing me home with them. You know Gwendolen? Ah, yes, of course you do. A lady with fair banded hair and an aquiline nose, a lady in a bonnet which was simplicity itself, and could only have been produced by a milliner who had perfected herself in the supreme art of concealing her art, dropped the double eyeglass through which she had been looking at Joanna of Naples, and held out a hand so exquisitely gloved that it looked as if it had been sculptured out of grey marble. "'I am afraid Mr. Raymond has forgotten me,' she said. "'Papa and I have been so long away from Midlandshire, and Lowlands was beginning to look like quite a deserted habitation. I used to think of Hood's haunted house whenever I rode by your gates, Lady Gwendolen. But you have come home for good now, as if you could come for anything but good,' interjected Mr. Raymond gallantly. "'You have come with the intention of stopping, I hope?' "'Yes,' Lady Gwendolen answered, with something like a sigh. "'Papa and I mean to settle in Midlandshire. He has let the Clarges Street house for a time, sold his lease at least, I think, or something of that sort, and we know every nook and corner of the continent, so I suppose that really the best thing we can do is to settle at Lowlands. But I suppose we shan't keep Roland long in the neighbourhood. He'll get tired of us in a fortnight and run away to the Pyrenees, or Cairo, or Central Africa, anywhere, anywhere, out of the world.' "'It isn't of you that I shall get tired, Gwendolen,' said the gentleman called Roland, who had dropped back into his old lounging attitude on the window-seat. "'It's myself that bores me, the only bore a man can't cut. But I'm not going to run away from Midlandshire. I shall go in for stream-farming and agricultural implements and drainage. I should think drainage now would have a very elevating influence upon a man's mind.' and I shall send my short horns to Smithfield next Christmas, and you shall teach me political economy, Raymond, and will improve the condition of the farm labourer, and will offer a prize for the best essay on, say, classical agriculture as revealed to us in the writings of Virgil. That's the sort of thing for a farm labourer, I should think, and Gwendolen shall give the prizes a blue ribbon and a gold medal and a frieze coat or a pair of top boots." Isabel still lingered by the Tintoretto. She was aghast at the fact that Mr. Raymond knew, and was even familiar with, these beings. Yes, beings, creatures of that remote sphere which she only knew in her dreams. Standing near the Tintoretto, she ventured to look very timidly toward these radiant creatures. What did she see? A young man, half reclining in the deep embrasure of a window, with the summer sunshine behind him and the summer breezes fluttering his loose brown hair, that dark, rich brown, which is only a warmer kind of black. She saw a man upon whom beneficent or capricious nature, in some fantastic moment, had lavished all the gifts that men most covet and that women most admire. She saw one of the handsomest faces ever seen since Napoleon, the young conqueror of Italy, first dazzled, regenerated France, a kind of face that is only familiar to us in a few old Italian portraits, a beautiful, dreamy, perfect face, exquisite alike in form and color. I do not think that any words of mine can realize Roland Lansdell's appearance. I can only briefly catalogue the features, which were perfect in their way, and yet formed so small an item in the homogeneous charm of this young man's appearance. The nose was midway between an aquiline and a Grecian nose, but it was in the chiseling of the nostril, the firmness and yet delicacy of the outline, that it differed from other noses. The forehead was of medium height, broad and full at the temples. The head was strong in the perceptive faculties, very strong in benevolence, altogether wanting in destructiveness. But Mr. Raymond could have told you that veneration and conscientiousness were deficient in Roland Lansdell's cranium, a deficiency sorely to be lamented by those who knew and loved the young man. His eyes and mouth formed the chief beauty of his face, and yet I can describe neither, for their chief charm lay in the fact that they were indescribable. The eyes were of a nondescript color, the mouth was ever varying in expression, 
Sometimes you looked at the eyes, and they seemed to you a darkish blue-gray. Sometimes they were hazel, sometimes you were half beguiled into fancying them black, and the mouth was somehow in harmony with the eyes, inasmuch as, looking at it one minute, you saw an expression of profound melancholy in the thin, flexible lips, and then in the next a cynical smile. Very few people ever quite understood Mr. Lansdell, and perhaps this was his highest charm. To be puzzled is the next thing to being interested. To be interested is to be charmed. Yes, capricious nature had showered her gifts upon Roland Lansdell. She had made him handsome, and had attuned his voice to a low, melodious music, and had made him sufficiently clever, and beyond all this had bestowed upon him that subtle attribute of grace which she and she alone can bestow. He was always graceful. Involuntarily and unconsciously he fell into harmonious attitudes. He could not throw himself into a chair, or rest his elbow upon a table, or lean against the angle of a doorway, or stretch himself full length upon the grass to fall asleep with his head upon the folded arms, without making himself into a kind of picture. He looked like a picture just now, as he lounged in the castle window with his face turned toward Mr. Raymond. The lady, who was called Lady Gwendolen, put up her eyeglass to look at another picture, and in that attitude Isabel had time to contemplate her, and saw that she too was graceful, and that in every fold of her simple dress, it was only muslin, but quite a different fabric from Isabel's muslin, there was an indescribable harmony which stamped her as the creature of that splendid sphere which the girl only knew in her books. She looked longer and more earnestly at Lady Gwendolen than at Roland Lansdell, for in this elegant being she saw the image of herself as she fancied herself so often, the image of a heartless aristocratic divinity for whose sake people cut their throats and broke blood vessels and drowned themselves. George came in while his wife was looking at Lady Gwendolen, and Mr. Raymond suddenly remembered the young couple whom he had taken upon himself to chaperone. "'I must introduce you to some new friends of mine, Roland,' he said, "'and when you are ill you must send for Mr. Gilbert of Greybridge, who, I am given to understand, is a very clever surgeon, and whom I know to have the best moral region I ever had under my hand.' "'Gilbert, my dear boy, this is Roland Lansdell of Mordred Priory. Lady Gwendolen, Mrs. Gilbert, Mr. Lansdell. But you know something about my friend, I think, don't you, Isabel?' Mrs. Gilbert bowed and smiled and blushed in a pleasant bewilderment. To be introduced to two beings in this offhand manner was almost too much for Mr. Sleaford's daughter— a faint perfume of jasmine and orange blossom floated toward her from Lady Gwendolen's handkerchief, and she seemed to see the fair-haired lady who smiled at her, and the dark-haired gentleman who had risen at her approach, through an odorous mist that confused her senses. "'I think you know something of my friend Roland,' Mr. Raymond repeated. "'Eh, my dear?' "'Oh, n no, indeed,' Isabel stammered. "'I, I never saw—' "'You never saw him before to-day,' answered Mr. Raymond, laying his hand on the young man's shoulder with a kind of protecting tenderness in the gesture. "'But you've read his verses, those pretty drawing-room Byronics that refined and anglicized Alfred de Musseyism that you told me you were so fond of. Don't you remember asking me who wrote the verses, Mrs. Gilbert? I told you the alien was a country squire.' "'And here he is, a Midlandshire squire of high degree, as the old ballad has it.' Isabel's heart gave a great throb, and her pale face flushed all over with a faint carnation. To be introduced to a being was something, but to be introduced to a being who was also a poet, and the very poet whose rhapsodies were her last and favorite idolatry, she could not speak. She tried to say something, something very commonplace, to the effect that the verses were very pretty, and she liked them very much, thank you, but the words refused to come, and her lips only trembled. Before she could recover her confusion, Mr. Raymond had hooked his arm through that of Roland Lansdell, and the two men had walked off together, talking with considerable animation, for Charles Raymond was a kind of adopted father to the owner of Mordred Priory, 
and was about the only man whom Roland had ever loved or trusted. Isabel was left by the open window with Lady Gwendolen and George, whose common sense preserved him serene and fearless in the presence of these superior creatures. "'You like my cousin's poetry, then, Mrs. Gilbert?' said Lady Gwendolen. Her cousin, the dark-haired being, was cousin to this fair-haired being in the Parisian bonnet, a white chip bonnet with just one feathery sprig of mountain heather and broad, thick, white silk strings tied under an aristocratic chin, a determined chin, Mr. Raymond would have told Isabel. Mrs. Gilbert took heart of grace, now that Roland Lansdell was out of hearing, and said, "'Oh, yes, she was very, very fond of the alien's dreams. They were so very sweetly pretty.' "'Yes, they are pretty,' Lady Gwendolen said, seating herself by the window and playing with her bonnet strings as she spoke. "'They are graceful.' "'Do sit down, Mrs. Gilbert. "'These show-places are so fatiguing. "'I am waiting for Papa, who is talking politics "'with some Midlandshire people in the hall. "'I am very glad you like Roland's verses. "'They are not very original. "'All the young men write the same kind of poetry nowadays, "'a sort of mixture of Tennyson and Edgar Poe and Alfred de Musset. "'It reminds me of Bath's music somehow. "'It pleases, and one catches the melody.' without knowing how or why. The book made a little sensation. The Westminster was very complimentary. But the quarterly was dreadful. I remember Roland reading the article and laughing at it, but he looked like a man who tries to be funny in tight boots, and he called it by some horrible slang term, a slate, I think he said. Isabel had said nothing to this. She had never heard that the quarterly was a popular review, and, indeed, the adjective quarterly had only one association for her, and that was rent, which had been almost as painful a subject as taxes in the Camberwell household. Lady Gwendolen's papa came in presently to look for his daughter. He was Angus Pierpont Aubrey Amorot Pomfrey, Earl of Reesdale, but he wore a black coat and grey trousers and waistcoat, just like other people, and had thick boots and didn't look a bit like an earl, Isabel thought. He said, "'Ha, oh, hum, yes, to be sure, my dear,' when Lady Gwendolen told him she was ready to go home. "'Been talking to Witherston, very good fellow, Witherston, wants to get his son returned for Conventford general election next year, liberal interest.' "'Very gentlemanly young fellow, the son. "'Then he went to look for Roland, "'whom he found in the next room with Charles Raymond, "'and then Lady Gwendolen wished Isabel good morning, "'and said something very kind, "'to the effect they should most likely meet again before long, "'Lowlands being so near Greybridge, "'and then the Earl offered his arm to his daughter. "'She took it, but she looked back at her cousin, "'who was talking to Mr. Raymond,' and glancing every now and then in a half-amused, half-admiring way at Isabel. "'I am so glad to think you like my wretched scribble, Mrs. Gilbert,' he said, going up to her presently. Isabel blushed again and said, "'Oh, thank you. Yes, they are very pretty.' And it was as much as she could do to avoid calling Mr. Lansdell sir or your lordship. "'You are coming with us, I suppose, Roland?' "'Lady Gwendolen said. "'Oh, yes, that is to say, I'll see you to the carriage. "'I thought you were coming to luncheon. "'No, I meant to come, but I must see that fellow Percival, "'the lawyer you know, Gwendolen, "'and I want to have a little more talk with Raymond. "'You'll go on and show Mrs. Gilbert the Murillo in the next room, Raymond, "'and I'll run and look for my cousin's carriage, and then come back. "'We can find the carriage very well without you, Roland,' "'Lady Gwendolen answered quickly. "'Come, papa.' The young man stopped, and a little shadow darkened over his face. "'Did you really ask me to luncheon?' he said. "'You really volunteered to come after breakfast this morning, when you proposed bringing us here?' "'Did I? Oh, very well. In that case I shall let the Percival business stand over, and I shall ride to Oakbank tomorrow morning, Raymond, and lie on the grass and talk to you all day long, if you'll let me waste your time for once in a way.' "'Good-bye. Good morning, Mrs. Gilbert. 
"'By the by, how do you mean to finish the day, Raymond?' "'I'm going to take Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert to Hurstonleigh Grove, or rather they take me, for they've brought a basket that reminds one of the Derby Day. We're going to picnic in the Grove and drink tea at a cottage in honour of Isabel's Mrs. Gilbert's birthday. You must come and picnic at Mordred some day. It's not as pretty as Hurstonleigh, but we'll manage to find a rustic spot. If you care for partridges, Mr. Gilbert, you'll find plenty in the woods round Mordred next September. The young man put on his hat, and went after his cousin and her father. Isabel saw him walk along the bright vista of rooms, and disappear in a burst of sunshine that flooded the great hall when the door was opened. The beings were gone. For a brief interval she had been breathing the poetry of life. But she fell back now into the sober prose— and thought that half the grandeur of the castle was gone with those aristocratic visitors. "'And how do you like my young kinsman?' Mr. Raymond asked presently. Isabel looked at him with surprise. "'He is your relation, Mr. Lansdell?' "'Yes, my mother was a Lansdell. There's a sort of cousinship between Roland and me. He's a good fellow, a very noble-hearted, high-minded young fellow, but—' "'But what?' Mr. Raymond broke off with so deep a sigh that Isabel imagined an entire romance upon the strength of the inspiration. "'Has he done anything wicked, that dark, beautiful creature, who only wanted the soul-harrowing memory of a crime to render him perfect? Had he fled his country, like Byron, or buried a fellow-creature in a cave, like Mr. Aram?' Isabel's eyes opened to their widest extent, and Charles Raymond answered that inquiring glance. "'I sigh when I speak of Roland,' he said, "'because I know the young man is not happy. He stands quite alone in the world, and has more money than he knows how to spend. Two very bad things for a young man. He's handsome and fascinating, another disadvantage, and he's brilliant without being a genius.' In short, he's just the sort of man to dawdle away the brightest years of his life in the drawing-rooms of a lot of women, and take to writing cynical trash about better men in his old age. I can see only one hope of redemption for him, and that is a happy marriage, a marriage with a sensible woman who would get the whip-hand of him before he knew where he was. All the luckiest and happiest men have been henpecked. Look at the fate of the men who won't be henpecked. Look at Swift. He was a lord of the creation, and made the women fear him. Look at him driveling and doting under the care of a servant-maid. Look at Stern, and Byron, who outraged his wife, in fact, and satirized her in fiction. Were their lives so much the better because they scorned the gentle guidance of the apron-string? "'Depend upon it, Mrs. Gilbert, the men who lead great lives and do noble deeds and die happy deaths are married men who obey their wives. I'm a bachelor, so of course I speak without prejudice. I do most heartily wish that Roland Lansdell may marry a good and sensible woman.' "'A good and sensible woman!' Isabel gave an involuntary shudder. Surely, of all the creatures upon this overpopulated earth, a sensible woman was the very last whom Roland Lansdell ought to marry. He should marry some lovely being in perpetual white muslin, with long, shimmering golden hair. The dark men always married fair women in Isabel's novels. A creature who would sit at his feet and watch with him as a start watched with Manfred till dismal hours in the silent night and who should be consumptive, and should die some evening, promiscuously, as Mrs. Gamp would say, with flowers upon her breast and a smile upon her face. Isabel knew very little more of the pictures, or the men in armour, or the cannon in the chambers that yet remained to be seen at Warncliffe Castle. She was content to let Mr. Raymond and her husband talk. George admired the cannon, and the old-fashioned locks and keys, and the model of a cathedral made by a poor man out of old champagne corks, and a very few other curiosities of the same order, and he enjoyed himself, and was happy to see that his wife was pleased. He could tell that by the smile upon her lips, though she said so little. 
The drive from Warncliffe to Hurstonleigh Grove was as beautiful as the drive from Greybridge to Warncliffe, for this part of Midlandshire is a perpetual park. Isabel sat back in the carriage and thought of Lady Gwendolen's aristocratic face and white chip bonnet, and wondered whether she was the sensible woman whom Roland Lansdell would marry. They would be a very handsome couple. Mrs. Gilbert could fancy them riding Arabs. Nobody worth speaking of ever rode anything but Arab horses, in Isabel's fancy, in Rotten Row. She could see Lady Gwendolen with a cavalier hat and a long sweeping feather, and Roland Lansdell bending over her horse's neck to talk to her as they rode along. She fancied them in that glittering saloon, which was one of the stock scenes always ready to be pushed on the stage of her imagination. She fancied them in the midst of that brilliant supernumerary throng who waited upon the footsteps of heroes and heroines. She pictured them to herself going down to the grave through an existence of dinner parties and rotten row and balls and ascot cups. Ah, what a happy life, what a glorious destiny! The picnic seemed quite a tame thing after these reveries in the carriage. The orphans met their uncle at the lodge gate, and they all went across the grass, just as they had gone before, to the little low iron gate which Mr. Raymond was privileged to open with a special key, and into the grove where the wonderful beeches and oaks made a faint summer darkness. Was it the same grove? To Isabel it looked as if it had been made smaller since that other picnic, and the waterfall, and the woodland vistas, and the winding paths, and the arbor where they were to dine. It was all very well for the orphans to clap their hands, and disport themselves upon the grass, and dart off at a tangent every now and then to gather inconvenient wild flowers. But, after all, there was nothing so very beautiful in Hurstonleigh Grove. Isabel wandered a little way by herself, while Mr. Raymond and George and the orphans unpacked the basket. She liked to be alone, that she might think of Lady Gwendolen and her cousin. Lady Gwendolen Pomfrey! Oh, how grand it sounded! Why, to have such a name as that would alone be bliss! but to be called Gwendolen Pomfrey, and to wear a white chip bonnet with that heavenly sprig of heather just trembling on the brim, and those broad, carelessly tied, unapproachable strings, and then, like the sudden fall of a curtain in a brilliant theatre, the scene darkened, and Isabel thought of her own life, the life to which she must go back when it was dark that night, the common parlour, or the best parlour, what was the distinction in their dismal wretchedness that one should be called better than the other? The bread and cheese, the radishes, and, oh, how George could eat radishes, crunch, 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 till madness would have been relief. This unhappy girl fell a blank despair as she thought of her commonplace home, her home for ever and ever, unbrightened by a hope, unsanctified by a memory. Her home, in which she had a comfortable shelter, and enough to eat and to drink, and decent garments with which to cover herself, and where, had she been a good or sensible young woman, she ought, of course, to have been happy. But she was not happy. The slow fever that had been burning so long in her veins was now a rapid and consuming fire. She wanted a bright life, a happy life, a beautiful life— she wanted to be like Lady Gwendolen, and to live in a house like Warncliffe Castle. It was not that she envied Lord Reesdale's daughter, remember. Envy had no part in her nature. She admired Gwendolen Pomfrey too much to envy her. She would like to have been the elegant creature's youngest sister, and to have worshipped her and imitated her in a spirit of reverence. She had none of the radicals' desire to tear the trappings from the bloated aristocrat, she only wanted to be an aristocrat, too, and to wear the same trappings, and to march through life to the same music. George came, presently, very much out of breath, to take her back to the arbor where there was a lobster salad, and that fine high-colored Greybridge sherry, and some pale German wine which Mr. Raymond contributed to the feast. The orphans and the two gentlemen enjoyed themselves very much— 
Mr. Raymond could talk about medicine as well as political economy, and he and George entered into a conversation in which there were a great many hard words. The orphans ate, to do that was to be happy, and Isabel sat in a corner of the arbor looking dreamily out at the shadows on the grass, and wondering why fate had denied her the privilege of being an earl's daughter. The drowsy atmosphere of the hot summer's afternoon, the Rhine wine, and the sound of his companion's voice, had such a pleasant influence upon Mr. Raymond, that he fell asleep presently while George was talking, and the young man, perceiving this, produced a Midlandshire newspaper, which he softly unfolded, and began to read. "'Will you come and gather some flowers, Izzy?' whispered one of the orphans. "'There are wild roses and honeysuckle in the lane outside. Do come!' Mrs. Gilbert was very willing to leave the arbor. She wandered away with the two children, along these lonely paths, which now sloped downwards into a kind of ravine, and then wound upwards to the grove. The orphans had a good deal to say to their late governess. They had a new instructress, and, "'She isn't a bit like you, dear Mrs. Gilbert,' they said, "'and we do love you best, though she's very kind, you know, and all that.' "'But she's old, you know, very old, more than thirty, "'and she makes us ham cambric frills, "'and she does go on so if we don't put away our things, "'and makes us do such hard sums, "'and instead of telling us stories when we're out with her, as you used, "'oh, don't you remember telling us Pelham? "'How I love Pelham and Dombey, "'about the little boy that died, and Florence. "'She teaches us botany and jalology. The orphans called it jalology, and tertiary sandstone, and old red formations, and things like that, and, oh, dear Izzy, I wish you had never been married. Isabel smiled at the orphans, and kissed them, when they entwined themselves about her. But she was thinking of the alien's dreams, and whether Lady Gwendolen was the duchess with the glittering hair and cruel azure eyes, regarding whom the alien was cynical, not to say abusive. Mrs. Gilbert felt as if she had never read the alien half enough. She had seen him and spoken to him, a real poet, a real living, breathing poet, who only wanted to lame himself and turn his collars down to become a Byron. She was walking slowly along the woodland path, with the orphans round about her, like a modern Laocoon family with the serpents, when she was startled by a rustling of the branches a few paces from her, and, looking up, with a sudden half-frightened glance, she saw the tall figure of a man between her and the sunlight. The man was Mr. Roland Lansdell, the author of An Alien's Dreams. "'I'm afraid I startled you, Mrs. Gilbert,' he said, taking off his hat, and standing bareheaded, with the shadows of the leaves flickering and trembling about him like living things. "'I thought I should find Mr. Raymond here, as he said you were going to picnic, and I want so much to talk to the dear old boy, so as they know me at the lodge, I got them to let me in.' Isabel tried to say something, but the orphans, who were in no way abashed by the stranger's presence, informed Mr. Lansdell that their uncle Charles was asleep in the arbor where they had dined, up there. The elder orphan pointed vaguely toward the horizon as she spoke. "'Thank you, but I don't think I shall find him very easily. I don't know half the windings and twistings of this place.' The younger orphan informed Mr. Lansdell that the way to the arbor was quite straight. He couldn't miss it. "'But you don't know how stupid I am,' the gentleman answered, laughing. "'Ask your uncle if I'm not awfully deficient in the organ of locality. Would you mind? But you were going the other way, and it seems so selfish to ask you to turn back. Yet, if you would take compassion upon my stupidity and show me the way—' He appealed to the orphans, but he looked at Isabel. He looked at her with those uncertain eyes, blue with a dash of hazel, hazel with a tinge of blue, yes, that were always half hidden under the thick fringe of their lashes, like a glimpse of water glimmering athwart overshadowing rushes. 
"'Oh, yes, if you like,' the orphans cried simultaneously. "'We don't mind going back a bit.' They turned as they spoke, and Isabel turned with them. Mr. Lansdell put on his hat and walked amongst the long grass beside the narrow pathway. The orphans were very lively and fraternized immediately with Mr. Lansdell. They were Mr. Raymond's nieces— then they were his poor cousin Rosa Harlow's children, of whom he had heard so much from that dear good Raymond. If so, they were almost cousins of his, Mr. Lansdell went on to say, and they must come to see him at Mordred. And they must ask Mrs. Gilbert to come with them, as they seemed so fond of her. The girls had plenty to say for themselves. Yes, they would like very much to come to Mordred Priory. It was very pretty. Their uncle Charles had shown them the house one day when he took them out for a drive. It would be capital fun to come and to have a picnic in the grounds, as Mr. Lansdell proposed. The orphans were ready for anything in the way of holiday-making, and for Isabel she only blushed and said, Thank you, when Mr. Roland Lansdell talked of her visiting Mordred with her late charges. She could not talk to this grand and beautiful creature, who possessed in his own person all the attributes of her favorite heroes. How often this young dreamer of dreams had fancied herself in such companionship as this, discoursing with an incessant flow of brilliant persiflage, half scornful, half playful, holding her own against a love-stricken marquis, making as light of a duke as Mary Queen of Scots ever made of a presumptuous chastelar, and now that the dream was realized, now that this splendid Byronic creature was by her side, talking to her, trying to make her answer him, looking at her athwart those wondrous eyelashes, she was stricken and dumbfounded, a miserable, stammering schoolgirl a Pamela amazed and bewildered by the first complimentary address of her aristocratic persecutor. She had a painful sense of her own deficiency. She knew all at once that she had no power to play the part she had so often fancied herself performing to the admiration of supernumerary beholders. But with all this pain and mortification there were mingled a vague delicious happiness. The dream had come true at last. This was romance. This was life. She knew now what a pallid and ghastly broker's copy of a picture that last year's business had been, the standing on the bridge to be worshipped by a country surgeon, the long, tedious courtship, the dowdy, vulgar, commonplace wedding. She knew now how poor and miserable a mockery all that had been. She looked with furtive glances at the tall figure bending now and then under the branches of the trees, the tall figure in loose garments, which, in the careless perfection of their fashion, were so unlike anything she had ever seen before, the wonderful face in which there was the mellow fight and color of a guido. She stole a few timid glances at Mr. Lansdell, and made a picture of him in her mind, which, like or unlike, must be henceforth the only image by which she would recognize or think of him. Did she think of him as he was, a young English gentleman, idle, rich, accomplished, and with no better light to guide his erratic wanderings than an uncertain glimmer which he called honor? Had she thought of him thus, she would have been surely wiser than to give him so large a place in her mind— or any place at all. But she never thought of him in that way. He was all this. He was a shadowy and divine creature, amenable to no earthly laws. He was here now, in this brief hour, under the flickering sunlight and trembling shadows, and to-morrow he would melt away for ever and ever into the regions of light, which were his everyday habitation." What did it matter, then, if she was fluttered and dazed and intoxicated by his presence? What did it signify if the solid earth became Empyrean air under this foolish girl's footsteps? Mrs. Gilbert did not even ask herself these questions. No consciousness of wrong or danger had any place in her mind. She knew nothing. She thought nothing, except that a modern Lord Byron was walking by her side, and that it was a very little way to the arbor. 
End of chapter 12 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 13 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter 13. Oh, my cousin, shallow-hearted. Roland Lansdell dined with his uncle and cousin at Lowlands upon the day after the picnic, but he said very little about his afternoon ramble in Hurstonleigh Grove. He lounged upon the lawn with his cousin Gwendolen, and played with the dogs, and stared at the old pictures in the long, dreary billiard-room, where the rattle of the rolling balls had been unheard for ages, and he entered into a languid little political discussion with Lord Reesdale, and broke off, or rather dropped out of it, in the middle, with a yawn, declaring that he knew very little about the matter, and was no doubt making a confounded idiot of himself, and would his uncle kindly excuse him, and reserve his admirable arguments for some one better qualified to appreciate them. The young man had no political enthusiasm. He had been in the great arena, and had done his little bit of wrestling, and had found himself baffled not by the forces of his adversaries— but by the vis inertiae of things in general. Eight or nine years ago, Roland Lansdell had been very much in earnest. Too much in earnest, perhaps, for he had been like a racehorse that goes off with a rush, and makes running for all the other horses, and then breaks down ignominiously, midway betwixt the starting-post and the judge's chair. There was no stay in this bright young creature— if the prizes of life could have been won by that fiery rush, he would have won them. But, as it was, he would feign to fall back among the ranks, nameless, and let the plotters rush on toward the golden goal. Thus it was that Roland Lansdell had been a kind of failure and disappointment. He had begun so brilliantly, he had promised so much. "'If this young man is so brilliant at one-and-twenty, people had said to one another, what will he be by the time he is forty-five? But at thirty Roland was nothing. He had dropped out of public life altogether, and was only a drawing-room favorite, a lounger in gay continental cities, a drowsy idler in fair Grecian islands, a scribbler of hazy little verses about pretty women and veils and fans and daggers and jealous husbands and moonlit balconies, and withered orange flowers and poisoned chalices and midnight revels and despair a beautiful useless purposeless creature a mark for manoeuvring mothers a hero for sentimental young ladies altogether a mockery a delusion and a snare this was the man whom Lady Gwendolen and her father had found at Baden-Baden losing his money pour se distraire Gwendolen and her father were on their way back to England. They had gone abroad for the benefit of the Earl's income, but continental residence is expensive nowadays, and they were going back to Lowlands, Lord Reesdale's family seat, where at least they would live free of house-rent, and where they could have garden-staff and dairy produce, and hares and partridges, and silvery trout from the fish-ponds in the shrubberies, for nothing, and where they could have long credit from the country tradesfolk, and wax or composition candles for something less than tenpence apiece. Lord Reesdale persuaded Roland to return with them, and the young man assented readily enough. He was tired of the continent. He was tired of England, too, for the matter of that, but those German gaming-places, those Grecian islands— those papist cities where the bells were always calling the faithful to their drowsy devotions in darksome old cathedrals, were his last weariness, and he said yes. He should be glad to see Mordred again. He should enjoy a month's shooting, and he could spend the winter in Paris. Paris was as good as any other place in the winter. He had so much money and so much leisure, and knew so little what to do with himself— he knew that his life was idle and useless, but he looked about him and saw that very little came of other men's work. 
He cried with the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem, Behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit, and there is no profit under the sun. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. The thing that has been, it is that which shall be. Do you remember that saying of Mirabeau's, which Mr. Luz has put upon the title page of his wonderful life of Robespierre, This man will do great things, said the statesman, I quote loosely from memory, for he believes in himself? Roland Lansdell did not believe in himself, and lacking that grand faculty of self-confidence, he had grown to doubt and question all other things, as he doubted and questioned himself. "'I will do my best to lead a good life and be useful to my fellow creatures,' Mr. Lansdell said, when he left Magdalen College, Oxford, with a brilliant reputation and the good wishes of all the magnates of the place. He began life with this intention firmly implanted in his mind. He knew that he was a rich man, and that there was a great deal expected of him. The parable of the talents was not without its import to him, though he had no belief in the divinity of the teacher. There was no great enthusiasm in his nature, but he was very sincere, and he went into Parliament as a progressive young liberal, and set to work honestly to help his fellow creatures. Alas, for poor humanity! He found the task more wearisome than the labor of Sisyphus or the toil of the daughters of Danas. The stone was always rolling back upon the laborer. The water was perpetually pouring out of the perforated buckets. He cultivated the working man and founded a club for him where he might have lectures upon geology and astronomy, and where, after twelve hours bricklaying or road-making, he might improve his mind with the works of Stuart Mill or McCulloch, and where he could have almost anything, except those two simple things which he especially wanted, a pint of decent beer and a quiet puff at his pipe. Roland Lansdell was the last man to plan any institution upon puritanical principles, but he did not believe in himself, so he took other people's ideas as the basis of his work and by the time he opened his eyes to the necessity of beer and tobacco, the workman had grown tired and had abandoned him. This was only one of many schemes which Mr. Lansdell attempted while he was still very young and had a faint belief in his fellow creatures, but this is a sample of the rest. Roland's schemes were not successful. They were not successful because he had no patience to survive preliminary failure and wade on to ultimate success through a slough of despond and discouragement. He picked his fruit before it was ripe and was angry when he found it sour and would hew down the tree that bore so badly and plant another. His fairest projects fell to the ground and he left them there to rot while he went away somewhere else to build new schemes and make fresh failures. Moreover, Mr. Lansdell was a hot-headed, impulsive young man, and there were some things which he could not endure. He could bear ingratitude better than most people, because he was very generous-minded, and set a very small price upon the favors he bestowed. But he could not bear to find that the people whom he sought to benefit were bored by his endeavors to help them. He had no ulterior object to gain, remember. He had no solemn conviction of a sacred duty to be performed at any cost to himself, in spite of every hindrance, in the face of every opposition. He only wanted to be useful to his fellow creatures— and when he found that they repudiated his efforts, he fell away from them and resigned himself to be useless, and to let his fellow creatures go their own willful way. So almost immediately after making a brilliant speech about the poor laws, at the very moment when people were talking of him as one of the most promising young liberals of his day, Mr. Lansdell abruptly turned his back upon St. Stephen's, accepted the Chiltern Hundreds, and went abroad. He had experienced another disappointment besides the failure of his philanthropic schemes, a disappointment that had struck home to his heart and had given him an excuse for the cynical indifference, the hypochondriacal infidelity, which grew upon him from this time. 
Mr. Lansdell had been his own master from his earliest manhood, for his father and mother had died young. The Lansdells were not a long-lived race. Indeed, there seemed to be a kind of fatality attached to the masters of Mordred Priory, and in the long galleries where the portraits of dead and gone Lansdells looked gravely down upon the frivolous creatures of today, the stranger was apt to be impressed by the youth of all the faces, the absence of those grey beards and bald foreheads which give dignity to most collections of family portraits. The Lansdells of Mordred were not a long-lived race, and Roland's father had died suddenly when the boy was away at Eton. But his mother, Lady Anna Lansdell, only sister of the present Earl of Reesdale, lived to be her son's companion and friend in the best and brightest years of his life. His life seemed to lose its brightness when he lost her. I think this one great grief, acting upon a naturally pensive temperament, must have done much to confirm that morbid melancholy which overshadowed Mr. Lansdell's mind. His mother died, and the grand inducement to do something good and great, which might have made her proud and happy, died with her. Roland said that he left the purest half of his heart behind him in the Protestant cemetery at Nice. He went back to England and made those brilliant speeches of which I have spoken, and was not too proud to seek for sympathy and consolation from the person whom he loved next best to her whom he had lost. That person was Lady Gwendolen Pomfrey, his betrothed wife, the beloved niece of his dead mother. There had been so complete a sympathy between Lady Anna Lansdell and her son that the young man had suffered himself, half unconsciously, to be influenced by his mother's predilections. She was very fond of Gwendolen, and when the two families were in Midlandshire, Gwendolen spent the greater part of her life with her aunt. She was two years older than Roland, and she was a very beautiful young woman, a fragile-looking, aristocratic beauty, with a lofty kind of gracefulness in all her movements, and with cold blue eyes that would have frozen the very soul of an aspiring young Lawrence. She was handsome, self-possessed, and accomplished, and Lady Anna Lansdell was never tired of sounding her praises. So young Roland, newly returned from Oxford, fell, or imagined himself to have fallen, desperately in love with her, and while his brief access of desperation lasted, the whole thing was arranged, and Mr. Lansdell found himself engaged. He was engaged, and he was very much in love with his cousin. That two years' interval between their ages gave Gwendolen an immense advantage over her lover— she practiced a thousand feminine coquetries upon this simple, generous lad, and was proud of her power over him, and very fond of him after her own fashion, which was not a very warm one. She was by no means a woman to consider the world well lost for love. Her father had told her all about Roland's circumstances, and that the settlements would be very handsome. She was only sorry that poor Roland was a mere nobody, after all, a country gentleman, who prided himself upon the length of his pedigree and the grandeur of his untitled race, but whose name looked very insignificant when you saw it at the tail of a string of dukes and marquises in the columns of the Morning Post. But then he might distinguish himself in Parliament. There was something in that, and Lady Gwendolen brought all her power to bear upon the young man's career. She fanned the faint flames of his languid ambition with her own fiery breath. This girl, with her proud Saxon beauty, her cold blue eyes, her pale auburn hair, was as ardent and energetic as Joan of Arc or Elizabeth of England. She was a grand, ambitious creature, and she wanted to marry a ruler, and to rule him. And she was discontented with her cousin, because a crown did not drop on to his brows the moment he entered the arena. His speeches had been talked about, but, oh, what languid talk it had been! Gwendolen wanted all Europe to vibrate with the clamor of the name that was so soon to be her own. At the end of his second session, Roland went abroad with his dying mother. He came back alone, six weeks after his mother's death, and went straight to Gwendolen for consolation. He found her in deep mourning, all a glitter with bracelets and necklaces of shining jet, looking very fair and stately in her trailing black robes, 
but he found her drawing-room filled with callers, and he left her wounded and angry. He thought her so much a part of himself that he had expected to find her grief equal to his own. He went to her again, in a passionate outbreak of grief and anger, told her that she was cold-hearted and ungrateful, and that she had never loved the aunt who had been almost a mother to her. Lady Gwendolen was the last woman in the world to submit to any such reproof. She was astounded by her lover's temerity. "'I loved my aunt very dearly, Mr. Lansdell,' she said, "'so dearly that I could endure a great deal for her sake. But I cannot endure the insolence of her son.' And then the Earl of Reesdale's daughter swept out of the room, leaving her cousin standing alone in a sunlit window, with the spring breezes blowing in upon him, and the shrill voice of a woman crying primroses sounding in the street below. He went home, dispirited, disheartened, doubtful of himself, doubtful of Lady Gwendolen, doubtful of all the world, and early the next morning he received a letter from his cousin, coolly releasing him from his engagement. The experience of yesterday had proved that they were unsuited to each other, she said. It was better that they should part now, while it was possible for them to be friends. Nothing could be more dignified or more decided than the dismissal. Mr. Lansdell put the letter in his breast, the pretty, perfumed letter with the Reesdale arms emblazoned on the envelope, the elegant, ladylike letter, which recorded his sentence without a blot or a blister, without one uncertain line to mark where the hand had trembled. The hand may have trembled nevertheless, for Lady Gwendolen was just the woman to write a dozen copies of her letter rather than send one that bore the faintest evidence of her weakness. Roland put the letter in his breast and resigned himself to his fate. He was a great deal too proud to appeal against his cousin's decree, but he had loved her very sincerely, and if she had recalled him— he would have gone back to her, and would have forgiven her. He lingered in England for a week or more after all the arrangements for his departure had been made. He lingered in the expectation that his cousin would recall him. But one morning, while he was sitting in the smoking-room at his favorite club, with his face hidden behind the pages of the post, he burst into a harsh, strident laugh. "'What the deuce is the matter with you, Lansdell?' asked a young man, who had been startled by that sudden outbreak of unharmonious hilarity. "'Oh, nothing particular. I was looking at the announcement of my cousin Gwendolen's approaching marriage with the Marquis of Heatherland. I'm rejoiced to see that our family is getting up in the world.' "'Oh, yes, that's been in the wind a long time,' the lounger answered coolly. "'Everybody saw that Heatherland was very far gone six months ago.' "'He's been mooning about your cousin ever since they met at the Bushes, "'Sir Francis Luxmore's Leicestershire place. "'They used to say you were rather sweet in that quarter, "'but I suppose it was only a cousinly flirtation.' "'Yes,' said Mr. Lansdell, throwing down the paper and taking out his cigar-case. "'I suppose it was what Gwendolen would call a flirtation. "'You see, I have been abroad six months, attending the deathbed of my mother.' I could scarcely expect to be remembered all that time. Will you give me a light for my cigar? The faces of the two young men were very close together as Roland lighted his cigar. Mr. Lansdell's pale olive complexion had blanched a little, but his hand was quite steady, and he smoked half his trabuco before he left the clubroom. The blow was sharp and unexpected, but Lady Gwendolen's lover bore it like a philosopher. I am unhappy, because I have lost her, he thought. But should I have been happy with her, if I had married her? Have I ever been happy in my life? Or is there such a thing as happiness upon this unequally divided earth? I have played all my cards, and lost the game. Philanthropy, ambition, love, friendship. I have lost upon every one of them. It is time that I should begin to enjoy myself." Thus it was that Mr. Lansdell accepted the Chiltern Hundreds, and turned his back upon a country in which he had never been especially happy. He had plenty of friends upon the continent, and, being rich, handsome, and accomplished, was feted and caressed wherever he went. He was very much admired, and he might have been beloved, 
but that first disappointment had done its fatal work, and he did not believe that there was in all the world any such thing as pure and disinterested affection for a young man with a landed estate and fifteen thousand a year. So he lounged and dawdled away his time in drawing-rooms and boudoirs, on moonlit balconies, in shadowy orange groves, beside the rippling Arno, in the colonnades of Venice, on the Parisian boulevards, under the lime-trees of Berlin, in any region where there was life and color and gaiety, and the brightness of beautiful faces, and where a man of naturally gloomy temperament might forget himself and be amused. He started with the intention of doing no harm, but, with no better guiding principle than the intention to be harmless, a man can contrive to do a good deal of mischief. Mr. Lansdell's life abroad was neither a good nor a useful one. It was an artificial kind of existence, with spurious pleasures, spurious brilliancy, a life whose brightest moments but poorly compensated for the dismal reaction that followed them. And in the meanwhile Lady Gwendolen did not become Marchioness of Heatherland, for only a month before the day appointed for the wedding, young Lord Heatherland broke his neck in the Irish steeplechase. It was a terrible and bitter disappointment, but Lady Gwendolen showed her high breeding and her philosophy at the same time. She retired from the world, in which her career had been hitherto so brilliantly successful, and bore her sorrow in silence. She, too, had played her best card, and had lost. And now that the Marquis was dead, and Roland Lansdell far away, people began to say that the lady had jilted her cousin, and that the loss of her titled lover was heaven's special judgment upon her iniquity, though why poor Lord Heatherland should be sacrificed to Lady Gwendolen Pomfrey's sin is rather a puzzling question. It may be that Lord Reesdale's daughter hoped her cousin would return when he heard of the Marquis's death. She knew that Roland had loved her, and what was more likely than that he should come back to her, now that he knew she was once more free to be his wife. Lady Gwendolen kept the secrets of her own heart, and no one knew which of her two lovers had been dearest to her. She kept her own secrets, and by and by, when she reappeared in the world, people saw that her beauty had suffered very little from her sorrow for her disappointment. She was still very handsome, but her prestige was gone. Impertinent young debutantes of eighteen called this splendid creature of four-and-twenty quite old. Wasn't she engaged to Mr. Lansdell ever so long ago, and then to the Marquis of Heatherland? Poor thing, how very sad. They wondered she'd not go over to Rome, or join Miss Sellen's sisterhood, or something of that kind. Lady Gwendolen's portrait still held its place in books of beauty, and she could see herself smiling in West End print shops, with a preternaturally high forehead and very long ringlets. But she felt that she was old, very old. Gossiping dowagers talked aristocratic scandal openly before her and said, "'We don't mind your hearing it, Gwendolen, dear, for of course you know the world, and that such things do happen. And a woman has seen the last of her youth when people say that sort of thing to her.' She felt that she was very old. She had led a high-pressure kind of existence, in which a year stands for a decade, and now, in her lonely old age, she discovered that her father was very poor, and that his estates were mortgaged and that henceforth her existence must be a wretched hand-to-mouth business, unless some distant relation, from whom Lord Reesdale had expectations, would be good enough to die. The distant relation had died within the last twelve months, and the fortune inherited from him, though by no means a large one, had set the Earl's affairs tolerably straight. So he had returned to Lowlands, after selling the lease and furniture of his townhouse, it was absurd to keep the townhouse any longer for the sake of Gwendolen, who was two and thirty years of age, and never likely to marry, Lord Reesdale argued. So he had paid his debts, and had released his estate from some of its many encumbrances, and had come back to the home of his boyhood to set up as a model farmer and country gentleman. So in the bright July sunshine Gwendolen and her cousin lounged upon the lawn, 
and talked of old pleasures and old acquaintances, and the things that had happened to them when they were young. If the lady ever cherished any hope that Roland would return to his allegiance, that hope was now utterly vanished. He has forgiven her for all the past, and they are friends and first cousins again, but there is no room for hope that they can ever be again what they have been. A man who can forgive so generously must have long ceased to love. That strange madness, so nearly allied to hatred and jealousy and rage and despair, has no kindred with forgiveness. Lady Gwendolen knew that her chance was gone. She knew this, and there was a secret bitterness in her heart when she thought of it, and she was jealous of her cousin's regard and exacting in her manner to him. He bore it all with imperturbable good temper. He had been hot-headed and fiery-tempered long ago, when he was young and chivalrous and eager to be useful to his fellow-creatures, but now he was only a languid loiterer upon the earth, and his creed was the creed of the renowned American, who has declared that there is nothing new and nothing true, and it don't signify. What did it matter? The crooked sticks would never be straight. That which was wanting would never be numbered. Roland Lansdell suffered from a milder form of that disease, in a wild paroxysm of which Swift wrote Gulliver, and Byron horrified society with Don Juan. He suffered from that moody desperation of mind which came upon Hamlet after his mother's wedding, and neither man nor woman delighted him. But do not suppose that this young man gave himself melancholy or Byronic airs upon the strength of the aching void at his own weary heart. He was a sensible young man, and he did not pose himself a la Lara, or turn his collars, or let his beard grow. He only took life very easily, and was specially indulgent to the follies and vices of people from whom he expected so very little. He had gone back to Midlandshire because he was tired of his continental wanderings, and now he was tired of Mordred already, before he had been back a week. Lady Gwendolen catechized him rather closely as to what he had done with himself upon the previous afternoon, and he told her very frankly that he had strolled into Hurstonleigh Grove to see Mr. Raymond, and had spent an hour or two talking with his old friend, while Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert and the children enjoyed themselves, and prepared a rustic tea, which would have been something like Watteau if Watteau had been a Dutchman. "'It was very pretty, Gwendolen, I assure you,' he said. "'Mrs. Gilbert made tea, and we drank it in a scalding state.' and the two children were all of a greasy radiance with bread and butter. The doctor seems to be an excellent fellow. His moral region is something tremendous, Raymond tells me, and he entertained us at tea with a most interesting case of fester. Oh, the doctor, that's Mr. Gilbert, is it not? said Lady Gwendolen. And what do you think of his wife, Roland? You must have formed some opinion upon that subject, I should think, by the manner in which you stared at her. Did I stare at her? cried Mr. Lansdell, with supreme carelessness. I dare say I did. I always stare at pretty women. Why should a man go into all manner of stereotyped raptures about a Raffaello or a Guido, and yet feel no honest thrill of disinterested admiration when he looks at a picture fresh from the hands of the supreme painter, Nature, who, by the way, makes as many failures, and is as often out of drawing, as any other artist. Yes, I admire Mrs. Gilbert, and I like to look at her. I don't suppose she's any better than other people, but she's a great deal prettier, a beautiful piece of animated waxwork, with a little machinery inside, just enough to make her say, Yes, if you please, and no, thank you. A lovely non-entity with yellow-black eyes. Did you observe her eyes? No, Lady Gwendolen answered sharply. I observed nothing except that she was a very dowdy-looking person. What, in heaven's name, is Mr. Raymond's motive for taking her up? He's always taking up some extraordinary person. "'But Mrs. Gilbert is not an extraordinary person. "'She's very stupid and commonplace. "'She was nursery-maid or nursery-governess "'or something of that kind "'to that dear good Raymond's penniless nieces.' 
There was no more said about Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert. Lady Gwendolen did not care to talk about these common people who came across her dull pathway and robbed her of some few accidental rays of that light which was now the only radiance upon earth for her, the light of her cousin's presence. Ah, me, with what a stealthy step, invisible in the early sunshine, pitiless nemesis creeps after us and glides past us and goes on before to wait for us upon the other side of the hill amidst the storm clouds and the darkness from the very first gwendolen had loved her cousin roland better than any other living creature upon this earth but the chance of bringing down the bird at whose glorious plumage so many a fair fowler had levelled her rifle had dazzled and tempted her the true wine of life was not that mawkish sickly sweet compound of rose leaves and honey called love but an effervescing intoxicating beverage known as success lady gwendolen had thought and in the triumph of her splendid conquest it seemed such an easy thing to resign the man she loved but now it was all different she looked back and remembered what her life might have been she looked forward and saw what it was to be, and the face of Nemesis was very terrible to look upon. Thus it was that Lady Gwendolen was exacting of her cousin's attention, impatient of his neglect. Oh, if she could only have brought him back, if she could have kindled a new flame in the cold embers, alas, she knew that to do that would be to achieve the impossible. She looked in the glass, and saw that her aristocratic beauty was pale and faded. She felt that the story of her life was ended. The sea might break against the crags for ever and ever, but the tender grace of a day that was dead could never return to her. "'He loved me once,' she thought, as she sat in the summer twilight, watching her cousin stroll on the lawn, smoking his after-dinner cigar, and looking so tired— so tired of himself and everything in the world. He loved me once. It is something to remember that. The day was very dull at Lowlands, Mr. Lansdell thought. There was a handsome house, a little old and faded, but very handsome notwithstanding, and there was a well-cooked dinner and good wines, and there was an elegant and accomplished woman always ready to talk to him and amuse him, and yet, somehow, it was all flat, stale, and unprofitable to this young man, who had lived the same kind of life for ten years, and had drained its pleasures to the very dregs. We should laugh at a man who went on writing epic poems all of his life, though people refused to read a line of his poetry, and no man can be expected to go on trying to improve the position of people who don't want to be improved— I've tried my hand at the working man, and he has rejected me as an intrusive nuisance. I've no doubt he was in his right. How should I like a reformer who wanted to set me straight, and lay out my leisure hours by line and rule, and spend my money for me, and show me how to get mild Turkish and German wines in the best and cheapest market? Mr. Lansdell often thought about his life— it is not natural that a man, originally well disposed, should lead a bad and useless life without thinking of it. Mr. Lansdell was subject to gloomy fits of melancholy, in which the present seemed a burden, and the future a blank, a great blank desert, or a long dreary bridge, like that which the genius showed to Mirza in his morning vision, with dreadful pitfalls every here and there, down which unwary foot-passengers sank engulfed in the dreadful blackness of a bottomless ocean. End of chapter 13 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 14 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter 14. Under Lord Thurston's Oak. While Mr. Lansdell remembered Isabel Gilbert as a pretty automaton, who had simpered and blushed when he spoke to her, 
and stammered shyly when she was called upon to answer him, the doctor's wife walked up and down the flat, commonplace garden at Greybridge on the Wayvern, and thought of her birthday afternoon, whose simple pleasures had been embellished by the presence of a demigod. Yes, she walked up and down between two rows of straggling gooseberry bushes, in a rapturous daydream, a dangerous daydream, in which Roland Lansdell's dark face shone dazzling and beautiful. Was it wrong to think of him? She never asked herself that question. She had read sentimental books all her life, and had been passionately in love with heroes in three volumes ever since she could remember. What did it matter whether she was in love with Sir Reginald Glanville or Mr. Roland Lansdell? One passion was as hopeless as the other, and as harmless, therefore. She was never likely to see the Lord of Mordred Priory again. Had she not heard him tell Mr. Raymond that he should spend the winter in Paris? Mrs. Gilbert counted the months upon her fingers. Was November the winter? If so, Mr. Lansdell would be gone in four months' time, and in all those four months what likelihood was there that she should see him, she who was such a low, degraded wretch as compared with this splendid being, and those with whom it was his right to associate? Never, no, never until now had she understood the utter hideousness and horror of her life. The square, miserable parlour, with little stunted cupboards on each side of the fireplace, and shells and peacock's feathers and penny bottles of ink and dingy, unpaid bills upon the mantelpiece. She sat there with the July sun glaring in upon her through the yellow-white blind. She sat there and thought of her life and its squalid ugliness, and then thought of Lady Gwendolen at Lowlands, and rebelled against the unkindness of a providence that had not made her an earl's daughter. And then she clasped her hands upon her face, and shut out the vulgar misery of that odious parlour. A parlour, the very word was unknown in those bright regions of which she was always dreaming, and thought of Roland Lansdell. She thought of him, and she thought what her life might have been, if— if what? If any one out of a hundred different visions, all equally childish and impossible, could have been realized. If she had been an earl's daughter, like Lady Gwendolen. If she had been a great actress, and Roland Lansdell had seen her and fallen in love with her from a stage-box. If he had met her in the Walworth Road two or three years ago. She fancied the meeting— he in a cab, with the reins lightly held between the tips of his gloved fingers, and a tiny tiger swinging behind, and she standing on the curbstone waiting to cross the road, and not out to fetch anything vulgar, only going to pay a water rate, or to negotiate some mysterious backing of the spoons, or some such young ladylike errand. And then she got up and went to the looking-glass to see if she really was pretty or if her face, as she saw it in her daydreams, was only an invention of her own, like the scenery and the dresses of those foolish dreams. She rested her elbows on the mantelpiece, and looked at herself, and pushed her hair about, and experimented with her mouth and eyes, and tried to look like Edith Dombey in the grand Carker scene, and acted the scene in a whisper. No, she wasn't a bit like Edith Dombey. She was more like Juliet, or Desdemona. She lowered her eyelids, and then lifted them slowly, revealing a tender, penetrating glance in the golden-black eyes. "'I'm very sorry that you are not well,' she whispered. "'Yes, she would do for Desdemona. Oh, if instead of marrying George Gilbert she had only run away to London and gone straight to that enterprising manager who would have been so sure to engage her. If she had done this, she might have played Desdemona, and Mr. Lansdell might have happened to go to the theatre, and might have fallen desperately in love with her on the spot. She took a dingy volume of the immortal Williams from a dusty row of books on one of the cupboards, and went up to her room and locked the door, and pleaded for Cassio, and wept, and protested opposite the looking-glass, before which three matter-of-fact generations of Gilberts had shaved themselves. 
She was only nineteen, and she was a child, with all a child's eagerness for something bright and happy. It seemed only a very short time since she had longed for a gaily dressed doll that adorned one of the Walworth Road shop windows. Her married life had not as yet invested her with any matronly dignity. She had no domestic cares or duties, for the simple household was kept in order by Miss Jeffson, who would have resented any interference from the young mistress. Isabel went into the kitchen sometimes, when she was very much at a loss as to what she should do with herself, and sat in an old rocking-chair, swinging languidly backwards and forwards, and watching kind-hearted Tilly making a pie. There are some young women who take kindly to a simple domestic life, and have a natural genius for pies and puddings and cutting and contriving, in a cheery, pleasant way, that invests poverty with a grace of its own. And when a gentleman wishes to marry on three hundred a year, he should look out for one of these bright household fairies. Isabel had no liking for these things. To her the making of pastry was a wearisome business. It was all very well for Ruth Pinch to do it once in a way, and to be admired by John Westlock, and marry a rich and handsome young husband offhand. No doubt Miss Pinch knew instinctively that Mr. Westlock would come that morning while the beefsteak pudding was in progress. But to go on making puddings for Tom Pinch for ever and ever, with no John Westlock, Isabel left the house affairs to Mrs. Jeffson, and acted Shakespearean heroines and Edith Dombey before her looking-glass, and read her novels, and dreamed her dreams, and wrote little scraps of poetry, and drew pen-and-ink profiles of Mr. Lansdell, always looking from right to left. She gave him very black eyes, with white blanks in the centre, and streaky hair. She drew Lady Gwendolen and the chip bonnet also very often, if not quite as often as the gentleman, so there was no harm in it. Mrs. Gilbert was strictly punctilious with herself, even in the matter of her thoughts. She only thought of what might have happened if Mr. Lansdell had met her long ago, before her marriage. It is not to be supposed that she forgot Roland's talk of some picnic or entertainment at Mordred. She thought of it a great deal sometimes fancying that it was too bright a thing to come to pass, at other times thinking that Mr. Lansdell was likely to call at any moment with a formal invitation for herself and her husband. The weather was very warm just now, and the roads very dusty, so Mrs. Gilbert stayed at home a good deal. He might come, he might come at any unexpected moment, she trembled and turned hot at the sound of a double knock, and ran to the glass to smooth her disordered hair, but only the most commonplace visitors came to Mr. Gilbert's mansion, and Isabel began to think that she would never see Roland Lansdell again. And then she plunged once more into the hot-pressed pages of The Alien, and read Mr. Lansdell's plaints on toned paper, with long S's that looked like F's, and she copied his verses, and translated them into bad French. They were very difficult. How was she to render even such a simple sentence as, My own Clotilde? She tried such locutions as, Ma propre Clotilde, Ma Clotilde particulière, but she doubted if they were quite academically correct, and she set the alien to tunes that he didn't match, and sang him in a low voice to the cracked notes of an old harpsichord which George's mother had imported from Yorkshire. One day, when she was walking with George, one dreary afternoon, when George had less to do than usual, and was able to take his wife for a nice dusty walk on the high road, Mrs. Gilbert saw the man of whom she thought so much— she saw a brown horse and a well-dressed rider sweep past her in a cloud of dust, and she knew, when he had gone by, that he was Roland Lansdell. He had not seen her any more than if there were no such creature upon this earth. He had not seen her. For the last five weeks she had been thinking of him perpetually, and he rode by and never saw that she was there. No doubt Lord Byron would have passed her by in much the same manner if he had lived, and would have ridden on to make a morning call upon that thrice-blessed Italian woman whose splendid shame it was to be associated with him. Was it not always so? The moon is a cold divinity, 
and the brooks look up for ever and win no special radiance in recompense for their faithful worship. The sunflower is always turning to the sun, and the planet takes very little notice of the flower. Did not Napoleon snub Madame de Stael? And if Isabel could have lived thirty years earlier, and worked her passage out to St. Helena as ship's needlewoman, or something of that kind, and expressed her intention of sitting at the exile's feet for the rest of her natural life, the hero would doubtless send her back by the first homeward-bound vessel with an imperially proportioned flea in her ear. No, she must be content to worship after the manner of the brooks. No subtle power of sympathy was engendered out of her worship. She drew rather fewer profile views of Mr. Lansdell after that wretched, dusty afternoon, and she left off hoping that he would call and invite her to Mordred. She resumed her old habits, and went out again with Shelley and the alien and the big green parasol. One day, one never-to-be-forgotten day, which made a kind of chasm in her life, dividing all the past from the present and the future, she sat on her old seat under the great oak tree, beside the creaking mill-wheel and the plashing water, she sat in her favorite spot, with Shelley on her lap and the green parasol over her head. She had been sitting there for a long time in the drowsy midday atmosphere, when a great dog came up to her, and stared at her, and snuffled at her hands, and made friendly advances to her, and then another dog, bigger, if anything, than the first, came bouncing over a stile and bounding towards her, and then a voice whose sudden sound made her drop her book all confused and frightened, cried, "'Hi, Frollo! This way, Frollo!' And in the next minute a gentleman, followed by a third dog, came along the narrow bridge that led straight to the bench on which she was sitting. Her parasol had fallen back as she stooped to pick up her book, and Roland Lansdell could not avoid seeing her face." He thought her very pretty, as we know, but he thought her also very stupid, and he had quite forgotten his talk about her coming to Mordred. "'Let me pick up the book, Mrs. Gilbert,' he said. "'What a pretty place you have chosen for your morning's rest. This is a favorite spot of mine.' He looked at the open pages of the book as he handed it to her, and saw the title, and, glancing at another book on the seat near her, he recognized the familiar green cover and beveled edges of The Alien. A man always knows the cover of his own book, especially when the work has hung rather heavily on the publisher's hands. "'You are fond of Shelley,' he said. He was considerably surprised to find that this pretty non-entity beguiled her morning walks with the perusal of Revolt of Islam. "'Oh, yes, I am very, very fond of him. Wasn't it a pity that he was drowned?' She spoke of that calamity as if it had been an event of the last week or two. These things were nearer to her than all that common business of breakfast and dinner and supper which made up her daily life. Mr. Lansdell shot a searching glance at her from under cover of his long lashes. Was this feminine affectation provincial Rosa Matildism? "'Yes, it was a pity,' he said. "'But I fancy we're beginning to get over the misfortune. "'And so you like all that dreamy, misty stuff?' he added, "'pointing to the open book which Isabel held in her hands. "'She was turning the leaves about, with her eyes cast down upon the pages. "'She would have sat, shy and trembling, if Reginald Glanville, or Eugene Aram, "'or the Jower, or Napoleon the Great,' or any other grand melancholy creature could have been conjured into life and planted by her side, but she could not tolerate the substantive stuff as applied to the works of the lamented Percy Bysshe Shelley. "'I think it is the most beautiful poetry that was ever written,' she said. "'Better than Byron's?' asked Mr. Lansdell. "'I thought most young ladies made Byron their favorite. "'Oh, yes, I love Byron, but then he makes one so unhappy, because one feels that he was so unhappy when he wrote. Fancy his writing the Jower late at night, after being out at parties where everybody adored him. And if he hadn't written it, he would have gone mad,' said Mrs. Gilbert, opening her eyes very wide. "'Reading Shelley's poetry seems like being almost amongst birds and flowers and blue rippling water and summer.' 
It always seems summer in his poetry. Oh, I don't know which I like best. Was all this affectation, or was it only simple, childish reality? Mr. Lansdell was so much given to that dreadful disease disbelief that he was slow to accept even the evidence of those eloquent blushes, the earnestness in those wonderful eyes, which could scarcely be assumed at will, however skilled in the light comedy of everyday life Miss Gilbert might be. The dogs, who had no misanthropical tendencies, had made friends with Izzy already, and had grouped themselves about her, and laid their big paws and cold wet noses on her knee. "'Shall I take them away?' asked Mr. Lansdell. "'I am afraid they will annoy you.' "'Oh, no, indeed. I am so fond of dogs.' She bent over them, and caressed them with her ungloved hands, and dropped Shelley again, and was ashamed of her awkwardness. Would Edith Dombey have been perpetually dropping things? She bent over a big black retriever till her lips touched his forehead, and he was emboldened to flap his great slimy tongue over her face in token of his affection. His dog! Yes, it had come to that already. Mr. Lansdell was that awful being, the mysterious Lui, of a thousand romances. Roland had been standing upon the bridge all this time, but the bridge was very narrow, and as a laboring man came across at this moment, with a reaping-hook across his shoulder, Mr. Lansdell had no choice except to go away, or else to sit down on the bench under the tree. So he sat down, at a respectful distance from Mrs. Gilbert, and picked up Shelley again, and I think if it had not been for the diversion afforded by the dogs— Isabel would have been likely to drop over into the brawling mill-stream in the intensity of her confusion. He was there, by her side, a real living hero and poet, and her weak, sentimental little heart swelled with romantic rapture, and yet she felt that she ought to go away and leave him. Another woman might have looked at her watch and exclaimed at the lateness of the hour, and gathered up her books and parasol, and departed with a sweeping curtsey and a dignified adieu to Mr. Lansdell. But Isabel was planted to the spot, held by some fearful but delicious charm, a magic and a mystic spell, with which the plashing of the water and the slow creaking of the mill-wheel and a faint fluttering of leaves and flowers, the drowsy buzz of multitudinous insects, the thrilling song of Shelley's own skylark in the blue heavens high above her head, blended in one sweet confusion. I acknowledge that all this was very hard upon the honest-hearted parish doctor, who was at this moment sitting in the faint atmosphere of a cottage chamber, applying fresh layers of cotton-wool to the poor tortured arm of a Sunday-school pupil, who had been all but burnt to death in the previous week. But then, if a man chooses to marry a girl because her eyes are black and large and beautiful, he must be contented with the supreme advantage he derives from the special attribute for which she has chosen her, and so long as she does not become a victim to cataract, or aggravated inflammation of the eyelids, or chronic ophthalmia, he has no right to complain of his bargain. If he selects his wife from amongst other women because she is true-hearted, and high-minded, and trustworthy, he has ample right to be angry with her whenever she ceases to be any of those things. Mr. Lansdell and his dogs lingered for some considerable time under the shadow of the big oak. The dogs were rather impatient, and gave expression to their feelings by sundry yawns that were like half-stifled yowls, and by eager pantings, and sudden and purposeless leaps, and short, broken-off yelps or snaps, but Roland Lansdell was in no hurry to leave the region of Thurston's Crag. Mrs. Gilbert was not stupid after all. She was something better than a pretty waxen image, animated by limited machinery. That pretty head was tilled with a quaint confusion of ideas, half-formed childish fancies, which charmed and amused this elegant loiterer, who had lived in a world where all the women were clever and accomplished, and able to express all they thought, and a good deal more than they thought, with the clear precision and self-possession of creatures who were thoroughly convinced of the infallibility of their own judgment. Yes, Mr. Lansdell was amused by Isabel's talk, 
and he led her on very gently till her shyness vanished, and she dared to look up at his face as she spoke to him, and he attuned his own talk to the key of hers, and wandered with her in the Valhalla of her heroes from Eugene Aram to Napoleon Bonaparte. But in the midst of all this she looked all in a hurry at the little silver watch that George had given her, and found that it was past three. "'Oh, I must go, if you please,' she said. "'I have been out ever since eleven o'clock, and we dine at half-past four. "'Let me carry your books a little way for you, then,' said Mr. Lansdell. "'But are you going that way?' "'Yes, that is the very way I am going.' The dogs were all excitement at the prospect of a move. They barked and careered about Isabel, and rushed off as if they were going to run ten miles at a stretch, and then wheeled round with alarming suddenness and flew back to Mrs. Gilbert and their master. The nearest way to Greybridge lay across all that swelling sea of lovely meadowland, and there were a good many stiles to be crossed and gates to be opened and shut, so the walk occupied some time and Mr. Lansdell must have had business to transact in the immediate neighborhood of Greybridge, for he walked all the way through those delicious meadows, and only parted with Isabel at a gate that opened into the high road near the entrance of the town. "'I suppose you often stroll as far as Thurston's Crag,' Mr. Lansdell said. "'Oh, yes, very often. It isn't too long a walk, and it is so pretty.' "'It is pretty.' "'Mordred is quite as near to you, though, and I think that you would like the garden at Mordred. There are ruins, you know, and it's altogether very romantic. I will give you and Mr. Gilbert a key, if you would like to come there sometimes. Oh, by the by, I hope you haven't forgotten your promise to come to luncheon and see the pictures and all that sort of thing.' "'No, Isabel had not forgotten.' Her face flushed suddenly at the thought of this rapturous vista opening before her. She was to see him again, once more, in his own house, and then, and then it would be November, and he would go away, and she would never see him again. No, Isabel had not forgotten, but until this moment all recollection of that invitation to the Priory had been blotted out of Mr. Lansdell's mind. It flashed back upon him quite suddenly now and he felt that he had been unduly neglectful of these nice, simple-hearted Gilberts, in whom his dear, good Raymond was so much interested. "'I dare say you are fond of pictures?' he said interrogatively. "'Oh, yes, I am very, very fond of them.' This was quite true. She was fond of everything that was beautiful, ready to admire everything with ignorant, childish enthusiasm, pictures and flowers and fountains and moonlit landscapes and wonderful foreign cities and everything upon this earth that was romantic and different from her own life then will you ask mr gilbert to accept an unceremonious invitation and to bring you to the priory to luncheon say next tuesday as that will give me time to invite my cousin gwendolen and your old friend, Mr. Raymond, and the two little girls who are so fond of you? Isabel murmured something to the effect that she would be very happy, and she was sure her husband would be very happy. She thought that no creature in the world could be otherwise than enraptured by such an invitation, and then she began to think of what she would wear, and to remember that there were greasy streaks and patches upon her brown silk wedding dress, which was the best and richest garment her wardrobe contained. Oh, if only George would give her a pale, pearly-colored silk that she had seen in a shop window at Merlington, and a black silk mantle, and white bonnet, and pearly gloves and boots, and parasol to match the dress. There were people in the world rich enough to have all these things, she thought, thrice-blessed creatures who always walked in silk attire. Mr. Lansdell begged her to write him a line to say if Tuesday would suit Mr. Gilbert. They were at the last gate by this time, and he lifted his hat with one hand while he held out the other to Isabel. She touched it very lightly, with fingers that trembled a little at the thrilling contact. Her gloves were rolled up in a little ball in her pocket. She was at an age when gloves are rather a nuisance than otherwise— 
It is only when women come to years of discretion that they are learned as to the conflicting merits of Oubigan and Pivet. Good-bye. I shall see Gwendolen this afternoon, and I shall rely upon you for Tuesday. Hi, Frollo, Quasimodo, Caspar. He was gone, with his dogs, and a cloud of dust about his heels. Even the dust imparted a kind of grandeur to him. He seemed a being who appeared and disappeared in a cloud, after the manner of some African genie. Greybridge church clock chimed the half-hour after four, and Mrs. Gilbert hurried home, and went into the common parlour where dinner was laid, with her face a little flushed, and her dress dusty. George was there already, whistling very loudly, and whittling a stick with a big, knobby-handled clasp-knife. "'Why, Izzy,' he said, "'what have you been doing with yourself?' "'Oh, George!' exclaimed Mrs. Gilbert, in a tone of mingled triumph and rapture. "'I have met Mr. Lansdell, and he was so polite, and he stopped and talked to me ever so long, and we're to go there on Tuesday, and Lady Gwendolen Pomfrey is to be there to meet us. Only think of that!' "'Where?' cried George. "'Why, at Mordred Priory, of course.' "'We are to go to luncheon, and, oh, George, remember you must never call it lunch, "'and I'm to write and say if you'll go, but of course you will go, George.' "'Humph!' muttered Mr. Gilbert, reflectively. "'Tuesday's an awkward day, rather. "'But still, as you say, Izzy, it's a splendid connection, "'and a man oughtn't to throw away such a chance of extending his practice. "'Yes, I think I'll manage it, my dear. "'You may write to say we'll go.' And this was all. No rapture, no spark of enthusiasm. To tell the truth, the surgeon was hungry, and wanted his dinner. It came in presently, smelling very savoury, but oh so vulgar. It was Irish stew, a horrible plebeian dinner, such as Hibernian labourers might devour after a day's bricklaying. Isabel ate very little, and picked out all the little bits of onion and put them aside on her plate. Come what might, she would never, never eat onions again. That degradation, at least, it was in her own power to avoid. After dinner, while George was busy in the surgery, Mrs. Gilbert set to work to compose her letter to Mr. Lansdell. She was to write to him, to him. It was to be only a ceremonious letter, very brief and commonplace, Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert present their compliments to Mr. Lansdell, and will be happy to, etc., etc. But even such a letter as this was a critical composition. In that sublime region in which Mr. Lansdell lived, there might be certain words and phrases that were indispensable. There might be some arbitrary mode of expression, not to know which would argue yourself unknown. Isabel looked into Dombey, but there was no help for her there. She would have been very glad if she could have found Mrs. Granger presents her compliments to Mr. Dombey, or Miss F. Dombey has the pleasure to inform Mr. Gay, or something of that kind, anywhere amongst those familiar pages. However, she was obliged to write her letter as best she might, on a sheet of paper that was very thick and slippery, and strongly impregnated with patchouli, and she sealed the envelope with a profile of Lord Byron imprinted upon white wax, the only stick that was to be had in Greybridge, and to find which good-natured Mr. Jeffson scoured the town while Isabel was writing her letter. Roland Lansdell, Esquire, Mordred Priory. To write such an address was in itself a pleasure. It was dark by the time Mrs. Gilbert had finished her letter, and then she began to think of her dress. Her dress for Tuesday, the Tuesday which was henceforth to stand out from amongst all the other days in her life. Would George give her a new silk dress? No, that was impossible. He would give her a sovereign, and she might do up the old one. She was fain to be content and thankful for so much, and she went upstairs with a candle, and came down presently with two or three dresses on her arm. Among them there was a white muslin, a good deal the worse for wear, but prettier than the silk, a soft transparent fabric, and with lace about it. 
Mrs. Gilbert determined upon wearing this dress, and early the next morning she went out and consulted with a little dressmaker, and brought the young woman home with her, and sat down with her in the sunny parlour to unpick and refashion and improve this white muslin robe. She told the dressmaker that she was going on a visit to Mordred Priory, and by nightfall almost everybody in Greybridge knew that Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert had received an invitation from Mr. Lansdell. End of chapter 14 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 15 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter 15. Roland says, Amen. Isabel had seen Mr. Lansdell on Thursday, and by Saturday night all her preparations were made, and the white dress and a white muslin mantle to match it were in the hands of Mrs. Jeffson, who was to get them up in the highest style of clear starching. The sovereign had done a great deal. Isabel had bought a new riband for her straw hat, and a pair of pale straw-colored gloves, and all manner of small matters necessary to the female toilet upon gala occasions. And now that everything was done, the time between Saturday night and Tuesday lay all before them, a dreary blank that must be endured somehow or other. I should be ashamed to say how very little of the rector's sermon Isabel heard on Sunday morning. She was thinking of Mordred Priory all the time she was in church, and the beautiful things that Mr. Lansdell would say to her, and the replies that she would make. She imagined it all, as was her habit to do. And on this summer Sunday, this blessed day of quiet and repose, when there was no sound of the sickle in the cornfields, and only the slow drip, drip, drip of the water drops from the motionless mill wheel at Thurston's Crag, Roland Lansdell lounged all day in the library at Mordred Priory, reading a little, writing a little, smoking, and pondering a great deal. What should he do with himself? That was the grand question which this young man found himself very often called upon to decide. He would stop at Mordred till he was tired of Mordred, and then he would go to Paris. And when he was weary of that brilliant city, whose best delights familiarity had rendered indifferent to him, he would go Rhineward, over all the old ground again, amongst all the old people. Ten years is a very long time, when you have fifteen thousand a year, and nothing particular to do with yourself or your money. Roland Lansdell had used up all the delights of civilized Europe, and the pleasures that seemed so freshly effervescent to other men were to him as champagne that had grown flat and vapid in the unemptied glasses on a deserted banquet table. He sat to-day in the great window of the library, a deeply embayed Tudor window jutting out upon a broad stone terrace, along whose balustrade a peacock stalked slowly in the sunshine. There were books on either side of the window, solid ranges of soberly bound volumes that reached from floor to ceiling on every side of the room, for the Lansdells had been a studious and book-learned race time out of mind, and the library at Mordred was worthy of its name. There was only one picture— a portrait by Rembrandt, framed in a massive border of carved oak, above the high chimney-piece. A grave, grand face, with solemn eyes that followed you wherever you went. A splendid, earnest face, with the forehead mysteriously shadowed by the broad brim of a steeple-crowned hat. In the dark melancholy of that sombre countenance, there was some vague resemblance to the face of the young man lounging in the sunny window this afternoon, smoking and pondering and looking up now and then to call to the peacock on the balustrade. Beyond that balustrade there was a fair domain, bounded far away by a battlement wall, a lofty, ivy-mantled wall, propped every here and there with mighty buttresses, 
a wall that had been built in the days when William of Normandy enriched his faithful followers with the fairest lands of his newly conquered realm. Beyond that grand old boundary arose the square turret of the village church, coeval with the oldest part of Mordred Priory. The bells were swinging in the turret now, and the sounds of them floated toward Roland Lansdell as he lounged in the open window. "'Only thirty years of age,' he thought, "'and how long it seems since I sat on my mother's knee "'in the shadowy, sleepy old pew yonder, "'and heard the vicar's voice humming under the sounding board above our heads. Thirty years, thirty profitless, tiresome years, "'and there is not a reaper in the fields "'or a shock-headed country lad that earns sixpence a day "'by whooping to the birds amongst the corn.' that is not of more use to his fellow-creatures than I am. I suppose, though, that at the worst I'm good for trade, and I try my best not to do any harm. Heaven knows I don't want to do any harm. It must have been a strange transition of ideas that, at this moment, led Mr. Lansdell to think of that chance meeting with the doctor's dark-eyed wife under the dense foliage of Lord Thurston's oak. "'She's a pretty creature,' he thought. "'A pretty, inexperienced, shy little creature. "'Just the sort of woman that a hardened profligate or a roué "'would try to pervert and entangle. "'There's something really bewitching in all that enthusiastic talk "'about Byron and Shelley. "'What a pity he was drowned! "'And, oh, if he had only fought for Greece "'and been victorious like Leonidas, you know. "'Poor little thing!' "'I wonder how much she knows about Leonidas. "'How splendid that would have been! "'But, oh, to think that he should have had fever, "'a fever just such as kills common people, "'and die just when he had proved himself so great and noble. "'It's the newest thing to find all these silly schoolgirl fancies "'confusing the brain of a woman "'who ought to be the most practical person in Greybridge.' A parish surgeon's wife, who should not, according to the fitness of things, have an idea above coarse charity flannels and chamomile tea and gruel. How she will open her eyes when she sees this room, and all the books in it. Poor little thing, I shall never forget what a pretty picture she made sitting under the oak, with the greenish-gray of that great knotted trunk behind her and the blue water in the foreground. And then Mr. Lansdell's ideas, which seemed especially irrelevant this afternoon, broke off abruptly. "'I hope I may never do any harm,' he thought. "'I am not a good man or a useful man, but I don't think I have ever done much harm.' He lit another cigar, and strolled out upon the terrace, and from the terrace to the great quadrangular stable-yard. Upon one side of the quadrangle there was a cool, arched way that had once been a cloister, and I regret to say that the stone cells in which the monks of Mordred had once spent their slow, quiet days and meditative nights now did duty as loose-boxes for Mr. Lansell's hunters. Openings had been knocked through the dividing walls, for horses are more socially disposed creatures than monks, and are apt to pine and sicken if entirely deprived of companionship with their kind. Roland went into three or four of the boxes, and looked at the horses, and sighed for the time when the hunting season should commence, and Midlandshire might be tolerable. "'I want an occupation,' he thought. "'Physical wear and tear and all that sort of thing.' I let my mind run upon all manner of absurd things for want of occupation. He yawned and threw away his cigar, and strode across the yard toward the open window of a harness-room at which a man was sitting in his shirt-sleeves, and with a Sunday paper before him. "'You may bring the diver round in half an hour, Christie,' said Lansdell. "'I shall ride over to Conventford this afternoon.' "'Yes, sir.' Roland Lansdale did ride to Conventford, galloping his hardest into Waverley, to the scandal of the sober townspeople, who looked up from their tea-tables, half-scared at the sound of the clattering hoofs upon the uneven pavement, and then dawdling at a foot-pace all along the avenue which extends in unbroken beauty from Waverley to Conventford. 
The streets of this latter town were crowded with gaily dressed factory girls, and the bells for three separate spires were clanging loudly in the summer air. Mr. Lansdell rode very slowly, thinking of all manner of absurd things, as he went along, and he entered Mr. Raymond's pretty drawing-room at Oak Bank just in time to catch that gentleman drinking tea with the orphans. Of course Roland had forgotten that his friend dined at an early hour on Sundays, and he had come to dine, but it wasn't of the least consequence. He would have some tea, yes, and cold beef by all means, if there was cold beef. A side-table was laid for him, and a great sirloin was brought in, but Mr. Lansdell did not make much havoc with the joint. He and Mr. Raymond had a good deal to say to each other, and Mr. Lansdell took very kindly to the orphans, and asked them a good many questions about their studies, and their present governess, who was a native of Conventford, and had gone out that evening to drink tea with her friends, and then, somehow or other, the conversation rambled on to their late governess, Isabel Sleaford and the orphans had a great deal to say about her. She was so nice, and she told them such pretty things, Eugene Aram and Jower, how wicked Black Hassan was to tie his poor sister up in a sack and drown her, because he didn't wish her to marry the Jower. Miss Sleaford had modified the romantic story in deference to the tender ages of her pupils, Yes, the young ladies said they loved Miss Sleaford dearly. She was so nice. And sometimes, at night, when they begged her very, very hard, she would act. The orphans uttered this last word in an awfully distinct whisper. And, oh, that was beautiful. She would do Hamlet and the ghost. When she stood one way, with a black cloak over her shoulder, she was Hamlet— when she stood the other way, with a mahogany ruler in her hand, she was the ghost. And she acted the ghost so beautifully, that sometimes they were frightened, and wouldn't go outside the schoolroom door without a candle, and somebody's hand to hold, tight. And then Mr. Raymond laughed, and told Roland what he thought of Isabel, phrenologically and otherwise. "'Poor little thing, I think there must be something very sad about the story of her early life,' he said, "'for she so evidently shrinks from all allusion to it. "'It's the old story, I suppose, an unkind stepmother and an uncomfortable home. "'Under these circumstances I was very glad to see her married to a well-disposed, honest-hearted young man. "'She was very fond of Mr. Gilbert, I suppose, very much in love with him,' said Roland, after a little pause. "'In love with him? Not a bit of it. She was very fond of him, I dare say, not in the sentimental manner in which she discourses about her poets and her heroes. But she has every reason to be fond of him as a faithful protector and a good friend.' Mr. Raymond looked up suddenly, and fixed his eyes upon the face of his young kinsman. But it was dusk by this time, and in the dim light of the room Charles Raymond could not see the expression of Roland's face. He could only see the attitude of his head, which drooped a little forward, supported by his hand. "'I lent my voice to the bringing about of Isabel Gilbert's marriage,' Mr. Raymond said, slowly, "'and God grant that no man may ever be base enough or cruel enough "'to interpose himself between these two. "'Amen,' answered Roland Lansdell, in a deep, solemn voice. "'And then he walked to the window and looked out into the twilight garden "'above which the faint summer moon had newly arisen. "'If I could have believed in that splendid fable of a future life,' that grand compensating balance for all the sorrows and mistakes of this lower world, what a good man I might have been, he thought, as he stood there looking out, with his arm resting upon the broad wooden sash, and his head upon his arm. End of chapter 15 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 16 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter 16. 
Mr. Lansdell relates an adventure. The Tuesday was a fine day. The August sunshine, the beautiful harvest-time sunshine, which was rejoicing the hearts of all the farmers in Midlandshire, awoke Mrs. Gilbert very early. She was going to Mordred Priory. For once she forgot to notice the ugliness of the shabby furniture, the bare whitewashed walls upon which her eyes opened. She was going to Mordred Priory. There are moments in our lives in which all the great expanse of the past and the future seem as nothing compared with the consummate felicity of the present. It was very early, but not too early for her to get up, Mrs. Gilbert thought. She seated herself before the little glass at the open window and brushed her long black hair while the birds twittered and shook themselves in the sunshine and the faint lowing of cattle came like a long drowsy murmur from the distant fields. The surgeon and his wife had held solemn conference with each other as to the hour at which they ought to arrive at Mordred Priory. Luncheon might be eaten at any time from one until three, Mr. Gilbert said, and it was decided, therefore, that they should present themselves at the gates of the Priory a short time before one o'clock. How pretty the village of Mordred looked in the sleepy August atmosphere, the hazy, cup-like sunshine. How beautiful everything looked, just at the entrance to the village, where there was a long, straggling inn with a top-heavy roof, all dotted over with impossible little windows, a dear old red-tiled roof with powders and fantails brooding and cooing to themselves in the sunshine, and yellow stone crop creeping here and there in patches of gold. To the right of the inn a shady road led away below the walls of the priory to the square turreted church, and, grander than the church itself, the lofty gates of Mordred dominated over all. Isabel almost trembled as Mr. Gilbert got out of the gig and pulled the iron ring that hung at the end of a long chain on one side of those formidable oaken gates. It seemed like ringing at the door of the past, somehow, and the doctor's wife half expected to see quaintly costumed servants, with long points to their shoes and strange party-colored garments, and a jester with a cap and bells. But the person who opened the gates was only a very harmless old woman, who inhabited some stony chambers on one side of the ponderous archway. George drove slowly under that splendid Norman gateway, and Isabel looked with a shiver at the portcullis and the great rusty chains high above her head. Oh, if it should fall some day upon Mr. Lansdell, as he was riding out of his grand domain! Her mind was like a voluminous picture-book full of romantic incidents and dreadful catastrophes, and she was always imagining such events as these. Browned Molly jogged slowly along the winding drive. Oh, the beautiful shrubberies, and banks of verdure, and dark shining foliage, and dark spreading cedars making solemn shadows yonder on the lawn, and peeps of glistening water in the distance. How beautiful! How beautiful! And stopped before a gothic porch a grey old ivy-covered porch, beneath which there was an open doorway that revealed a hall with armour on the walls and helmeted classic heads of white marble on black marble pedestals and skins of savage beasts upon dark oak floors. Isabel had only caught a brief glimpse of the dusky splendour of this interior when a groom appeared from behind a distant angle of the house and ran forward to take George Gilbert's horse and in the next moment Mr. Lansdell came out of the porch and bade his visitors welcome to Mordred. "'I am so glad to see you. What a lovely morning, is it not? I'm afraid you must have found the roads rather dusty, though. Take care of Mr. Gilbert's horse, Christy. You'd better put him into one of the loose boxes. You see my dogs you know, Mrs. Gilbert.' A liver-colored pointer and a great black retriever were taking friendly notice of Isabel. "'Will you come and see my pictures at once? "'I expect Gwendolen and her father, "'and Raymond, your friend, and the children, presently.' "'There was no special brilliancy or eloquence in all this, "'but it sounded different from other people's talk, somehow. "'The languid, lingering tones were very cordial, "'in spite of their languor, "'and then how splendid the speaker looked "'in his loose, black, velvet morning-coat, "'which harmonized so exquisitely "'with the Rembrandt hues of his complexion. There was a waxen-looking hothouse flower in his buttonhole, 
and across that inspiration of a West End tailor, his waistcoat, there glimmered a slender chain of very yellow gold, with onyx cameos and antique golden coins hanging to it, altogether different from the clumsy yellow lockets and fussy boxes which dangled on the padded chests of the officers at Conventford, whom Isabel had, until so lately, implicitly believed in. Mr. Lansdell led the way into a room beyond which there were other rooms, opening one into the other into a long vista of splendor and sunshine. Isabel had only a very faint idea of what she saw in those beautiful rooms. It was all a confusion of brightness and color, which was almost too much for her poor sentimental brain. It was all a splendid chaos, in which antique oak cabinets and boule marquetry and carved ebony chairs and filigree work and ivory, old Chelsea, Battersea, Copenhagen, Vienna, Dresden, Sevres, Derby, and Salopian China, Majorca and Palissy ware, pictures and painted windows, revolved like the figures in a kaleidoscope before her dazzled eyes. Mr. Lansdell was very kind, and explained the nature of some of these beautiful things as he loitered here and there with his guests. George walked softly, with his hat in his hand, as if he had been in church, and stared with equal reverence at everything. He was pleased with a Vandeville, because the sea was so nice and green, and the rigging so neatly made out, and he stopped a minute before a feet to admire the whiskers of a hare, and he thought that a plump-shouldered divinity by Greuze, with melting blue eyes and a grey satin gown, was rather a fine young woman. But he did not particularly admire the Murillos or the Spanvolettis, and thought that the models who sat to those two masters would have done better if they had washed their faces and combed their hair before doing so. Mr. Gilbert was not enthusiastic about the pictures, but Isabel's eyes wandered here and there in a rapture of admiration, and by and by those great dark eyes filled with tears before the gem of Mr. Lansdell's collection, a Raffaele, a picture of the man of sorrows half fainting under the cruel burden of his cross, sublime in resignation, unspeakably sorrowful and tender, an exquisite half-length figure sharply defined against a vivid blue sky. "'My father believed in that picture,' said Mr. Lansdell. "'But connoisseurs shrug their shoulders and tell me that it never stood upon the easel of Raffaele d'Urbino.' "'But it is so beautiful,' Isabel answered in a low, awe-stricken voice. She had been very inattentive to the rector's sermon on the previous Sunday, but her heart filled with a tender devotion as she looked at this picture— does it matter much who painted it, if it is only beautiful? And then Mr. Lansdell began to explain in what manner the picture differed from the best authenticated productions of the Prince of Painters. But in the middle of this little lecture, Mr. Raymond and the orphans came trooping through the rooms, and the conversation became general. Soon after this, Lady Gwendolen and her father made their appearance— and then a very neatly dressed maid conducted the ladies to a dressing-room that had once belonged to Roland's mother, where the window-curtains were sea-green silk, and the looking-glass was framed in Sèvres bisque, and where there were ivory-backed brushes and glittering bottles of rich yellow-looking perfume in a casket of gold and enamel. Isabel took off her bonnet and smoothed her hair with one of the brushes, and remembered her dressing-table at home, and a broken black brush of George's, with all the unprotected wires sticking out at the back. She thought of the drawer in the looking-glass, with a few bent hair-pins, and her husband's razors with colored bone handles, and a flat, empty bottle that had once held lavender water, all jostling one another when the drawer was pulled open. Mrs. Gilbert thought of these things while Lady Gwendolen removed her bonnet, another marvelous bonnet, and drew off the tightest coffee with plenty of milk in it colored gloves, and revealed long white hands luminous with opals and diamonds. The doctor's wife had time to contemplate Lady Gwendolen's silk dress, that exquisitely fitting dress, whose soft golden brown was only a little darker than the lady's hair, and the tiny embroidered collar fitting closely to the long slender throat, and clasped by one big turquoise in a wide rim of lustreless gold, and the turquoise earrings just peeping out under rich bands of auburn hair, 
Mrs. Gilbert admired all these things, and she saw that Lady Gwendolen's face, which was so handsome in profile, was just a little faded and wan when you had a full view of it. The orphans took the gold tops off the bottles one by one, and sniffed energetically at the different perfumes, and disputed in whispers as to which was nicest. Lady Gwendolen talked very kindly to Mrs. Gilbert. She did not at all relish being asked to meet the doctor's wife, and she was angry with her cousin for noticing these people, but she was too well-bred to be otherwise than kind to Roland's visitor. They all went downstairs presently, and were ushered into an oak-panelled room, where there was an oval table laid for luncheon, and where Isabel found herself seated presently on Mr. Lansdell's right hand, and opposite to Lady Gwendolen Pomfrey. This was life. There was a lance-like group of hothouse grapes and peaches, crowned with a pineapple, in a high Dresden basket in the centre of the table. Isabel had never been in company with a pineapple until to-day. There were flowers upon the table, and a faint odour of orange blossoms and apricots pervaded the atmosphere. There were starry white glasses, so fragile-looking that it seemed as if a breath would have blown them away. Cup-shaped glasses, broad, shallow glasses, like water-lily leaves, glasses of the palest green, and here and there a glimpse of a ruby glass flashing in the sunshine— Mrs. Gilbert had a vague idea of the nature of the viands which were served to her at that wonderful feast. Somebody dropped a lump of ice into the shallow glass, and filled it afterward with a yellow bubbling wine, which had a faint flavor of jargonelle pears, and which someone said was Moselle. Mr. Lansdell put some white creamy compound on her plate, which might or might not have been chicken, and one of the servants brought her an edifice of airy pastry— filled with some mysterious concoction in which there were little black lumps. She took a spoonful of the concoction, seeing that other people had done so, but she was very doubtful about the little black lumps, which she conjectured might be a mistake of the cook's. And then someone brought her an ice, a real ice, just as if Mordred Priory had been a perpetual pastry-cook's shop, a pink ice in the shape of a pear, which she ate with a pointed golden spoon, and then the pineapple was cut, and she had a slice of it, and was rather disappointed in it, as hardly realizing the promise of its appearance. But all the dishes in that banquet were of such stuff as dreams are made of, so may have tasted the dewberries which Titania's attendants gave to Bottom. To Isabel there was a dreamlike flavor in everything. Was not he by her side? talking to her every now and then. The subjects of which he spoke were commonplace enough, certainly, and he talked to other people as well as to her. He talked about the plans of the cabinet and the hunting season to Lord Reesdale, and he talked of books and pictures with Mr. Raymond and Lady Gwendolen, and of parish matters with George Gilbert. He seemed to know all about everything in the world, Isabel thought. She could not say how much, how to admire, was all the art she knew. As to the orphans, those young ladies sat side by side, and nudged each other when the sacrificial knife was plunged into any fresh viand, and discoursed together every now and then in rapturous whispers. No part of the banquet came amiss to these young persons, from rout cakes and preserved ginger to lobster salad or the wall of a fricado. It was four o'clock by the time the pineapple had been cut, and the banquet concluded. The oak-painted room was lighted by one window, a great square window, which almost filled one side of the room, a splendid window, out of which you could walk into a square garden, an old-fashioned garden, divided from the rest of the grounds by cropped hedges of dense box, wonderful boundaries that had taken a century or two to grow. The bees were humming in this garden all luncheon-time, and yellow butterflies shot backwards and forwards in the sunshine. Tall hollyhocks flowered gorgeously in the prim beds and threw straight shadows on the grass. "'Shall we go into the garden?' said Lady Gwendolen, as they rose from the table and everybody assented. So presently Isabel found herself amidst a little group upon the miniature lawn, in the centre of which there was a broad marble basin filled with goldfish, and a feeble little fountain that made a faint tinkling sound in the still August atmosphere. 
Mr. Raymond and Roland Lansdell both having plenty to say for themselves, and Lord Reesdale and Lady Gwendolen being able to discourse pleasantly upon any possible subject, there had been no lack of animated conversation, though neither the doctor nor his wife had done much to keep the ball rolling. Mr. Lansdell and his guests had been talking of all manner of things— flying off at tangents to all kinds of unlikely subjects, till they had come, somehow or other, to discuss the question of length of days. "'I can't say that I consider long life an inestimable blessing,' said Roland, who was amusing himself with throwing minute morsels of a macaroon to the goldfish. "'They're not so interesting as Stern's donkeys, are they, Mrs. Gilbert?' "'No, I do not consider long life an advantage, unless one can be warm and young for ever, like our dear Raymond. Perhaps I am only depreciating the fruit because it hangs out of my reach, though, for everybody knows that the Lansdells never live to be old.' Isabel's heart gave a bump as Roland said this, and involuntarily she looked at him with just one sudden startled glance. Of course he would die young. Beings always have so died, and always must. A thrill of pain shot through her breast as she thought of this. Yet I doubt if she would have had it otherwise. It would be almost better that he should break a blood vessel, or catch a fever, or commit suicide, than that he should ever live to have grey hair, and wear spectacles, and double-soled boots." Brief as that sudden look of alarm had been, Roland had seen it, and paused for a moment before he went on talking. "'No, we are not a long-lived race. We have been consumptive, and we have had our heads cut off in the good old days, when to make a confidential remark to a friend was very often lèse majesty or high treason. And we have been killed in battle, at Floden, to wit, and at Fontenoy, and in the peninsula, and one of us was shot through the lungs in an Irish duel on the open sword of the Phanix. In short, I almost fancy some fearful ban must have been set upon us in the Dark Ages, when one of our progenitors, a wicked prior of Mordred, who had been a soldier and a renegade before he crept into the bosom of the church, appropriated some of the sanctified plate to make a dowry for his handsome daughter, who married Sir Anthony Lansdell, knight, and thus became the mother of our race. And we are evidently a doomed race, for very few of us have ever lived to see a fortieth birthday. "'And how is your doom to be brought about, Roland?' asked Lady Gwendolen. "'Oh, that's all settled,' Mr. Lansdell answered. "'I know my destiny.' "'It has been predicted to you?' "'Yes.' "'How very interesting!' exclaimed the lady, with a pretty silvery laugh. Isabel's eyes opened wider and wider, and fixed themselves on Roland Lansdell's face. "'Pray tell us all about it,' continued Lady Gwendolen. "'We won't promise to be very much frightened, because the accessories are not quite the thing for a ghost story. If it were midnight now, and we were sitting in the oak room, with the lights burning low and the shadows trembling on the wall, you might do what you liked with our nerves.' "'And yet I really don't know that a ghost story might not be more awful in the broad sunshine, "'a ghost that would stand across the glass and then fade slowly till it melted into the water-drops of the fountain. "'Come, Roland, you must tell us all about the prediction. "'Was it made by a pretty girl with a dove on her wrist, like the phantom that appeared to Lord Littleton? "'Shall we have to put back the clock for an hour in order to foil the designs of your impalpable foe?' "'Or was it a black cat, or a gentleman usher, or a skeleton, or all three? "'I dare say it was an abnormal state of the organs of form and colour, said Mr. Raymond. "'That's the foundation of all ghost stories.' "'It isn't by any means a ghost story,' answered Roland Lansdell. "'The gentleman who predicted my early death was the very reverse of a phantom, and the region of the prediction was a place which had never yet been invested with any supernatural horrors. Amongst all the legends of the Old Bailey, I never heard of any ghostly record. "'The Old Bailey!' exclaimed Lady Gwendolen. "'Yes, the affair was quite an adventure, and the only adventure I ever had in my life. Pray tell us the story. But it's rather a long one, and not particularly interesting. I insist upon hearing it.' said Mr. Raymond. You've stimulated our organs of wonder, and you're bound to restore our brains to their normal state by satisfying our curiosity. 
"'Most decidedly!' exclaimed Lady Gwendolen, seating herself upon a rustic bench, with the shining folds of her silk dress spread round her like the plumage of some beautiful bird, and a tiny fringed parasol sloping a little backward from her head, and throwing all manner of tremulous pinky shadows upon her animated face. She was very handsome when she was animated. It was only when her face was in repose that you saw how much beauty had faded since the picture with the high forehead and the long curls was first exhibited to an admiring public. It may be that Lady Gwendolen knew this, and was on that account rather inclined to be animated about trifles. "'Well, I'll tell you the story if you like,' said Roland. "'But I warn you that there's not much in it. I don't suppose you, any of you, take much interest in criminal cases.' "'But this one made rather a sensation at the time. "'A criminal case? "'Yes. "'I was in town on business a year or two ago. "'I'd come over from Switzerland to renew some leases "'and look into a whole batch of tiresome business matters, "'which my lawyer insisted upon my attending to "'in my own proper person, very much to my annoyance. "'While I was in London, "'I dropped into the United Joint Stock Bank, Temple Bar Branch,' to get circular notes and letters of credit upon their correspondent at Constantinople, and so on. I was not in the office more than five minutes, but while I was talking to one of the clerks at the counter, a man came in and stood close at my elbow while he handed in a check for eighty-seven pounds ten, or some such amount, I know it came very close upon the hundred, received the money, and went out. He looked like a groom out of livery. I left the bank almost immediately after him, and as he turned into a little alley leading down to the temple, I followed a few paces behind him, for I had business in paper buildings. At the bottom of the alley my friend the groom was met by a big black-whiskered man, who seemed to have been waiting for him, for he caught him suddenly by the arm and said, "'Well, did they do it?' Yes, the other man answered, and began fumbling in his waistcoat pocket, making a chinking sound as he did so. I had seen him put his money, which he took in notes and gold, into this waistcoat pocket. You needn't have pounced upon me so precious sharp, he said rather sulkily. I wasn't going to bolt with it, was I? The black-whiskered man had seen me by this time, and he muttered something to his companion, which evidently meant that he was to hold his tongue, and then dragged him off without further ceremony in the opposite direction to that in which I was going. This was all I saw of the groom or the black-whiskered gentleman on that occasion. I thought their method of cashing a check was rather a queer one, but I thought no more about it until three weeks afterwards, when I went into the Temple Bar office of the United Joint Stock again to complete my continental arrangements, and was told that the check for eighty-seven pounds ten, more or less, which had been cashed in my presence, was a forgery, one of a series of most audacious frauds, perpetrated by a gang whose plans had only just come to light, and none of whom had yet been arrested. "'They've managed to keep themselves dark in the most extraordinary manner,' the clerk told me. "'The checks are supposed to have been all fabricated by one man,' But three or four men have been employed to get hold of the original signatures of our customers, which they have obtained by a complicated system. No two checks have been presented by the same person. That's the point that has beaten the detectives. They don't know what sort of men to look for. Don't they? said I. Then I think I can assist them in the matter, whereupon I told my little story of the black-whiskered gentleman. Mr. Lansdell paused to take a breath and stole a glance at Isabel. She was pale always, but she was very pale now, and was watching him with an eager, breathless expression. Silly, romantic little thing, he thought, to be so intensely absorbed in my story. You're getting interesting, Roland, said Lady Gwendolen. Pray go on. The upshot of the matter was that, at eight o'clock that evening, a grave little gentleman in a pepper-and-salt waistcoat came to me at Mivart's and cross-questioned me closely as to what I knew of the man who had cashed the check. "'You think you could recognize this man with the black whiskers?' he said. "'Yes, most decidedly I could.' "'And you'll swear to him, if necessary?' "'With pleasure.' 
On this the detective departed, and came to me the next day to tell me that he fancied he was on the track of the man he warded, but he was at a loss for means of identification. He knew, or thought he knew, who the man was, but he didn't know the man himself from Adam. The gang had taken fright, and it was believed that they all had started for Liverpool with the intention of getting off to America by a sea vessel that was expected to sail at eight o'clock the following morning. The detective had only just got his information, and he came to me for help. The result of the business was that I put on my great coat, sent for a cab, and started for Euston Square with my friend the detective, with a view to identifying the black-whiskered gentleman. It was the first adventure I had ever had in my life, and I assure you I most heartily enjoyed it. Well, we travelled by the mail, got into Liverpool in the dead of the night, and in the bleak early dawn of the next morning I had the supreme pleasure of pointing out my black-whiskered acquaintance, just as he was going to step on board the steamer that was to convey him to the Atalanta Screw steamship bound for New York. He looked very black at first, but when he found that my companion was altogether en règle, he went away with him, meekly enough, declaring that it was all a mistake, and that it would be easily set right in town. I let the two go back together, and returned by a later train, very well pleased with my adventure. I was not so well pleased, however, when I found that I was wanted as a witness at preliminary examinations, and adjourned examinations, and on and off throughout a trial that lasted four days and a half, to say nothing of being badgered and browbeaten by old Bailey practitioners, who were counsel for the prisoner, and who asked me if it was my friend's whiskers I recognized, or if I had never seen any other whiskers exactly like his, if I should know him without his whiskers, whether I could swear to the color of his waistcoat, whether any member of my family had ever been in a lunatic asylum, whether I usually devoted my leisure time to traveling about with detective officers, whether I had been plucked at Oxford, whether I should be able to recognize an acquaintance whom I had only seen once in twenty years, whether I was short-sighted, could I swear I was not short-sighted, would I be kind enough to read a verse or so from a diamond edition of the works of Thomas Moore, and so on. But, question me as they would, the prisoner at the bar, commonly known as Jack the Scribe, alias Jack the Gentleman, alias ever so many other names, which I have completely forgotten, was the identical person whom I had seen meet the groom at the entrance to the temple. My evidence was only a single link in a long chain, but I suppose it was eminently damaging to my black-whiskered friend, for when he and two of his associates had received their sentence, ten years' penal servitude, he turned towards where I was standing, and said, I don't bear any grudge against the gentlemen of the jury, and I don't bear any malice against the judge, though his sentence isn't a light one, but when a languid swell mixes himself up in business that doesn't concern him, he deserves to get it hot and strong, and if ever I come out of prison alive, I'll kill you. He shook his fist at me as he said it. There wasn't much in his words, but there was a good deal in the way in which they were spoken. He tried to say more, but the warders got hold of him, and held him down, panting and gasping, and with his face all of a dull, livid white. I saw no more of him, but if he does live to come out of prison, I most firmly believe he'll keep his word. "'Izzy,' cried George Gilbert, suddenly, "'what's the matter?' All the point of Mr. Lansdell's story was lost." for at this moment Isabel tottered and fell slowly backward upon the sward, and all the goldfish leaped away in panic of terror as the doctor dipped his hat into the marble basin. He splashed the water into his wife's face, and she opened her eyes at last, very slowly, and looked round her. "'Did he say that?' she said. "'Did he say that he'd kill?' End of chapter 16 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 17 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 17 The First Warning 
Mrs. Gilbert recovered very quickly from her fainting fit. She had been frightened by Mr. Lansdell's story, she said, and the heat had made her dizzy. She sat very quietly upon a sofa in the drawing-room, with one of the orphans on each side of her, while Brown Molly was being harnessed. Lady Gwendolen went away with her father, after bidding Mrs. Gilbert rather a cool good morning. The Earl of Reesdale's daughter did not approve of the fainting fit, which she was pleased to call Mrs. Gilbert's extraordinary demonstration. "'If she were a single woman, I should fancy she was trying to fascinate Roland,' Lady Gwendolen said to her father, as they drove homewards. "'What can possibly have induced him to invite those people to Mordred? The man is a clod, and the woman a non-entity, except when she chooses to make an exhibition of herself by fainting away. That sort of person is always fainting away and being knocked down by feathers and going unexpectedly into impossible hysterics, and so on.' But if Lady Gwendolen was unkind to the doctor's wife, Roland was kind, dangerously, bewilderingly kind. He was so anxious about Isabel's health. It was his fault, entirely his fault, that she had fainted. He had kept her standing under the blazing sun while he told his stupid story. He should never forgive himself, he said, and he would scarcely accept George Gilbert's assurance that his wife was all right. He rang the bell and ordered strong tea for his visitors— with his own hands he closed the Venetian shutters and reduced the light to a cool, dusky glimmer. He begged Mr. Gilbert to allow him to order a closed carriage for his wife's return to Greybridge. "'The gig shall be sent home to you to-night,' he said. "'I am sure the air and dust will be too much for Mrs. Gilbert.' But Mr. Raymond hereupon interfered, and said the fresh air was just the very thing that Isabel wanted, to which opinion the lady herself subscribed. She did not want to cause trouble, she said, she would not for all the world have caused him trouble, she thought. So the gig was brought round presently, and George drove his wife away, under the Norman archway by which they had entered in the fresh noonday sun. The young man was in excellent spirits, and declared that he had enjoyed himself beyond measure. These undemonstrative people always declare that they enjoy themselves. But Isabel was very silent and subdued, and when questioned upon the subject, said that she was tired. Oh, how blank the world seemed after that visit to Mordred Priory! It was all over. This one supreme draught of bliss had been drained to the very dregs. It would be November soon, and Roland Lansdell would go away. He would go before November, perhaps. He would go suddenly, whenever the fancy seized him. Who can calculate the arrangements of the Jower or Sir Reginald Glanville? At any moment, in the dead darkness of the moonless sky, the hero might call for his fiery steed, and only the thunder of hurrying hoofs upon the high hard road may bear witness of his departure. Mr. Lansdell might leave Mordred at any hour in the long summer day, Isabel thought, as she stood at the parlour window, looking out at the dusty lane where Mrs. Jeffson's fowls were pecking up stray grains of wheat that had been scattered by some passing wain. He might be gone now, yes, now, while she stood there thinking of him. Her heart seemed to stop beating as she remembered this. Why had he ever invited her to Mordred? Was it not almost cruel to open the door of that paradise just a little way, only to shut it again when she was half-blinded by the glorious light from within? Would he ever think of her, this grand creature with dark, pensive eyes, tender, dreamy eyes that were never the same color for two consecutive minutes? Was she anything to him, or was that musical lowering of his voice common to him when he spoke to women? Again and again, and again and again, she went over all that shining ground of that day at Mordred, and the flowers and glass and pictures and painted windows and hothouse fruit only made a kind of variegated background against which he stood forth paramount and unapproachable. She sat and thought of Roland Lansdell, with some scrap of never-to-be-finished work lying in her lap. It was better than reading. A crabbed little old woman who kept the only circulating library in Greybridge noted a falling off in her best customer about this time. It was better than reading, to sit through all the length of a hot August afternoon thinking of Roland Lansdell. What romance had ever been written that was equal to this story, this perpetual fiction, with a real hero dominant in every chapter? 
There was a good deal of repetition in the book, perhaps, but Isabel was never aware of its monotony. It was all very wicked, of course, and a deep and cruel wrong to the simple country surgeon who ate his dinner and complained of the underdone condition of the mutton upon one side of the table, while Isabel read the inexhaustible volume on the other. It was very wicked, but Mrs. Gilbert had not yet come to consider the wickedness of her ways. She was a very good wife, very gentle and obedient, and she fancied she had a right to furnish the secret chambers of her mind according to her own pleasure. What did it matter if a strange god reigned in the temple, so long as the doors were forever closed upon his awful beauty, so long as she rendered all due service to her liege lord and master? He was her lord and master, though his fingers were square at the tips, and he had an abnormal capacity for the consumption of spring onions. Spring onions! All the year round onions, Isabel thought, for those obnoxious bulbs seemed always in season at Greybridge. She was very wicked, and she thought perpetually of Roland Lansdell, as she had thought of Eugene Aram and Lara and Ernest Maltravers, blue-eyed Ernest Maltravers. The blue-eyed heroes were out of fashion now, for was not he dark of aspect? She was very wicked. She was very foolish, very childish. All her life long she had played with the heroines and heroes as other children play with their dolls. Now Edith Dombey was the favorite, and now dark-eyed Zuleika, kneeling forever at Salem's feet with an unheeded flower in her hand. Left quite to herself through all her idle girlhood, this foolish child had fed upon three-volume novels and sentimental poetry, and now that she was married and invested with the solemn duties of a wife, she could not throw off the sweet romantic bondage all at once and take to pies and puddings. So she made no endeavor to banish Mr. Lansdell's image from her mind. If she had recognized the need of such an effort, she would have made it, perhaps, but she thought that he would go away and her life would drop back to its dead level and would be all the same as if he had not been. But Mr. Lansdell did not leave Mordred just yet. Only a week after the never-to-be-forgotten day at the Priory, he came again to Thurston's Crag, and found Isabel sitting under the oak with her books in her lap. She started up as he approached her, looking rather frightened, and with her face flushed and eyelids drooping. She had not expected him. Demigods do not often drop out of the clouds. It is only once in a way that Castor or Pollux are seen fighting in a mortal fray. Mrs. Gilbert sat down again, blushing and trembling, but oh, so happy, so foolishly, unutterably happy. And Roland Lansdell seated himself by her side and began to talk to her. He did not make the slightest allusion to that unfortunate swoon which had spoiled the climax of his story that one subject which of all others would have been most embarrassing to the doctor's wife was scrupulously avoided by mr lansdell he talked of all manner of things he had been a flaneur pure and simple for the last ten years and was a consummate master of the art of conversation so he talked to this ignorant girl of books and pictures and foreign cities and wonderful people living and dead of whom she had never heard before he seemed to know everything, Mrs. Gilbert thought. She felt as if she was before the wonderful gates of a new fairyland, and Mr. Lansdell had the keys, and could open them for her at his will, and could lead her through the dim, mysterious pathways into the beautiful regions beyond. Mr. Lansdell asked his companion a good many questions about her life at Greybridge, and the books she read, he found that her life was a very idle one, and that she was perpetually reading the same books, the dear dilapidated volumes of popular novels that were to be had at every circulating library. Poor little childish creature, who could wonder at her foolish sentimentality? Out of pure philanthropy, Roland offered to lend her any of the books in his library. If you can manage to stroll this way tomorrow morning, I'll bring you The Life of Robespierre and Carlyle's French Revolution. I don't suppose you'll like Carlyle at first, but he's wonderful when you get accustomed to his style. 
like a monster brass band, you know, that stuns you at first with its crashing thunder, until little by little you discover the wonderful harmony, and appreciate the beauty of the instrumentation. Shall I bring you Lamartine's Girondiste as well? That will make a great pile of books, but you need not read them laboriously. You can pick out the pages you like here and there, and we can talk about them afterwards. The French Revolution was one of Isabel's pet oases in the history of the universe, a wonderful period, in which a quiet, country-bred young woman had only to make her way up to Paris and assassinate a tyrant, and, lo, she became a feature throughout all time. Mr. Lansdell had discovered this special fancy in his talk with the doctor's wife, and he was pleased to let in the light of positive knowledge on her vague ideas of the chiefs of the mountain and the martyrs of Gironde. Was it not an act of pure philanthropy to clear some of the sentimental mistiness out of that pretty little head? Was it not a good work, rather than a harmful one, to come now and then to this shadowy resting-place under the oak, and while away an hour or so with this poor little half-educated damsel, who had so much need of some sounder instruction than she had been able to glean, unaided, out of novels and volumes of poetry. There was no harm in these morning rambles, these meetings, which arose out of the purest chance. There was no harm whatever, especially as Mr. Lansdell meant to turn his back upon Midlandshire directly the partridge-shooting was over. He told Isabel indirectly of this intended departure presently. "'Yes,' he said, "'you must ask me for whatever books you would like to read, and by and by, when I have left Mordred,' he paused for a moment, involuntarily, for he saw that Isabel gave a little shiver— "'When I leave Mordred at the end of October, you must go to the Priory and choose the books for yourself. My housekeeper is a very good woman, and she will be pleased to wait upon you.' So Mrs. Gilbert began a quiet new course of reading, and eagerly devoured the books which Mr. Lansdell brought her, and wrote long extracts from them, and made profile sketches of the heroes, all looking from right to left, and all bearing a strong family resemblance to the master of Mordred Priory. The education of the doctor's wife took a grand stride by this means. She sat for hours together reading in the little parlour at Greybridge, and George, whose life was a very busy one, grew to consider her only in her normal state with a book in her hand, and was in no wise offended when she ate her supper with an open volume by the side of her plate, or responded vaguely to his simple talk. Mr. Gilbert was quite satisfied. He had never sought for more than this, a pretty little wife to smile upon him when he came home, to brush his hat for him now and then in the passage after breakfast before he went out for his day's work, and to walk to church twice every Sunday, hanging upon his arm, if any one had ever said that such a marriage as this in any way fell short of perfect and entire union, Mr. Gilbert would have smiled upon that person as on a harmless madman. Mr. Lansdale met the doctor's wife very often, sometimes on the bridge beside the watermill, sometimes in the meadowland which surged in emerald billows all about Greybridge and Mordred and Warncliffe. He met her very often. It was no new thing for Isabel to ramble here and there in that lovely rustic paradise, but it was quite a new thing for Mr. Lansdell to take such a fancy for pedestrian exercise. The freak could not last long, though. The feast of St. Partridge the Martyr was close at hand, and then Mr. Lansdell would have something better to do than dawdle away his time in country lanes and meadows talking to the doctor's wife. Upon the very eve of that welcome morning, which was to set all the guns in Midlandshire popping at those innocent red-breasted victims, George Gilbert received a letter from his old friend and comrade, Mr. Sigismund Smith, who wrote in very high spirits, and with a great many blots. "'I'm coming down to stop a few days with you, dear old boy,' he wrote, to get London smoke blown out of my hyacinths, and to go abroad in the meadows to see the young lambs. Are there any young lambs in September, by the by? I want to see what sort of a matron you have made of Miss Isabel Sleaford. Do you remember that day in the garden when you first saw her? A palpable case of spoons, there and then. 
as Mr. Buckstone remarks when he digs his knuckles into the walking gentleman's ribs. Does she make puddings and sew on buttons and fill up the holes in your stockings with wonderful trellis work? She never would do that sort of thing at Camberwell. I shall give you a week, and I shall spend another week in the bosom of my family, and I shall bring a gun because it looks well in the railway carriage, you know, especially if it doesn't go off which I suppose it won't, if it isn't loaded, though to my mind there's always something suspicious about the look of firearms, and I should never be surprised to see them explode by spontaneous combustion or something of that kind. I suppose you've heard of my new three-volume novel, a legitimate three-volume romance with all the interest concentrated upon one body, The Mystery of Mowbray Manor. Pleasant alliteration of M's, eh? which is taking the town by storm, that's to say Camden Town, where I partial board, and have some opportunity of pushing the book myself by going into all the circulating libraries I pass, and putting my name down for an early perusal of the first copy. Of course I never go for the book, but if I am the means of making any one simple-minded librarian take a copy of the M of M M more than he wants, I feel I have not labored in vain." Mr. Smith arrived at Warncliffe by an early train next morning, and came on to Greybridge in an omnibus which was quite spiky with guns. He was in very high spirits, and talked incessantly to Isabel, who had stayed at home to receive him, who had stayed at home when there was just a faint chance that Mr. Lansdell might take his morning walk in the direction of Lord Thurston's Crag, only a faint chance, for was it not the first of September, and might not he prefer the slaughter of partridges to those lazy loiterings under the big oak? Mrs. Gilbert gave her old friend a very cordial welcome. She was fond of him, as she might have been of some big brother less objectionable than the ordinary run of big brothers. He had never seen Mr. Sleaford's daughter looking so bright and beautiful. A new element had been introduced into her life. She was happy unutterably happy, on the mystical threshold of a new existence. She did not want to be Edith Dombey any longer. Not for all the ruby velvet gowns and diamond coronets in the world would she have sacrificed one accidental half-hour on the bridge under Lord Thurston's oak. She sat at the little table smiling and talking gaily, while the author of The Mystery of Mowbray Manor ate about a half a quartern of dough made up into puffy Yorkshire cakes, and new-laid eggs and frizzled bacon in proportion. Mr. Smith deprecated the rampant state of his appetite by and by, and made a kind of apology for his ravages. "'You see, the worst of going into society is that,' he remarked vaguely, they see one eat, and it's apt to tell against one in three volumes. It's a great pity that fiction is not compatible with a healthy appetite, but it isn't, and society is so apt to object to one if one doesn't come up to its expectations. You've no idea what a lot of people have invited me out to tea. Ladies, you know, since the publication of The Mystery of Mowbray Manor. I used to go at first, but they generally said to me, "'Lor, Mr. Smith, you're not a bit like what I fancied you were. I thought you'd be tall and dark and haughty-looking, like Montague Manderville in The Mystery of etc., etc., and that sort of thing is apt to make a man feel himself an impostor. And if a writer of fiction can't drink hot tea without colouring up as if he had just pocketed a silver spoon, and it was his guilty conscience, why, my idea is he'd better stay at home.' "'I don't think any man was ever as good or as bad as his books,' continued Sigismund, reflectively, scraping up a spoonful of that liquid grease which Mrs. Jeffson tersely entitled Dip. "'There is a kind of righteous indignation and a frantic desire to do something splendid for his fellow creatures, like vaccinating them all over again, or founding a hospital for everybody, which a man feels when he's writing.' especially late at night, when he's been keeping himself awake with bitter ale, that seems to ooze away somehow when his copy has gone to the printers, and it's pretty much the same with one's scorn and hate and cynicism. Nobody ever quite comes up to his books. Even Byron, but for turning down his collars and walking lame and dining on biscuits and soda-water, might have been a social failure. 
I think there's a good deal of Horace Walpole's inspired idiocy in this world. The morning sun shines, and the statue is musical, but all the day there is silence, and at night, in a society, I suppose, the sounds are lugubrious. Now I do talk, Izzy, and you don't say anything, but I needn't ask if you're happy. I never saw you looking so pretty. Isabel blushed. Was she pretty? Oh, she wanted so much to be pretty. And I think George may congratulate himself upon having secured the dearest little wife in all Midlandshire. Mrs. Gilbert blushed a deeper red, but the happy smile died away on her lips. Something, a very vague something as yet, was lurking in what Mr. Raymond would have called her inner consciousness, and she thought, perhaps, George had not such a very great reason for self-gratulation. "'I always do as he tells me,' she said naively, "'and he's kinder than Mamma used to be, and doesn't mind my reading at meals. You know how Mamma used to go on about it, and I mend his socks sometimes.' She drew open a drawer, where there were some little bundles of grey wool and stuff, and balls of worsted with big needles stuck across them. And, oh, Sigismund, she exclaimed rather inconsecutively, we've been to Mordred, to Mordred Priory, to a luncheon, quite a grand luncheon, pineapple, and ices, and nearly half a dozen different kinds of glasses for each person. She could talk to Sigismund about Mordred and the master of Mordred, he was not like George. He would sympathize with her enthusiasm about that earthly paradise. "'Do you know Mordred?' she asked. She felt a kind of pleasure in calling the mansion Mordred, all short, as he called it. "'I know the village of Mordred well enough,' Mr. Smith answered, "'and I ought to know the priory precious well. The last Mr. Lansdell gave my father a good deal of business, and when Roland Lansdell was being coached up in the classics by a private tutor, I used to go up to the Priory and read with him. The governor was very glad to get such a chance for me, but I can't say I intensely appreciated the advantage myself on hot summer afternoons when there was cricketing on Warncliffe Meads. "'You knew him? You knew Mr. Roland Lansdell when he was a boy?' said Isabel with a little gasp. "'I certainly did, my dear Izzy, but I don't think there's anything wonderful in that. "'You couldn't open your eyes much wider if I said I'd known Eugene Aram when he was a boy. "'I remember Roland Lansdell,' continued Mr. Smith, slapping his breakfast napkin across his dusty boots. "'And a very jolly young fellow he was, a regular young swell, with a chimney-pot hat and dandy boots, and a gold hunter in his waistcoat pocket.' and no end of pencil cases and cricket balls and dwarfing portfolios and single sticks and fishing tackle he taught me fencing added sigismund throwing himself suddenly into a position that covered one entire side of the little parlour and making a postman's knock upon the carpet with the sole of his foot come mrs gilbert he said presently put on your bonnet and come out for a walk i suppose there is no chance of our seeing george till dinner-time Isabel was pleased to go out. All the world seemed astir upon this bright September morning, and out of doors there was always just a chance of meeting him. She put on her hat, the broad-leaved straw that cast such soft shadows upon her face, and she took up the big green parasol and was ready to accompany her old friend in a minute. "'I don't want the greetings in the marketplace,' Mr. Smith said, as they went out into the lane, where it was always very dusty and dry weather, and very muddy when there was rain. "'I know almost everybody in Greybridge, and there'll be a round of stereotyped questions and answers to go through, as to how I'm getting on oop in London. I can't tell those people that I earn my bread by writing The Demon of the Galleys, or The Mystery of Mowbray Manor.' "'Take me for a country walk, Izzy, a regular rustic ramble.' Mrs. Gilbert blushed. The habit of blushing when she spoke, or was spoken to, had grown upon her lately. Then, after a little pause, she said shyly, "'Thurston's Crag is a pretty place. Shall we go there?' "'Suppose we do. That's quite a brilliant thought of yours, Izzy. Thurston's Crag is a pretty place, a nice, drowsy, lazy old place.' where one always goes to sleep and wishes one had bottled beer. It reminds one of bottled beer, you know, the waterfall, bottled beer in a rampant state of effervescence. Isabel's face was all lighted up with smiles. I am so glad you have come to see us, Sigismund, she said. 
She was very glad. She might go to Thurston's Crag now as often as she could beguile Sigismund thitherward, and that haunting sense of something wrong would no longer perplex her in the midst of her unutterable joy. It was unutterable. She had tried to write poetry about it, and had failed dismally, though her heart was making poetry all day long, as wildly, vaguely beautiful as Solomon's song. She had tried to set her joy to music, but there were no notes on the harpsichord that could express such wondrous melody, though there was indeed one little simple theme, an old-fashioned air, arranged as a waltz. "'Twere vain to tell thee all I feel,' which Isabel would play slowly again and again for an hour together, dragging the melody out into lingering legato notes and listening to its talk about Roland Lansdell. But all this was very wicked, of course. Today she could go to Thurston's Crag with a serene front, an unburdened conscience. What could be more intensely proper than this country walk with her mother's late partial boarder? They turned into the meadows presently, and as they drew nearer and nearer to the grassy hollow under the cliff where the miller's cottage and the waterfall were nestled together like jewels in a casket of emerald velvet, the ground seemed to grow unsubstantial under her feet, as if Thurston's crag had been a phantasmal region suspended in mid-air. Would he be there? Her heart was perpetually beating out the four syllables of that simple sentence. Would he be there? It was the first of September, and he would be away shooting partridges, perhaps. Oh, was there even the remotest chance that he would be there? Sigismund handed her across the stile in the last meadow, and then there was only a little bit of smooth verdure between them and the waterfall but the overhanging branches of the trees intervened, and Isabel could not see yet whether there was any one on the bridge. But presently the narrow winding path brought them to a break in the foliage. Isabel's heart gave a tremendous bound, and then the color, which had come and gone so often on her face, faded away altogether. He was there, leaning with his back against the big knotted trunk of the oak, and making a picture of himself, with one arm above his head, plucking the oak leaves and dropping them into the water. He looked down at the glancing water and the hurrying leaves, with a moody, dissatisfied scowl. Had he been anything less than a hero, one might have thought that he looked sulky. But when the light footsteps came rustling through the long grass, accompanied by the faint fluttering of a woman's garments, his face brightened as suddenly as if the dense foliage above his head had been swept away by a titan's axe, and all the sunshine let in upon him. That very expressive face darkened a little when Mr. Lansdell saw Sigismund behind the doctor's wife, but the cloud was transient. The jealous delusions of a monomaniac could scarcely have transformed Mr. Smith into a Cassio. Desdemona might have pleaded for him all day long, and might have supplied him with any number of pocket-handkerchiefs hemmed by and marked by her own fair hands, without causing the moor a single apprehensive pang. Mr. Lansdell did not recognize the youthful acquaintance who had stumbled a little way in the thorny path of knowledge by his side, but he saw that Sigismund was a harmless creature, and after he had bared his handsome head before Isabel, he gave Mr. Smith a friendly little nod of general application. "'I have let the keepers shoot the first of the partridges,' he said, dropping his voice almost to a whisper as he bent over Mrs. Gilbert, "'and I have been here ever since ten o'clock. It was past one now.' He had been there three hours, Isabel thought, waiting for her. Yes, it had gone so far as this already, but he was to go away at the end of October. He was to go away, it would all be over, and the world would come to an end by the first of November. There was a little pile of books upon the seat under the tree. Mr. Lansdell pushed them off the bench and tumbled them ignominiously among the long grass and weeds beneath it. Isabel saw them fall, and uttered a little exclamation of surprise. "'You have brought me,' she began, but to her astonishment Roland checked her with a frown, and began to talk about the waterfall and the trout that were to be caught in the season lower down the stream. 
Mr. Lansdell was more worldly wise than the doctor's wife, and he knew that the books brought there for her might seem slightly suggestive of an appointment. There had been no appointment, of course, but there was always a chance of finding Isabel under Lord Thurston's oak. Had she not gone there constantly, long ago, when Mr. Lansdell was lounging in Grecian islands and eating ices under the colonnades of Venice? And was it strange that she should go there now? I should become very wearisome were I to transcribe all that was said that morning. It was a very happy morning, a long, idle, sunshiny pause in the business of life. Roland recognized an old acquaintance in Sigismund Smith presently, and the two young men talked gaily of their juvenile days at Mordred. They talked pleasantly of all manner of things. Mr. Lansdell must have been quite ardently attached to Sigismund in those early days, if one might judge of the past by the present, for he greeted his old acquaintance with an absolute effusion, and sketched out quite a little royal progress of rustic enjoyment for the week Sigismund was to stay at Greybridge. "'We'll have a picnic,' he said. "'You remember we talked about a picnic, Mrs. Gilbert. "'We'll have a picnic at Waverley Castle.' There isn't a more delightfully inconvenient place for a picnic in all Midlandshire. One can dine on the top of the western tower in actual danger of one's life. You can write to your uncle Raymond Smith and ask him to join us with the two nieces, who are really most amiable children, so estimably unintellectual, and no more in the way than a little extra furniture. You mayn't want it, but if you've space enough for it in your rooms, it doesn't in the least inconvenience you. This is Thursday, shall we say Saturday, for my picnic? I mean it to be my picnic, you know. A bachelor's picnic, with all the most obviously necessary items forgotten, I dare say. I think the salad dressing and the champagne nippers are the legitimate things to forget, are they not? Do you think Saturday will suit you and the doctor, Mrs. Gilbert? I should like it to be Saturday, because you must all dine with me at Mordred on Sunday, in order that we may drink success and a dozen additions to the—what's the name of your novel, Smith? Shall it be Saturday, Mrs. Gilbert? Isabel only answered by deepening blushes and a confused murmur of undistinguishable syllables. But her face lightened up with a look of rapture that was wont to illuminate it now and then, and which, Mr. Lansdell thought, was the most beautiful expression of a human countenance that he had ever seen, out of a picture or in one. Sigismund answered for the doctor's wife. Yes, he was sure Saturday would do capitally, and he would settle it all with George, and he would answer for his uncle Raymond and the orphans, and he would answer for the weather even, for the matter of that— he further accepted the invitation to dine at Mordred on Sunday, for himself and his host and hostess. "'You know you can, Izzy,' he said, in answer to Mrs. Gilbert's deprecating murmur. "'It's mere nonsense talking about prior engagements in a place like Greybridge, where nobody ever does go out to dinner, and a tea-party on a Sunday is looked upon as wickedness. Lansdale always was a jolly good fellow.' "'and I'm not a bit surprised to find that he's a jolly good fellow still, "'because if you twain up a twig in the way it's inclined, "'the tree will not depart from it, as the philosopher has observed. "'I want to see Mordred again, most particularly. "'For, to tell you the truth, Lansdell,' said Mr. Smith, with a gush of candour, "'I was thinking of taking the priory for the scene of my next novel. "'There's a mossy kind of gloom about the eastern side of the house "'and the old square garden that I think would take with the general public.' "'And with regard to the cellarage, cried Sigismund, kindling with sudden enthusiasm, "'I've been through it with a lantern, and I'm sure there's accommodation for a perfect regiment of bodies, "'which would be a consideration if I was going to do the story in penny numbers, "'for in penny numbers one body always leads on to another, "'and you never know when you begin how far you may be obliged to go. "'However, my present idea is three volumes.' "'What do you think now, Lansdell, of the eastern side of the priory, "'deepening in the gloom, you know, "'and letting the gardens all run to seed, "'with rank grass and a blasted cedar or so, "'and introducing rats behind the panelling, "'and a gentle rottenness and perhaps a ghostly footstep in the corridor, "'or a periodical rustling behind the tapestry? "'What do you say now to Mordred, "'taken in connection with twin brothers hating each other from infancy?' and both in love with the same woman, and one of them, the darkest twin, with a scar on his forehead, 
walling up the young female in a deserted room, while the more amiable twin, without a scar, devotes his life to searching for her in foreign climes, accompanied by a detective officer and a bloodhound. It's only a rough idea at present, concluded Mr. Smith modestly, but I shall work it out in railway trains and pedestrian exercise. There's nothing like railway traveling or pedestrian exercise for working out an idea of that kind. Mr. Lansdell declared that his house and grounds were entirely at the service of his young friend, and it was settled that the picnic should take place on Saturday and the dinner party on Sunday and George Gilbert's acquiescence in the two arrangements was guaranteed by his friend Sigismund. And then the conversation wandered away into more fanciful regions, and Roland and Mr. Smith talked of men and books, while Isabel listened, only chiming in now and then with little sentimental remarks, to which the master of Mordred Priory listened as intently as if the speaker had been a Madame de Stael. She may not have said anything very wonderful, but those were wonderful blushes that came and went upon her face as she spoke, fluttering and fitful as the shadow of a butterfly's wing hovering above a white rose, and the golden light in her eyes was more wonderful than anything out of a fairy tale. But he always listened to her, and he always looked at her from a certain position which he had elected for himself in relation to her. She was a beautiful child, and he, a man of the world, very much tired and worn out by the ordinary men and women of the world, was half amused, half interested, by her simplicity and sentimentality. He did no wrong, therefore, by cultivating her acquaintance when accident threw her, as had happened so often lately, in his way. There was no harm, so long as he held himself firmly to the position that he had chosen for himself, so long as he contemplated this young, gushing creature from across all the width of his own wasted youth and useless days, so long as he looked at her as a bright, unapproachable being, as much divided from him by the difference in their natures as by the fact that she was the lawful wife of Mr. George Gilbert of Greybridge on the Wavern. Mr. Lansdell tried his uttermost to hold firmly to this self-elected position with regard to Isabel. He was always alluding to his own age, an age not to be computed, as he explained to Mrs. Gilbert, by the actual number of years in which he had inhabited this lower world, but to be calculated rather by the waste of those wearisome years, and the general decadence that had fallen upon him thereby. "'I suppose, according to the calendar, I am only your senior by a decade,' he said to Izzy one day. "'But when I hear you talk about your books and your heroes, I feel as if I had lived a century.' He took the trouble to make little speeches of this kind very often, for Mrs. Gilbert's edification, and there were times when the doctor's wife was puzzled and even wounded by his talk and his manner— which were both subject to abrupt transitions that were perplexing to a simple person. Mr. Lansdell was capricious and fitful in his moods, and would break off in the middle of some delicious little bit of sentiment, worthy of Ernest Maltravers or Eugene Aram himself, with a sneering remark about the absurdity of the style of conversation into which he had been betrayed and would sit moodily, pulling his favorite retriever's long ears for ten minutes or so, and then get up and wish Isabel an abrupt good morning. Mrs. Gilbert took these changes of manner very deeply to heart. It was her fault, no doubt. She had said something silly, or affected, perhaps. Had not her brother Horace been apt to jeer at her as a mass of affectation because she preferred Byron to Bell's life, and was more interested in Edith Dombey than in the favorite for the Oaks? She had said something that had sounded affected, though uttered in all simplicity of heart, and Mr. Lansdell had been disgusted by her talk. Contempt from him, she always thought of him in italics, was very bitter. She would never, never go to Thurston's Crag again. But then, after one of those abruptly unpleasant good mornings, Mr. Lansdell was very apt to call at Greybridge. He wanted Mr. Gilbert to go and see one of the men on the home farm, who seemed in a very bad way, poor fellow, and ought not to be allowed to go on any longer without medical advice. Mr. Lansdell was very fond of looking up cases for the Greybridge surgeon, 
How good he was, Isabel thought, he in whom goodness was, in a manner, a supererogatory attribute, since heroes who were dark and pensive and handsome were not called upon to be otherwise virtuous. How good he was, he who was as scornfully depreciative of his own merits as if the bones of another Mr. Clark had been bleaching in some distant cave in imperishable evidence of his guilt. How good he was! And he had not been offended or disgusted with her when he left her so suddenly, for to-day he was kinder to her than ever, and lingered for nearly an hour in the unshaded parlour, in the hope that the surgeon would come in. But when Mr. Lansdell walked slowly homeward after such a visit as this, there was generally a dissatisfied look upon his face, which was altogether inconsistent with the pleasure he had appeared to take in his wasted hour at Greybridge. He was inconsistent. It was in his nature, as a hero, to be so, no doubt. There were times when he forgot all about that yawning chasm of years which was supposed to divide him from any possibility of sympathy with Isabel Gilbert. There were times when he forgot himself so far as to be very young and happy in his loitering visits at Greybridge, playing idle scraps of extempore melody on the wise and old harpsichord, sketching little bunches of foliage and frail Italian temples and pretty girlish faces with big black eyes, not altogether unlike Isabel's, or strolling out into the flat old-fashioned garden where Mr. Jeffson lolled on his spade and made a rustic figure of himself between a middle distance of brown earth and a foreground of cabbage plants. I am bound to say that Mr. Jeffson, who was generally courtesy itself to every living creature, from the pigs to whom he carried savoury messes of skim milk and specky potatoes, to the rector of Greybridge, who gave him good evening sometimes as he reposed himself in the cool twilight upon the wooden gate leading into George Gilbert's stable-yard, I am bound to say that Mr. Jeffson was altogether wanting in politeness to Roland Lansdell, and was apt to follow the young man with black and evil looks as he strolled by Izzy's side along the narrow walks, or stooped now and then to extricate her muslin dress from the thorny branches of a gooseberry bush. Once, and once only, did Isabel Gilbert venture to remonstrate with her husband's retainer on the subject of his surly manner to the master of Mordred Priory. Her remonstrance was a very faint one, and she was stooping over a rose-bush while she talked, and was very busy plucking off the withered leaves, and now and then leaves that were not withered. "'I am afraid you don't like Mr. Lansdell, Jeff,' she said. She had been very much attached to the gardener, and very confidential to him, before Roland's advent, and had done a little amateur gardening under his instructions, and had told him all about Eugene Aram and the murder of Mr. Clark. "'You seemed quite cross to him this morning, when he called to see George, and to inquire about the man that had the rheumatic fever. I'm afraid you don't like him.' She bent her face very low over the rose-bush, so low that her hair, which, though much tidier than of old, was never quite as neatly or compactly adjusted as it might have been, fell forward like a veil, and entangled itself among the spiky branches. "'Oh, yes, Mrs. George, I like him well enough. There's not a young gentleman that I ever set eyes on, as I think nobler to look at, or pleasanter to talk to, than Mr. Lansdell, or more free and open-like in his manner to poor folk. But, like, many other good things, Mrs. George, Mr. Lansdell's only good, to my mind, when he's in his place, and I tell you, frank and candid, as I think he's never more out of his place than when he's hanging about your house, or idling away his time in this garden. It isn't for me, Mrs. George, to say who should come here and who shouldn't, but there was a kind of relationship between me and my master's dead mother— I can see her now, poor young thing, with her bright, fair face and her fair hair blowing across it, as she used to come towards me along the very path on which you're standing now, Mrs. George, and all that time comes back to me as if it was yesterday. I never know any one lead a better life or a purer life. I stood beside her deathbed, and I never saw a happier death, nor one that seemed to bring it closer home to a man's mind, that there was something happier and better still to come afterwards. 
"'But there was never no Mr. Roland Lansdell in those days, Mrs. George. "'Scribblin' heads with no bodies to em, and trees without any stumps on scraps of paper, "'or playin' tunes, or otherwise dawdlin' like, while my master was out of doors. "'And I remember, as almost the last words that sweet young creature says, "'was something about havin' done her duty to her dear husband, "'and never havin' known one thought, as she could wish to keep hid from him or heaven. "'Mrs. Gilbert dropped down on her knees before the rose-bush, "'with her face still shrouded by her hair, and her hands still busy among the leaves.' When she looked up, which was not until after a lapse of some minutes, Mr. Jeffson was ever so far off, digging potatoes, with his back turned towards her. There had been nothing unkind in his manner of speaking to her. Indeed, there had even been a special kindness and tenderness in his tones, a sorrowful gentleness that went home to her heart. She thought of her husband's dead mother a good deal that night, in a reverential spirit, but with a touch of envy also. Was not the first Mrs. Gilbert specially happy to have died young? Was it not an enormous privilege so to die, and to be renowned ever afterwards as having done something meritorious, when, for the matter of that, other people would be very happy to die young if they could? Isabel thought of this with some sense of injury. Long ago, when her brothers had been rude to her, and her stepmother had upbraided her on the subject of a constitutional unwillingness to fetch butter and back spoons, she had wished to die young, leaving a legacy of perpetual remorse to those unfeeling relatives. But the gods had never cared anything about her. She had kept on wet boots, sometimes after backing spoons, in bad weather, in the fond hope that she might thereby fall into a decline. She had pictured herself in the little bedroom at Camberwell, fading by inches, with becoming hectic spots on her cheeks, and imploring her stepmother to call her early, which desire would have been the converse of the popular idea of the ruling passion, inasmuch as, in her normal state of health, Miss Sleaford was wont to be late of a morning, and remonstrate drowsily with the voice of the sluggard, when roused roughly from some foolish dream, in which she wore a ruby velvet gown that wouldn't keep hooked, and was beloved by a duke who was always inconsistently changing into the young man at the butter-shop. All that evening Isabel pondered upon the simple history of her husband's mother, and wished that she could be very, very good like her, and die early, with holy words upon her lips. But in the midst of such thoughts as these she found herself wondering whether the hands of Mr. Gilbert the Elder were red and knobby like those of his son, whether he employed the same bootmaker and entertained an equal predilection for spring onions and Cheshire cheese. And from the picture of her deathbed Isabel tried in vain to blot away a figure that had no right to be there, the figure of some one who would be fetched post-haste at the last moment to hear her dying words, and to see her die. End of chapter 17 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 18 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter 18. The Second Warning. Mr. Roland Lansdell did not invite Lady Gwendolen or her father to that bachelor picnic which he was to give at Waverley Castle. He had a kind of instinctive knowledge that Lord Reesdale's daughter would not relish that Sylvan entertainment. "'She'd object to poor Smith, I dare say,' Roland said to himself, with his sporting-cut clothes and his slang phrases and his perpetual talk about three-volume novels and penny numbers. "'No, I don't think it would do to invite Gwendolen. She'd be sure to object to Smith.' Mr. Lansdell said this, or thought this, a good many times upon the day before the picnic, 
but it may be that there was a lurking idea in his mind that Lady Gwendolen might object to the presence of some one other than Mr. Smith in the little assembly that had been planned under Lord Thurston's oak. Perhaps Roland Lansdell, who hated hypocrisy as men who are by no means sinless and yet apt to hate the base and crawling vices of man, had become a hypocrite all at once and wanted to deceive himself. Or it may be that the weak slope of this handsome chin and the want of breadth in a certain region of his skull were the outward and visible signs of such a weak and vacillating nature that what was true with regard to him one minute was false the next, so that out of this perpetual changefulness of thought and purpose there grew a confusion in the young man's mind, like the murmur of many streamlets rushing into one broad river, along whose tide the feeble swimmer was drifted to the very sea he wanted so very much to avoid. The picnic will be a pleasant thing for young Smith, Mr. Lansdell thought, and it'll please the children to make themselves bilious amongst the ruins, and that dear good Raymond always enjoys himself with young and happy people. I cannot see that the picnic can be anything but pleasant, and for the matter of that I've a good mind to send the baskets early by Stevens, who could make himself useful all day, and not go at all myself. I could run up to town under pretense of particular business, and amuse myself somehow for a day or two. Or, for that matter, I might go over to Baden or Hamburg, and finish the autumn there. Heaven knows I don't want to do any harm. But, in spite of all this uncertainty and vacillation of mind, Mr. Lansdell took a great deal of interest in the preparations for the picnic. He did not trouble himself about the magnificent game-pie, which was made for the occasion, the crust of which was as highly glazed as a piece of modern wedgewood. He did not concern himself about the tender young fowls, nestling in their groves of parsley, nor the tongue, floridly decorated with vegetable productions chiseled into the shapes of impossible flowers, nor the York ham, also in a state of high polish like fine Spanish mahogany, and encircled about the knuckle by pure white fringes of cut paper. The comestibles to which Mr. Lansdell directed his attention were of a more delicate and fairy-like description, such as women and children are apt to take delight in. There must be jellies and creams, Mr. Lansdell said, whatever difficulty there might be in the conveyance of such compositions. There must be fruit. He attended himself to the cutting of hothouse grapes and peaches, the noblest pineapple in the long range of forcing-houses, and picturesque pears with leaves still clinging to the stalk. He ordered bouquets to be cut, one a very pyramid of choice flowers, chiefly white and innocent-looking, and he took care to select richly scented blossoms, and he touched the nosegay caressingly with his slim white fingers, and looked at it with a tender smile on his dark face, as if the flowers had a language for him, and so they had. But it was by no means that stereotyped dictionary of substantives and adjectives popularly called the language of flowers. It was nothing new for him to choose a bouquet. Had he not dispensed a small fortune in the Rue de la Paix and in the Faubourg Saint-Honoré, in exchange for big bunches of roses and myosities and cape jasmine and waxy camellias, which he saw afterwards lying on the velvet cushion of an opera box, or withering in the warm atmosphere of a boudoir. He was not a good man. He had not led a good life. Pretty women had called him enfant in the dim, mysterious shades of lamp-lit conservatories, upon the curtain-shrouded thresholds of moonlit balconies, arch soubrette in little Parisian theatres, bewitching Marton and Margot and Jeanneton with brooms in their hands and diamonds in their ears, had smiled at him, and acted at him, and sung at him as he lounged in the dusky recesses of a cavernous box. He had not led a good life. He was not a good man. But he was a man who had never sinned with impunity. With him remorse always went hand in hand with wrongdoing. 
In all his life I doubt if there was any period in which Mr. Lansdell had ever so honestly and truly wished to do a right as he did just now. His mind seemed to have undergone a kind of purification in the still atmosphere of those fair Midlandshire glades and meads. There was even a purifying influence in the society of such a woman as Isabel Gilbert, so different from all the other women he had known, so deficient in the merest rudiments of worldly wisdom. Mr. Lansdell did not go to London when the ponderous old fly from Greybridge drove up a narrow winding lane and emerged upon the green rising ground below the gates of Waverley Castle, Roland was standing under the shadow of the walls with a big bunch of hothouse flowers in his hand. He was in very high spirits, for to-day he had cast care to the winds. Why should he not enjoy this innocent pleasure of a rustic ramble with simple country-bred people and children? He laid some little stress upon the presence of the orphans. Yes, he would enjoy himself for to-day, and then to-morrow— Ah, by the by, to-morrow Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert and Sigismund Smith were to dine with him. After to-morrow it would be all over, and he would be off to the continent again, to begin the old wearisome rounds once more, to eat the same dinners at the same restaurants, the same little suppers after the opera, in stuffy entresol chambers all crimson velvet and gaslight and glass and gilding to go to the same balls in the same gorgeous saloons, and to see the same beautiful faces shining upon him in their monotonous splendor. I might have turned country gentleman and have been good for something in this world, thought Roland, if— Mr. Lansdell was not alone. Charles Raymond and the orphans had arrived, and they all came forward together to welcome Isabel and her companions. Mr. Raymond had always been very kind to his niece's governess, but he seemed especially kind to her to-day. He interposed himself between Roland and the door of the fly, and assisted Isabel to alight. He slipped her hand under his arm with a pleasant friendliness of manner, and looked with a triumphant smile at the rest of the gentlemen. "'I mean to appropriate Mrs. Gilbert for the whole of this day,' he said cheerily. "'and I shall give her a full account of Waverley, "'looked upon from an archaeological, historical, and legendary point of view. "'Never mind your flowers now, Roland. "'It's a very charming bouquet, "'but you don't suppose Mrs. Gilbert is going to carry it about all day? "'Take it into the lodge yonder, and ask them to put it in water, "'and in the evening, if you are very good, Mrs. Gilbert, "'shall take it home to ornament her parlour at Graybridge.' The gates were opened, and they went in, Isabel arm in arm with Mr. Raymond. Roland placed himself presently on one side of Isabel, but Mr. Raymond was so very instructive about John of Gaunt and the Tudors that all Mrs. Gilbert's attention was taken up in the effort to understand his discourse, which was very pleasant and lively in spite of its instructive nature. George Gilbert looked at the ruins with the same awful respect with which she had regarded the pictures at Mordred. He was tolerably familiar with those empty halls, those roofless chambers, and open doorways, and ivy-festooned windows, but he always looked at them with the same reverence, mingled with a vague wonder as to what it was that people admired in ruins, seeing that they generally made such short work of inspecting them, and seemed so pleased to get away and take refreshment. Ruins and copious refreshment were associated in Mr. Gilbert's mind, and, indeed, there does seem to be a natural union between ivied walls and lobster salad, crumbling turrets and cold chicken, just as the domes of Greenwich Hospital, the hilly park beyond, and the rippling water in the foreground, must be for ever and ever associated with floundered sushi and deviled whitebait. Mr. Sigismund Smith was delighted with Waverley. He had rambled amongst the ruins often enough in his boyhood, but to-day he saw everything from a new point of view, and he groped about in all manner of obscure corners with a pencil and pocket-book in his hand, 
laying the plan of a thrilling serial and making himself irrecognizable with dust. His friends found him, on one occasion, stretched at full length amongst crisp-fallen leaves in a recess that had once been a fireplace, with a view to ascertain whether it was long enough to accommodate a body. He climbed fearful heights and planned perilous leaps and hair-breath scapes, deadly dangers in the ways of walks along narrow cornices high up above empty space, such feats as hold the reader with suspended breath and make the continued expenditure of his weekly penny almost a certainty. The orphans accompanied Mr. Smith, and were delighted with the little chambers that they found in nooks and corners of the mouldering castle. How delightful to have chairs and tables and kitchen utensils, and to live there for ever and ever, and keep house for themselves. They envied the vulgar children who lived in the square tower by the gate, and saw ruins every day of their lives. It was a very pleasant morning altogether. There was a strangely mingled feeling of satisfaction and annoyance in Roland Lansdell's mind as he strolled beside Isabel and listened, or appeared to listen, to Mr. Raymond's talk. He would have liked to have had Isabel's little hand lying lightly on his arm. He would like to have seen those wandering black eyes lifted to his face. He would like her to have heard the romantic legends belonging to the ruined walls and roofless banquet chambers from him. And yet perhaps it was better as it was. He was going away very soon, immediately, indeed. He was going where that simple pleasure would be impossible to him, and it was better not to lull himself in soft delights that were so soon to be taken away from his barren life. Yes, his barren life. He had come to think of his fate with bitter repining, and to look upon himself as, somehow or other, cruelly ill-used by Providence. But in spite of Mr. Raymond, he contrived to sit next to Isabel at dinner, which was served by and by in a lovely sheltered nook under the walls, where there was no chance of the salt being blown into the green-gauged heart, or the custard spilt over the lobster salad. Mr. Lansdell had sent a couple of servants to arrange matters, and the picnic was not a bit like an ordinary picnic, where things are lost and forgotten, and where there is generally confusion by reason of everybody's desire to assist in the preparations. This was altogether a recherché banquet, but scarcely so pleasant as those more rural feasts in which there is a paucity of tumblers and no forks to speak of. The champagne was iced, the jellies quivered in the sunlight, everything was in perfect order, and if Mr. Raymond had not insisted upon sending away the two men, who wanted to wait at table with the gloomy solemnity of everyday life, it would scarcely have been worth the name of picnic. But with the two solemn servants out of the way, and with Sigismund, very red and dusty and noisy, to act as butler, matters were considerably improved. The sun was low when they left the ruins of the feast for the two solemn men to clear away. The sun was low, and the moon had risen, so pale as to be scarcely distinguishable from a faint summer cloud high up in the clear opal heaven. Mr. Raymond took Isabel up by a winding staircase to the top of a high turret, beneath which spread green meads and slopes of verdure, where once had been a lake and plaisance. The moon grew silvery before they reached the top of the turret, where there was room enough for a dozen people. Roland went with them, of course, and sat on one of the broad stone battlements, looking out at the still night, with his profile defined as sharply as a cameo against the deepening blue of the sky. He was very silent, and his silence had a distracting influence on Isabel, who made vain efforts to understand what Mr. Raymond was saying to her, and gave vague answers every now and then, so vague that Charles Raymond left off talking presently, and seemed to fall into as profound a reverie as that which kept Mr. Lansdell silent. 
To Isabel's mind there was a pensive sweetness in that silence, which was in some way in harmony with the scene and the atmosphere. She was free to watch Roland's face, now that Mr. Raymond had left off talking to her, and she did watch it. That still profile, whose perfect outline grew more and more distinct against the moonlit sky. If anybody could have painted his portrait as he sat there with one idle hand hanging listless among the ivy leaves, blanched in the moonlight, what a picture it would have made! What was he thinking of? Were his thoughts far away in some foreign city with dark-eyed Clotilde, or the duchess with the glittering hair who had loved him and been false to him long ago when he was an alien, and recorded the history of his woes in heart-breaking verse, in fitful numbers larded with scraps of French and Latin, alternately despairing and sarcastic. Isabel solemnly believed in Clotilde and the glittering duchess, and was steeped in self-abasement and humiliation when she compared herself with those vague and splendid creatures. Roland spoke at last. If there had been anything commonplace or worldly wise in what he said, there must have been a little revulsion in Isabel's mind, but his talk was happily attuned to the place and the hour, incomprehensible and mysterious, like the deepening night in the heavens. "'I think there is a point at which a man's life comes to an end,' he said. I think there is a fitting and legitimate close to every man's existence that is as palpable as the falling of a curtain when a play is done. He goes on living, that is to say, eating and drinking, and inhaling so many cubic feet of fresh air every day, for half a century afterward, perhaps. But that is nothing. Do not the actors live after the play is done and the curtain has fallen? Hamlet goes home and eats his supper and scolds his wife and snubs his children, but the exultation and the passion that created him, Prince of Denmark, have died out like the coke ashes of the green-room fire. Surely that afterlife is the penalty, the counterbalance, of brief golden hours of hope and pleasure. I am glad the Lansdells are not a long-lived race, Raymond, for I think the play is finished, and the dark curtain has dropped for me. Humph, muttered Mr. Raymond. Wasn't there something to that effect in the alien? It's very pretty, Roland, that sort of dismal prettiness which is so much in fashion nowadays. But don't you think if you were to get up a little earlier in the morning and spend a couple of hours amongst the stubble with your clogs and gun, so as to get an appetite for your breakfast— you might get over that sort of thing? Isabel turned a mutely reproachful gaze upon Mr. Raymond, but Roland burst out laughing. Now I dare say I talk like a fool, he said. I feel like one sometimes. When are you going abroad again? In a month's time. But why should I go abroad? asked Mr. Lansdell, with a dash of fierceness in the sudden change of his tone. Why should I go? What is there for me to do there better than here? What good am I there more than I am here? He asked these questions of the sky, as much of Mr. Raymond, and the philosopher of Conventford did not feel himself called upon to answer them. Mr. Lansdell relapsed into silence that so puzzled Isabel, and nothing more was said until the voice of George Gilbert sounded from below, deeply sonorous amongst the walls and towers, calling to Isabel. "'I must go,' she said. "'I dare say the fly is ready to take us back. "'Good night, Mr. Raymond. "'Good night, Mr. Lansdell.' She held out her hand, as if doubtful to whom she should first offer it. Roland had never changed his position until this moment, but he started up suddenly now, like a man awakened from a dream. "'You are going,' he said, "'so soon?' "'So soon. It is very late, I think,' Mrs. Gilbert answered. "'At least, I mean, we have enjoyed ourselves very much, and the time has passed so quickly.' She thought it was her duty to say something of this kind to him, as the giver of the feast, 
and then she blushed and grew confused, thinking she had said too much. "'Good night, Mr. Lansdell.' "'But I am coming down with you to the gate,' said Roland. "'Do you think we could let you go down those slippery stairs by yourselves, "'to fall and break your neck, and haunt the tower by moonlight for ever afterwards, "'a pale ghost in shadowy muslin drapery? "'Here's Mr. Gilbert,' he added, as the top of George's hat made itself visible upon the winding staircase." "'But I'm sure I know the turret better than he does, and I shall take you under my care.' He took her hand as he spoke, and led her down the dangerous winding way as carefully and tenderly as if she had been a little child. Her hand did not tremble as it rested in his, but something like a mysterious winged creature that had long been imprisoned in her breast seemed to break his bonds all at once and float away from her towards him. She thought it was her long-imprisoned soul, perhaps, that so left her to become a part of his. If that slow downward journey could have lasted for ever, if she could have gone down, down, down with Roland Lansdell into some fathomless pit, until at last they came to a luminous cavern and still moonlit water, where there was a heavenly calm, and death. But the descent did not last very long, careful as Roland was of every step, and there was the top of George's hat bobbling about in the moonlight all the time, for the surgeon had lost his way in the turrets, and only came down at last very warm and breathless when Isabel called to him from the bottom of the stairs. Sigismund and the orphans appeared at the same moment. Mr. Raymond had followed Roland and Isabel very closely, and they all went together to the fly. "'Remember to-morrow,' Mr. Lansdell said generally to the Greybridge party as they took their seats. "'I shall expect you as soon as the afternoon service is over. I know you are regular churchgoers at Greybridge. Couldn't you come to Mordred for the afternoon service, by the by? The church is well worth seeing.' There was a little discussion, and it was finally agreed that Mr. and Mrs. George Gilbert and Sigismund Smith should go to Mordred Church on the following afternoon, and then there was a good deal of handshaking before the carriage drove away and disappeared behind the sheltering edges that screened the winding road. "'I'll see you and the children off, Raymond,' Mr. Lansdell said, "'before I go myself.' "'I'm not going away just this minute,' Mr. Raymond answered gravely. "'I want to have a little talk with you first. "'There's something I particularly want to say to you. "'Mrs. Primshaw,' he cried to the landlady of the little inn just opposite the castle gates, "'a good-natured, rosy-faced young woman who was standing on the threshold of her door "'watching the movements of the gentlefolks.' "'Will you take care of my little girls and see whether their wraps are warm enough for the drive home "'while I take a moonlight stroll with Mr. Lansdell?' "'Mrs. Primshaw declared that nothing would give her greater pleasure than to see to the comfort of the young ladies. "'So the orphans skipped across the moonlit road, no wise sorry to take shelter in the pleasant bar-parlour, "'all rosy and luminous, with a cosy handful of bright fire in the tiniest grate ever seen out of a doll's house.' Mr. Lansdell and Mr. Raymond walked along the lonely road, under the shadow of the castle wall, and for some minutes neither of them spoke. Roland evinced no curiosity about, or interest in, that unknown something which Mr. Raymond had to say to him, but there was a kind of dogged sullenness in the carriage of his head, the fixed expression of his face, that seemed to promise badly for the pleasantness of the interview. Perhaps Mr. Raymond saw this, and was rather puzzled how to commence the conversation. At any rate, when he did begin, he began very abruptly, taking what one might venture to call a conversational header. "'Roland,' he said, "'this won't do.' "'What won't do?' asked Mr. Lansdell coolly. "'Of course I don't set up for being your mentor,' returned Mr. Raymond." or for having any right to lecture you, or dictate to you. The tie of kinsmanship between us is a very slight one. 
though, as far as that goes, God knows that I could scarcely love you better than I do if I were your father. But if I were your father, I don't suppose you'd listen to me or heed me. Men never do in such matters as these. I've lived my life, Roland, and I know too well how little good advice can do in such a case as this. But I can't see you going wrong without trying to stop you. And for that poor, honest-hearted fellow yonder, for his sake, I must speak, Roland. Have you any consciousness of the mischief you're doing? Have you any knowledge of the bottomless pit of sin and misery and shame and horror that you are digging before that foolish woman's feet? Why, Raymond, cried Mr. Lansdell, with a laugh, not a very hearty laugh, but something like that hollow mockery of merriment with which a man greets the narration of some old Joe Millerism that has been familiar to him from his childhood. Why, Raymond, you're as obscure as a modern poet. What do you mean? Who's the honest-hearted fellow? And who's the foolish woman? And what's the nature of the business altogether? Roland, let us be frank with each other, at least. Do you remember how you told me once that, when every bright illusion had dropped away from you one by one, honor still remained? A poor pallid star compared to those other lights that had perished in the darkness, but still bright enough to keep you in the straight road? Has that light gone out with the rest, Roland, my poor melancholy boy, my boy whom I have loved as my own child? Will the day ever come when I shall have to be ashamed of Anna Lansdell's only son? His mother's name had always something of a spell for Roland. His head, so proudly held before, drooped suddenly, and he walked on in silence for some time. Mr. Raymond was also silent. He had drawn some good augury from the altered carriage of the young man's head, and was loath to disturb the current of his thoughts. When Roland did at last raise his head, he turned and looked his friend and kinsman full in the face. "'Raymond,' he said, "'I am not a good man.' He was very fond of making this declaration, and I think he fancied that in so doing he made some vague atonement for his shortcomings." I am not a good man, but I am no hypocrite. I will not lie to you or prevaricate with you. Perhaps there may be some justification for what you said just now, or there might be, if I were a different sort of man, but as it is, I give you my honor, you are mistaken. I have been digging no pit for a woman's innocent footsteps to stray into. I have been plotting no treachery against that honest fellow yonder. Remember, I do not by any means hold myself blameless. I have admired Mrs. Gilbert, just as one admires a pretty child, and I have allowed myself to be amused by her sentimental talk, and have lent her books, and may perhaps have paid her a little more attention than I ought to have done. But I have done nothing deliberately. I have never for one moment had a purpose in my mind— or mixed her image with so much as a dream of, of any tangible form. I have drifted into a dangerous position, or a position that might be dangerous to another man, but I can drift out of it as easily as I drifted in. I shall leave Midlandshire next month. And tomorrow the Gilberts dine with you at Mordred, and all through this month there will be the chance of your seeing Mrs. Gilbert, and lending her more books, and paying her more attention, and so on. It is not so much that I doubt you, Roland. I cannot think so meanly of you as to doubt your honor in this business. But you are doing mischief. You are turning this silly girl's head. It is no kindness to lend her books. It is no kindness to invite her to Mordred, and to show her brief glimpses of a life that never can be hers. If you want to do a good deed, and to elevate her life out of its present dead level, make her your almoner, and give her a hundred a year to distribute among her husband's poor patients. The weak, unhappy child is perishing for want of some duty to perform upon this earth, some necessary task to keep her busy from day to day, and to make a link between her husband and herself. 
"'Roland, I do believe that you are as good and generous-minded a fellow "'as ever an old bachelor was proud of. "'My dear boy, let me feel prouder of you than I have ever felt yet. "'Leave Midlandshire to-morrow morning. "'It will be easy to invent some excuse for going. "'Go to-morrow, Roland.' "'I will.' "'answered Mr. Lansdell, after a brief pause. "'I will go, Raymond,' he repeated, "'holding out his hand and clasping that of his friend. "'I suppose I have been going a little astray lately, "'but I only wanted the voice of a true-hearted fellow like yourself "'to call me back to the straight road. "'I shall leave Midlandshire to-morrow, Raymond, "'and it may be a very long time before you see me back again.' "'Heaven knows I am sorry enough to lose you, my boy,' Mr. Raymond said, with some emotion. "'But I feel that it's the only thing for you to do. "'I used sometimes to think, before George Gilbert offered to marry Isabel, "'that you and she would have been suited to each other somehow, "'and I have wished that—' "'And here Mr. Raymond stopped abruptly, "'feeling that his speech was scarcely the wisest he could have made.' But Roland Lansdell took no notice of that unlucky observation. "'I shall go to-morrow,' he repeated. "'I'm very glad you've spoken to me, Raymond. I thank you most heartily for the advice you have given me this night, and I shall go to-morrow.' And then his mind wandered away to his boyish studies in mythical Roman history, and he wondered how Marcus Curtius felt just after making up his mind to take the leap that made him famous. And then, with a sudden slip from ancient to modern history, he thought of poor, tender-hearted Louise La Vallière running away and hiding herself in a convent, only to have her pure thoughts and aspirations scattered like a cluster of frail wood anemones in a storm of wind only to have her holy resolutions trampled upon by the ruthless foot of an impetuous young king. End of chapter 18 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 19 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 19 What Might Have Been Mrs. Gilbert spoke very little during the homeward drive through the moonlight. In her vision of that drive, or what that drive might be, she had fancied Roland Lansdell riding by the carriage window and going a few miles out of his way in order to escort his friends back to Greybridge. "'If he cared to be with us, he would have come,' Isabel thought, with a pensive, reproachful feeling about Mr. Lansdell. "'It is just possible that Roland might have ridden after the fly from Greybridge, and ridden beside it along the quiet country roads, talking as he only in all the world could talk, according to Mrs. Gilbert's opinion. It is possible that, being so sorely at a loss as to what he should do with himself— Mr. Lansdell might have wasted an hour thus, had he not been detained by his old friend Charles Raymond. As it was, he rode straight home to Mordred Priory, very slowly, thinking deeply as he went along, thinking bitter thoughts about himself and his destiny. "'If my cousin Gwendolen had been true to me, I should have been an utterly different man,' he thought." I should have been middle-aged, a steady-going fellow by this time, with a boy at Eton, and a pretty fair-haired daughter to ride her pony by my side. I think I might have been good for something if I had married long ago, when my mother died, and my heart was ready to shelter the woman she had chosen for me. Children, a man who has children, has some reason to be good, and to do his duty— but to stand quite alone in a world that one has grown tired of, with every pleasure exhausted, and every faith worn threadbare, with a dreary waste of memory behind, a barren desert of empty years before, to be quite alone in the world, the last of a race that once was brave and generous, 
the feeble, worn-out remnant of a lineage that once did great deeds, and made a name for itself in this world, that indeed is bitter. Mr. Lansdell's thoughts dwelt upon his loneliness tonight, as they never had dwelt before, since the day when his mother's death and cousin's inconstancy first left him lonely. "'Yes, I shall go abroad again,' he thought presently, "'and go over the whole dreary beat once more, "'like Marriott's phantom captain-turned-landsman, "'like the wandering Jew in a pool-built travelling dress. "'I shall eat fish at Philippe's again, "'and buy more bouquet in the Rue Castiglione, "'and lose more money at Homburg, "'and shoot more crocodiles on the banks of the Nile, "'and be laid up with another fever in the Holy Land. "'It will be all the same over again.' "'except that it will be a great deal more tiresome this time.' "'And then Mr. Lansdell began to think what his life might have been "'if the woman he loved, or rather the woman for whom he had a foolish sentimental fancy, "'he did not admit to himself that his predilection for Isabel Gilbert was more than this, "'had been free to become his wife.' He imagined himself returning from those tiresome continental wanderings a twelve month earlier than he had actually returned. Ah, me, he thought, only one little year earlier, and all things would have been different. He would have gone to Conventford to see his dear old friend, Charles Raymond, and there, in the sunny drawing-room, he would have found a pale-faced, dark-eyed girl bending over a child's lesson-book, or listening while a child strummed on the piano. He could fancy that scene, he could see it all like a beautiful cabinet picture. Ah, how different, how different everything would have been then! It would have been no sin then to be inexplicably happy in that girlish presence. There would have been no vague, remorseful pang, no sting of self-reproach mingling with every pleasant emotion, contending with every thrill of mystic joy. And then, and then, some night in the twilight garden, when the stars were hovering dim above the city roofs, still and hushed in the distance, he would have told her that he loved her, that, after a decade of indifference to all the brightest things of earth, he had found a pure, unutterable happiness in the hope and belief that she would be his wife. He fancied her shy blushes, her drooping eyes suddenly tearful in the depths of her joy, and he fancied what his life might have been for ever afterwards, transformed and sublimated by its new purpose, its new delights, transfigured by a pure and exalted affection. He fancied all this as it might have been, and turned and bowed his face before an image that bore his own likeness, and yet was not himself, the image of a good man, happy husband and father, true friend and gentle master, dwelling forever and ever amidst that peaceful English landscape, beloved, respected, the center of a happy circle, the keystone of a fair domestic arch, a necessary link in the grand chain of human love and life. And instead of all this, I am a wandering nomad, who never has been, and never can be, of any use in this world, who fills no place in life, and will leave no blank when he dies. When Louis the well-beloved was disinclined for the chase, the royal huntsmen were wont to announce that to-day His Majesty would do nothing. I have been doing nothing all my life, and cannot even rejoice in a stag-hunt. Mr. Lansdell beguiled his homeward way with many bitter reflections of this kind, but inconsistent and vacillating in his thoughts, as he had been ever inconsistent and vacillating in his actions, he thought of himself at one time as being deeply and devotedly in love with Isabel Gilbert, and at another time as being only the victim of a foolish romantic fancy, which would perish by a death as speedy as its birth. "'What an idiot I am for my pains,' he said to himself presently. "'In six weeks' time this poor child's face will have no more place in my mind "'than the snows of last winter have on this earth. 
or only in faraway nooks and corners of memory, like the alpine peaks where the snows linger undisturbed by the hand of change. Poor little girl, how she blushes and falters sometimes when she speaks to me. And how pretty she looks then! If they could get such an ingenue at the Francais, all Paris would be mad about her. We are very much in love with each other, I dare say, but I don't think it's a passion to outlast six weeks' absence on either side. Not on her side, certainly, dear romantic child. I have only been the hero of a story-book, and all this folly has been nothing more than a page out of a novel set in action. Raymond is very right. I must go away, and she will go back to her three-volume novels and fall in love with a fair-haired hero and forget me. He sighed as he thought this. It was infinitely better that he should be forgotten and speedily, and yet it is hard to have no place in the universe, not even one hidden shrine in a foolish woman's heart. Mr. Lansdell was before the priory gates by this time. The old woman stifled a yawn as she admitted the master of the domain. He went in past a little blinking light in the narrow Gothic window, and along the winding roadway, between cool shrubberies that shed an aromatic perfume on the still night air. Scared fawns flitted, ghost-like, away into deep recesses amid the mordred oaks, and in the distance the water-drops of a cascade, changed by the moonbeams into showers of silver, fell with a little tinkling sound amongst great blocks of moss-grown granite and wet fern. Mordred Priory, seen in the moonlight, was not a place upon which a man would willingly turn his back. Long ago Roland Lansdell had grown tired of its familiar beauties, but to-night the scene seemed transformed. He looked at it with a new interest. He thought of it with a sad, tender regret that stung him like a physical pain. As he had thought of what his life might have been under other circumstances, he thought now of what the place might have been. He fancied the grand old rooms resonant with the echoes of children's voices. He pictured one slender, white-robed figure on the moonlit terrace. He fancied a tender, earnest face turned steadily toward the path along which he rode. He felt the thrilling contact of a caressing arm twining itself shyly in his. He heard the low murmur of a loving voice, his wife's voice, bidding him welcome home. But it was never to be. The watchdog's honest bark, or rather the bark of several watchdogs, made the night clamorous presently when Mr. Lansdell drew rein before the porch. But there was no eye to mark his coming and be brighter when he came, unless, indeed, it was the eye of his valet, which had waxed dim over the columns of the morning post, and may have glimmered faintly in evidence of that functionary's satisfaction at the prospect of being speedily released from duty. If it was so, the valet was doomed to be disappointed, for Mr. Lansdell, usually the least troublesome of masters, wanted a great deal done for him to-night. "'You may set to work at once with my portmanteau, Jadis,' he said, when he met his servant in the hall. "'I must leave Mordred to-morrow morning, in time for the seven o'clock express from Warncliffe. I want you to pack my things, and arrange for Wilson to be ready to drive me over. Perhaps, by the by, you may as well pack one portmanteau for me to take with me, and you can follow with the rest of the luggage on Monday.' "'You are going abroad, sir?' "'Yes. I am tired of Mordred. I shall not stop for the hunting season. You can go upstairs now and pack the portmanteau. Don't forget to make all arrangements about the carriage, for six precisely. You can go to bed when you've finished packing. I've some letters to write, and shall be late.' The man bowed and departed, to grumble in an undertone, over Mr. Lansdell's shirts and waistcoats, while Roland went into the library to write his letters. The letters which he had to write turned out to be only one letter, or rather a dozen variations upon the same theme, which he tore up, one after another, almost as soon as they were written. 
He was not wont to be so fastidious in the wording of his epistles, but to-night he could not be satisfied with what he wrote. He wrote to Mrs. Gilbert, yes, to her. Why should he not write to her when he was going away to-morrow morning, when he was going to offer up that vague, bright dream which had lately beguiled him, a willing sacrifice on the altar of duty and honor? "'I am not much good,' he said, forever excusing his shortcomings by his self-deprecation. "'I never set up for being a good man, but I have some feeling of honor left in me at the worst.' He wrote to Isabel, therefore, rather than to her husband, and he destroyed many letters before he wrote what he fancied suitable to the occasion." Did not the smothered tenderness, the regret, the passion, reveal itself in some of those letters, in spite of his own determination to be strictly conventional and correct? But the letter which he wrote last was stiff and commonplace enough to have satisfied the sternest moralist. Dear Mrs. Gilbert, I much regret that circumstances, which only came to my knowledge after your party left last night, will oblige me to leave Mordred early to-morrow morning. I am therefore compelled to forego the pleasure which I had anticipated from our friendly little dinner to-morrow evening, but pray assure Smith that the Priory is entirely at his disposal whenever he likes to come here, and that he is welcome to make it the scene of half a dozen fictions, if he pleases. I fear the old place will soon look gloomy and desolate enough to satisfy his ideas of the romantic, for it may be some years before I again see the Midlandshire woods and meadows. The dear old bridge across the waterfall, the old oak under which I have spent such pleasant hours, Mr. Lansdell had written here, in one of the letters which he destroyed, I hope you will convey to Mr. Gilbert my warmest thanks, with the accompanying check for the kindness and skill which have endeared him to my cottagers. I shall be very glad if he will continue to look after them, and I will arrange for the carrying out of any sanitary improvements he may suggest to Hodgson, my steward. The library will be always prepared for you whenever you feel inclined to read and study there, and the contents of the shelves will be entirely at the service of yourself and Mr. Gilbert. With regards to your husband and all friendly wishes for Smith's prosperity and success, I remain, dear Mrs. Gilbert, yours very truly, Roland Lansdell, Mordred Priory, Saturday night. It may be some years before I again see the Midlandshire woods and meadows, this sentence was the gist of the letter. The stiff, unmeaning letter, which was as dull and labored as a schoolboy's holiday missive to his honored parents. My poor, innocent, tender-hearted darling, will she be sorry when she reads it? thought Mr. Lansdell, as he addressed his letter. Will this parting be a new grief to her? a shadowy romantic sorrow, like her regret for drowned Shelley or fever-stricken Byron. My darling, my darling, if fate had sent me here a twelve-month earlier, you and I might have been standing side by side in the moonlight, talking of the happy future before us. Only a year, and there were so many accidents that might have caused my return. Only one year— and in that little space I lost my one grand chance of happiness. Mr. Lansdell had done his duty. He had given Charles Raymond a promise which he meant to keep, and having done so he gave his thoughts and fancies a license which he had never allowed them before. He no longer struggled to retain the attitude from which he had hitherto endeavored to regard Mrs. Gilbert— he no longer considered it his duty to think of her as a pretty grown-up child, whose childish follies amused him for the moment. No, he was going away now, and had no longer any need to set any restraint upon his thoughts. He was going away, and was free to acknowledge to himself that this love, which had grown up so suddenly in his breast, was the one grand passion of his life and, under different circumstances, 
might have been his happiness and redemption. End of chapter 19 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 20 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 20 Oceans Should Divide Us Mr. and Mrs. Gilbert went to church, arm in arm as usual, on the Monday morning after the picnic. But Sigismund stayed at home to sketch the rough outline of that feudal romance which he had planned among the ruins of Waverley. The day was very fine, a real summer day, with a blazing sun and a cloudless blue sky. The sunshine seemed like a good omen, Mrs. Gilbert thought, as she dressed herself in the white muslin robe that she was to wear at Mordred. An omen of what? She did not ask herself that question, but she was pleased to think that the heavens should smile upon her visit to Mordred. She was thinking of the dinner-party at the Priory, while she sat by her husband's side in church, looking demurely down at the prayer-book in her lap. It was a common thing for her now to be thinking of him, when she ought to have been attending to the sermon. Today she did not even try to listen to the rector's discourse. She was fancying herself in the dusky drawing-room at Mordred, after dinner, hearing him talk. She saw his face turned toward her in the twilight, the pale, dark face, the dreamy, uncertain eyes. When the congregation rose suddenly, at the end of the sermon, she sat bewildered for a moment, like a creature awakened from a dream, and when the people knelt, and became absorbed in silent meditation on the injunctions of their pastor, Mrs. Gilbert remained so long in a devotional attitude that her husband was fain to arouse her by a gentle tap upon the shoulder. She had been thinking of him even on her knees. She could not shut his image from her thoughts. She walked about in a perpetual dream, and rarely awakened to the consciousness that there was wickedness in so dreaming. And even when she did reflect upon her sin, it was very easy to excuse it and make light of it. He would never know. In November he would be gone, and the dream would be nothing but a dream. It was only one o'clock by the old-fashioned eight-day clock in the passage when they went home after church. The gig was to be ready at a quarter before three, and at that hour they were to start for Mordred. George bent to put up his horse at the little inn near the priory gates, and then they could walk quietly from the church to Mr. Lansdell's after the service. Mr. Gilbert felt that Brown Molly appeared rather at a disadvantage in Roland's grand stables. Sigismund was still sitting in the little parlor, looking very warm and considerably the worse for ink. He had tried all the penny bottles in the course of his labors, and had a little collection of them clustered at his elbow. "'I don't think anyone ever imagined so many ink bottles compatible with so little ink,' he said plaintively. I've had my test ideas balked by perpetual hairs in my pen, to say nothing of flies' wings, and even bodies. There's nothing like unlimited ink for imparting fluency to a man's language. You cut short his eloquence the moment you limit his ink. However, I'm down here for pleasure, old fellow, Mr. Smith added cheerfully, and all the printing machines in the City of London may be waiting for copy for aught I care. An hour and three-quarters must elapse before it would be time even to start for Mordred. Mrs. Gilbert went upstairs and rearranged her hair, and looked at herself in the glass, and wondered if she was pretty. He had never told her so. He had never paid her any compliment. But she fancied somehow that he thought her pretty, though she had no idea whence that fancy was derived. She went downstairs again, and out into the garden, whence Mr. Smith was calling to her, the little garden in front of the house, where there were a few common flowers blooming dustily in oval beds like dishes, and where in a corner there was an erection of shells and broken bits of colored glass, which Mr. Jeffson fondly imagined to be the exact representation of a grotto. Mr. Smith had a good deal to say for himself, as indeed he had on all occasions. 
but as his discourse was entirely of a personal character, it may have been rather wanting in general interest. Isabel strolled up and down the narrow pathway by his side, and turned her face politely towards him, and said, Yes, did you really? And, well, how very strange, now and then. She was thinking, as she had thought in church, she was thinking of the wonderful happiness that lay before her, an evening in his companionship, amongst pictures and hothouse flowers and marble busts and trailing silken curtains, and with glimpses of a moonlit expanse of lawn and shrubbery gleaming through every open window. She was thinking of this when a bell rang loud and shrill in her ear, and, looking round suddenly, she saw a man in livery, a man who looked like a groom, standing outside the garden gate. She was so near the gate that it would have been a mere affectation to keep the man waiting there while Mrs. Jeffson made her way from the remote premises at the back of the house. The doctor's wife turned the key in the lock and opened the gate, but the man only wanted to deliver a letter, which he gave her with one hand while he touched the brim of his hat with the other. "'From Mr. Lansdell, ma'am,' he said. In the next moment he was gone, and the open gate and the white dusty lane seemed to reel before Isabel Gilbert's eyes. There had been no need for the man to tell her that the letter was from his master. She knew the bold dashing hand in which she had read pencil annotations upon the margins of those books which Mr. Lansdell had lent her, and even if she had not known the hand, she would have easily guessed whence the letter came. Who else should send her so grand-looking a missive with that thick cream-colored envelope, a big official-looking envelope, and the broad coat of arms with tall winged supporters on the seal? But why should he have written to her? It was to put off the dinner, no doubt. Her lips trembled a little, like the lips of a child who was going to cry as she opened the letter. She read it very hurriedly twice, and then, all at once, comprehended that Roland was going away, for some years, for ever. It was all the same thing, and that she would never, 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 the word seemed to repeat itself in her brain, like the dreadful clang of a bell, never see him again. She knew that Sigismund was looking at her, and asking her some questions about the contents of the letter. "'What did Lansdell say? Was it a put-off, or what?' Mr. Smith demanded, but Isabel did not answer him. She handed him the open letter, and then, suddenly turning from him, ran into the house, upstairs, and into her room. She locked the door, flung herself face downward upon the bed, and wept as a woman weeps in the first great agony of her life. The sound of those passionate sobs was stifled by the pillows amidst which her face was buried, but the anguish of them shook her from head to foot. It was very wicked to have thought of him so much, to have loved him so dearly. The punishment of her sins came to her all at once, and was very bitter. "'I suppose it is a put-off,' he said to himself, "'and she's disappointed because we're not going.' "'Why, what a child she still is. "'I remember her behaving just like that once at Camberwell, "'when I'd promised her tickets for the play and couldn't get them. "'The manager of the TRDL said he didn't consider the author "'of the brand upon the shoulder-blade entitled to the usual privilege. "'Poor little Izzy. "'I remember her running away and not coming back for ever so long, "'and when she did make her appearance her eyelids were red and swollen.' Mr. Smith stooped to pick up a narrow slip of lavender-tinted paper from the garden walk. It was the check which Roland Lansdell had written in payment of the doctor's services. Sigismund read the letter and reflected over it. "'I'm almost as much disappointed as Izzy, for the matter of that,' he thought to himself. "'We should have had a jolly good dinner at the Priory, and any amount of sparkling, and Chateau What's-Its-Name, and Claude a thingamy to follow, I dare say.' I'll take George the letter and the check. It's just like Izzy to leave the check on the ground, and resign myself to a dullish Sunday. It was a dull Sunday. The unacademical ish, with which Mr. Smith had qualified the adjective, was quite unnecessary. It was a very dull Sunday. Ah, reader, if Providence has some desperate sorrow in store for you, 
pray that it may not befall you on a Sunday in the blazing sunshine when the church bells are ringing on the still drowsy air. Mr. Gilbert went upstairs by and by when the bells were at their loudest, and, finding the door of his chamber locked, knocked on the panel, and asked Isabel if she did not mean to go to church. But she told him she had a dreadful headache, and wanted to stay at home. He asked her ever so many questions as to why her head ached, and how long it had ached, and wanted to see her from a professional point of view. "'Oh, no, no!' she cried from the bed upon which she was lying. "'I don't want any medicine. I only want to rest my head. I was asleep when you knocked.' Ah, what a miserable falsehood that was, as if she could ever hope to sleep again. "'But is he?' remonstrated Mr. Gilbert. "'You've had no dinner. There's cold lamb in the house, you know, and we're going to have that and a salad after church. You'll come down to dinner, eh?' "'No, no, I don't want any dinner. Please leave me alone. I only want to rest,' she answered piteously. Poor, honest George Gilbert little knew how horrible an effort it had cost his wife to utter even these brief sentences without breaking down in a passion of sobbing and weeping. She buried her face in the pillows again as her husband's footsteps went slowly down the narrow stair. She was very wretched, very foolish. It was only a dream, nothing more than a dream, that was lost to her. Again, had she not known all along that Roland Lansdell would go away, and that all her bright dreams and fancies must go with him? Had she not counted upon his departure? Yes, but not in November, not in September, not on the day that was to have been such a happy day. Oh, how cruel, how cruel, she thought, how cruel of him to go away like that, without even saying good-bye, without even saying he was sorry to go. And I fancied that he liked to talk to me. I fancied that he was pleased to see me sometimes, and would be sorry when the time came for him to go away. But to think that he should go away two months before the time he spoke of, to think that he should not even be sorry to go. Mrs. Gilbert got up by and by, when the western sky was all one lurid glow of light and color. She got up because there was little peace for a weary spirit in that chamber to the door of which some considerate creature came every half hour or so to ask Isabel if her head was any better by this time, if she would have a cup of tea, if she would come downstairs and lie on the sofa, and to torment her with many other thoughtful inquiries of the like nature. She was not to be alone with her great sorrow. Sooner or later she must go out and begin life again, and face the blank world in which he was not. Better, since it must be so, that she should begin her dreary task at once. She bathed her face and head. She plaited her long black hair before the little glass, behind which the lurid sky glared redly at her. Ah, how often in the sunny morning she had stood before that shabby, old-fashioned glass thinking of him, and the chance of meeting him beside the mill-stream under the flickering shadows of the oak leaves at Thurston's Crag. And now it was all over, and she would never, 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 never see him again. Her life was finished. Ah, how truly he had spoken on the battlements of the ruined tower, and how bitterly the meaning of his words came home to her today. Her life was finished. The curtain had fallen, and the lights were out, and she had nothing more to do but to grope blindly about upon a darkened stage until she sank in the great vampire trap the grave. A pale ghost, with somber, shadowy hair, looked back at her from the glass. Oh, if she could die, if she could die! She thought of the mill-stream. The wheel would be idle, and the water low down in the hollow beyond the miller's cottage would be still to-night, still and placid and glassy, shining rosy red in the sunset, like the pavement of a cathedral stained with the glory of a painted window. Why should she not end her sorrows for ever in the glassy pool, so deep, so tranquil? She thought of Ophelia and the miller's daughter on the banks of the Allen water. Would she be found floating on the stream with weeds of water-lilies tangled in her long dark hair? Would she look pretty when she was dead? Would he be sorry when he heard of her death? 
Would he read a paragraph in the newspapers some morning at breakfast and break a blood vessel into his coffee cup? Or would he read and not care? Why should he care? If he had cared for her, he could never have gone away. He could never have written that cruel, formal letter, with not a word of regret, no, not one. Vague thoughts like these followed one another in her mind. If she could have the courage to go down to the water's brink, and to drop quietly into the stream where Roland Lansdell had once told her it was deepest. She went downstairs by and by, in the dusk, with her face as white as the tumbled muslin that hung about her in limp and flabby folds. She went down into the little parlor, where George and Sigismund were waiting for their tea, and where two yellow mold candles were flaring in the faint evening breeze. She told them that her head was better, and then began to make the tea, scooping up vague quantities of congu and gunpowder with the little silver scallop shell which had belonged to Mr. Gilbert's grandmother, and was stamped with a puffy profile of George the Third. "'But you've been crying, Izzy,' George exclaimed presently for Mrs. Gilbert's eyelids looked red and swollen in the light of the candles. "'Yes, my head was so bad it made me cry. But please don't ask me any more about it,' Isabel pleaded piteously. "'I suppose it was the... the... P picnic.' She nearly broke down upon the word, remembering how good he had been to her all through the happy day. "'Yesterday that made me ill.' "'I dare say it was that lobster salad.' "'Mr. Gilbert answered briskly. "'I ought to have told you not to eat it. "'I don't think there's anything more bilious "'than lobster salad dressed with cream.' "'Sigismund Smith watched his hostess "'with a grave countenance "'while she poured out the tea "'and handed the cups right and left. "'Poor Isabel managed it all "'with tolerable steadiness, "'and then when the miserable task was over "'she sat by the window alone, "'staring blankly out "'at the dusty shrubs distinct in the moonlight.' while her husband and his friend smoked their cigars in the lane outside. How was she to bear her life in that dull, dusty lane, her odious life, which would go on and on for ever, like a slow barge crawling across the dreary flats upon the black, tideless waters of a canal? How was she to endure it all, its monotony, all its misery, its shabby dreariness, its dreary shabbiness, rose up before her with redoubled force? and the terror of that hideous existence smote her like a stroke from a giant's hand. It all came back. Yes, it came back. For the last two months it had ceased to be. It had been blotted out, hidden, forgotten. There had been no such thing. An enchanter's wand had been waved above that dreary, square-built house in the dusty lane, and a fairy palace had arisen for her habitation. A fairyland of beauty and splendor had spread itself around her, a paradise in which she wandered hand in hand with a demigod. The image of Roland Lansdell had filled her life, to the exclusion of every other shape, animate or inanimate. But the fair land melted away all at once like a mirage in the desert, like the last scene in a pantomime. The rosy and cerulean lights went out in foul, sulphurous vapors. The mystic domes and minarets melted into thin air, but the barren sands remained real and dreary, stretching away for ever and for ever before the wanderer's weary feet. In all Mrs. Gilbert's thoughts there was no special horror or aversion to her husband. He was only a part of the dullness of her life. He was only one dreary element of that dreary world in which Roland Lansdell was not. He was very good to her, and she was vaguely sensible of his goodness and thankful to him, but his image had no abiding place in her thoughts. At stated times he came home and ate his dinner, or drank his tea, with substantial accompaniment of bread and butter and crisp garden stuff, but during the last two months there had been many times when his wife was scarcely conscious of his presence. She was happy in fairyland, with the prince of her perpetual fairy tale, while poor George Gilbert munched bread and butter and crunched overgrown radishes. But the fairy tale was finished now, with an abrupt and cruel climax. The prince had vanished. The dream was over. Sitting by that open window, with her folded arms resting on the dusty sill, Mrs. Gilbert wondered how she was to endure her life. 
and then her thoughts went back to the still pool below the mill stream. She remembered the happy, drowsy summer afternoon on which Roland Lansdell had stood by her side and told her the depth of the stream. She closed her eyes, and her head sank forward upon the folded arms, and all the picture came back to her. She heard the shivering of the rushes, the bubbling splash of a gudgeon leaping out of the water. She saw the yellow sunlight on the leaves, the beautiful sunlight creeping in through every break in the dense foliage, and she saw his face turned towards her with that luminous look, that bright and tender smile which had only seemed another kind of sunshine. Would he be sorry if he opened the newspaper and read a little paragraph in a corner to the effect that she had been found floating amongst the long rushes in that very spot? Would he remember the sunny afternoon and the things he had said to her? His talk had been very dreamy and indefinite, but there had been, or had seemed to be, an undercurrent of mournful tenderness in all he said, as vague and fitful, as faint and mysterious, as the murmuring of the summer wind across the rushes. The two young men came in presently, smelling of dust and tobacco smoke. They found Isabel lying on the sofa, with her face turned to the wall. Did her head still ache? Yes, as badly as ever. George sat down to read his Sunday paper. He was very fond of a Sunday paper, and he read all the accidents and police reports, and the indignant letters from liberal-minded citizens who signed themselves Aristides and Diogenes and Junius Brutus, and made fiery protests against the iniquities of a bloated aristocracy. While the surgeon folded the crackling newspaper and cut the leaves, he told Isabel about Roland Lansdell's check. "'He has sent me five and twenty pounds,' he said. "'It's very liberal, but of course I can't think of taking such a sum.' I've been a good deal about amongst his farm people, for there's been so much low fever this last month, but I've been looking over the account I'd made out against him, and it doesn't come to a five-pound note. I suppose he's been used to deal with physicians who charge a guinea for every visit. I shall send him back his check. Isabel shuddered as she listened to her husband's talk. How low and mean all this discussion about money seemed! Had not the enclosure of the check in that cruel letter been almost an insult? What was her husband better than a tradesman, when there could be this question of accounts and payments between him and Roland Lansdell? And then she thought of Clotilde and the Duchess, the Duchess with her glittering hair and the cruel azure eyes. She thought of marble pillars gleaming white against the purple of the night or crimson curtains starred with gold, and high-bred beauty brightly cold. She thought of all that confusion of color and glitter and perfume and music, which was the staple commodity in Mr. Lansdell's poetic wares, and she wondered, in self-abasement and humiliation, how she could have ever for a moment deluded herself with the idea that he could feel one transient sentiment of regard or admiration for such a degraded being as herself. She thought of her scanty dresses that never had the proper number of breadths in the skirt. She thought of her skimpy sleeves made in last year's fashion, her sunburnt straw hat, her green parasol faded like sickly grass at the close of a hot summer. She thought of the gulf between herself and the master of Mordred, and wondered at the madness of her presumption. Poor George Gilbert was quite puzzled by his wife's headache, which was of a peculiarly obstinate nature, lasting for some days. He gave her cooling draughts and lotions for her forehead, which was very hot under his calm professional hand. Her pulse was rapid, her tongue was white, and the surgeon pronounced her to be bilious. He had not the faintest suspicion of any mental ailment lurking at the root of these physical derangements. He was very simple-minded, and, being incapable of wrong himself, measured all his decent fellow-creatures by a fixed standard. He thought that the good and the wicked formed two separate classes, as widely apart as the angels of heaven and the demons of the fiery depths. He knew that there were, somewhere or other in the universe, wives who wronged their husbands and went into outer darkness, just as he knew that in dismal dens of crime there lurked robbers and murderers, forgers and pickpockets, the newspaper record of whose evil deeds made no unpleasant reading for quiet Sunday afternoons. 
but of vague sentimental errors, of shadowy dangers and temptations, he had no conception. He had seen his wife pleased and happy in Roland Lansdell's society, and the thought that any wrong to himself, how small soever, could arise out of that companionship, had never entered his mind. Mr. Raymond had remarked of the young surgeon that a man with such a moral region was born to be imposed upon. The rest of the week passed in a strange, dreary way for Isabel. The weather was very fine, cruelly fine, and to Mrs. Gilbert the universe seemed all dust and sunshine and blankness. Sigismund was very kind to her, and did his best to amuse her, reciting the plots of numerous embryo novels, which were to take Camden Town by storm in the future. But she sat looking at him without seeing him, and his talk sounded a harsh confusion on her ear. Oh, for the sound of that other voice, that other voice, which had attuned itself to such a tender melody! Oh, for the beautiful cynical talk about the hollowness of life and the wretchedness of things in general! Poor simple-hearted Mr. Smith made himself positively hateful to Isabel during that dismal week by reason of his efforts to amuse her. If he would only let me alone, she thought. If people would only have mercy upon me and let me alone. But that was just what every one seemed determined not to do. Sigismund devoted himself exclusively to the society of his young hostess. William Jeffson let the weeds grow high amongst the potatoes while he planted standard rose bushes and nailed up graceful creepers and dug and improved and transplanted in that portion of the garden which made a faint pretense to prettiness. Was it that he wished to occupy Mrs. Gilbert's mind, and to force her to some slight exertion? He did not prune a shrub or trim a scrap of box without consulting the doctor's wife upon the subject, and Isabel was called out into the garden half a dozen times in an hour. And then, during his visit, Sigismund insisted upon taking Mrs. Gilbert to Warncliffe to dine with his mother and sisters. Mr. Smith's family made quite a festival for the occasion. There was a goose for dinner— a vulgar and savoury bird, and a big damson pie and apples and pears in green leaf-shaped dishes for dessert, and, of course, Isabel's thoughts wandered away from the homely mahogany, with its crimson-worsted doilies and dark-blue finger-glasses, to the oval table at Mordred, and all its artistic splendour of glass and fruit and flowers. The Smith family thought Mrs. Gilbert very quiet and insipid, but luckily Sigismund had a great deal to say about his own achievements, past, present, and future, so Isabel was free to sit in the twilight, listening dreamily to the slow footsteps in the old-fashioned street outside, the postman's knocking growing fainter and fainter in the distance, and the cawing of the rooks in the grove of elms on the outskirts of town. Mr. Smith, Sr. spent the evening in the bosom of his family, and was put through rather a sharp examination upon abstruse questions in chancery and criminal practice by his aspiring son, who was always getting into morasses of legal difficulty, from which he required to be extricated by professional assistance. The evening seemed a very long one to poor Isabel, but it was over at last, and Sigismund conducted her back to Greybridge in a jolting omnibus, and during that slow homeward drive she was free to sit in a corner and think of him. Mr. Smith left his friends on the following day, and before going he walked with Isabel in the garden and talked to her a little about her life. "'I dare say it's a little dull at Greybridge,' he said, as if in answer to some remark of Isabel's, and yet she had said nothing. "'I dare say you do find it a little dull,' "'Though George is one of the best fellows that ever lived, and devoted to you, "'yes, is he devoted to you in his quiet way? "'He isn't one of your demonstrative fellows, you know, "'can't go into grand romantic raptures or anything of that kind. "'But we were boys together, Izzy, and I know him thoroughly, "'and I know that he loves you dearly, "'and would break his honest heart if anything happened to you, "'or he was, anyhow, to take it into his head that you didn't love him.' "'But still, I dare say you do find life rather slow work down here, "'and I can't help thinking that if you were to occupy yourself a little more than you do, "'you'd be happier. "'Suppose now,' cried Mr. Smith, palpably swelling with the importance of his idea, 
"'Suppose you were to write a novel. "'There! You don't know how happy it would make you. "'Look at me. I always used to be sighing and lamenting "'and wishing for this and that or the other, "'wishing I had ten thousand a year, "'or a Grecian nose, or some worldly advantage of that sort. "'But since I've taken to writing novels, "'I don't think I've a desire unsatisfied. "'There's nothing I haven't done, on paper.' the beautiful women I've loved and married, the fortunes I've come into always unexpectedly, and when I was at the very lowest ebb with the tendency to throw myself into the serpentine in the moonlight, the awful vengeance I've wreaked upon my enemies, the murders I've committed, would make the life of a Napoleon Bonaparte seem tame and trivial by comparison. I suppose it isn't I that steal up the creaking stair with a long knife tightly grasped and gleaming blue in the moonbeams that creep through a chink in the shutter— "'but I'm sure I enjoy myself as much as if it was. "'And if I were a young lady,' continued Mr. Smith, "'speaking with some slight hesitation "'and glancing furtively at Isabel's face, "'if I were a young lady "'and had a kind of romantic fancy "'for a person I ought not to care about, "'I'll tell you what I'd do with him. "'I'd put him into a novel, Izzy, "'and work him out in three volumes. "'And if I wasn't heartily sick of him "'by the time I got to the last chapter,' Nothing on earth would cure me. This was the advice which Sigismund gave to Isabel at parting. She understood his meaning and resented his interference. She was beginning to feel that people guessed her wickedness and tried to cure her of her madness. Yes, she was very wicked, very mad. She acknowledged her sin, but she could not put it away from her. And now that he was gone, now that he was far away, never to come back, never to look upon her face again. Surely there could be no harm in thinking of him. She did think of him, daily and hourly, no longer with any reservation, no longer with any attempt at self-deception. Eugene Aram and Ernest Maltravers, the Jaur and the Corsair, were alike forgotten. The real hero of her life had come, and she bowed down before his image and paid him perpetual worship. What did it matter? He was gone. He was as far away from her now as those fascinating figments of the poetic brain, Monsieur Aram and Maltravers. He was a dream, like all the other dreams of her life. Only he could never melt away or change as they had done. End of chapter 20 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 21 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter 21 Once More the Gate Behind Me Falls. All through the autumnal months, all through the dreary winter, George Gilbert's wife endured her existence and hated it. The days were all alike all dark and cold and dreary, and her life was dark and cold and dreary like the days. She did not write a novel. She did not accomplish any task or carry out any intention. But she began a great many undertakings and grew tired of them and gave them up in despair. She wrote a few chapters of a novel, a wild, weird work of fiction, in which Mr. Roland Lansdell reigned paramount over all the rules of Lindley Murray, and was always nominative when he ought to have been objective, and vice versa, and did altogether small credit to the university at which he was described to have gained an impossible conglomeration of honors. Mrs. Gilbert very soon got tired of the novel, though it was pleasant to imagine it in a complete form, taking the town by storm. He would read it, and would know that she had written it. Was there not a minute description of Lord Thurston's oak in the very first chapter? It was pleasant to think of the romance, neatly bounded in three volumes, but Mrs. Gilbert never got beyond a few random chapters in which the grand crisis of the work, the first meeting of the hero and heroine, the death of the latter by drowning and of the former by rupture of a blood vessel, and so on, were described. She could not do the everyday work. 
She could erect a fairy palace and scatter lavish splendor in its spacious halls, but she could not lay down the stair carpets or fit the window blinds or arrange and plan the furniture. She tore up her manuscript, and then for a little time she thought that she would be very good, kind to the poor, affectionate to her husband, and attentive to the morning and afternoon sermons at Greybridge Church. She made a little book out of letter paper, and took notes of the vicar's and the curate's discourses. But both these gentlemen had a fancy for discussing abstruse points of doctrine far beyond Mrs. Gilbert's comprehension, and the doctor's wife found the business of a reporter very difficult work. She made her poor little unaided effort to repent of her sins and to do good. She cut up her shabbiest dresses and made them into frocks for some poor children, and she procured a packet of limp tracts from a conventford bookseller and distributed them with the frocks, having a vague idea that no charitable benefaction was complete unless accompanied by a tract. Alas, for this poor sentimental child, the effort to be good and pious and practical did not sit well upon her. She got on very well with some of the cottagers' daughters, who had been educated at the national school and were as fond of reading novels as herself. She fraternized with these damsels, and lent them odd volumes out of her little library, and even read aloud to them on occasion, and the vicar of Greybridge, entering one day a cottage where she was sitting, was pleased to hear a humming of noise, as of the human voice, and praised Mrs. Gilbert for her devotion to the good cause. He might not have been quite so well pleased had he heard the subject of her lecture, which had relation to a gentleman of loose principles and buccaneering propensities, a gentleman who left a corsair's name to other times, linked with one virtue and a thousand crimes. But even these feeble attempts to be good, ah, how short a time it seemed since Isabel Gilbert had been a child, subject to have her ears boxed by the second Mrs. Sleaford. How short a time, since to be good, meant to be willing to wash the teacups and saucers, or to darn a three-cornered rent in a hobbledehoy's jacket. Even these feeble efforts ceased by and by, and Mrs. Gilbert abandoned herself to the dull monotony of her life, and solaced herself with the thought of Roland Lansdell, as an opium-eater beguiles his listless days with the splendid visions that glorify his besotted stupor. She resigned herself to her life, and was very obedient to her husband, and read novels as long as she could get one to read, and was forever thinking of what might have been, if she had been free, and if Roland Lansdell had loved her. Alas, he had only too plainly proved that he did not love her, had never loved her, he had made this manifest by cruelly indisputable evidence at the very time when she was beginning to be unutterably happy in the thought that she was somehow or another nearer and dearer to him than she ought to have been. The dull autumn days and the dark winter days dragged themselves out, and Mr. Gilbert came in and went out and attended to his duties and ate his dinner and rode brown molly between the leafless hedgerows beside the frozen streams as contentedly as he had done in the bright summer time, when his rides had lain through a perpetual garden. His was one of those happy natures which are undisturbed by any wild yearnings after the unattainable. He had an idea of exchanging his Greybridge practice for a better one, by and by, and he used to talk to Isabel of this ambitious design, but she took little interest in the subject. She had evinced very little interest in it from the first, and she displayed less now. What would be the use of such a change? It could only bring her a new kind of dreariness, and it was something to stand shivering on the little bridge under Lord Thurston's oak, so bare and leafless now, it was something to see even the chimney-pots of Mordred, the wonderful clusters of dark red-brick chimneys, warm against the chill December sky. Mrs. Gilbert did not forget that passage in Mr. Roland Lansdell's letter in which he had placed the Mordred library at her disposal, but she was very slow to avail herself of the privilege thus offered to her. 
She shrank away shyly from the thought of entering his house. Even though there was no chance of meeting him in the beautiful rooms, even though he was at the other end of Europe, gay and happy and forgetful of her. It was only by and by, when Mr. Lansdell had been gone some months, and when the dullness of her life had grown day by day more oppressive, that Isabel Gilbert took courage to enter the noble gates of Mordred. Of course she told her husband whither she was going. Was it not her duty to do so? And George good-naturedly approved. "'Though I'm sure you've got books enough already,' he said, "'for you seem to be reading all day.' She set out upon a wintry afternoon and walked alone to the priory. The old housekeeper received her very cordially. "'I've been expecting to see you every day, ma'am, since Mr. Lansdell left us,' the worthy woman exclaimed, "'for he said as you were rare fond of books, and was to take away any that you fancied, and John's to carry them for you, ma'am, and I was to pay you every attention. But I was beginning to think you didn't mean to come at all, ma'am.' There were fires in many of the rooms, for Mr. Lansdell's servants had a wholesome terror of that fatal blue mould which damp engenders upon the surface of a picture. The firelight glimmered upon golden frames, and glowed here and there in the ruby depths of rich bohemian glass, and flashed in fitful gleams upon rare porcelain vases and groups of stainless marble. But the rooms had a desolate look somehow, in spite of the warmth and light and splendor. Mrs. Warman, the housekeeper, told Isabel of Mr. Lansdell's whereabouts. He was at Milan, Lady Gwendolen Pomfrey had been good enough to tell Mrs. Warman, somewhere as in Italy that was, the housekeeper believed, and he was to spend the rest of the winter in Rome, and then he was going on to Constantinople, and goodness knows where for there never was such a traveller, or any one so restless-like. "'Isn't it a pity he don't marry his cousin Lady Gwendolen and settle down like his pa?' said Mrs. Warman. "'It do seem shame for such a place as this to be shut up from year's end to year's end, till the very pictures get quite a ghastly way with them, and seem to stare at one reproachful-like, as if they was asking over and over again, "'Where is he? Why don't he come home?' Isabel was standing with her back to the chill wintry sky outside the window, and the housekeeper did not perceive the effect of her discourse. That simple talk was very painful to her. It seemed to her as if Roland Lansdell's image receded farther and farther from her in this grand place, where all the attributes of his wealth and station were a standing evidence of the great gulf between them. "'What am I to him?' she thought. What can such a despicable wretch as I am ever be to him? If he comes home it will be to marry Lady Gwendolen. Perhaps he will tell her how he used to meet me by the mill-stream, and they will laugh together about me. Had her conduct been shameless and unwomanly, and would he remember her only to despise her? She hoped that if Roland Lansdell ever returned to Midlandshire it would be to find her dead. He could not despise her if she was dead. The only pleasant thought she had that afternoon was the fancy that Mr. Lansdell might come back to Mordred and engage himself to his cousin, and the marriage would take place at Greybridge Church, and as he was leading his bride along the quiet avenue, he would start back, anguish-stricken, to the sight of a newly erected headstone, to the memory of Isabel Gilbert, aged twenty. Twenty, that seems quite old, Mrs. Gilbert thought. She had always fancied that the next best thing to marrying a duke would be to fade into an early grave before the age of eighteen. The first visit to Mordred made the doctor's wife very unhappy. Was it not a reopening of all the old wounds? Did it not bring too vividly back to her the happy summer day when he sat beside her at luncheon, and bent his handsome head and subdued his deep voice as he talked to her? Having broken the ice, however, she went very often to the priory, and on one or two occasions even condescended to take an early cup of tea with Mrs. Warman, the housekeeper, though she felt that by doing so she in some small measure widened the gulf between Mr. Lansdell and herself. Little by little she grew to feel quite at home in the splendid rooms. 
It was very pleasant to sit in a low easy chair in the library, his easy chair, with a pile of books on the little reading table by her side, and the glow of the great fire subdued by a noble screen of ground glass and brazen scrollwork. Mrs. Gilbert was honestly fond of reading, and in the library at Mordred her life seemed less bitter than elsewhere. She read a great deal of the lighter literature upon Mr. Lansdell's bookshelves, poems and popular histories, biographies and autobiographies, letters and travels in bright romantic lands. To read of the countries through which Mr. Lansdell wandered seemed almost like following him. As Mrs. Gilbert grew more and more familiar with the grand old mansion, and more and more friendly with Mrs. Warman, the housekeeper, she took to wandering in and out of all the rooms at pleasure, sometimes pausing before one picture, sometimes sitting before another for half an hour at a time, lost in reverie. She knew all the pictures, and had learned their histories from Mrs. Warman, and ascertained which of them were most valued by Mr. Lansdell. She took some of the noble folios from the lower shelves of the library, and read the lives of her favorite painters, and stiff translations of Italian disquisitions on art, her mind expanded amongst all the beautiful things around her, and the graver thoughts engendered out of grave books pushed away many of her childish fancies, her simple, sentimental yearnings. Until now she had lived too entirely amongst poets and romancers, but now grave volumes of biography opened to her a new picture of life. She read the stories of real men and women who had lived and suffered real sorrows, prosaic anguish, hard, commonplace trial and misery. Do you remember how, when young Caxton's heart had been wrung by his youth's bitterest sorrows, the little father sends his son to the life of Robert Hall for comfort? Isabel, very foolish and blind as compared with the son of Austin Caxton, was yet able to take some comfort from the stories of the good men's sorrows. The consciousness of her ignorance increased, as she became less ignorant, and there were times when this romantic girl was almost sensible, and became resigned to the fact that Roland Lansdell could have no part in the story of her life. If the drowsy life, the quiet afternoons in the deserted chambers of the Priory, could have gone smoothly on for ever, Isabel Gilbert might have, little by little, developed into a clever and sensible woman but the current of her existence was not to glide with one dull motion to the end. There were to be storms and peril of shipwreck and fear and anguish before the waters flowed into a quiet haven and the story of her life was ended. One day in March, one bleak day, when the big fires in the rooms at Mordred seemed especially comfortable, Mrs. Gilbert carried her books into an inner apartment, half boudoir, half drawing-room, at the end of a long suite of splendid chambers. She took off her bonnet and shawl, and smoothed her dark hair before the glass. She had altered a little since the autumn, and the face that looked out at her to-day was thinner and older than that passionate, tear-blotted face which she had seen in the glass on the night of Roland Lansdell's departure. Her sorrow had not been the less real because it was weak and childish, and had told considerably upon her appearance. But she was getting over it. She was almost sorry to think that it was so. She was almost grieved to find that her grief was less keen than it had been six months ago, and that the splendor of Roland Lansdell's image was perhaps a trifle faded. But to-day Mrs. Warman was destined to undo the good work so newly effected by grave books, and to awaken all Isabel's regrets for the missing squire of Mordred. The worthy housekeeper had received a letter from her master, which she brought in triumph to Mrs. Gilbert. It was a very brief epistle, enclosing checks for diverse payments, and giving a few directions about the gardens and stables. See that pines and grapes are sent to Lord Reesdale's whenever he likes to have them, and I shall be glad if you send hothouse fruit and flowers occasionally to Mr. Gilbert, the surgeon of Greybridge. He was very kind to some of my people. Be sure that every attention is shown to Mrs. Gilbert whenever she comes to Mordred. 
Isabel's eyes grew dim as she read this part of the letter. He thought of her, far away, at the other end of the world almost, as it seemed to her, for this letter was dated from Corfu. He remembered her existence, and was anxious for her happiness. The books were no use to her that day. She sat with a volume open in her lap, staring at the fire, and thinking of him. She went back to the old italics again. His image shone out upon her in all its ancient splendor. Oh, dreary, dreary life, where he was not! How was she to endure her existence? She clasped her hands in a wild rapture. Oh, my darling, if you could know how I love you, she whispered, and then started confused and blushing. Never until that moment had she dared to put her passion into words. The priory clock struck three succeeding hours, but Mrs. Gilbert sat in the same attitude, thinking of Roland Lansdell. The thought of going home and facing her daily life again was unutterably painful to her. That fatal letter, so commonplace to a common reader, had revived all the old exaltation of feeling. Once more Isabel Gilbert floated away upon the wings of sentiment and fancy into that unreal region where the young squire of Mordred reigned supreme, beautiful as a prince in a fairy tale, grand as a demigod in some classic legend. The French clock on the mantelpiece chimed the half-hour after four, and Mrs. Gilbert looked up, aroused for a moment from her reverie. "'Half-past four, she thought. It will be dark at six, and I have a long walk home. Home, she shuddered at the simple monosyllable, which it is the special glory of our language to possess. The word is very beautiful, no doubt, especially so to a wealthy country magnet, happy owner of a grand old English mansion, with fair lands and coverts, home farm and model farm buildings, shadowy park and sunlit plaisance, and wonderful dairies lined with Majorca ware, and musical with the plashing of a fountain. But for Mrs. Gilbert, home meant a square-built house in a dusty lane, and was never likely to mean anything better or brighter. She got up from her low seat, and breathed a long-drawn sigh, as she took her bonnet and shawl from a table near her, and began to put them on before the glass. "'The parlor at home always looks ugliest and barest and shabbiest when I have been here,' she thought, as she turned away from the glass and moved toward the door. She paused suddenly. The door of the boudoir was ajar. All the other doors in the long range of rooms were open and she heard a footstep coming rapidly towards her, a man's footstep. Was it one of the servants? No. No servant's footstep ever touched the ground with that firm and stately tread. It was a stranger's footstep, of course. Who should come there that day except a stranger? He was far away, at the other end of the world, almost. It was not within the limits of possibility that his footfall should sound on the floors of Mordred Priory. And yet, and yet, Isabel stopped, with her heart beating violently, her hands clasped, her lips apart and tremulous, and in the next moment the step was close to the threshold, the door was pushed open, and she was face to face with Roland Lansdell, Roland Lansdell, whom she never thought to see again upon this earth, Roland Lansdell whose face had looked at her in her dreams by day and night any time within these last six months. "'Isabel, Mrs. Gilbert,' he said, holding out both his hands and taking hers, which were as cold as death. She tried to speak, but no sound came from her tremulous lips. She could utter no word of welcome to this restless wanderer, but stood before him breathless and trembling. Mr. Lansdell drew a chair toward her and made her sit down. "'I startled you,' he said. "'You did not expect to see me. I had no right to come to you so suddenly, but they told me you were here, and I wanted so much to see you. I wanted so much to speak to you.' The words were insignificant enough, but there was a warmth and earnestness in the tones that was new to Isabel. 
Faint blushes flickered into her cheeks, so deathly pale a few moments before. Her eyelids fell over the dark, unfathomable eyes. A look of sudden happiness spread itself upon her face, and made it luminous. "'I thought you were at Corfu,' she said. "'I thought you would never, never, never come back again.' "'I have been at Corfu, and in Italy, and in innumerable places. "'I meant to stay away, but—but I changed my mind, and I came back. "'I hope you are glad to see me again.' What could she say to him? Her terror of saying too much kept her silent. The beating of her heart sounded in her ears, and she was afraid that he too must hear that tell-tale sound. She dared not raise her eyes, and yet she knew that he was looking at her earnestly, scrutinizingly even. "'Tell me that you are glad to see me,' he said. "'Ah, if you knew why I went away, why I tried so hard to stay away—' Why, I have come back, after all, after so many resolutions made and broken, so many deliberations, so much doubt and hesitation. Isabel, tell me you are glad to see me once more. She tried to speak, and faltered out a word or two, and broke down, and turned away from him, and then she looked round at him again with a sudden impulse, as innocently and childishly as Zuleika might have looked at Selim, Forgetful for a moment of the square-built house in the dusty lane of George Gilbert and all the duties of her life. "'I have been so unhappy,' she exclaimed. "'I have been so miserable. And you will go away again by and by, and I shall never, never see you any more.' Her voice broke, and she burst into tears, and then, remembering the surgeon all in a moment, she brushed them hastily away with her handkerchief. "'You frightened me so, Mr. Lansdell,' she said, "'and I'm very late, and I was just going home, "'and my husband will be waiting for me. "'He comes to meet me sometimes when he can spare time. "'Good-bye.' "'She held out her hand, looking at Roland nervously as she did so. "'Did he despise her very much?' she wondered. "'No doubt he had come home to marry Lady Gwendolen Pomfrey, "'and there would be a fine wedding in that bright May weather.' There was just time to go into a consumption between March and May, Mrs. Gilbert thought, and her tombstone might be ready for the occasion, if the gods who bestow upon their special favorites the boon of early death would only be kind to her. "'Good-bye, Mr. Lansdell,' she repeated. "'Let me walk a little way with you. Ah, if you knew how I have traveled night and day, if you knew how I have languished for this hour, and for the sight of—' "'For the sight of what?' "'Roland Lansdell was looking down at the pale face of the doctor's wife "'as he uttered that unfinished sentence. "'But amongst all the wonders that ever made the story of a woman's life wonderful, "'it could never surely come to pass that a demigod would descend from the ethereal regions "'which were his common habitation on her account, Mrs. Gilbert thought. "'She went home in the chill March twilight.' but not through the bleak and common atmosphere which other people breathed that afternoon, for Mr. Lansdell walked by her side, and, not encountering the surgeon, went all the way to Greybridge, and only left Mrs. Gilbert at the end of the dusty lane in which the doctor's red lamp already glimmered faintly in the dusk. Would the master of Mordred Priory have been stricken with any sense of shame if he had met George Gilbert? There was an air of decision in Lansdell's manner, which seemed like that of a man who acts upon a settled purpose, and has no thought of shame. End of chapter 21 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter 22 of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter 22 My Love's a Noble Madness Mr. Lansdell did not seem in a hurry to make any demonstration of his return to Mordred. He did not affect any secrecy, it is true, 
but he shut himself a good deal in his own rooms, and seldom went out except to walk in the direction of Lord Thurston's Oak, whither Mrs. Gilbert also rambled in the chilly spring afternoons, and where Mr. Lansdell and the doctor's wife met each other very frequently. Not quite by accident now, for at parting, Roland would say with supreme carelessness, "'I suppose you will be walking this way to-morrow. It is the only walk worth taking hereabouts, and I'll bring you the other volume.' Lord Reesdale and his daughter were still at Lowlands, but Mr. Lansdell did not betake himself thither to pay his respects to his uncle and cousin, as he most certainly should have done in common courtesy. He did not go near the grey old mansion where the earl and his daughter vegetated in gloomy and economical state. But Lady Gwendolen heard from her maid that Mr. Lansdell had come home, and bitterly resented his neglect. She resented it still more bitterly by and by, when the maid, who was a little faded like her mistress, and perhaps a little spiteful into the bargain, let drop a scrap of news she had gleaned in the servants' hall. Mr. Lansdell had been seen walking on the Greybridge Road with Mrs. Gilbert, the doctor's wife. And it wasn't the first time either, and people do say it looks odd when a gentleman like Mr. Lansdell seen walking and talking oftentimes with such as her. The maid saw her mistress's face turn pale in the glass. No matter what the rank or station or sex of poor Othello, he or she is never suffered to be at peace or to be happy, knowing nothing. There is always a mine ancient, male or female, as the case may be, to bring home the freshest information about the delinquent. "'I have no wish to hear the servant's gossip about my cousin's movements,' Lady Gwendolen said, with supreme hauteur. "'He is the master of his own actions, and free to go where he pleases and with whom he pleases.' "'I'm sure I beg pardon, my lady, and meant no offence. the maid answered meekly. "'But she don't like it for all that,' the damsel thought, with an inward chuckle. Roland Lansdell kept himself aloof from his kindred, but he was not suffered to go his own way unmolested. The road to perdition is not quite so smooth and flower-bestrewn a path as we are sometimes taught to believe. A merciful hand often flings stumbling-blocks and hindering brambles in our way. It is our own fault if we insist upon clambering over the rocky barriers and scrambling through the briary hedges in a mad eagerness to reach the goal. Roland had started up the fatal descent, and was, of course, going at that rapid rate at which we always travelled downhill. But the road was not all clear for him. Charles Raymond of Conventford was amongst the people who heard accidentally of the young man's return, and about a week after Roland's arrival the kindly philosopher presented himself at the priory, and was fortunate enough to find his kinsman at home. In spite of Mr. Lansdell's desire to be at his ease, there was some restraint in his manner, as he greeted his old friend. "'I am very glad to see you, Raymond,' he said. "'I should have ridden over to Conventford in a day or two. I've come home, you see.' "'Yes, and I'm very sorry to see it. This is a breach of good faith, Roland.' "'Of what faith? With whom?' "'With me,' answered Mr. Raymond, gravely. "'You promised me that you would go away.' "'I did, and I went away. And now you have come back again.' "'Yes,' replied Mr. Lansdell, folding his arms and looking full at his kinsman, with an ominous smile upon his face. "'Yes, the fact is, a little too evident for the basis of an argument, I have come back.' Mr. Raymond was silent for a minute or so. The younger man stood with his back against the angle of the embayed window, and he never took his eyes from his friend's face. There was something like defiance in the expression of his face, and even in his attitude, as he stood with folded arms leaning against the wainscot. "'I hope, Roland, that since you have come home it is because the reason which took you away from this place has ceased to exist. You come back because you are cured. I cannot imagine it to be otherwise, Roland. I cannot believe that you have broken faith with me.' 
"'What if I have come home because I find my disease is past all cure? "'What if I have kept faith with you and have tried to forget "'and come back at last because I cannot? "'Roland! Ah, it is a foolish fever, is it not? "'Very foolish, very contemptible, "'to the solemn-faced doctor who looks on and watches "'a wretched patient tossing and writhing "'and listens to his delirious ravings.' "'Have you ever seen a man in the agonies of delirium tremens "'catching imaginary flies and shrieking about imps and demons "'capering on his counterpane? "'What a pitiful disease it is, "'only the effect of a few extra bottles of brandy, "'but you can't cure it. "'You may despise the sufferer, "'but you shrink back terror-stricken before the might of the disease. "'You've done your duty, doctor.' "'You tried honestly to cure my fever, "'and I submitted honestly to your remedies. "'But you're only a quack after all, "'and you pretended, what all charlatans pretend, "'to be able to cure the incurable. "'You have come back with the intention of remaining, then, Roland? "'Si selon, I have no present idea of remaining here very long. "'And in the meantime you allow people to see you walking the Greybridge Road "'and loitering about Thurston's Crag with Mrs. Gilbert. "'Do you know that already that unhappy girl's name is compromised? "'The Greybridge people are beginning to couple her name with yours.' "'Mr. Lansdell laughed aloud, but not with the pleasant laugh which was common with him. "'Did you ever look in a British atlas for Greybridge on the Wayvern? he asked. "'There are some atlases which do not give the name of the place at all. "'In others you'll find a little black dot with the word Greybridge printed in very small letters. "'The British Gazetteer will tell you that Greybridge is interesting on account of its church, "'which, etc., etc., that an omnibus plies to and fro between the village and Warncliffe Station, "'and that the nearest market town is Wareham.' In all the literature of the world, that's about all the student can learn of Greybridge. What an affliction it must be to a traveller in the Upper Pyrenee, or on the banks of the Amazon, to know that people at Greybridge mix his name sometimes with their tea-table gossip. What an enduring torture for a loiterer in fair Grecian isles, an idle dreamer beside that blue depths of southern sea, to know that Greybridge disapproves of him. "'I had better go away, Roland,' Mr. Raymond said, looking at his kinsman with a sad, reproachful gaze, and stretching out his hand to take up the hat and gloves he had thrown upon a chair near him. "'I can do no good here. "'You cannot separate me from the woman I love,' answered Roland boldly. "'I am a scoundrel, I suppose, but I am not a hypocrite. "'I might tell you a lie and send you away hoodwinked and happy.' "'No, Raymond, I will not do that. "'If I am foolish and wicked, I have not sinned deliberately. "'I have striven against my folly and my wickedness. "'When you talked to me that night at Waverley, "'you only echoed the reproaches of my own conscience. "'I accepted your counsel and ran away. "'My love for Isabel Gilbert was only a brief infatuation, I thought, "'which would wear itself out like other infatuations with time and absence.' I went away, fully resolved never to look upon her face again. And then, and then only, I knew how truly and how dearly I loved her. I went from place to place, but I could no more fly from her image than from my own soul. In vain I argued with myself, as better men have done before my time, that this woman was in no way superior to other women. Day by day I took my lesson deeper to heart. I cannot talk of these things to you. There is a kind of profanation in such a discussion. I can only tell you that I came back to England with a rooted purpose in my mind. Do not thrust yourself upon me. You have done your duty, and may wash your hands of me with Christian-like self-satisfaction. You have nothing further to do in this galère. Oh, Roland, that you should ever come to talk to me like this! Have you no sense of truth or honor? "'Not even the common instinct of a gentleman? "'Have you no feeling for that poor, honest-hearted fellow "'who has judged you by his own simple standard "'and has trusted you implicitly? "'Have you no feeling for him, Roland?' "'Yes. I am very sorry for him. "'I am sorry for the grand mistake of his life. "'But do you think he could ever be happy with that woman? 
I have seen them together, and know the meaning of the grand word union as applied to them. All the width of the universe cannot divide them more entirely than they are divided now. They have not one single sentiment in common, Charles Raymond. I tell you I am not entirely a villain. I do still possess some lingering remnant of that common instinct of which you spoke just now. If I had seen Isabel Gilbert happy with a husband who loved her and understood her, and who was loved by her, I would have held myself aloof from her pure presence. I would have stifled every thought that was a wrong to that holy union. I am not base enough to steal the lamp which lights a good man's home. But if I find a man who has taken possession of a peerless jewel as ignorant of its value and as powerless to appreciate its beauty as a soldier who drags a Raphaela from the innermost shrine of some ransacked cathedral— and makes a knapsack for himself out of the painted canvas. If I find a pig trampling pearls under his ruthless feet, am I to leave the gems for ever in his sty, in my punctilious dread that I may hurt the feelings of the animal by taking his unvalued treasure away from him? Other men have argued as you argue today, Roland, answered Mr. Raymond. Other men have reasoned as you reason, Roland, but they have not the less brought anguish and remorse upon themselves, and upon the victims of their sin. Did not Rousseau declare that the first man who enclosed a lot of ground and called it mine was the enemy of the human race? You young philosophers of our modern day twist the argument another way, and are ready to avow that the man who marries a pretty woman is the foe to all unmarried mankind. He should have held himself aloof and waited till the man arrived upon the scene, the man with the poetic sympathies and sublime appreciation of womanly grace and beauty and all manner of hazy attributes which are supposed to be acceptable to the sentimental womanhood. Bah, Bromant! All this is very well on toned paper, in a pretty little hot-pressed volume published by Messieurs Moxon, but the universe was never organized for the special happiness of poets. There must be jog-trot existences, and commonplace contentment, and simple everyday households, in which husbands and wives love each other, and do their duty to each other in a plain, prosaic manner. Life can't be all rapture and poetry." Ah, Roland, it has pleased you of late years to play the cynic. Let your cynicism save you now. Is it worth while to do a great wrong, to commit a horrible sin for the sake of a pretty face and a pair of black eyes, for the gratification of a passing folly? It is not a passing folly, returned Mr. Lansdell fiercely. I was willing to think that it was so last autumn, when I took your advice and went away from this place— I know better now. If there is depth and truth anywhere in the universe, there is depth and truth in my love for Isabel Gilbert. Do not talk to me, Raymond. The arguments which would have weighed with other men will have no power with me. It is my fault or my misfortune that I cannot believe in the things in which other men believe. Above all, I cannot believe in formulas. I cannot believe that a few words shuffled over by a parson at Conventford last January twelve-month can be strong enough to separate me forever from the woman I love, and who loves me. Yes, she loves me, Raymond, cried the young man, his face lighting up suddenly with a smile which imparted a warmth to his dark complexion, like the rich glow of a murillo. She loves me, my beautiful, unvalued blossom that I found blooming all alone and unnoticed in a desert. She loves me. If I had discovered coldness or indifference, coquetry or pretense of any kind in her manner the other day when I came home, I would have gone back even then. I would have acknowledged my mistake and would have gone away to suffer alone. My dear old Raymond, it is your duty, I know, to lecture me and argue with me, but I tell you again it is only wasted labor. I am past all that. Try to pity me and sympathize with me, if you can. Solitude is not such a pleasant thing, and people do not go through the world alone without some sufficient reason for their loneliness. There must have been some sorrow in your life, dear old friend, some mistake, some disappointment. Remember that, and have pity upon me. 
Mr. Raymond was silent for some minutes. He sat with his face shaded in his hand, and his hand was slightly tremulous. "'There was a sorrow in my life, Roland,' he said by and by, "'a deep and lasting one, and it is the memory of that sorrow which makes you so dear to me. But it was a sorrow in which shame had no part. I am proud to think that I suffered, and suffered silently.' I think you can guess, Roland, why you have always been, and always must be, as dear to me as my own son. I can, answered the young man, holding out his hand. You loved my mother. I did, Roland, and stood aloof, and saw her married to the man she loved. I held her in my arms, and blessed her on her wedding day, in the church yonder, but never from that hour to this have I ceased to love and honor her. I have worshipped a shadow all my life, but her image was nearer and dearer to me than the living beauty of other women. I can sympathize with a wasted love, Roland, but I cannot sympathize with a love that seeks to degrade its object. Degrade her, cried Roland. Degrade Isabel. There can be no degradation in such a love as mine. But, you see, we think differently. We see things from a different point of view. You look through the spectacles of Greybridge and see an elopement, a scandal, a paragraph in the country papers. I recognize only the immortal right of two free souls who know that they have been created for each other. Do you ever think of your mother, Roland? I remember how dearly she loved you, and how proud she was of the qualities that made you worthy to be her son. Do you ever think of her as a living presence? "'conscious of your sorrows, compassionate of your sins. "'I think if you considered her thus, Roland, as I do, "'she has never been dead to me. "'She is the ideal in my life, "'and lifts my life above its common level. "'If you thought of her as I do, "'I don't think you could hold to the bad purpose "'that has brought you back to this place.' "'If I believed what you believe,' "'cried Mr. Lansdell with sudden animation, I should be a different man from what I am, a better man than you are, perhaps. I sometimes wonder at such as you, who believe in all the glories of unseen worlds, and yet are so eager and so worldly in all your doings upon this shabby, commonplace earth. If I believed, I think I should be blinded and intoxicated by the splendor of my heritage. I would turn Trappist, and live in a dumb rapture from year's end to year's end. I would go and hide myself amid the mountain tops, high among the eagles and the stars, and ponder upon my glory. But, you see, it is my misfortune not to believe in that beautiful fable. I must take my life as it is, and if, after ten foolish, unprofitable years, fate brings one little chance of supreme happiness in my way, who shall tell me to withhold my hand? Who shall forbid me to grasp my treasure? Mr. Raymond was not a man to be easily put off. He stayed at Mordred for the remainder of the day, and dined with his young cousin, and sat talking with him until late at night. But he went away at last with a sad countenance and a heavy heart. Roland's disease was past the cure of philosophy. What chance have Friar Lawrence and philosophy ever had against Miss Capulet's Grecian nose and dark Italian eyes, the balmy air of a warm southern night, the low harmonious murmur of a girlish voice, the gleaming of a white arm on a moonlit balcony? End of chapter 22 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter Twenty Three of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter Twenty Three A Little Cloud. Isabel was happy. He had returned. He had returned to her, never again to leave her. Had he not said something to that effect? He had returned because he had found existence unendurable away from her presence. Mr. Lansdell had told the doctor's wife all this, not once, but twenty times. 
and she had listened, knowing that it was wicked to listen, and yet powerless to shut her ears against the sweet, insidious words. She was beloved, for the first time in her life, really, truly, sentimentally beloved, like the heroine of a novel. She was beloved, despite of her shabby dresses, her dowdy bonnets, her clumsy country-made boots. All at once, in a moment, she was elevated into a queen, crowned with woman's noblest diadem, the love of a poet. She was Beatrice, and Roland Lansdell was Dante, or she was Leonora, and he was Tasso. She did not particularly care which. Her ideas of the two poets and their loves were almost as vague as the showman's notion of the rival warriors of Waterloo. She was the shadowy love of the poet, the pensive, impossible love who never could be more to him than a perpetual dream. This was how Isabel Gilbert thought of the master of Mordred, who met her so often now in the chill spring sunshine. There was a kind of wickedness in these stolen meetings, no doubt, she thought. But her wickedness was no greater than that of the beautiful princess who smiled upon the Italian poet— in that serene region of romance, that mystic fairyland in which Isabel's fancies dwelt, sin, as the world comprehends it, had no place. There was no such loathsome image in that fair kingdom of fountains and flowers. It was very wrong to meet Mr. Lansdell, but I doubt if the happiness of those meetings would have had quite such an exquisite flavor to Isabel had that faint soupçon of wickedness been wanting. Did Mrs. Gilbert ever think that the road which seemed so pleasant, the blossoming pathway along which she wandered hand in hand with Roland Lansdell, was all downhill, and that there was a black and hideous goal hidden below in the farthermost valley? No, she was enraptured and intoxicated by her present happiness, blinded by the glory of her lover's face. It had been very difficult for her to realize the splendid fact of his love and devotion, but, once believing, she was ready to believe forever. She remembered a sweet sentimental legend of the Rhineland, the story of a knight who, going away to the wars, was reported as dead, whereon his lady-love, despairing, entered a convent and consecrated the sad remainder of her days to heaven. But by and by the knight, who had not been killed, returned, and finding that his promised bride was lost to him, devoted the remainder of his days to constancy and solitude, building for himself a hermitage upon a rock high above the convent, where his fair and faithful Hildegonde spent her pure and pious days. And every morning, with the earliest flush of light in the low eastern sky, and all day long, and when the evening star rose pale and silvery beneath the purpling heavens, the hermit of love sat at the door of his cell, gazing upon the humble casement behind which it pleased him to fancy his pure mistress kneeling before her crucifix, sometimes mingling his name with her prayers. And was not the name of the knight Roland his name? It was such a love as this which Isabel imagined she had won for herself. It is such a love as this which is the dearest desire of womankind, a beautiful, useless, romantic devotion, a wasted life of fond, regretful worship. Poor, weak, sentimental Mary of Scotland accepts Chastelar's poetic homage, and is pleased to think that the poet's heart is breaking because of her grace and loveliness, and would like it to go on breaking forever. But the lovesick poet grows weary of that distant worship, and would scale the royal heavens to look nearer at the brightness of his star, whence come confusions and troubles, and the amputation of that foolish, half-demented head. So there was no thought of peril to herself or to others in Mrs. Gilbert's mind when she stood on the bridge above the mill-stream, talking with Roland Lansdell. She had a vague idea that she was not exactly doing her duty to her husband, but poor George's image only receded farther and farther from her. Did she not still obey his behests, and sit opposite to him at the little dinner-table, and pour out his tea at breakfast, and assist him to put on his overcoat in the passage before he went out? 
Could she do more for him than that? No. He had himself rejected all further attention. She had tried to brush his hat once in a sudden gush of dutiful feeling, but she had brushed the nap the wrong way and had incurred her husband's displeasure. She had tried to read poetry to him, and he had yawned during her lecture. She had put flowers on his dressing-table, white, fragile-looking flowers, in a tall, slender vase, with a tendril of convolvulus twined artfully round the stem, like a garland about a classic column. And Mr. Gilbert had objected to the perfumed blossoms as liable to generate carbonic acid gas. What could any one do for such a husband as this? The tender, sentimental raptures, the poetic emotions— the dim aspirations which Isabel revealed to Roland would have been as unintelligible as the Semitic languages to George. Why should she not bestow this other half of her nature upon whom she chose? If she gave her duty and obedience to Othello, surely Cassio might have all the poetry of her soul, which the matter-of-fact Moor despised and rejected— it was something after this wise that Isabel reasoned, when she did reason at all, about her platonic attachment for Roland Lansdell. She was very happy, lulled to rest by her own ignorance of all danger, rather than by any deeply studied design on the part of her lover. His manner to her was more tender than a father's manner to his favorite child, more reverential than Raleigh's to Elizabeth of England. But in all this he had no thought of deception. The settled purpose in his mind took a firmer root every day, and he fancied that Isabel understood him, and knew that the great crisis of her life was fast approaching, and had prepared herself to meet it. One afternoon, late in the month, when the March winds were bleaker and more pitiless than usual, Isabel went across the meadows, where the hedgerows were putting forth timid little buds to be nipped by the chill breezes, and where here and there a violet made a tiny speck of purple on the grassy bank. Mr. Lansdell was standing on the bridge when Isabel approached the familiar trysting place, and turned with a smile to greet her. But although he smiled as he pressed the slender little hand that almost always trembled in his own, the master of Mordred was not very cheerful this afternoon. It was the day succeeding that on which Charles Raymond had dined with him, and the influence of his kinsman's talk still hung about him and oppressed him. He could not deny that there had been truth and wisdom in his friend's earnest pleading, but he could not abandon his purpose now. Long vacillating and irresolute, long doubtful of himself and all the world, he was resolved at last and obstinately bent upon carrying out his resolution. "'I am going to London, Isabel,' he said, after standing by Mrs. Gilbert for some minutes, staring silently at the water. "'I am going to London to-morrow morning, Isabel.' He always called her Isabel now, and lingered with a kind of tenderness upon the name. Edith Dombey would have brought confusion upon him for this presumption, no doubt, by one bright glance of haughty reproof, but poor Isabel had found out long ago that she in no way resembled Edith Dombey. "'Going to London?' cried the doctor's wife, piteously. "'Ah, I knew, I knew that you would go away again, and I shall never see you any more.' She clasped her hands in her sudden terror, and looked at him with a world of sorrow and reproach in her pale face. "'I knew that it would be so,' she repeated. "'I dreamt the other night that you had gone away, and I came here, and, oh, it seemed such a dreadful way to come.' and I kept taking the wrong turnings and going through the wrong meadows, and when I came there was only someone, some stranger, who told me that you were gone and would never come back. But, Isabel, my love, my darling, the tender epithets did not startle her. She was so absorbed by the fear of losing the god of her idolatry. I am only going to town for a day or two to see my lawyer, to make arrangements, arrangements of vital importance. I should be a scoundrel if I neglected them, or incurred the smallest hazard by delaying them an hour. You don't understand these sort of things, Isabel, but trust me, and believe that your welfare is dearer to me than my own. I must go to town, but I shall only be gone a day or two, two days at the most, perhaps only one. 
and when I come back, Izzy, I shall have something to say to you, something very serious, something that had better be said at once, something that involves all the happiness of my future life. Will you meet me here two days hence, on Wednesday, at three o'clock? You will, won't you, Isabel? I know I do wrong in exposing you to the degradation of these stolen meetings. If I feel the shame so keenly, how much worse it must be for you, my own dear girl, my sweet, innocent darling. But this shall be the last time, Isabel, the last time I will ask you to incur any humiliation for me. Henceforward we will hold our heads high, my love, for at least there shall be no trickery or falsehood in our lives. Mrs. Gilbert stared at Roland Lansdell in utter bewilderment. He had spoken of shame and degradation, and had spoken in the tone of a man who had suffered, and still suffered, very bitterly. This was all Isabel could gather from her lover's speech, and she opened her eyes in blank amazement as she attended to him. Why should he be ashamed, or humiliated, or degraded? Was Dante degraded by his love for Beatrice? Was Waller degraded by his devotion for Saccharissa, forever evidenced by so many charming versicles, and never dropping down from the rosy cloudland of poetry into the matter-of-fact regions of prose? Degraded? Ashamed? Her face grew crimson all in a moment as these cruel words stung her poor sentimental heart. She wanted to run away all at once and never see Mr. Lansdell again. Her heart would break, as a matter of course, but how infinitely preferable to shame would be a broken heart and early death with an appropriate tombstone. The tears rolled down her flushed cheek as she turned away her face from Roland. She was almost stifled by mingled grief and indignation. I, I did not think you were ashamed to meet me here sometimes, she sobbed out. You asked me to come. I did not think that you were humiliated by talking to me. I— Why, Izzy, Isabel, darling, cried Roland, can you misunderstand me so utterly? Ashamed to meet you? Ashamed of your society? Can you doubt what would have happened had I come home a year earlier than it was my ill fortune to come? Can you doubt for a moment that I would have chosen you for my wife out of all the women in the universe? and that my highest pride would have been the right to call you that dear name? I was too late, Izzy, too late, too late to win that pure and perfect happiness which would have made a new man of me, which would have transformed me into a good and useful man, as I think. I suppose it is always so. I suppose there is always one drop wanting in the cup of joy, that one mystic drop which would change the commonplace potion into an elixir. I came too late. Why should I have everything in this world? Why should I have fifteen thousand a year, and Mordred Priory, and the right to acknowledge the woman I love in the face of all creation, while there are crippled wretches sweeping crossings for the sake of a daily crust, and men and women wasting away in great prison houses called unions, whose first law is the severance of every earthly tie? I came too late, and I suppose it was natural that I should so come. Millions of destinies have been blighted by as small a chance as that which has blighted mine, I dare say. We must take our fate as we find it, Isabel, and if we are true to each other, I hope and believe that it may be a bright one even yet, even yet. A woman of the world would have very quickly perceived that Mr. Lansdell's discourse must have relation to more serious projects than future meetings under Lord Thurston's oak, with interchanges of diverse volumes of light literature. But Isabel Gilbert was not a woman of the world. She had read novels while other people perused the Sunday papers, and of the world out of a three-volume romance she had no more idea than a baby. She believed in a phantasmal universe created out of the pages of poets and romancers. She knew that there were good people and bad people, Ernest Maltraverses and Lumley Ferrerses, Walter Gaze and Carkers. But beyond this she had very little notion of mankind, and, having once placed Mr. Lansdell amongst the heroes, could not imagine him to possess one attribute in common with the villains. 
If he seemed intensely in earnest about these meetings under the oak, she was in earnest too, and so had been the German knight who devoted the greater part of his life to watching the casement of his lady-love. "'I shall see you sometimes,' she said with timid hesitation. "'I shall see you sometimes, shan't I, when you come home from town? Not often, of course. I dare say it isn't right to come here often, away from George.' and the last time I kept him waiting for his dinner. But I told him where I had been, and that I'd seen you, and he didn't mind a bit. Roland Lansdell sighed. Ah, don't you understand, Isabel, he said, that doubles our degradation. It is for the very reason that he doesn't mind. It is precisely because he is so simple-hearted and trusting that we ought not to deceive the poor fellow any longer. That's the degradation, Izzy. The deception, not the deed itself. A man meets his enemy in fair fight and kills him, and nobody complains. The best man must always win, I suppose, and if he wins by fair means, no one need grudge him his victory. I mystify you, don't I, my darling, by all this rambling talk? I shall speak plainer on Wednesday, and now let me take you homewards, added Mr. Lansdell, looking at his watch, if you are to be home at five. He knew the habits of the doctor's little household, and knew that five o'clock was Mr. Gilbert's dinner hour. There was no conversation of any serious nature during the homeward walk, only dreamy talk about books and poets and foreign lands. Mr. Lansdell told Isabel of bright spots in Italy and Greece, wonderful villages upon the borders of blue lakes deeply hidden among alpine slopes, and snow-clad peaks like stationary clouds, "'Beautiful and picturesque regions, which she must see by and by,' Roland added gaily. "'But Mrs. Gilbert opened her eyes very wide and laughed aloud. "'How should she ever see such places?' she asked, smiling. "'George would never go there. "'He would never be rich enough to go, nor would he care to go, were he ever so rich.' And while she was speaking, Isabel thought that, after all, she cared very little for those lovely lands, much as she had dreamed about them and pined to see them long ago in the Camberwell garden on the still moonlit nights, when she used to stand on the little stone step leading from the kitchen, with her arms resting on the water-butt, like Juliet's on the balcony, and fancy it was Italy. Now she was quite resigned to the idea of never leaving Greybridge on the Wavern, she was content to live there all her life, as long as she could see Mr. Lansdell now and then, so long as she could know that he was near her, thinking of her, and loving her, and that at any moment his dark face might shine out of the dullness of her life. A perfect happiness had come to her, the happiness of being beloved by the bright object of her idolatry. Nothing could add to that perfection. The cup was full to the very brim— filled with an inexhaustible draught of joy and delight. Mr. Lansdell stopped to shake hands with Isabel when they came to the gate leading into the Greybridge Road. "'Good-bye,' he said softly. "'Good-bye until Wednesday, Isabel. "'Isabel, what a pretty name it is. "'You have no other Christian name?' "'Oh, no. "'Only Isabel. "'Isabel Gilbert. "'Good-bye.' He opened the gate and stood watching the doctor's wife as she passed out of the meadow and walked at a rapid pace towards the town. A man passed along the road as Mr. Lansdell stood there and looked at him as he went by, and then turned and looked after Isabel. "'Raymond is right, then,' thought Roland. "'They have begun to stare and chatter already. Let them talk about me at their tea-tables, and paragraph me in their newspapers to their heart's content. My soul is as much above them as the eagle soaring sunward is above the sheep that stare up at him from the valleys. I have set my foot upon the fiery plowshare, but my darling shall be carried across it scatheless in the strong arms of her lover. Mrs. Gilbert went home to her husband, and sat opposite to him at dinner as usual, but Roland's words, dimly as she had comprehended their meaning, had in some manner influenced her, for she blushed when George asked her where she had been that cold afternoon. Mr. Gilbert did not see the blush, for he was carving the joint as he asked the question, 
and indeed had asked it rather as a matter of form than otherwise. This time Mrs. Gilbert did not tell her husband that she had met Roland Lansdell. The words shame and degradation were ringing in her ears all dinner-time. She had tasted, if ever so little, the fruit of the famous tree, and she found the flavor thereof very bitter. It must be wrong to meet Roland under Lord Thurston's oak, since he said it was so, and the meeting on Wednesday was to be the last, and yet their fate was to be a happy one, had he not said so in eloquent, mysterious words, whose full meaning poor Isabel was quite unable to fathom. She brooded over what Mr. Lansdell said all that evening, and a dim sense of impending trouble crept into her mind. He was going away for ever, perhaps, and had only told her otherwise in order to lull her to rest with vain hopes, and thus spare himself the trouble of her lamentations. Or he was going to London to arrange for a speedy marriage with Lady Gwendolen. Poor Isabel could not shake off her jealous fears of that brilliant high-bred rival whom Mr. Lansdell had once loved. Yes, he had once loved Lady Gwendolen. Mr. Raymond had taken an opportunity of telling Isabel all about the young man's early engagement to his cousin, and he had added a hope that, after all, a marriage between the two might yet be brought about. And had not the housekeeper at Mordred said very much the same thing? "'He will marry Lady Gwendolen,' Isabel thought, in a sudden access of despair. "'And that is what he is going to tell me on Wednesday.' He was different to-day from what he has been since he came back to Mordred. And yet, and yet, and yet what? Isabel tried in vain to fathom the meaning of all Roland Lansdell's wild talk, now earnestly grave, now suddenly reckless, one moment full of hope, and in the next tinctured with despair. What was this simple young novel-reader to make of a man of the world, who was eager to defy the world, and knew exactly what a terrible world it was that he was about to outrage and defy. Mrs. Gilbert lay awake all that night, thinking of the meeting by the waterfall. Roland's talk had mystified and alarmed her. The ignorant happiness, the unreflecting delight in her lover's presence, the daily joy that in its fullness had no room for a thought of the morrow, had vanished all at once like a burst of sunlight eclipsed by the darkening clouds that presage a storm. Eve had listened to the first whispers of the serpent, and paradise was no longer entirely beautiful. End of chapter 23 Recording by Kirsten Weber Chapter Twenty Four of The Doctor's Wife by Mary Elizabeth Braddon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kirsten Weber. Chapter Twenty Four Lady Gwendolen Does Her Duty. Mrs. Gilbert stayed at home all through the day which succeeded her parting from Roland Lansdell. She stayed in the dingy parlor and read a little and played upon the piano a little and sketched a few profile portraits of Mr. Lansdell, desperately inky and sentimental, with impossibly enormous eyes. She worked a little, wounding her fingers, and hopelessly entangling her thread, and she let the fire out two or three times, as she was accustomed to do very often to the aggravation of Mrs. Jeffson. That hard-working and faithful retainer came into the parlor at two o'clock, carrying a little plate of seed-cake and a glass of water for her mistress's frugal luncheon, and finding the grate black and dismal for the second time that day, fetched a bundle of wood and a box of matches, and knelt down to rekindle the cavernous cinders in no very pleasant humor. "'I'm sorry I've left the fire out again, Mrs. Jeffson,' Isabel said meekly. "'I think there must be something wrong in the grate somehow, for the fire always will go out.' "'It usen't to go out in Master George's mother's time,' Mrs. Jeffson answered, rather sharply. "'And it was the same great then. But my dear young mistress used to sit in yon chair, stitch, 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 at the doctor's cambric shirt-fronts, and the fire was always burning bright and pleasant when he came home. She was a regular stay-at-home, she was,' added the housekeeper, in a musing tone. 
and it was very rare as she went out beyond the garden, except on a summer's eve when the doctor took her for a walk. She didn't like going out alone, poor dear, for there was plenty of young squires about Greybridge as would have been glad enough to follow her and talk to her and set people's malicious tongues chattering about her if she'd have let em. But she never did. She was as happy as the day was long, sitting at home working for her husband, always ready to jump up and run to the door when she heard his step outside. God bless her innocent heart." Mrs. Gilbert's face grew crimson as she bent over a sheet of paper on which the words despair and prayer, breath and death, were twisted into a heart-rending rhyme. Ah, this was part of the shame and degradation Roland had spoken of. Everybody had a right to lecture her, and at every turn the perfections of the dead were cast reproachfully in her face, as if she did not wish to be dead and at rest. "'regretted and not lectured, deplored rather than slandered and upbraided. "'These vulgar people laid their rude hands upon her cup of joy "'and changed its contents into the bitter waters of shame. "'These commonplace creatures set themselves up as the judges of her life "'and turned all its purest and brightest poetry into a prosaic record of disgrace.' The glory of the Koh-i-Nur would have been tarnished by the print of such base hands as these. How could these people read her heart, or understand her love for Roland Lansdell? Very likely the serene lady of the Rhineland, praying in her convent cell, was slandered and misrepresented by vulgar boors, who, passing along the roadway beneath, saw the hermit knight sitting at the door of his cell, and gazing fondly at his lost love's casement. Such thoughts as these arose in Isabel's mind, and she was angry and indignant at the good woman who presumed to lecture her. She pushed away the plate of stale cake, and went to the window flushed and resentful. But the flush faded all in a moment from her face when she saw a lady in a carriage driving slowly towards the gate. A lady who wore a great deal of soft brown fur, and a violet velvet bonnet with drooping features— and who looked up at the house as if uncertain as to its identity. The lady was Lord Reesdale's daughter, and the carriage was only a low basket phaeton, drawn by a stout bay cob, and attended by a groom in a neat livery of dark blue. But if the simple equipage had been the fairy chariot of Queen Mab herself, Mrs. Gilbert could scarcely have seemed more abashed and astounded by its apparition before her door. The groom descended from his seat at an order from his mistress, and rang the bell at the surgeon's gate. And then Lady Gwendolen, having recognized Isabel at the window, and saluted her with a very haughty inclination of the head, abandoned the reins to her attendant, and alighted. Mrs. Jeffson had opened the gate by this time, and the visitor swept by into the little passage, and thence into the parlour, where she found the doctor's wife standing by the table, trifling nervously with that scrap of fancy-work whose only progress was to get grimier and grimier day by day under Isabel's idle fingers. Oh, what a dingy, shabby place that Greybridge parlour was always! How doubly and trebly dingy it seemed to-day by contrast with that gorgeous, millet-like figure of Gwendolen Pomfrey, rich and glorious in violet, velvet, and Russian sable, with the yellow tints of her hair contrasted by the deep purple shadows under her bonnet. Mrs. Gilbert almost sank under the weight of all that aristocratic splendor. She brought a chair for her visitor, and asked in a tremulous voice if Lady Gwendolen would be pleased to sit. There was a taint of snobbishness in her reverential awe of the Earl's handsome daughter. Was not Lady Gwendolen the very incarnation of all her own foolish dreams of the beautiful? Long ago, in the Camberwell garden, she had imagined such a creature, and now she bowed herself before the splendor, and was stricken with fear and trembling in the dazzling presence. And then there were other reasons that she should tremble and turn pale. Might not Lady Gwendolen have come to announce her intended marriage with Mr. Lansdell, and to smite the poor wretch before her with sudden madness and despair? Isabel felt that some calamity was coming down upon her, 
and she stood pale and silent, meekly waiting to receive her sentence. "'Pray sit down, Mrs. Gilbert,' said Lady Gwendolen. "'I wish to have a little conversation with you. I am very glad to have found you at home, and alone.' The lady spoke very kindly, but her kindness had a stately coldness that crept like melted ice through Isabel's veins and chilled her to the bone. "'I am older than you, Mrs. Gilbert,' said Lady Gwendolen, after a little pause, and she slightly winced as she made the confession. "'I am older than you, and if I speak to you in a manner that you may have some right to resent, as an impertinent interference with your affairs, I trust that you will believe I am influenced only by a sincere desire for your welfare.' Isabel's heart sank to a profounder depth of terror than before when she had heard this, she had never in her life known anything but unpleasantness to come from people's desire for her welfare, from the early days in which her stepmother had administered salutary boxes on the ear and salts and senna with an equal regard to her moral and physical improvement. She looked up fearfully at Lady Gwendolen, and saw that the fair Saxon face of her visitor was almost as pale as her own. "'I am older than you, Mrs. Gilbert,' repeated Gwendolen. "'and I know my cousin Roland Lansdell much better than you can possibly know him.' "'The sound of the dear name, the sacred name, "'which to Isabel's mind should only have been spoken in a hushed whisper, "'like a tender pianissimo passage in music, "'shot home to the foolish girl's heart. "'Her face flushed crimson, and she clasped her hands together "'while the tears welled slowly up in her eyes. "'I know my cousin better than you can know him.' "'I know the world better than you can know it. "'There are some women, Mrs. Gilbert, who would condemn you unheard, "'and who would consider their lips sullied by any mention of your name. "'There are many women in my position who would hold themselves aloof from you, "'content to let you go your own way. "'But I take leave to think for myself in all matters. "'I have heard Mr. Raymond speak very kindly of you. "'I cannot judge you as harshly as other people judge you.' I cannot believe you to be what your neighbors think you. Oh, what can they think of me? cried Isabel, trembling with a vague fear, an ignorant fear of some deadly peril utterly unknown to her, and yet close upon her. What harm have I done that they should think ill of me? What can they say of me? What can they say? Her eyes were blinded by tears that blotted Lady Gwendolen's stern face from her sight. She was still so much of a child that she made no effort to conceal her terror and confusion. She bared all the foolish secrets of her heart before those cruel eyes. "'People say that you are a false wife to a simple-hearted and trusting husband,' Lord Reesdale's daughter answered, with pitiless calmness. "'A false wife, in thought and intention, if not in deed, since you have lured my cousin back to this place, and are ready to leave it with him as his mistress whenever he chooses to say, Come. That is what people think of you, and you have given them only too much cause for their suspicion. Do you imagine that you could keep any secret from Greybridge? Do you think your actions, or even your thoughts, could escape the dull eyes of these country people, who have nothing better to do than watch the doings of their neighbors? demanded Lady Gwendolen bitterly. Alas, she knew that her name had been bandied about from gossip to gossip, and that her grand disappointment in the matter of Lord Heatherland, her increasing years, and declining chances of a prize in the matrimonial lottery, had been freely discussed at all tea-tables in the little country town. "'Country people find out everything, Mrs. Gilbert,' she said presently. "'You have been watched in your sentimental meetings and rambles with Mr. Lansdell, "'and you may consider yourself very fortunate "'if no officious person has taken the trouble to convey the information to your husband.' "'Isabel had been crying all this time, crying bitterly, "'with her head bent upon her clasped hands, but to Lady Gwendolen's surprise she lifted it now, and looked at her accuser with some show of indignation, if not defiance. "'I told George every—almost every time I met Mr. Lansdell,' she exclaimed. "'And George knows that he lends me books, and he likes me to have books—nice inst instructive books,' said Mrs. Gilbert, stifling her sobs as best she might. 
"'And I n never thought that anybody could be so wicked as to fancy there was any harm in my meeting him. "'I don't suppose anyone ever said anything to Beatrice Portinari, though she was married, and Dante loved her very dearly. "'And I only want to see him now and then, and to hear him talk, and he has been very, very kind to me.' "'Kind to you?' cried Lady Gwendolen scornfully. "'Do you know the value of such kindness as his? "'Did you ever hear of any good coming of it? "'Did such kindness ever bear any fruit but anguish and misery and mortification? "'You talk like a baby, Mrs. Gilbert, or else like a hypocrite. "'Do you know what my cousin's life has been? "'Do you know that he is an infidel, "'and outrages his friends by opinions which he does not even care to conceal?' Do you know that his name has been involved with the names of married women before to-day? Are you besotted enough to think that his new fancy for you is anything more than the caprice of an idle and dissipated man of the world, who is ready to bring ruin upon the happiest home in England for the sake of a new sensation, a little extra aliment for the vanity which a host of foolish women have pampered into his ruling vice? Vanity! exclaimed Mrs. Gilbert. "'Oh, Lady Gwendolen, how can you say that he is vain? "'It is you who do not know him. "'Ah, if you could only know how good he is, how noble, how generous! "'I know that he would never try to injure me by so much as a word or a thought. "'Why should I not love him, as we love the stars that are so beautiful and so distant from us? "'Why should I not worship him, as Helena worshipped Bertram, as Viola loved Zanoni? "'The wicked Greybridge people may say what they like.' "'And if they tell George anything about me, I will tell him the truth. "'And then, and then, if I was only a Catholic, I would go into a convent like Hildegonde. "'Ah, Lady Gwendolen, you do not understand such love as mine,' added Isabel, "'looking at the Earl's daughter with an air of superiority that was superb in its simplicity. "'She was proud of her love, which was so high above the comprehension of ordinary people.' It is just possible that she was even a little proud of the slander which attached to her. She had all her life been pining for the glory of martyrdom, and, lo, it had come upon her. The fiery circlet had descended upon her brow, and she assumed a dignified pose in order to support it properly. "'I only understand that you are a very foolish person,' Lady Gwendolen answered coldly. "'And I have been extremely foolish to trouble myself about you.' I considered it my duty to do what I have done, and I wash my hands henceforward of you and your affairs. Pray go your own way, and do not fear any further interference from me. It is quite impossible that I can have the smallest association with my cousin's mistress. She hurled the cruel word at the doctor's wife, and departed with a sound of silken rustling in the narrow passage. Isabel heard the carriage drive away, and then flung herself down upon her knees to sob and lament her cruel destiny. That last word had stung her to the very heart. It took all the poetry out of her life. It brought before her, in its full significance, the sense of her position. If she met Roland under Lord Thurston's oak, if she walked with him in the meadows that his footsteps beautified into the smooth lawns of paradise— People, vulgar, ignorant people, utterly unable to comprehend her or her love, would say that she was his mistress, his mistress, to what people she had heard that word applied, and Beatrice Portinari and Viola and Leila and Gulnare and Zelika, what of them? The visions of all those lovely and shining creatures arose before her, and beside them, in letters of fire, blazed the odious word that transformed her fond platonic worship, her sentimental girlish idolatry, into a shame and disgrace. "'I will see him to-morrow and say farewell to him,' she thought. "'I will bid him good-bye for ever and ever, though my heart should break.' "'Ah, how I hope it may, as I say the bitter word! "'And never, never will I see him again. "'I know now what he meant by shame and humiliation. "'I can understand all he said now.' "'Mrs. Gilbert had another of her headaches that evening, "'and poor George was obliged to dine alone. 
He went upstairs once or twice in the course of the evening to see his wife, and found her lying very quietly in the dimly lighted room with her face turned to the wall. She held out her hand to him as he bent over her, and pressed his broad palm with fevered fingers. "'I'm afraid I've been neglectful of you sometimes, George,' she said. "'But I, I won't be so again. I won't go out for those long walks and keep you waiting for dinner. And if you would like a set of new shirts made—you said the other day that yours were nearly worn out—I should like to make them for you myself. I used to help to make the shirts for my brothers, and I don't think I should pucker so much now. And, oh, George, Mrs. Jeffson was talking of your poor mother today, and I want you to tell me what it was she died of.' Mr. Gilbert patted his wife's hand approvingly, and laid it gently down on the coverlet. "'That's a melancholy subject, my love,' he said, "'and I don't think it would do either of us any good to talk about it. As for the shirts, my dear, it's very good of you to offer to make them, but I doubt if you'd manage them as well as the workwoman at Wareham, who made the last. She's very reasonable, and she's lame, poor soul, so it's a kind of charity to employ her.' "'Good-bye for the present, Izzy. Try to get a nap, and don't worry your poor head about anything.' He went away, and Isabel listened to his substantial boots creaking down the stairs, and away towards the surgery. He had come thence to his wife's room, and he left a faint odour of drugs behind him. Ah, how that odious flavour of senna and chamomile flowers brought back a magical, exotic perfume that had floated toward her one day from his hair— as he bent his head to listen to her foolish talk. And now the senna and chamomile were to flavor all her life. She was no longer to enjoy that mystical double existence, those delicious glimpses of dreamland, which made up for all the dullness of the common world that surrounded her. If she could have died and made an end of it all, there are moments in life when death seems the only issue from a dreadful labyrinth of grief and horror. I suppose it is only very weak-minded people, doubtful, vacillating creatures, like Prince Hamlet of Denmark, who wish to die and make an easy end of their difficulties. But Isabel was not by any means strong-minded, and she thought with a bitter pang of envy of the commonplace young women whom she had known to languish and fade in the most interesting pulmonary diseases, while she so vainly yearned for the healing touch which makes a sure end of all mortal fevers. But there was something, one thing in the world yet worth the weariness of existence, that meeting with him, that meeting which was to be also an eternal parting. She would see him once more, he would look down at her with his mysterious eyes, the eyes of Zanoni himself could scarcely have been more mystically dark and deep, she would see him, and perhaps that strangely intermingled joy and anguish would be more fatal than earthly disease, and she would drop dead at his feet, looking to the last at the dark splendor of his face, dying under the spell of his low, tender voice. And then, with a shudder, she remembered what Lady Gwendolen had said of her demigod, dissipated and an infidel, vain, selfish, oh, cruel, cruel slander! the slander of a jealous woman, perhaps, who had loved him and been slighted by him. The doctor's wife would not believe any treasonous whisper against her idol. Only from his own lips could come the words that would be strong enough to destroy her illusions. She lay awake all that night, thinking of her interview with Lady Gwendolen, acting the scene over and over again, hearing the cruel words repeated in her ears with dismal iteration throughout the long, dark, slow hours. The pale, cheerless spring daylight came at last, and Mrs. Gilbert fell asleep just when it was nearly time for her to think of getting up. The doctor breakfasted alone that morning, as he had dined the day before. He begged that Isabel might not be disturbed. A good long spell of rest was the best thing for his wife's head, he told Mrs. Jeffson, to which remark that lady only replied by a kind of suspicious sniff, accompanied by a jerk of the head, and followed by a plaintive sigh, all of which were entirely lost upon the parish surgeon. "'Females whose heads keep em a bed when they ought to be seeing after their husband's meals hadn't ought to marry,' 
Mrs. Jeffson remarked, with better sense than grammar, when she took George's breakfast paraphernalia back to the kitchen. I heard down the street just now, as he come back to the Priory late last night, and I lay she'll be going out to meet him this afternoon, William. Mr. Jeffson, who was smoking his matutinal pipe by the kitchen fire, shook his head with a slow, melancholy gesture as his wife made this remark. "'It's a bad business, Tilly,' he said. "'A bad business first and last. If he was anything of a man, he'd keep away from these parts, and it'd be above leading a poor, simple little thing like that astray.' Them poetry hooks and such like, as she's always a readin, has half turned her head long ago, and it only needs a fine chap like him to turn it all together. I mind what I say to Muster Jarge the night as I fust see her, and I can see her face now, Tilly, as I see it then, with the eyes fixed and looking far away like, and I knew then what I know better still now, my lass. Them two'll never get on together. They warrant made for one another. I wonder sometimes to see the trouble a man'll take before he gets a pair of boots to find out as they're a good fit and won't gall his foot when he comes to wear em, but the same man'll go and get married as careless and off-hand like as if there weren't the smallest chance of his wife's not suiting him. I was took by thy good looks, lass, I won't deny, when I first saw thee, Mr. Jeffson added, with diplomatic gallantry. "'But it wasn't because of thy looks as I asked thee to be my true wife and friend and companion throughout this mortal life and all its various troubles.'" End of chapter 24 Recording by Kirsten Weber